by Charles Dickens. Hard Times. Now what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. This is the principle on which I bring up my own children, and this is the principle on which I bring up these children. Stick to the facts, sir. The scene was a plain, bare, monotonous vault of a schoolroom, and the speaker's square forefinger emphasized his observations by underscoring every sentence with a line on the schoolmaster's sleeve. The emphasis was helped by the speaker's square wall of a forehead, which had his eyebrows for its base, while his eyes found commodious cellarage in two dark caves overshadowed by the wall. The emphasis was helped by the speaker's mouth, which was wide, thin, and hard-set. The emphasis was helped by the speaker's voice, which was inflexible, dry, and dictatorial. The emphasis was helped by the speaker's hair, which bristled on the skirts of his bald head, a plantation of furs to keep the wind from its shining surface, all covered with knobs like the crust of a plum pie as if the head had scarcely warehouse room for the hard facts stored inside. The speaker's obstinate carriage, square coat, square legs, square shoulders, nay, his very neckcloth, trained to take him by the throat with an unaccommodating grasp, like a stubborn fact, as it was, all helped the emphasis. In this life we want nothing but facts, sir. Nothing but facts. The speaker, and the schoolmaster, and the third grown person present, all backed a little, and swept with their eyes the inclined plane of little vessels then and there arranged in order, ready to have imperial gallons of facts poured into them until they were full to the brim. Thomas Gradgrind, sir, a man of realities, a man of facts and calculations, a man who proceeds upon the principle that two and two are four and nothing over, and who is not to be talked into allowing for anything over. Thomas Gradgrind, sir. Peremptorily, Thomas. Thomas Gradgrind. With a rule and a pair of scales, and the multiplication tables always in his pocket, sir, ready to weigh and measure any parcel of human nature and tell you exactly what it comes to. It is a mere question of figures, a case of simple arithmetic. You might hope to get some other nonsensical belief into the head of George Gradgrind, or Augustus Gradgrind, or John Gradgrind, or Joseph Gradgrind, all supposititious non-existent persons. But into the head of Thomas Gradgrind, no, sir. In such terms Mr. Gradgrind always mentally introduced himself, whether to his private circle of acquaintance or to the public in general. In such terms, no doubt, substituting the words boys and girls for sir, Thomas Gradgrind now presented Thomas Gradgrind to the little pictures before him, who were to be filled so full of facts. Indeed, as he eagerly sparkled at them from the cellarage before mentioned, he seemed a kind of cannon, loaded to the muzzle with facts, and preparing to blow them clean out of the regions of childhood at one discharge. He seemed a galvanizing apparatus, too, charged with a grim mechanical substitute for the tender young imaginations that were to be stormed away. Girl number 20 said Mr. Gradgrind, squarely pointing with his square forefinger. I don't know that girl. Who is that girl? Sissy Jupe, sir, explained number twenty, blushing, standing up, and curtsying. Sissy is not a name, said Mr. Gradgrind. Don't call yourself Sissy. Call yourself Cecilia. Its father as calls me Sissy, sir, returned the young girl in a trembling voice and with another curtsy. Then he has no business to do it, said Mr. Gradgrind. Tell him he mustn't. Cecilia Jupe, let me see, what is your father? He belongs to the horse-riding, if you please, sir. 
Mr. Gradgrind frowned, and waved off the objectionable calling with his hand. We don't want to know anything about that here. You mustn't tell us about that here. Your father breaks horses, don't he? If you please, sir, when they can get any to break, they do break horses in the ring, sir. You mustn't tell us about the ring here. Very well, then. Describe your father as a horse-breaker. He doctors sick horses, I dare say. Oh, yes, sir. Very well, then. He is a veterinary surgeon, a farrier, and horse-breaker. Give me your definition of a horse. Sissy Jupe thrown into the greatest alarm by this demand. Girl number twenty unable to define a horse, said Mr. Gradgrind, for the general behoof of all the little pitchers. Girl number twenty possessed of no facts in reference to one of the commonest of animals. Some boy's definition of a horse. Bitzer, yours. The square finger, moving here and there, lighted suddenly on Bitzer. Perhaps because he chanced to sit in the same ray of sunlight which— darting in at one of the bare windows of the intensely whitewashed room, irradiated Sissy, for the boys and girls sat on the face of the inclined plane in two compact bodies, divided up the center by a narrow interval, and Sissy, being at the corner of a row on the sunny side, came in for the beginning of a sunbeam, of which Bitzer, being at the corner of a row on the other side, a few rows in advance, caught the end. But, whereas the girl was so dark-eyed and dark-haired, that she seemed to receive a deeper and more lustrous color from the sun when it shone upon her, the boy was so light-eyed and light-haired, that the self-same rays appeared to draw out of him what little color he ever possessed. His cold eyes could hardly have been eyes, but for the short ends of lashes which, by bringing them into immediate contrast with something paler than themselves, expressed their form. His short-cropped hair might have been a mere continuation of the sandy freckles on his forehead and face. His skin was so unwholesomely deficient in the natural tinge that he looked as though, if he were cut, he would bleed white. Bitzer, said Mr. Gradgrind. Your definition of a horse. A quadruped, graminivorous, Forty teeth, namely twenty-four grinders, four eye teeth, and twelve incisive. Sheds caught in the spring. In marshy countries, sheds hooves, too. Hooves hard, but requiring to be shod with iron. Age known by marks in mouth. Thus add much more, Bitzer. Now, girl number twenty, said Mr. Gradgrind, you know what a horse is. She curtsied again, and would have blushed deeper if she could have blushed deeper than she had blushed all this time. Bitzer, after rapidly blinking at Thomas Gradgrind with both eyes at once, and so catching the light upon his quivering ends of lashes that they looked like the antenna of busy insects, put his knuckles to his freckled forehead and sat down again. The third gentleman now stepped forth. A mighty man at cutting and drying he was, a government officer in his way, and in most other people's too, a professed pugilist, always in training, always with a system to force down the general throat like a bolus, always to be heard of at the bar of his little public office, ready to fight all England. To continue in fistic phraseology, he had a genius for coming up to the scratch, wherever and whatever it was, and proving himself an ugly customer. He would go in and damage any subject whatever with his right, follow up with his left, stop, exchange, counter, bore his opponent, he always fought all England, to the ropes, and fall upon him neatly. He was certain to knock the wind out of common sense, and render that unlucky adversary deaf to the call of time and he had it in charge from high authority to bring about the great public office millennium, when commissioners should reign upon earth. Very well, said this gentleman, briskly smiling and folding his arms. That's a horse. Now let me ask you, boys and girls, would you paper a room with representations of horses? After a pause, one half of the children cried in chorus, Yes, sir, upon which the other half, 
seeing in the gentleman's face that yes was wrong, cried out in chorus, No, sir, as the custom is in these examinations. Of course no. Why wouldn't you? A pause. One corpulent slow boy, with a wheezing manner of breathing, ventured the answer. Because he wouldn't paper a room at all, but would paint it. You must paper it, said the gentleman, rather warmly. You must paper it, said Thomas Gradgrind. Whether you like it or not, don't tell us you wouldn't paper it. What do you mean, boy? I'll explain to you, then, said the gentleman, after another and dismal pause. Why you wouldn't paper a room with representations of horses. Do you ever see horses walking up and down the sides of room and reality, in fact? Do you? Yes, sir, from one half. No, sir, from the other. Of course, no, said the gentleman, with an indignant look at the wrong half. Why, then, you are not to see anywhere what you don't see in fact. You are not to have anywhere what you don't have in fact. What is called taste is only another name for fact. Thomas Gradgrind nodded his approbation. This is a new principle, a discovery, a great discovery, said the gentleman. Now, I'll try you again. Suppose you were going to carpet a room. Would you use a carpet having a representation of flowers upon it? There being a general conviction by this time that no, sir, was always the right answer to this gentleman, the chorus of no was very strong. Only a few feeble stragglers said yes. Among them, Sissy Jupe. Girl number twenty, said the gentleman, smiling in the calm strength of knowledge. Sissy blushed and stood up. So you would carpet your room, or your husband's room, if you were a grown woman and had a husband, with representations of flowers, would you? said the gentleman. Why would you? If you please, sir, I am very fond of flowers, returned the girl. And that is why you would put tables and chairs upon them and have people walking over them with heavy boots? It wouldn't hurt them, sir. They wouldn't crush and wither, if you please, sir. They would be the pictures of what was very pretty and pleasant, and I would fancy— Ay, 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 but you mustn't fancy, cried the gentleman, quite elated by coming so happily to his point. That's it. You are never to fancy. You are not, Cecilia Jupe, Thomas Gradgrind solemnly repeated, to do anything of that kind. Fact, 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 said the gentleman. Fact, fact, fact repeated Thomas Gradgrind. You are to be in all things regulated and governed, said the gentleman, by fact. We hope to have, before long, a board of fact, composed of commissioners of fact, who will force the people to be a people of fact, and of nothing but fact. You must discard the word fancy altogether. You have nothing to do with it. You are not to have, in any object of use or ornament, what would be a contradiction in fact. You don't walk upon flowers, in fact. You cannot be allowed to walk upon flowers and carpets. You don't find that foreign birds and butterflies come and perch upon your crockery. You cannot be permitted to paint foreign birds and butterflies upon your crockery. You never meet with quadrupeds going up and down walls. You must not have quadrupeds represented upon walls. You must use, said the gentleman, for all these purposes, combinations and modifications, in primary colors, of mathematical figures which are susceptible of proof and demonstration. This is the new discovery. This is fact. This is taste. The girl curtsied and sat down. She was very young and she looked as if she were frightened by the matter-of-fact prospect the world afforded. Now, if Mr. Mchokumchild, said the gentleman, will proceed to give his first lesson here, Mr. Gradgrind, I shall be happy, at your request, to observe his mode of procedure. Mr. Gradgrind was much obliged. Mr. Mchokumchild, we only wait for you. So Mr. Mchokumchild began in his best manner. 
He and some one hundred and forty other schoolmasters had been lately turned at the same time in the same factory on the same principles, like so many pianoforte legs. He had been put through an immense variety of paces, and had answered volumes of head-breaking questions, orthography, etymology, syntax, and prosody, biography, astronomy, geography, and general cosmography, the sciences of compound proportion, algebra, land surveying and leveling, vocal music, and drawing from models, were all at the ends of his ten chilled fingers. He had worked his stony way into Her Majesty's most honorable Privy Council's Schedule B, and had taken the bloom off the higher branches of mathematics and physical science, French, German, Latin, and Greek. He knew all about all the watersheds of all the world, whatever they are, and all the histories of all the peoples, and all the names of all the rivers and mountains, and all the productions, manners, and customs of all the countries, and all their boundaries and bearings on the two and thirty points of the compass. Ah, rather overdone, McChokum child, if he had only learnt a little less— how infinitely better he might have taught much more. He went to work in this preparatory lesson, not unlike Morgiana in the Forty Thieves, looking into all the vessels ranged before him, one after another, to see what they contained. Say, good McChokum child, when from thy boiling store thou shalt fill each jar brim full by and by, Dost thou think that thou wilt always kill outright the robber fancy lurking within, or sometimes only maim him and distort him? Mr. Gradgrind walked homeward from the school in a state of considerable satisfaction. It was his school, and he intended it to be a model. He intended every child in it to be a model, just as the young Gradgrinds were all models. There were five young Gradgrinds, and they were models every one. They had been lectured at from their tenderest years, coursed like little hares. Almost as soon as they could run alone, they had been made to run to the lecture-room. The first object with which they had an association, or of which they had a remembrance, was a large blackboard with a dry ogre, chalking ghastly white figures on it. Not that they knew, by name or nature, anything about an ogre. Fact forbid. I only use the word to express a monster in a lecturing castle, with heaven knows how many heads manipulated into one, taking childhood captive and dragging it into gloomy statistical dens by the hair. No little Gradgrind had ever seen a face in the moon. It was up in the moon before it could speak distinctly. No little Gradgrind had ever learnt the silly jingle, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. No little Gradgrind had ever known wonder on the subject. Each little Gradgrind, having at five years old dissected the great bear like a Professor Owen, and driven Charles's Wayne like a locomotive engine driver. No little Gradgrind had ever associated a cow in a field with that famous cow with the crumpled horn, who tossed the dog, who worried the cat, who killed the rat, who ate the malt, or with that yet more famous cow who swallowed Tom Thumb. It had never heard of those celebrities, and had only been introduced to a cow as a graminivorous ruminating quadruped with several stomachs. To his matter-of-fact home, which was called Stone Lodge, Mr. Gradgrind directed his steps. He had virtually retired from the wholesale hardware trade before he built Stone Lodge, and was now looking about for a suitable opportunity of making an arithmetical figure in Parliament. Stone Lodge was sitting on a moor within a mile or two of a great town called Coketown in the present faithful guide-book. A regular feature on the face of the country, Stone Lodge was, not the least disguise toned down or shaded off that uncompromising fact in the landscape. A great square house, 
with a heavy portico darkening the principal windows, as its master's heavy brows overshadowed his eyes. A calculated, cast-up, balanced, and proved house. Six windows on this side of the door, six on that side. A total of twelve in this wing, a total of twelve in the other wing. Four and twenty carried over to the back wings. A lawn and garden and an infant avenue, all ruled straight like a botanical account book. Gas and ventilation, drainage and water service, all of the primest quality. Iron clamps and girders, fireproof from top to bottom. Mechanical lifts for the housemaids, with all their brushes and brooms. Everything that hearth could desire. Everything? Well, I suppose so. The little Gradgrinds had cabinets in various departments of science, too. They had a little conchological cabinet, and a little metallurgical cabinet, and a little mineralogical cabinet. And the specimens were all arranged and labeled and the bits of stone and ore looked as though they might have been broken from the parent substances by those tremendously hard instruments, their own names, and, to paraphrase the idle legend of Peter Piper, who had never found his way into their nursery, if the greedy little gradgrinds grasped at more than this, what was it, for good gracious goodness sake, that the greedy little gradgrinds grasped at? Their father walked on in a hopeful and satisfied frame of mind. He was an affectionate father, after his manner, but he probably would have described himself, if he had been put, like Sissy Jupe, upon a definition, as an eminently practical father. He had a particular pride in the phrase eminently practical, which was considered to have a special application to him. Whatsoever the public meeting held in Coketown, and whatsoever the subject of such meeting, some Coketowner was sure to seize the occasion of alluding to his eminently practical friend Gradgrind. This always pleased the eminently practical friend. He knew it to be his due, but his due was acceptable. He had reached the neutral ground upon the outskirts of the town, which was neither town nor country, and yet was either spoiled, when his ears were invaded by the sound of music. The clashing and banging band attached to the horse-riding establishment, which had there set up its rest in a wooden pavilion, was in full bray. A flag, floating from the summit of the temple, proclaimed to mankind that it was Sleary's horse-riding, which claimed their suffrages. Sleary himself, a stout modern statue with a money-box at his elbow, in an ecclesiastical niche of early Gothic architecture, took the money. Miss Josephine Sleary, as some very long and very narrow strips of printed bill announced, was then inaugurating the entertainments with her graceful equestrian Tyrolean flower act. Among the other pleasing, but always strictly moral wonders, which must be seen to be believed, Signor Jupe was that afternoon to elucidate the diverting accomplishments of his highly trained performing dog, Merrylegs. He was also to exhibit his astounding feat of throwing seventy-five hundred weight in rapid succession back-handed over his head, thus forming a fountain of solid iron in mid-air, a feat never before attempted in this or any other country and which, having elicited some rapturous plaudits from enthusiastic throngs, it cannot be withdrawn. The same Signor Jupe was to enliven the varied performances at frequent intervals with his chaste Shakespearean quips and retorts. Lastly, he was to wind them up by appearing in his favorite character of Mr. William Button, of Tooley Street, in the highly novel and laughable hippocomedietta of the tailor's journey to Brentford. Thomas Gradgrind took no heed of these trivialities, of course, but passed on as a practical man ought to pass on, either brushing the noisy insects from his thoughts or consigning them to the house of correction. But the turning of the road took him by the back of the booth, and at the back of the booth, a number of children were congregated, in a number of stealthy attitudes, 
striving to peep in at the hidden glories of the place. This brought him to a stop. Now to think of these vagabonds, said he, attracting the young rabble from a model school. A space of stunted grass and dry rubbish being between him and the young rabble, he took his eyeglass out of his waistcoat to look for any child he knew by name and might order off. Phenomenon almost incredible, though distinctly seen, what did he then behold but his own metallurgical Louisa, peeping with all her might through a hole in a deal-board, and his own mathematical Thomas abasing himself on the ground to catch but a hoof of the graceful equestrian Tyrolean flower-act. Dumb with amazement, Mr. Gradgrind crossed to the spot where his family was thus disgraced, laid his hand upon each erring child, and said, Louisa! Thomas! Both rose, red and disconcerted. But Louisa looked at her father with more boldness than Thomas did. Indeed, Thomas did not look at him, but gave himself up to be taken home like a machine. In the name of wonder, idleness, and folly, said Mr. Gradgrind, leading each way by a hand, what do you do here? Wanted to see what it was like, returned Louisa, shortly. What it was like? Yes, father. There was an air of jaded sullenness in them both and particularly in the girl. Yet, struggling through the dissatisfaction of her face, there was a light with nothing to rest upon, a fire with nothing to burn, a starved imagination keeping life in itself somehow, which brightened its expression, not with the brightness natural to cheerful youth, but with uncertain, eager, doubtful flashes, analogous to the changes on a blind face groping its way. She was a child now of fifteen or sixteen, but at no distant day would seem to become a woman all at once. Her father thought so as he looked at her. She was pretty, would have been self-willed, he thought in his eminently practical way, but for her bringing up. Thomas, though I have the fact before me, I find it difficult to believe you, with your education and resources, should have brought your sister to a scene like this. I brought him, father, said Louisa quickly. I asked him to come. I am sorry to hear it. I am very sorry indeed to hear it. It makes Thomas no better than it makes you worse, Louisa. She looked at her father again, but no tear fell down her cheek. You! Thomas, and you, to whom the circle of the sciences is open. Thomas, and you, who may be said to be replete with facts. Thomas, and you, who have been trained to mathematical exactness. Thomas, and you, here, cried Mr. Gradgrind, in this degraded position. I am amazed. I was tired, father. I have been tired a long time," said Louisa. "'Tired? Of what?' asked the astonished father. "'I don't know of what. Of everything, I think.' "'Say not another word,' returned Mr. Gradgrind. "'You are childish. I will hear no more.' He did not speak again until they had walked some half a mile in silence, when he gravely broke out with, "'What would your best friend say, Louisa?' Do you attach no value to their good opinion? What would Mr. Bounderby say? At the mention of this name, his daughter stole a look at him, remarkable for its intense and searching character. He saw nothing of it, for before he looked at her, she had again cast down her eyes. What? He repeated presently. Would Mr. Bounderby say? All the way to Stone Lodge, as with grave indignation he led the two delinquents home, he repeated at intervals, What would Mr. Bounderby say? As if Mr. Bounderby had been Mrs. Grundy. Not being Mrs. Grundy, who was Mr. Bounderby? Why, Mr. Bounderby was as near being Mr. Gradgrind's bosom friend as a man perfectly devoid of sentiment can approach that spiritual relationship towards another man perfectly devoid of sentiment. 
So near was Mr. Bounderby, or, if the reader should prefer it, so far off. He was a rich man, banker, merchant, manufacturer, and what not, a big, loud man with a stare and a metallic laugh, a man made out of a coarse material, which seemed to have been stretched to make so much of him, a man with a great puffed head and forehead, swelled veins in his temples, and such a strained skin to his face that it seemed to hold his eyes open and lift his eyebrows up. A man with a pervading appearance on him of being inflated like a balloon, and ready to start. A man who could never sufficiently vaunt himself as a self-made man. A man who was always proclaiming, through that brassy speaking trumpet of a voice of his, his old ignorance and his old poverty a man who was the bully of humility. A year or two younger than his eminently practical friend, Mr. Bounderby looked older. His seven or eight and forty might have had the seven or eight added to it again without surprising anybody. He had not much hair. One might have fancied he had talked it off, and that what was left, all standing up in disorder, was in that condition from being constantly blown about by his windy boastfulness. In the formal drawing-room of Stone Lodge, standing on the hearth-rug, warming himself before the fire, Mr. Bounderby delivered some observations to Mrs. Gradgrind on the circumstance of it being his birthday. He stood before the fire, partly because it was a cool spring afternoon, though the sun shone, partly because the shade of Stone Lodge was always haunted by the ghost of damp mortar, partly because he thus took up a commanding position from which to subdue Mrs. Gradgrind. Ah, he hadn't a shoe to my foot. As to a stocking, I didn't know such a thing by name. I passed the day in a ditch and the night in a pigsty. That's the way I spent my tenth birthday. Not that a ditch was new to me, for I was born in the ditch. Mrs. Gradgrind, a little, thin, white, pink-eyed bundle of shawls, of surpassing feebleness, mental and bodily, who was always taking physic without any effect, whenever she showed a symptom of coming to life, was invariably stunned by some weighty piece of fact tumbling on her. Mrs. Gradgrind hoped it was a dry ditch. No, as wet as a sop, a foot of water in it, said Mr. Bounderby. Enough to give a baby a cold, Mrs. Gradgrind considered. Cold? I was born with inflammation of the lungs and of everything else I believe that was capable of inflammation, returned Mr. Bounderby. For years, ma'am. I was one of the most miserable little wretches ever seen. I was so sickly that I was always moaning and groaning. I was so ragged and dirty that you wouldn't have touched me with a pair of tongs. Mrs. Gradrine faintly looked at the tongs as the most appropriate thing her imbecility could think of doing. How I fought through it, I don't know, said Mounderby. I was determined, I suppose. I've been a determined character in later life, and I suppose I was then. Here I am, Mrs. Gradgrind, anyhow, and nobody to thank for my being here but myself. Mrs. Gradgrind meekly and weakly hoped that his mother— My mother? <laughs> bolted, ma'am, said Bounderby. Mrs. Gradgrind, stunned as usual, collapsed and gave it up. My mother? left me to my grandmother, said Bounderby, and according to the best of my remembrance, my grandmother was the wickedest and worst old woman that ever lived. If I got a little pair of shoes by any chance, she'd take them off and sell them for drink. Why, I've known that grandmother of mine lie in her bed and drink her fourteen glasses of liquor before breakfast. Mrs. Gradgrind, weakly smiling, and giving no other sign of vitality, looked, as she always did, like an indifferently executed transparency of a small female figure, without enough light behind it. 
She kept the chandler's shop, pursued Bounderby, and kept me in an egg box. That was the cot of my infancy, an old egg box. As soon as I was big enough to run away, of course I ran away. Then I became a young vagabond, and instead of one old woman knocking me about and starving me, everybody of all ages knocked me about and starved me. They were right. They had no business to do anything else. I was a nuisance, an encumbrance, and a pest. I know that very well. His pride in having at any time of his life achieved such a great social distinction as to be a nuisance, an encumbrance, and a pest was only to be satisfied by three sonorous repetitions of the boast. I was to pull through it, I suppose, Mrs. Gradgrind. Whether I was to do it or not, ma'am, I did it. I pulled through it, though nobody threw me a rope. Vagabond, errand boy, vagabond, labourer, porter, clerk, chief manager, small partner, Josiah Bounderby of Coketown. Those are the antecedents and the culmination. Josiah Bounderby of Coketown. Learnt his letters from the outsides of shops, Mrs. Gradgrind, and was first able to tell the time upon the dial plate from studying the steeple clock of St. Giles Church, London, under the direction of a drunken cripple who was a convicted thief and an incorrigible vagrant. Tell Josiah Boundary of Corktown of your district schools and your model schools and your training schools and your whole kettle of fish schools. And Josiah Bounderby of Coketown tells you plainly, all right, all correct, he hadn't such advantages. But let us have hard-headed, solid-fisted people. The education that made him won't do for everybody, he knows well. Such and such his education was, however, and you may force him to swallow boiling fat, but you shall never force him to suppress the facts of his life. Being heated when he arrived at this climax, Josiah Bounderby of Coketown stopped. He stopped just as his eminently practical friend, still accompanied by the two young culprits, entered the room. His eminently practical friend, on seeing him, stopped also, and gave Louisa a reproachful look that plainly said, Behold your Bounderby. Well, blustered Mr. Bounderby, What's the matter? What's young Thomas in the dumps about? He spoke of young Thomas, but he looked at Louisa. We were peeping at the circus, muttered Louisa, haughtily, without lifting up her eyes. And father caught us. And Mrs. Gradgrind, said her husband in a lofty manner. I should as soon have expected to find my children reading poetry. Dear me, whimpered Mrs. Gradgrind. How can you, Louisa and Thomas? I wonder at you. I declare you're enough to make one regret ever having had a family at all. I have a great mind to say I wish I hadn't. Then what would you have done, I should like to know? Mr. Gradgrind did not seem favorably impressed by these cogent remarks. He frowned impatiently. As if, with my head in its present throbbing state, you couldn't go and look at the shells and minerals and things provided for you, instead of circuses? said Mrs. Gradgrind. You know as well as I do, no young people have circus masters or keep circuses in cabinets or attend lectures about circuses. What can you possibly want to know of circuses, then? I am sure you have enough to do, if that's what you want. With my head in its present state, I couldn't remember the mere names of half the facts you have got to attend to. That's the reason, pouted Louisa. Don't tell me that's the reason, because it can't be nothing of the sort said Mrs. Gradgrind. Go and be something illogical directly. Mrs. Gradgrind was not a scientific character, and usually dismissed her children to their studies with this general injunction to choose their pursuit. In truth, Mrs. Gradgrind's stock of facts in general was woefully defective. But Mr. Gradgrind, in raising her to her high matrimonial position, had been influenced by two reasons. Firstly, she was most satisfactory as a question of figures, and secondly, she had no nonsense about her. 
By nonsense he meant fancy. And, truly, it is probable she was as free from any alloy of that nature as any human being not arrived at the perfection of an absolute idiot ever was. The simple circumstance of being left alone with her husband and Mr. Bounderby was sufficient to stun this admirable lady again without collision between herself and any other fact. So she once more died away, and nobody minded her. Bounderby, said Mr. Gradgrind, drawing a chair to the fireside, you were always so interested in my young people, particularly in Louisa, that I make no apology for saying to you I am very much vexed by this discovery. I have systematically devoted myself, as you know, to the education of the reason of my family. The reason is, as you know, the only faculty to which education should be addressed. And yet, Bounderby, it would appear from this unexpected circumstance of today, though in itself a trifling one, as if something had crept into Thomas's and Louisa's minds, which is, or rather which is not, I do not know that I can express myself better than by saying, which has never been intended to be developed, and in which their reason has no part. There certainly is no reason for looking with interest at a parcel of vagabonds, returned Bounderby. When I was a vagabond myself, nobody looked with any interest at me. I know that. Then comes the question, said the eminently practical father, with his eyes on the fire. In what has this vulgar curiosity its rise? I'll tell you in what. In idle imagination. I hope not said the eminently practical. I confess, however, that the misgiving has crossed me on my way home. In idle imagination, Gradgrind, repeated Bounderby. A very bad thing for anybody, but a cursed bad thing for a girl like Louisa. I should ask Mrs. Gradgrind's pardon for strong expression, but that she knows very well I am not a refined character. Whoever expects refinement in me will be disappointed. I hadn't a refined bringing up. Whether, said Gradgrind, pondering with his hands in his pockets and his cavernous eyes on the fire, whether any instructor or servant can have suggested anything, whether Louisa or Thomas can have been reading anything, whether in spite of all precautions an idle storybook can have got into the house, because in minds that have been practically formed by rule and line from the cradle upwards, this is so curious, so incomprehensible. Stop a bit, cried Bounderby, who all this time had been standing, as before, on the hearth, bursting at the very furniture of the room with explosive humility. You have one of those strollers' children in the school. Cecilia Jupe by name said Mr. Gradgrind, with something of a stricken look at his friend. "'Now stop a bit,' cried Bounderby again. "'How did she come here?' "'Why, the fact is, I saw the girl myself for the first time, only just now. She specially applied here at the house to be admitted, as not regularly belonging to our town, and—yes, you are right, Bounderby, you are right.' "'Now stop a bit.' cried Bounderby once more. Louisa saw her when she came. Louisa certainly did see her, for she mentioned the application to me. But Louisa saw her, I have no doubt, in Mrs. Gradgrind's presence. Pray, Mrs. Gradgrind, said Bounderby, what passed? Oh, my poor health, retired Mrs. Gradgrind. The girl wanted to come to the school, and Mr. Gradgrind wanted girls to come to the school, and Louisa and Thomas both said that the girl wanted to come, and that Mr. Gradgrind wanted girls to come, and how was it possible to contradict them when such was the fact? Now, I'll tell you what, Gradgrind, said Mr. Bounderby, turn this girl to the right about, and there's an end of it. I am much of your opinion. Do it at once, said Bounderby has always been my motto from a child. When I thought I would run away from my egg-box and my grandmother, I did it at once. Do you the same. Do this at once. Are you walking? asked his friend. I have the father's address. Perhaps you would not mind walking to town with me. 
"'Not the least in the world,' said Mr. Bounderby. "'As long as you do it at once.' So Mr. Bounderby threw on his hat. He always threw it on, as expressing a man who had been far too busily employed in making himself to acquire any fashion of wearing his hat, and with his hands in his pockets sauntered out into the hall. "'I never wear gloves.' It was his custom to say, I didn't climb up the ladder in them. Shouldn't be so high up if I had. Being left to saunter in the hall a minute or two while Mr. Gradgrind went upstairs for the address, he opened the door of the children's study and looked into that serene floor clothed apartment, which, notwithstanding its bookcases and its cabinets and its variety of learned and philosophical appliances, had much the genial aspect of a room devoted to hair-cutting. Louisa languidly leaned upon the window looking out, without looking at anything, while young Thomas stood sniffing revengefully at the fire. Adam Smith and Malthus, two younger Gradgrinds, were out at lecture in custody, and little Jane, after manufacturing a good deal of moist pipe-clay on her face with slate pencil and tears, had fallen asleep over a vulgar fraction. "'It's all right now, Louisa. It's all right, young Thomas,' said Mr. Bounderby. "'You won't do so any more. I'll answer for it being all over with father. Well, Louisa, that's worth a kiss, isn't it?' "'You can take one, Mr. Bounderby,' returned Louisa, when she had coldly paused and slowly walked across the room, and ungraciously raised her cheek towards him with her face turned away. "'Always my pet, ain't you, Louisa?' said Mr. Bounderby. "'Good-bye, Louisa.' He went his way, but she stood on the same spot, rubbing the cheek he had kissed with her handkerchief until it was burning bread. She was still doing this five minutes afterwards. "'What are you about, Lou?' her brother sulkily remonstrated. "'You'll rub a hole in your face.' You may cut the piece out with your penknife if you like, Tom. I wouldn't cry. Coketown, to which Messrs. Bounderby and Gradgride now walked, was a triumph of fact. It had no greater taint of fancy in it than Mrs. Gradgrind herself. Let us strike the keynote, Coketown, before pursuing our tune. It was a town of red brick or of brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But, as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black, like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys, out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever, and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal in it, and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye, and vast piles of building full of windows, where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long, and where the piston of the steam-engine worked monotonously up and down like the head of an elephant in a state of melancholy madness. It contained several large streets, all very like one another, and many small streets still more like one another inhabited by people equally like one another, who all went in and out at the same hours, with the same sound upon the same pavements to do the same work, and to whom every day was the same as yesterday and to-morrow, and every year the counterpart of the last and the next. These attributes of Coketown were in the main inseparable from the work by which it was sustained, Against them were to be set off comforts of life which found their way all over the world, and elegancies of life which made, we will not ask how much, of the fine lady who could scarcely bear to hear the place mentioned. The rest of its features were voluntary, and they were these. You saw nothing in Coketown but was severely workful. If the members of a religious persuasion built a chapel there, as the members of eighteen religious persuasions had done, they made it a pious warehouse of red brick, with sometimes, but this is only in highly ornamental examples, a bell in a birdcage on the top of it. The solitary exception was the new church, 
a stuccoed edifice with a square steeple over the door, terminating in four short pinnacles like florid wooden legs. All the public inscriptions in the town were painted alike, in severe characters of black and white. The jail might have been the infirmary, the infirmary might have been the jail, the town hall might have been either, or both, or anything else, for anything that appeared to the contrary in the graces of their construction. Fact, 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 everywhere in the material aspect of the town. Fact, 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 everywhere in the immaterial. The McChokum Child School was all fact, and the school of design was all fact, and the relations between master and man were all fact, and everything was fact between the lying-in hospital and the cemetery, and what you couldn't state in figures, or show to be purchasable in the cheapest market, and saleable in the dearest, was not, and never should be. World without end. Amen. A town so sacred in fact, and so triumphant in its assertion, of course got on well. Why, no, not quite well. No? Dear me! No, Coketown did not come out of its own furnaces in all respects like gold that had stood the fire. First, the perplexing mystery of the place was, who belonged to the eighteen denominations? Because whoever did, the laboring people did not. It was very strange to walk through the streets on a Sunday morning and note how few of them the barbarous jangling of bells that was driving the sick and nervous mad called away from their own quarter, from their own close rooms, from the corners of their own streets, where they lounged listlessly, gazing at all the church and chapel going, as at a thing with which they had no manner of concern. Nor was it merely the stranger who noticed this because there was a native organization in Coketown itself whose members were to be heard in the House of Commons every session, indignantly petitioning for acts of Parliament that should make these people religious by main force. Then came the Teetotal Society, who complained that these same people would get drunk, and showed in tabular statements that they did get drunk, and proved at tea parties that no inducement, human or divine, except a medal, would induce them to forego their custom of getting drunk. Then came the chemist and the druggist, with other tabular statements, showing that when they didn't get drunk, they took opium. Then came the experienced chaplain of the jail, with more tabular statements, outdoing all the previous tabular statements, and showing that the same people would resort to low haunts, hidden from the public eye, where they heard low singing and saw low dancing, and mayhap joined in it, and where A. B., aged twenty-four next birthday, and committed for eighteen months solitary, had himself said, not that he had ever shown himself particularly worthy of belief, his ruin began, as he was perfectly sure and confident that otherwise he would have been a tip-top moral specimen. Then came Mr. Gradgrind and Mr. Bounderby, the two gentlemen at this present moment walking through Coketown, and both eminently practical, who could, on occasion, furnish more tabular statements, derived from their own personal experience, and illustrated by cases they had known and seen, from which it clearly appeared, in short, it was the only clear thing in the case, that these same people were a bad lot altogether, gentlemen that do what you would for them, they were never thankful for it, gentlemen, that they were restless, gentlemen, and that they never knew what they wanted, that they lived upon the best, and bought fresh butter, and insisted on mocha coffee, and rejected all but prime parts of meat, and yet were internally dissatisfied and unmanageable. In short, it was the moral of the old nursery fable, there was an old woman, and what do you think? She lived upon nothing but victuals and drink. Victuals and drink were the whole of her diet, and yet this old woman would never be quiet. Is it possible, I wonder, that there was an analogy between the case of the Coke Town population and the case of the little Gradgrinds? Surely 
None of us, in our sober senses and acquainted with figures, are to be told at this time of day that one of the foremost elements in the existence of the Coketown working people had been for scores of years deliberately set at naught that there was any fancy in them demanding to be brought into healthy existence instead of struggling on in convulsions, that exactly in the ratio as they worked long and monotonously the craving grew within them for some physical relief, some relaxation, encouraging good humor and good spirits, and giving them a vent, some recognized holiday, though it were but for an honest dance to a stirring band of music some occasional light pie in which even McChokum child had no finger, which craving must and would be satisfied aright, or must and would inevitably go wrong until the laws of the creation were repealed. This man lives at Pod's End, and I don't quite know Pod's End, said Mr. Gradgrind. Which is it, Bounderby? Mr. Bounderby knew it was somewhere downtown, but knew no more respecting it. So they stopped for a moment, looking about. Almost as they did so, there came running round the corner of the street at a quick pace and with a frightened look a girl whom Mr. Gradgrind recognized. Hello! said he. Stop! What are you doing? Stop! Girl number twenty stopped then, palpitating, and made him a curtsy. Why are you tearing about the streets? said Mr. Gradgrind in this improper manner. I was, I was run after, sir. The girl panted. And I wanted to get away. Run after? Repeated Mr. Gradgrind. Who would run after you? The question was unexpectedly and suddenly answered for her by the colorless boy Bitzer, who came round the corner with such blind speed and so little anticipating a stoppage on the pavement that he brought himself up against Mr. Gradgrind's waistcoat and rebounded into the road. "'What do you mean, boy?' said Mr. Gradgrind. "'What are you doing? How dare you dash against everybody in this manner?' Bitzer picked up his cap, which the concussion had knocked off, and backing and knuckling his forehead, pleaded that it was an accident. "'Was this boy running after you, Jupe?' asked Mr. Gradgrind. "'Yes, sir.' said the girl reluctantly. No, I wasn't, sir, cried Bitzer. Not till she run away from me. But the horse riders never mind what they say, sir. They're famous for it. You know the horse riders are famous for never minding what they say. Addressing Sissy. It's as well known in the town as, please, sir, as the multiplication table isn't known to the horse riders. Bitzer tried Mr. Bounderby with this. He frightened me so, said the girl with his cruel faces. Oh! cried Bitzer. Oh, and you one of the rest. And you a horse rider. I never looked at her, sir. I asked her if she would know how to define a horse tomorrow, and offered to tell her again, and she ran away, and I ran after her, sir, that she might know how to answer when she was asked. You wouldn't have thought of saying such mischief if you hadn't been a horse rider. Their yeah, calling seems to be pretty well known among them, observed Mr. Bounderby. You'd have had the old school peeping in the row in a week. Truly, I think so, returned his friend. Bitzer, turn you about and take yourself home. Joop, stay here a moment. Let me hear of your running in this manner any more, boy, and you will hear of me through the master of the school. You understand what I mean? Go along. The boy stopped in his rapid blinking, knuckled his forehead again, glanced at Sissy, turned about, and retreated. Now, girl, said Mr. Gradgrind, take this gentleman and me to your father's. We are going there. What have you got in that bottle you are carrying? Gin, said Mr. Bounderby. Dear no, sir, it's the nine oils. The what? cried Mr. Bounderby. The nine oils, sir, to rub father with. Then, said Mr. Bounderby, with a loud, short laugh, what the devil do you rub your father with nine oils for? It's what our people always use, sir, when they get any hurts in the ring," replied the girl, looking over her shoulder to assure herself that her pursuer was gone. They bruise themselves very bad sometimes. Serve them right," said Mr. Bounderby. But being idle, she glanced up at his face with mingled astonishment and dread. By George," 
said Mr. Bounderby. "'When I were four or five years younger than you, I had worse bruises upon me than ten oils. Twenty oils, forty oils would have rubbed off. I didn't get them by posture-making, but by being banged about. There was no rope-dancing for me. I danced on the bare ground, and was larruped with the rope. Mr. Gradgrind, though hard enough, was by no means so rough a man as Mr. Bounderby. His character was not unkind, all things considered. It might have been a very kind one indeed, if he had only made some round mistake in the arithmetic that balanced it, years ago. He said, in what he meant for a reassuring tone, as they turned down a narrow road, And this is Pod's end, is it, Joop? This is it, sir, and, if you wouldn't mind, sir, this is the house. She stopped at twilight at the door of a mean little public house, with dim red lights in it, as haggard and shabby as if, for want of custom, it had itself taken to drinking, and had gone the way all drunkards go, and was very near the end of it. It's only crossing the bar, sir, and up the stairs, if you wouldn't mind, and waiting there for a moment till I get a candle. If you should hear a dog, sir, it's only Merrylegs, and he only barks. <laughs> Merrylegs with nine oils, eh? <laughs> said Mr. Bounderby, entering last with his metallic laugh. <sighs> Pretty well this for a self-made man. The name of the public house was Pegasus's Arms. The Pegasus's legs might have been more to the purpose, but underneath the winged horse upon the signboard, the Pegasus's arms was inscribed in Roman letters. Beneath that inscription again, in a flowing scroll, the painter had touched off the lines, Good malt makes good beer. Walk in, and they'll draw it here. Good wine makes good brandy. Give us a call, and you'll find it handy. Framed and glazed upon the wall behind the dingy little bar was another Pegasus, a theatrical one, with real gauze let in for his wings, golden stars stuck on all over him, and his ethereal harness made of red silk. As it had grown too dusky without to see the sign, and as it had not grown light enough within to see the picture, Mr. Gradgrind and Mr. Bounderby received no offence from these idealities. They followed the girl up some steep corner stairs without meeting anyone, and stopped in the dark while she went on for a candle. They expected every moment to hear Merrylegs give tongue, but the highly trained performing dog had not barked when the girl and the candle appeared together. "'Father's not in our room, sir,' she said, with a face of great surprise. "'If you wouldn't mind walking in, I'll find him directly.' They walked in, and Sissy— having set two chairs for them, sped away with a quick light step. It was a mean, shabbily furnished room with a bed in it. The white nightcap, embellished with two peacock's feathers and a pigtail bolt upright, in which Signor Jupe had that very afternoon, enlivened the varied performances with his chaste Shakespearean quips and retorts, hung upon a nail but no other portion of his wardrobe, or other token of himself or his pursuits, was to be seen anywhere. As to Merrylegs, that respectable ancestor of the highly trained animal who went aboard the ark, might have been accidentally shut out of it, for any sign of a dog that was manifest to eye or ear in the Pegasus's arms. They heard the doors of rooms above opening and shutting, as Sissy went from one to another in quest of her father and presently they heard voices expressing surprise. She came bounding down again in a great hurry, opened a battered and mangy old hair-trunk, found it empty, and looked round with her hands clasped and her face full of terror. Father must have gone down to the booth, sir. I don't know why he should go there, but he must be there. I'll bring him in a minute. She was gone directly, without her bonnet, with her long, dark, childish hair streaming behind her. "'What does she mean?' said Mr. Gradgrind. "'Back in a minute. It's more than a mile off.' Before Mr. Banderby could reply, a young man appeared at the door, and introducing himself with the words, "'By your leaves, gentlemen,' walked in with his hands in his pocket. His face, close-shaven, thin, and sallow, was shaded by a great quantity of dark hair, 
brushed into a roll all round his head, and parted up the centre. His legs were very robust, but shorter than legs of good proportion should have been. His chest and back were as much too broad as his legs were too short. He was dressed in a new market coat and tight-fitting trousers, wore a shawl round his neck, smelt of lamp oil, straw, orange peel, horses' provender, and sawdust, and looked a most remarkable sort of centaur, compounded of the stable and the playhouse. Where the one began and the other ended, nobody could have told with any precision. This gentleman was mentioned in the bills of the day as Mr. E. W. B. Childers, so justly celebrated for his daring vaulting act as the wild huntsman of the North American prairies, in which popular performance a diminutive boy with an old face, who now accompanied him, assisted as his infant son, being carried upside down over his father's shoulder by one foot and being held by the crown of his head heels upwards in the palm of his father's hand. According to the violent paternal manner in which wild huntsmen may be observed to fondle their offspring, made up with curls, wreaths, wings, white bismuth, and carmine, this hopeful young person soared into so pleasing a cupid as to constitute the chief delight of the maternal part of the spectators. But, in private, where his characteristics were a precocious cutaway coat and an extremely gruff voice, he became of the turf turfy. By your leaves, gentlemen, said Mr. E. W. B. Childers, glancing round the room. It was you, I believe, that were wishing to see Jupe. It was, said Mr. Gradgrind. His daughter has gone to fetch him, but I can't wait. Therefore, if you please, I will leave a message for him with you. You see, my friend, Mr. Bounderby put in. We're the kind of people who know the value of time, and you're the kind of people who don't know the value of time. I have not, retorted Mr. Childers, after surveying him from head to foot, the honor of knowing you. But if you mean that you can make more money of your time than I can of mine, I should judge from your appearance that you are about right. And when you have made it, you can keep it too, I should think, said Cupid. Kidderminster stole that," said Mr. Childers. Master Kidderminster was Cupid's mortal name. What does he come here cheeking us for, then? cried Mr. Kidderminster, showing a very irascible temperament. If you want to cheek us, pay your ochre at the doors and take it out. Kidderminster," said Mr. Childers, raising his voice. Stole that, sir. I was addressing myself to you. You may or you may not be aware. For perhaps you have not been much in the audience, that Jupe has missed his tip very often lately. Has, what has he missed? Asked Mister Gradgrind, glancing at the potent Bounderby for assistance. Missed his tip. Offered at the garters four times last night and never done him once. Said Master Kidderminster. Missed his tip at the banners too, and was loose in his ponging. Didn't do what he ought to do. Was short in his leaps and bad in his tumbling. Mister Childers interpreted. Oh, said Mister Gradgrind, that is tip, is it? In a general way, that's missed his tip. Mister E. W. B. Childers answered. Huh, nine oils, merry legs, missing tips, garters, banners, and pong in eh? Huh. Ejaculated Bounderby with his laugh of laughs. Queer sort of company too for a man who has raised himself. Lower yourself then," retorted Cupid. "Oh Lord, if you've raised yourself so high as all that comes to, let yourself down a bit." This is a very obtrusive lad," said Mister Gradgrind, turning and knitting his brows on him. "We'd have had a young gentleman to meet you if we'd have known you were coming," retorted Mister Kidderminster, nothing abashed. It's a pity you don't have a bespeak, being so particular. You're on the tight, Jeff, ain't you? What does this unmannerly boy mean by tight, Jeff? There, get out, get out," said Mister Childers, thrusting his young friend from the room, rather in the prairie manner. Tight, Jeff, or slack, Jeff, it don't much signify. It's only tight rope and slack rope. 
You were going to give me a message for Jupe? Yes, it was. Then? Continued Mr. Childers, quickly. My opinion is, he will never receive it. Do you know much of him? I never saw the man in my life. I doubt if you ever will see him now. It's pretty plain to me he's off. Do you mean that he has deserted his daughter? Aye, I mean, said Mr. Childers, with a nod, that he has cut. He was goosed last night. He was goosed the night before last. He was goosed today. He has lately got in the way of being always goosed, and he can't stand it. Why has he been so very much goosed? asked Mr. Gradgrind, forcing the word out of himself with great solemnity and reluctance. His joints are turning stiff, and he is getting used up, said Childers. He has his points as a cackler still, but he can't get a living out of them. A cackler? Bounderby repeated. Here we go again. A speaker, if the gentleman likes it better, said Mr. E. W. B. Childers, superciliously throwing the interpretation over his shoulder, and accompanying it with a shake of his long hair, which all shook at once. Now, it's a remarkable fact, sir, that it cut that man deeper, to know that his daughter knew of his being goosed, than to go through with it. Good, interrupted Mr. Bounderby. This is good, Grand Grind. A man so fond of his daughter that he runs away from her. This is devilish good. <laughs> Now, I tell you what, young man, I haven't always occupied my present station of life. I know what these things are. You may be astonished to hear it, but my mother ran away from me. E. W. B. Childers replied pointedly that he was not at all astonished to hear it. Very well, said Bounderby. I was born in the ditch, and my mother ran away from me. Do I excuse her for it? No. Have I ever excused her for it? No. What do I call her for it? I call her probably the worst woman that ever lived in the world. Except my drunken grandmother. There's no family pride about me, and there's no imaginative sentimental humbug about me. I call a spade a spade, and I call the mother of Josiah Bounderby of Corktown, without any fear or favour, what I should call her if she'd been the mother of Dick Jones of Wapping. So with this man, he's a runaway rogue and a vagabond, that's what he is, in English. It's all the same to me what he is or what he is not, whether in English or whether in French, retorted Mr. E. W. B. Childers, facing about. I am telling your friend what's the fact. If you don't like to hear it, you can avail yourself in the open air. You give it mouth enough, you do, but give it mouth in your own building at least, remonstrated E. W. B. with stern irony. Don't give it mouth in this building till you're called upon. You have got some building of your own, I dare say now. Perhaps so," <laughs> replied Mr. Bounderby, rattling his money and laughing. "Then give it mouth in your own building, will you, if you please?" said Childers. "Because this isn't a strong building, and too much of you might bring it down." Eyeing Mr. Bounderby from head to foot again, he turned from him, as from a man finally disposed of, to Mr. Gradgrind. Jupe sent his daughter out on an errand not an hour ago, and then was seen to slip out himself with his hat over his eyes and a bundle tied up and a handkerchief under his arm. So she will never believe it of him, but he has cut away and left her. Pray, said Mr. Gradgrind, why will she never believe it of him? Because those two were one, because they were never asunder, because up to this time he seemed to dote upon her, said Childers. Taking a step or two to look into the empty trunk, both Mr. Childers and Master Kidderminster walked in a curious manner, with their legs wider apart than the general run of men, and with a very knowing assumption of being stiff in the knees. This walk was common to all the male members of the Sleary's company, and was understood to express that they were always on horseback. Poor Sissy, he had better have apprenticed her," said Childers. Giving his hair another shake as he looked up from the empty box, now he leaves her without anything to take to. It is credible to you who have never been apprenticed to express that opinion," returned Mr. Gradgrind approvingly. "I never apprenticed. I was apprenticed when I was seven years old. 
Oh, indeed, said Mr. Gradgrind, rather resentfully, as having been defrauded of his good opinion. I was not aware of its being the custom to apprentice young persons to idleness. Mr. Bounderby put in a loud laugh. No, nor the Lord Harry nor I. Her father always had it in his head, resumed Childers, feigning unconsciousness of Mr. Bounderby's existence, that she was to be taught the deuce and all of education. How it got into his head, I can't say. I can only say that it never got out. He has been picking up a bit of reading for her here, and a bit of writing for her there, and a bit of ciphering for her somewhere else these seven years. Mr. E. W. B. Childers took one of his hands out of his pockets, stroked his face and chin, and looked with a good deal of doubt and a little hope at Mr. Gradgrind. From the first, he had sought to conciliate that gentleman for the sake of the deserted girl. When Sissy got into the school here, he pursued. Her father was as pleased as Punch. I couldn't altogether make out why myself, as we were not stationary here, but being comers and goers anywhere. I suppose, however, he had this move in his mind. He was always half cracked, and then considered her provided for. If you should happen to have looked in here tonight for the purpose of telling him that you were going to do her any little service. Said Mr. Childers, stroking his face again and repeating his look. It would be very fortunate and well timed, very fortunate and well timed. On the contrary, returned Mr. Gradgrind. I came to tell him that her connections made her not an object for the school, and that she must not attend any more. Still, if her father really has left her without any connivance on her part, Bounderby, let me have a word with you. Upon this, Mr. Childers politely betook himself, with his equestrian walk, to the landing outside the door, and there stood stroking his face and softly whistling. While thus engaged, he overheard such phrases in Mr. Bounderby's voice as, No, I say no, I advise you not, I say by no means. While from Mr. Gradgrind, he heard in his much lower tone the words, but even as an example to Louisa of what this pursuit has been the subject of a vulgar curiosity, leads and ends in. Think of it, Bounderby, in that point of view. Meanwhile, the various members of Sleary's company gradually gathered together from the upper regions where they were quartered, and from standing about, talking in low voices to one another and to Mr. Childers, gradually insinuated themselves and him into the room. There were two or three handsome young women among them, with their two or three husbands, and their two or three mothers, and their eight or nine little children, who did the fairy business when required. The father of one of the families was in the habit of balancing the father of another of the families on the top of a great pole. The father of the third family often made a pyramid of both those fathers with Master Kidderminster for the apex, and himself for the base. All the fathers could dance upon rolling casks, stand upon bottles, catch knives and balls, twirl hand-basins, ride upon anything, jump over everything, and stick at nothing. All the mothers could and did dance upon the slack wire and the tightrope, and perform rapid acts on bare-backed steeds none of them were at all particular in respect of showing their legs, and one of them, alone in a Greek chariot, drove six in hand into every town they came to. They all assumed to be mighty rakish and knowing. They were not very tidy in their private dresses, they were not at all orderly in their domestic arrangements, and the combined literature of the whole company would have produced but a poor letter on any subject. Yet there was a remarkable gentleness and childishness about these people, a special inaptitude for any kind of sharp practice, and an untiring readiness to help and pity one another, deserving often of as much respect, and always of as much generous construction, as the everyday virtues of any class of people in the world. Last of all appeared Mr. Sleary, a stout man, as already mentioned, with one fixed eye and one loose eye, a voice, if it can be called so, like the efforts of a broken old pair of bellows, a flabby surface, 
and a muddled head which was never sober and never drunk. "'Squire,' said Mr. Sleary, who was troubled with asthma, and whose breath came far too thick and heavy for the letter S. "'Your servant. This is a bad piece of business, this is. You heard of my clown and his dog being supposed to have molested? He addressed Mr. Gradgrind, who answered, Yes. Well, squire, he returned, taking off his hat and rubbing the lining with his pocket handkerchief, which he kept inside for the purpose. Is it your intention to do anything for the poor girl, squire? I shall have something to propose to her when she comes back, said Mr. Gradgrind. Glad to hear it, squire. Not that I want to get rid of the child any more than I want to stand in her way. I'm willing to take her apprentice, though at her age is late. My voice is a little husky, squire, and not easily heard by them as don't know me. But if you'd been chilled and heated, heated and chilled, chilled and heated in the ring when you was young, as often as I have been. Your voice wouldn't have lasted out, squire, no more than mine. I dare say not, said Mr. Gradgrind. What shall it be, squire, while you wait? Shall it be Sherry? Give it a name, squire, said Mr. Sleary, with hospitable ease. Nothing for me, I thank you, said Mr. Gradgrind. Don't say nothing, squire. What does your friend say? If you haven't took your feed yet, have a glass of bitters. Here his daughter, Josephine, a pretty fair-haired girl of eighteen, who had been tied on a horse at two years old, and had made a will at twelve, which she always carried about with her, expressive of her dying desire to be drawn to the grave by the two piebald ponies, cried, Father, hush, she has come back. Then came Sissy Jupe, running into the room as she had run out of it, and when she saw them all assembled, and saw their looks, and saw no father there, she broke into the most deplorable cry, and took refuge on the bosom of the most accomplished tightrope lady, herself in the family way, who knelt down on the floor to nurse her and to weep over her. It's an internal shame upon my soul, it is, said Sleary. Oh, my dear father, my good, kind father, where are you gone? You are gone to try to do me some good, I know. You are gone away for my sake, I am sure, and how miserable and helpless you will be without me, poor, poor father, until you come back. And it was so pathetic to hear her saying many things of this kind, with her face turned upward, and her arms stretched out as if she were trying to stop this departing shadow and embrace it, that no one spoke a word until Mr. Bounderby, growing impatient, took the case in hand. "'Now, good people all,' said he, "'this is a wanton waste of time. Let the girl understand the fact. Let her take it from me, if you like, or have been run away from myself. Here, what's your name? Your father has absconded, deserted you, and you mustn't expect to see him again as long as you live.' They cared so little for plain fact, these people, and were in that advanced state of degeneracy on the subject, that instead of being impressed by the speaker's strong common sense, they took it in extraordinary dudgeon. The men uttered shame, and the women brutes, and Sleary, in some haste, communicated the following hints apart to Mr. Bounderby. I tell you what, squire, to speak plain to you, my opinion is that you had better cut it short and drop it. They are very good-natured people, my people, but they are accustomed to be quick in their movements, and if you don't act upon my advice, I am damned if I don't believe they'll piss you out of winder. Mr. Bounderby being restrained by this mild suggestion, Mr. Gradgrind found an opening for his eminently practical exposition of the subject. It is of no moment, said he, whether this person is to be expected back at any time, or the contrary. He has gone away, and there is no present expectation of his return. 
That, I believe, is agreed on all hands. That agreed, squire. Stick to that. Well, then, I who came here to inform the father of the poor girl, Jupe, that she could not be received at the school any more, in consequence of there being practical objections into which I need not enter, to the reception there of the children of persons so employed, and prepared in these altered circumstances to make a proposal. I am willing to take charge of you, Jupe, and to educate you, and to provide for you. The only condition, over and above your good behavior, I make is that you decide now, at once, whether to accompany me or to remain here. Also, that if you accompany me now, it is understood that you communicate no more with any of your friends who are here present. These observations compromise the whole of the case. At the same time, said Sleary, I must put in my word, squire, though that both sides of the banner may be equally seen, if you like. Cecilia, to be prenticed, you know, the nature of the work, and you know your companions, Emma Gordon, in whose lap you are lying at present, would be a mother to you, and Josephine would be a sister to you. I don't pretend to be of the angel breed myself, and I don't say but what when you missed your tip you'd find me cut up rough, and swear an oath or two at you. But what I say, squire, is that, good-tempered or bad-tempered, I never did a horse an injury yet, no more than swearing at him went, and that I don't expect it shall begin otherwise at my time of life with a rider. I never was much of a cackler, squire, and I have said my say. The latter part of this speech was addressed to Mr. Gradgrind, who received it with a grave inclination of his head, and then remarked, The only observation I will make to you, Jupe, in the way of influencing your decision, is that it is highly desirable to have a sound practical education, and that even your father himself, from what I understand, appears on your behalf to have known and felt that much. The last words had a visible effect upon her. She stopped in her wild crying, a little detached herself from Emma Gordon, and turned her face full upon her patron. The whole company perceived the force of the change, and drew a long breath together that plainly said, She will go. Be sure you know your own mind, Jupe. Mr. Gradgrind counseled her. I say no more. Be sure you know your own mind. When father comes back, cried the girl, bursting into tears again after a minute's silence. How will he ever find me if I go away? You may be quite at ease, said Mr. Gradgrind, calmly. He worked out the whole matter like a sum. You may be quite at ease, Jupe, on that score, and in such a case your father— I apprehend must find out, Mr. Sleary. That's my name, squire. Not ashamed of it, known all over England, and always pays its way. Must find out, Mr. Sleary, who would then let him know where you went. I should have no power of keeping you against his wish, and he would have no difficulty at any time in finding Mr. Thomas Gradgrind of Coketown. I am well known. Well known assented Mr. Sleary, rolling his loose eye. You're one of the sort, squire, that keeps a precious sight of money out of the house. But never mind that at present. There was another silence, and then she exclaimed, sobbing with her hands before her face. Oh, give me my clothes, give me my clothes, and let me go away before I break my heart. The women sadly bestirred themselves to get the clothes together. It was soon done, for there were not many, and to pack them in a basket which had often travelled with them. Sissy sat all the time upon the ground, still sobbing and covering her eyes. Mr. Gradgrind and his friend Bounderby stood near the door, ready to take her away. Mr. Sleary stood in the middle of the room, with the male members of the company about him, exactly as he would have stood in the centre of the ring during his daughter Josephine's performance. He wanted nothing but his whip. The basket packed in silence, they brought her bonnet to her, 
and smoothed her disordered hair, and put it on. Then they pressed about her, and bent over her in very natural attitudes, kissing and embracing her, and brought the children to take leave of her, and were a tender-hearted, simple, foolish set of women altogether. Now, Jupe, said Mr. Gradgrind, if you are quite determined, come. But she had to take her farewell of the male part of the company yet, and every one of them had to unfold his arms, for they all assumed the professional attitude when they found themselves near Sleary, and gave her a parting kiss. Master Kidderminster accepted, in whose young nature there was an original flavor of the misanthrope, who was also known to have harbored matrimonial views, and who moodily withdrew. Mr. Sleary was reserved until the last. Opening his arms wide, he took her by both her hands, and would have sprung her up and down, after the riding-master manner of congratulating young ladies on their dismounting from a rapid act. But there was no rebound in Sissy, and she only stood before him crying. "'Good-bye, my dear,' said Sleary. "'You'll make your fortune, I hope.' and none of our poor folks will ever trouble you, I'll pound it. I wish your father hadn't taken his dog with him. It's a ill convenience to have the dog out of the bills. But on second thought, he wouldn't have performed without his master, though it's as broad as it's long. With that he regarded her attentively with his fixed eye, surveyed his company with his loose one, kissed her, shook his head, and handed her to Mr. Gradgrind as to a horse. "'There she is, squire,' he said, sweeping her with a professional glance as if she were being adjusted in her seat. "'And she'll do you justice. Good-bye, Cecilia.' "'Good-bye, Cecilia.' "'Good-bye, Sissy.' "'God bless you, dear.' In a variety of voices from all the room. But the riding-master I had observed the bottle of the nine oils in her bosom, and he now interposed with, Leave the bottle, my dear. It's large to carry. It will be of no use to you now. Give it to me. No, no, she said in another burst of tears. Oh, no. Pray let me keep it for father till he comes back. He will want it when he comes back. He had never thought of going away when he sent me for it. I must keep it for him, if you please. So be it, my dear. You see how it is, squire. Farewell, Cecilia. My last words to you is this. Stick to the terms of your engagement, be obedient to the squire, and forget us. But if when you're grown up and married and well off you come upon any horse riding ever, don't be hard upon it. Don't be cross with it. Give it a bespeak if you can and think you might do worse. People must be amused, squire, somehow," continued Sleary, rendered more pursy than ever by so much talking. They can't be always a-working, nor yet they can't be always a-learning. Make the best of us, not the worst. I've got my living out of the horse-riding all my life, I know, but I consider that I lay down the philosophy of the subject when I say to you, squire, make the best of us, not the worst. The sleary philosophy was propounded as they went downstairs, and the fixed eye of philosophy, and its rolling eye too, soon lost the three figures and the basket in the darkness of the street. Mr. Bounderby, being a bachelor, an elderly lady presided over his establishment in consideration of a certain annual stipend. Mrs. Sparsit was this lady's name, and she was a prominent figure in attendance on Mr. Bounderby's car, as it rolled along in triumph with the bully of humility inside. For Mrs. Sparsit had not only seen different days, but was highly connected she had a great aunt living in these very times, called Lady Scadgers. Mr. Sparsit, deceased, of whom she was the relict, had been by the mother's side what Mrs. Sparsit still called a powler. Strangers, of limited information and dull apprehension, 
were sometimes observed not to know what a powler was, and even to appear uncertain whether it might be a business, or a political party, or a profession of faith. The better class of minds, however, did not need to be informed that the powlers were an ancient stock, who could trace themselves so exceedingly far back that it was not surprising if they sometimes lost themselves, which they had rather frequently done, as respected horse-flesh, blind hooky, Hebrew monetary transactions, and the insolvent debtor's court. The late Mr. Sparsett, being by the mother's side a powler, married this lady, being by the father's side a Scadgers. Lady Scadgers, an immensely fat old woman, with an inordinate appetite for butcher's meat, and a mysterious leg which now refused to get out of bed for fourteen years, contrived the marriage at a period when Sparsett was just of age, and chiefly noticeable for a slender body, weakly supported on two long slim props, and surmounted by no head worth mentioning. He inherited a fair fortune from his uncle, but owed it all before he came into it, and spent it twice over immediately afterwards. Thus, when he died, at twenty-four, the scene of his decease Calais and the cause Brandy, he did not leave his widow, from whom he had been separated soon after the honeymoon, in affluent circumstances. That bereaved lady, fifteen years older than he, fell presently at deadly feud with her own relative, Lady Scadgers, and, partly to spite her ladyship, and partly to maintain herself, went out at a salary. And here she was now, in her elderly days, with the Cariolanian style of nose and the dense black eyebrows which had captivated Sparsett, making Mr. Bounderby's tea as he took his breakfast. If Bounderby had been a conqueror, and Mrs. Sparsett a captive princess, whom he took about as a feature in his state processions, he could not have made a greater flourish with her than he habitually did, just as it belonged to his boastfulness to depreciate his own extraction, so it belonged to it to exalt Mrs. Sparsett's, in the measure that he would not allow his own youth to have been attended by a single favorable circumstance, he brightened Mrs. Sparsett's juvenile career with every possible advantage, and showered wagon-loads of early roses all over that lady's path. "'And yet, sir,' he would say, "'how does it turn out after all? Why, here she is, a hundred a year. I give her a hundred, which she is pleased to term handsome, keeping the house of Josiah Bounderby of Corktown.' "'Nay, he made this foil of his so very widely known that third parties took it up, and handled it on some occasions with considerable briskness. It was one of the most exasperating attributes of Banderby that he not only sang his own praises, but stimulated other men to sing them. There was a moral infection of claptrap in him. Strangers, modest enough elsewhere, started up at dinners in Coketown, and boasted, in quite a rampant way, of Banderby. They made him out to be the royal arms the Union Jack, Magna Carta, John Bull, habeas corpus, the Bill of Rights, an Englishman's house is his castle, church and state, and God save the Queen, all put together. And as often, and it was very often, as an orator of this kind brought into his peroration, princes and lords may flourish or may fade, a breath can make them as a breath has made. It was, for certain, more or less understood among the company that he had heard of Mrs. Sparsit. Mr. Bounderby, said Mrs. Sparsit, you are unusually slow, sir, with your breakfast this morning. Why, ma'am, he returned, I am thinking about Tom Gradgrind's whim. Tom Gradgrind, for a bluff, independent manner of speaking as if somebody were always endeavouring to bribe him with immense sums to say Thomas, and he wouldn't. Tom Gradgrind's whim, ma'am, of bringing up the tumbling girl. The girl is now waiting to know, said Mrs. Sparsett, whether she is to go straight to the school or up to the lodge. She must wait, ma'am, answered Bounderby, till I know myself. 
We shall have Tom Gradgrind down here presently, I suppose. If he should wish her to remain here a day or two longer, of course she can, ma'am. Of course she can, if you wish it, Mr. Bounderby. I told him I would give her a shake down here last night, in order that he might sleep on it, before he decided to let her have any association with Louisa. Indeed, Mr. Bounderby. Very thoughtful of you. Mrs. Sparsett's Coriolanian nose underwent a slight expansion of the nostrils, and her black eyebrows contracted as she took a sip of tea. It's tolerably clear to me, said Bounderby, that the little puss can get small good out of such companionship. Are you speaking of young Miss Gradgrind, Mr. Bounderby? Yes, ma'am, I'm speaking of Louisa. Your observation being limited to little puss, said Mrs. Sparsett, and there being two little girls in question, I did not know which might be indicated by that expression. Louisa, repeated Bounderby. Louisa, Louisa. You are quite another father to Louisa, sir. Mrs. Sparsett took a little more tea, and, as she bent her again contracted eyebrows over her steaming cup, rather looked as if her classical countenance were invoking the infernal gods. If you had said I was another father to Tom, young Tom, I mean, not my friend Tom Gradgrind, you might have been nearer the mark. I'm going to take young Tom into my office. Going to have him under my wing, ma'am. Indeed? Rather young for that, is he not, sir? Mrs. Sparsett's sir, in addressing Mr. Bounderby, was a word of ceremony, rather exacting consideration for herself in the use than honouring him. Now, I'm not going to take him at once. He's to finish his educational cramming before then, said Bounderby. By the Lord Harry, he'll have enough of it first and last. He'd open his eyes, that boy would, if he knew how empty of learning my young Mo was at his time of life. Which, by the by, he probably did know, for he had heard of it often enough. But it's extraordinary the difficulty I have on scores of such subjects in speaking to anyone on equal terms. Here, for example, I've been speaking to you this morning about tumblers. <laughs> Why, what do you know about tumblers? At the time when to have been a tumbler in the mud of the streets would have been a godsend to me, a, a prize in the lottery to me, ma'am, you were at the Italian Opera. You were coming out of the Italian Opera, ma'am, in white satin and jewels, a blaze of splendour, when I hadn't a penny to buy a link to light you. I certainly, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett, with a dignity serenely mournful was familiar with the Italian opera at a very early age. Be God, ma'am, so was I, said Bounderby, with the wrong side of it. The hard bed, the pavement of its arcade, used to make, I assure you. People like you, ma'am, accustomed from infancy to lie on down feathers, have no idea how hard a paving stone is without trying it. No, no, it's no use my talking to you about tumblers. I should speak of foreign dancers and the West End of London and Mayfair and lords and ladies and honourables. I trust, sir, rejoined Mrs. Sparsett, with decent resignation. It is not necessary that you should do anything of that kind. I hope I have learnt how to accommodate myself to the changes of life— if I have acquired an interest in hearing of your instructive experiences, and can scarcely hear enough of them, I claim no merit for that, since I believe it is a general sentiment. Well, ma'am, said her patron, perhaps some people may be pleased to say that they do like to hear, in his own unpolished way, what Josiah bound to be a corktown has gone through. But you must confess that you were born in the lap of luxury yourself. Come, ma'am, you know you were born in the lap of luxury. I do not, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett with a shake of her head. Deny it. Mr. Bounderby was obliged to get up from the table and stand with his back to the fire, looking at her, 
she was such an enhancement of his position. "'And you were in crack society, devilish high society,' he said, warming his legs. "'It is true, sir.' with an affectation of humility the very opposite of his, and therefore in no danger of jostling it. "'You were in the tip-top fashion and all the rest of it,' said Mr. Bounderby. "'Yes, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsit, with a kind of social widowhood upon her. "'It is unquestionably true.' Mr. Bounderby, bending himself at the knees, literally embraced his legs in his great satisfaction, and laughed aloud. Mr. and Miss Gradgrind being then announced, he received the former with a shake of the hand, and the latter with a kiss. "'Can Jupe be sent here, Bounderby?' asked Mr. Gradgrind. "'Certainly. So Jupe was sent there. On coming in, she curtsied to Mr. Bounderby and to his friend Tom Gradgrind, and also to Louisa, but in her confusion unluckily omitted Mrs. Sparsit. Observing this, the blusterous Bounderby had the following remarks to make. Now, I tell you what, my girl, the name of that lady by the teapot is Mrs. Sparsit. That lady acts as mistress of this house, and she is a highly connected lady. Consequently, if ever you come into any room in this house, you will make a short stay in it if you don't behave towards that lady in your most respectful manner. Now, I don't care a button what you do to me, because I don't affect to be anybody. So far from having high connections, I have no connections at all, and I come from the scum of the earth. But towards that lady, I do care what you do, and you shall do what is deferential and respectful, or you shall not come here. I hope, Bounderby, said Mr. Gradgrind, in a conciliatory voice, that this was merely an oversight. "'My friend Tom Gradgrind suggests, Mrs. Sparsit,' said Bounderby, "'that this was merely an oversight. Very likely. However, as you are aware, ma'am, I don't allow of even oversights towards you.' "'You are very good indeed, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsit, shaking her head with her state humility. "'It is not worth speaking of.' Sissy, who all this time had been faintly excusing herself with tears in her eyes, was now waved over by the master of the house to Mr. Gradgrind. She stood looking intently at him, and Louisa stood coldly by, with her eyes upon the ground, while he proceeded thus. Jupe, I have made up my mind to take you into my house, and when you are not in attendance at the school, to employ you about Mrs. Gradgrind, who is rather an invalid. I have explained to Miss Louisa—this is Miss Louisa—the miserable but natural end of your late career, and you are to expressly understand that the whole of that subject is past, and it is not to be referred to any more. From this time you begin your history. You are, at present, ignorant, I know. Yes, sir, very, she answered, curtsying. I shall have the satisfaction of causing you to be strictly educated, and you will be a living proof to all who come into communication with you of the advantages of the training you will receive. You will be reclaimed and formed. You have been in the habit now of reading to your father and those people I found you among, I dare say, said Mr. Gradgrind, beckoning her nearer to him before he said so, and dropping his voice. Only to father and Merrylegs, sir. At least I mean to father, when Merrylegs was always there. Never mind Merrylegs, Jupe, said Mr. Gradgrind, with a passing frown. I don't ask about him. I understand you to have been in the habit of reading to your father. Oh, yes, sir, thousands of times. They were the happiest, oh, of all the happy times we had together, sir. It was only now, when her sorrow broke out, that Louisa looked at her. And what? asked Mr. Gradgrind, in a still lower voice. Did you read to your father, Jupe? About the fairies, sir, and the dwarf, and the hunchback, and the genies. She sobbed out. And about— Hush, said Mr. Gradgrind. That is enough. Never breathe a word of such destructive nonsense any more. Bounderby, this is a case for a rigid training, and I shall observe it with interest. Well, returned Mr. Bounderby, 
"'I have given you my opinion already, and I shouldn't do as you do. "'But very well, very well, since you are bent upon it, very well.' So Mr. Gradgrind and his daughter took Cecilia Jupp off with them to Stone Lodge, and on the way Louisa never spoke one word, good or bad, and Mr. Bounderby went about his daily pursuits. And Mrs. Sparsit got behind her eyebrows and meditated in the gloom of that retreat all the evening. Let us strike the keynote again before pursuing the tune. When she was a half a dozen years younger, Louisa had been overheard to begin a conversation with her brother one day by saying, "'Tom, I wonder,' upon which Mr. Gradgrind, who was the person overhearing, stepped forth into the light and said, "'Louisa, never wonder.' Herein lay the spring of the mechanical art and mystery of educating the reason without stooping to the cultivation of the sentiments and affections. Never wonder. By means of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, settle everything somehow, and never wonder. Bring to me, says McJoakum Child, yonder may be just able to walk, and I will engage that it shall never wonder. Now, besides very many babies just able to walk, there happen to be in Cogetown, a considerable population of babies who had been walking against time towards the infinite world twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years or more. These portentous infants, being alarming creatures to talk about in any human society, the eighteen denominations incessantly scratched one another's faces and pulled one another's hair by way of agreeing on the steps to be taken for their improvement, which they never did. A surprising circumstance, when the happy adaptation of the means to the end is considered. Still, although they differed in every other particular, conceivable and inconceivable, especially inconceivable, they were pretty well united on the point that these unlucky infants were never to wonder. Body number one said they must take everything on trust. Body number two said they must take everything on political economy. Body number three wrote leaden little books for them, showing how the good grown-up baby invariably got to the savings bank, and the bad grown-up baby invariably got transported. Body number four, under dreary pretenses of being droll, when it was very melancholy indeed, made the shallowed pretenses of concealing pitfuls of knowledge, into which it was the duty of these babies to be smuggled and inveigled. But all the bodies agreed that they were never to wonder. There was a library in Coketown, to which general access was easy. Mr. Gradgrind greatly tormented his mind about what the people read in this library, a point whereon little rivers of tabular statements periodically flowed into the howling ocean of tabular statements, which no diver ever got to any depth in and came up sane. It was a disheartening circumstance, but a melancholy fact, that even these readers persisted in wondering. They wondered about human nature, human passions, human hopes and fears, the struggles, triumphs, and defeats, the cares and joys and sorrows, the lives and deaths of common men and women. They sometimes, after fifteen hours' work, sat down to read mere fables about men and women more or less like themselves, and about children more or less like their own. They took Defoe to their bosoms instead of Euclid, and seemed to be, on the whole, more comforted by Goldsmith than by Cocker. Mr. Gradgrind was forever working, in print and out of print, at this eccentric sum and he could never make out how it yielded this unaccountable product. I am sick of my life, Lou. I hate it altogether. I hate everybody, except you, said the unnatural young Thomas Gradgrind in the hair-cutting chamber at twilight. You don't hate Sissy, Tom. I hate to be obliged to call her dupe, and she hates me, said Tom moodily. No, she does not, Tom, I'm sure. She must, said Tom. 
She must just hate and detest the whole set out of us. They'll bother her head off, I think, before they have done with her. Already she's getting as pale as wax and as heavy as I am. Young Thomas expressed his sentiments sitting astride of a chair before the fire, with his arms on the back and his sulky face on his arms. His sister sat in the darker corner by the fireside, now looking at him, now looking at the bright sparks as they dropped upon the hearth. "'As to me,' said Tom, tumbling his hair all manner of ways with his sulky hands, "'I am a donkey, that's what I am. I am as obstinate as one. I am more stupid than one. I get as much pleasure as one. And I should like to kick like one.' "'Not me, I hope, Tom.' "'No, Lou. I wouldn't hurt you. I made an exception of you at first. I don't know what this jolly old jaundiced jail. Tom had paused to find a sufficiently complimentary and expressive name for his parental roof, and seemed to relieve his mind for a moment by the strong alliteration of this one. I will be without you. Indeed, Tom. Do you really and truly say so? Why, of course I do. What's the use of talking about it? returned Tom, chafing his face on his coat-sleeve as if to mortify his flesh and have it in unison with his spirit. "'Because, Tom,' said his sister, after silently watching the sparks a while, "'as I get older and nearer growing up, I often sit wondering here and think how unfortunate it is for me that I can't reconcile you to home better than I am able to do. I don't know what other girls know. I can't play to you or sing to you. I can't talk to you so as to lighten your mind, for I never see any amusing sights or read any amusing books that it would be a pleasure or a relief to you to talk about when you are tired. Well, no more do I. I am as bad as you in that respect, and I am a mule too, which you're not. If father was determined to make me either a prig or a mule, and I am not a prig, why, it stands to reason, I must be a mule, and so I am," said Tom, desperately. It's a great pity, said Louisa, after another pause and speaking thoughtfully out of her dark corner. It's a great pity, Tom. It's very unfortunate for both of us. Oh, you, said Tom. You are a girl, Lou, and a girl comes out of it better than a boy does. I don't miss anything in you. You're the only pleasure I have. You can brighten even this place, and you can always lead me as you like. You are a dear brother, Tom, and while you think I can do such things, I don't so much mind knowing better. Though I do know better, Tom, and am very sorry for it. She came and kissed him, and went back into her corner again. I wish I could collect all the facts we hear so much about, said Tom, spitefully setting his teeth, and all the figures, and all the people who found them out, and I wish I could put a thousand barrels of gunpowder under them and blow them all up together. However, when I go to live with old Bounderby, I'll have my revenge. Your revenge, Tom? I mean, I'll enjoy myself a little, and go about and see something and hear something. I'll recompense myself for the way in which I've been brought up. But don't disappoint yourself beforehand, Tom. Mr. Bounderby thinks as father thinks, and is a great deal rougher and not half so kind. Oh, <laughs> said Tom, laughing. I don't mind that. I shall very well know how to manage and smooth old Bounderby. Their shadows were defined upon the wall, but those of the high presses in the room were all blended together on the wall and the ceiling, as if the brother and sister were overhung by a dark cavern. Or, a fanciful imagination, if such treason could have been there, might have made it out to be the shadow of their subject, and of its lowering association with their future. What is your great mode of smoothing and managing, Tom? Is it a secret? Oh said Tom. If it is a secret, it's not far off. It's you. You are his little pet. You are his favorite. He'll do anything for you. When he says to me what I don't like, I shall say to him, My sister Lou will be hurt and disappointed, Mr. Bounderby. She always used to tell me she was sure you would be easier with me than this. That'll bring him about, or nothing will. After waiting for some answering remark and getting none, Tom wearily relapsed into the present time, and twined himself yawning round and about the rails of his chair, 
and rumpled his head more and more, until he suddenly looked up and asked, Have you gone to sleep, Lou? No, Tom. I am looking at the fire. You seem to find more to look at in it than ever I could find, said Tom. Another of the advantages, I suppose, of being a girl. Tom? inquired his sister slowly, and in a curious tone, as if she were reading what she asked in the fire, and it was not quite plainly written there. Do you look forward with any satisfaction to this change to Mr. Bounderby's? Why, and there's one thing to be said of it, returned Tom, pushing his chair from him and standing up. It will be getting away from home. There is one thing to be said of it, Louisa repeated in her former curious tone. It will be getting away from home, yes. Not but I shall be very unwilling, both to leave you, Lou, and to leave you here. But I must go, you know, whether I like it or not, and I had better go where I can take with me some advantage of your influence than where I should lose it altogether, don't you see? Yes, Tom. The answer was so long in coming, though there was no indecision in it, that Tom went and leaned on the back of her chair to contemplate the fire which so engrossed her from her point of view and see what he could make of it. Except that it is a fire, said Tom. It looks to me as stupid as blank as everything else looks. What do you see in it? Not a circus? I don't see anything in it, Tom, particularly. But since I have been looking at it, I have been wondering about you and me, grown up. Wondering again, said Tom. I have such unmanageable thoughts, returned his sister, that they will wonder. Then I beg of you, Louisa, said Mrs. Gradgrind, who had opened the door without being heard. To do nothing of that description, for goodness sake, you inconsiderate girl, or I shall never hear the last of it from your father. And Thomas, it's really shameful, with my poor head continually wearing me out, that a boy brought up as you have been, and whose education has cost what yours has, should be found encouraging his sister to wonder, when he knows his father has expressly said that she is not to do it. Louisa denied Tom's participation in the offence, but her mother stopped her with the conclusive answer, Louisa, don't tell me in my state of health, for unless you had been encouraged, it is morally and physically impossible that you could have done it. I was encouraged by nothing, mother, but by looking at the red sparks dropping out of the fire, and whitening and dying. It made me think, after all, how short my life would be, and how little I could hope to do in it. Nonsense, said Mrs. Gradgrind, rendered almost energetic. Nonsense! Don't stand there and tell me such stuff, Louisa, to my face, when you know very well that if it was ever to reach your father's ears, I should never hear the last of it, after all the trouble that has been taken with you, after the lectures you have attended and the experiments you have seen, after I have heard you myself when the whole of my right side has been benumbed, going on with your master about combustion and calcination and calorification, and, I may say, every kind of Asian that could drive a poor invalid distracted to hear you talking in this absurd way about sparks and ashes. I wish, whimpered Mrs. Gradgrind, taking a chair and discharging her strongest points before succumbing under these mere shadows of facts. Yes, I really do wish that I had never had a family, and then you would have known what it was to do without me. Sissy Jupe had not an easy time of it between Mr. McChokumchild and Mrs. Gradgrind, and was not without strong impulses in the first months of her probation to run away. It hailed facts all day long so very hard, and life in general was opened to her as such a closely ruled ciphering book, that assuredly she would have run away, but for only one restraint. It is lamentable to think of, but this restraint was the result of no arithmetical process, was self-imposed in defiance of all calculation, and went dead against any table of probabilities that any actuary would have drawn up from the premises. The girl believed that her father had not deserted her. She lived in hope that he would come back, and in the faith that he would be made the happier by her remaining where she was. The wretched ignorance with which Jupe clung to this consolation, rejecting the superior comfort of knowing, on a sound arithmetical basis, that her father was an unnatural vagabond, filled Mr. Gradgrind with pity. 
Yet what was to be done? McJonkum Child reported that she had a very dense head for figures, that, once possessed with a general idea of the globe, she took the smallest conceivable interest in its exact measurements, that she was extremely slow in the acquisition of dates, unless some pitiful incident happened to be connected therewith, that she would burst into tears on being required, by the mental process, immediately to name the cost of two hundred and forty-seven muslin caps at fourteen pence halfpenny, that she was as low down in the school as low could be, that after eight weeks of induction into the elements of political economy she had only yesterday been set right by a prattler three feet high for returning to the question, what is the first principle of this science, the absurd answer, To do unto others as I would that they should do unto me. Mr. Gradgrind observed, shaking his head, that all this was very bad, that it showed the necessity of infinite grinding at the mill of knowledge, as per system, schedule, blue book, report, and tabular statements A to Z, and that Jupe must be kept to it. So Jupe was kept to it, and became low-spirited, but no wiser. It would be a fine thing to be you, Miss Louisa she said one night, when Louisa had endeavoured to make her perplexities for next day something clearer to her. Do you think so? I should know so much, Miss Louisa. All that is difficult to me now would be so easy then. You might not be the better for it, Sissy. Sissy submitted, after a little hesitation. I should not be the worse, Miss Louisa. To which Miss Louisa answered, I don't know that. There had been so little communication between these two, both because life at Stone Lodge went monotonously round like a piece of machinery, which discouraged human interference, and because of the prohibition relative to Sissy's past career, that they were still almost strangers. Sissy, with her dark eyes wandering directly at Louisa's face, was uncertain whether to say more or to remain silent. You are more useful to my mother, and more pleasant with her than I can ever be. Louisa resumed. You are pleasanter to yourself than I am to myself. But if you please, Miss Louisa. Sissy pleaded. I am oh so stupid. Louisa, with a brighter laugh than usual, told her she would be wiser by and by. You don't know, said Sissy, half crying. What a stupid girl I am. All through school hours I make mistakes. Mr. and Mrs. Machokum Child call me up over and over again regularly to make mistakes. I can't help them. They seem to come natural to me. Mr. and Mrs. Machokum Child never make any mistakes themselves, I suppose, Sissy. Oh, no. She eagerly returned. They know everything. Tell me some of your mistakes. I am almost ashamed, said Sissy, with reluctance. But today, for instance, Mr. Machokum Child was explaining to us about natural prosperity. National, I think it must have been, observed Louisa. Yes, it was, but isn't it the same? She timidly asked. You had better say national as he said so, returned Louisa with her dry reserve. National prosperity. And he said, Now, this schoolroom is a nation, and in this nation there are fifty millions of money. Isn't this a prosperous nation? Girl number twenty, isn't this a prosperous nation, and aren't you in a thriving state? What did you say? asked Louisa. Miss Louisa, I said I didn't know. I thought I couldn't know whether it was a prosperous nation or not, and whether I was in a thriving state or not, unless I knew who had got the money and whether any of it was mine. But that had nothing to do with it. It was not in the figures at all, said Sissy, wiping her eyes. That was a great mistake of yours, observed Louisa. Yes, Miss Louisa, I know it was now. Then Mr. Machokum Child said he would try me again, and he said, This schoolroom is an immense town, and in it there are a million of inhabitants, and only five and twenty are starved to death in the streets, in the course of a year. What is your remark on that proportion? And my remark was, for I couldn't think of a better one, that I thought it must be just as hard upon those who were starved, whether the others were a million or a million million. And that was wrong, too. Of course it was. Then Mr. Machokum Child said he would try me once more, and he said, Here are the stutterings. Statistics, said Louisa. Yes, Miss Louisa, they always remind me of stutterings, and that's another of my mistakes, of accidents upon the sea. 
and I find, Mr. Machokumchild said, that in a given time a hundred thousand persons went to sea on long voyages, and only five hundred of them were drowned or burnt to death. What is the percentage? And I said, Miss— Here Sissy fairly sobbed, as confessing with extreme contrition to her greatest error. I said it was nothing. Nothing, Sissy. Nothing, Miss, to the relations and friends of the people who were killed. I shall never learn, said Sissy. And the worst of all is that although my poor father wished me so much to learn, and although I am so anxious to learn because he wished me to, I am afraid I don't like it. Louisa stood looking at the pretty, modest head, as it drooped abashed before her, until it was raised again to glance at her face. Then she asked, Did your father know so much himself that he wished you to be well taught too, Sissy? Sissy hesitated before replying, and so plainly showed her sense that they were entering on forbidden ground, that Louisa added, No one hears us, and if any one did I am sure no harm could be found in such an innocent question. No, Miss Louisa, answered Sissy, upon this encouragement, shaking her head. Father knows very little indeed. It's as much as he can do to write, and it's more than people in general can do to read his writing, though it's plain to me. Your mother? Father says she was quite a scholar. She died when I was born. She was... Sissy made the terrible communication nervously. She was a dancer. Did your father love her? Louisa asked these questions with a strong, wild, wandering interest peculiar to her, an interest gone astray like a banished creature, and hiding in solitary places. Oh, yes, as dearly as he loves me. Father loved me first for her sake. He carried me about with him when I was quite a baby. We have never been asunder from that time. Yet he leaves you now, Sissy. Only for my good. Nobody understands him as I do. Nobody knows him as I do. When he left me for my good, he never would have left me for his own. I know he was almost broken-hearted with the trial. He will not be happy for a single minute till he comes back. Tell me more about him, said Louisa. I will never ask you again. Where did you live? We traveled about the country and had no fixed place to live in. Father's a... Sissy whispered the awful word. A clown. To make the people laugh, said Louisa, with a nod of intelligence. Yes, but they wouldn't laugh sometimes, and then father cried. Lately, they very often wouldn't laugh, and he used to come home despairing. Father's not like most. Those who didn't know him as well as I do, and didn't love him as dearly as I do, might believe he was not quite right. Sometimes they played tricks upon him, but they never knew how he felt them, and shrunk up when he was alone with me. He was far, far timider than they thought. And you were his comfort through everything. She nodded with the tears rolling down her face. I hope so, and father said I was. It was because he grew so scared and trembling, and because he felt himself to be a poor, weak, ignorant, helpless man, those used to be his words, that he wanted me so much to know a great deal and be different from him. I used to read to him to cheer his courage, and he was very fond of that. They were wrong books, I am never to speak of them here, but we didn't know there was any harm in them. And he liked them said Louisa, with a searching gaze on Sissy all this time. Oh, very much. They kept him many times from what did him real harm. And often and often of a night, he used to forget all his troubles in wondering whether the Sultan would let the lady go on with the story, or would have her head cut off before it was finished. And your father was always kind, to the last, asked Louisa, contravening the great principle and wondering very much. Always, always returned Sissy, clasping her hands. Kinder and kinder than I can tell. He was angry only one night, and that was not to me, but Merrylegs. Merrylegs is his performing dog. Why was he angry with the dog? Louisa demanded. Father, soon after they came home from performing, told Merrylegs to jump up on the backs of the two chairs and stand across them, which is one of his tricks. He looked at Father and didn't do it at once. Everything of Father's had gone wrong that night, and he hadn't pleased the public at all. He cried out that the very dog knew he was failing, and had no compassion on him. Then he beat the dog, and I was frightened, and said, Father, Father, pray don't hurt the creature who is so fond of you. Oh, heaven forgive you, Father, stop! And he stopped, and the dog was bloody, and Father lay down crying on the floor with the dog in his arms, and the dog licked his face. Louisa saw that she was sobbing, and going to her, 
kissed her, took her hand, and sat down beside her. Finish by telling me how your father left you, Sissy. Now that I have asked you so much, tell me the end. The blame, if there is any blame, is mine, not yours. Dear Miss Louisa, said Sissy, covering her eyes and sobbing yet. I came home from school that afternoon and found poor father just come home too, from the booth. And he sat rocking himself over the fire as if he was in pain. And I said, Have you hurt yourself, father? As he did sometimes, like they all did. And he said, A little, my darling. And when I came to stoop down and look up at his face, I saw that he was crying. The more I spoke to him, the more he hid his face. And at first he shook all over and said nothing but, My darling and my love. Here Tom came lounging in, and stared at the two with a coolness not particularly savoring of interest in anything but himself, and not much of that at present. I am asking Sissy a few questions, Tom, observed his sister. You have no occasion to go away, but don't interrupt us for a moment, Tom dear. Oh, very well, returned Tom. Only father's brought old Bounderby home, and I want you to come into the drawing room. Because if you come, there's a good chance of old Bounderby's asking me to dinner. And if you don't, there's none. I'll come directly. I'll wait for you, said Tom. To make sure, Sissy resumed in a lower voice. At last poor father said that he had given no satisfaction again, and never did give any satisfaction now, and that he was a shame and disgrace, and I should have done better without him all along. I said all the affectionate things to him that came into my heart, and presently he was quiet, and I sat down by him, and told him all about the school, and everything that had been said and done there. When I had no more left to tell, he put his arms round my neck, and kissed me a great many times. Then he asked me to fetch some of the stuff he used, for the little hurt he had had, and to get it at the best place, which was at the other end of town from there, and then, after kissing me again, he let me go. When I had gone downstairs, I turned back that I might be a little bit more company to him yet, and looked in at the door and said, Father dear, shall I take Merrylix? Father shook his head and said, No, sissy, no. Take nothing that's known to be mine, my darling. And I left him sitting by the fire. Then the thought must have come upon him, poor, poor father, of going away to try something for my sake. For when I came back, he was gone. I say, look sharp for old Bounderby Lou, Tom remonstrated. There's no more to tell, Miss Louisa. I keep the nine oils ready for him, and I know he will come back. Every letter that I see in Mr. Gradgrind's hand takes my breath away and blinds my eyes, for I think it comes from father or from Mr. Sleary about father. Mr. Sleary promised to write as soon as ever father should be heard of, and I trust him to keep his word. <sighs> Do look sharp for old Bounderby Lou, said Tom with an impatient whistle. He'll be off if you don't look sharp. After this, whenever Sissy dropped a curtsy to Mr. Gradgrind in the presence of his family, and said in a faltering way, I beg your pardon, sir, for being troublesome, but have you had any letter yet about me? Louisa would suspend the occupation of the moments, whatever it was, and look for the reply as earnestly as Sissy did. And when Mr. Gradgrind regularly answered, No, Jupe, nothing of the sort, the trembling of Sissy's lip would be repeated in Louisa's face, and her eyes would follow Sissy with compassion to the door. Mr. Gradgrind usually improved these occasions by remarking, when she was gone, that if Jupe had been properly trained from an early age, she would have remonstrated to herself on sound principles the baselessness of these fantastic hopes. Yet it did seem, though not to him, for he saw nothing of it, as if fantastic hope could take as strong a hold as fact. This observation must be limited exclusively to his daughter. As to Tom, he was becoming that not unprecedented triumph of calculation which is usually at work on number one. As to Mrs. Gradgrind, if she said anything on the subject, she would come a little way out of her wrappers, like a feminine dormouse, and say, Good gracious, bless me, how my poor head is vexed and worried by that girl Jupe so perseveringly asking over and over again about her tiresome letters. Upon my word and honour, I seem to be fated and destined and ordained to live in the midst of things that I am never to hear the last of. 
"'It really is a most extraordinary circumstance "'that it appears as if I never was to hear the last of anything.' "'At about this point Mr. Gradgrind's eye would fall upon her, "'and under the influence of that wintry piece of fact "'she would become torpid again. "'I entertain a weak idea that the English people "'are as hard-worked as any people upon whom the sun shines.' I acknowledge to this ridiculous idiosyncrasy as a reason why I would give them a little more play. In the hardest working part of Coketown, in the innermost fortifications of that ugly citadel, where nature was as strongly bricked out as killing airs and gases were bricked in, at the heart of the labyrinth of narrow courts upon courts and close streets upon streets, which had come into existence piecemeal, every piece in a violent hurry for some one man's purpose, and the whole an unnatural family, shouldering and trampling and pressing one another to death, in the last close nook of this great exhausted receiver, where the chimneys, for want of air to make a draught, were built in an immense variety of stunted and crooked shapes, as though every house put out a sign of the kind of people who might be expected to be born in it, among the multitude of Coketown, generally called the Hands, a race who would have found more favor with some people if Providence had seen fit to make them only Hands, or, like the lower creatures of the seashore, only Hands and Stomachs, lived a certain Stephen Blackpool, forty years of age. Stephen looked older, but he had had a hard life. It is said that every life has its roses and thorns. There seemed, however, to have been a misadventure or mistake in Stephen's case, whereby somebody else had become possessed of his roses, and he had become possessed of the same somebody else's thorns in addition to his own. He had known, to use his words, a peck of trouble. He was usually called Old Stephen, in a kind of rough homage to the fact. A rather stooping man, with a knitted brow, a pondering expression of face, and a hard-looking head sufficiently capacious, on which his iron-gray hair lay long and thin, old Stephen might have passed for a particularly intelligent man in his condition. Yet he was not. He took no place among those remarkable hands, who, piercing together their broken intervals of leisure through many years, had mastered difficult sciences, and acquired a knowledge of most unlikely things. He held no station among the hands who could make speeches and carry on debates. Thousands of his compeers could talk much better than he at any time. He was a good power-loom weaver and a man of perfect integrity. What more he was, or what else he had in him, if anything, let him show for himself. The lights in the great factories, which looked, when they were illuminated, like fairy palaces, or the travellers by express train said so, were all extinguished, and the bells had rung for knocking off for the night, and ceased again and the hands, man and women, boy and girl, were clattering home. Old Stephen was standing in the street, with the old sensation upon him which the stoppage of the machinery always produced, the sensation of its having worked and stopped in his own head. "'Yet I don't see Rachel still,' said he. It was a wet night, and many groups of young women passed him, with their shawls drawn over their bare heads, and held close under their chins to keep the rain out. He knew Rachel well, for a glance at any one of these groups was sufficient to show him that she was not there. At last there were no more to come, and then he turned away, saying in a tone of disappointment, Why, then I missed her. But he had not gone the length of three streets when he saw another of the shawled figures in advance of him at which he looked so keenly that perhaps its mere shadow, indistinctly reflected on the wet pavement, if he could have seen it without the figure itself moving along from lamp to lamp, brightening and fading as it went, would have been enough to tell him who was there. Making his pace at once much quicker and much softer, he darted on until he was very near this figure, 
then fell into his former walk, and called, Rachel! She turned, being then in the brightness of a lamp, and, raising her hood a little, showed a quiet, oval face, dark and rather delicate, irradiated by a pair of very gentle eyes, and further set off by the perfect order of her shining black hair. It was not a face in its first bloom. She was a woman five and thirty years of age. Ah, lad, tis thou. When she had said this, with a smile which would have been quite expressed, though nothing of her had been seen but her pleasant eyes, she replaced her hood again, and they went on together. I thought there was to hang me, Rachel. No. Early to night, lass. Times I'm a little early, Stephen. Times a little late. I'm never to be counted on going home. No go each other way, neither, seems to me, Rachel. No, Stephen. He looked at her with some disappointment in his face, but with a respectful and patient conviction that she must be right in whatever she did. The expression was not lost upon her. She laid her hand lightly on his arm a moment, as if to thank him for it. We are such true friends, lad, and such old friends, and getting to be such old folk now. Nay, Rachel, thou art as young as ever thou was. One of us would be puzzled how to get old, Stephen, without t'other getting so too, both being alive. But anyways, we're such old friends, and to hide a word of honest truth from one another would be a sin and a pity. Tis better not to walk too much together. Times, yes, t'would be hard indeed if t'was not to be at all. She said, with a cheerfulness she sought to communicate to him. Tis hard always, Rachel. Try to think not, and t'will seem better. I've tried a long time, and thank God better. But thou are right. My mek folk talk even of thee. Thou hast been that to me, Rachel, through so many year. Thou hast done me so much good, and heartened of me in that cheering way that thy word is law to me. Ah, lass, and a bright good law, better than some real ones. Never fret about them, Stephen. She answered quickly, and not without an anxious glance at his face. Let the laws be. Yes, he said, with a slow nod or two. Let em be, let everything be, let all sort alone. Tis a muddle and that's all. Always a muddle, said Rachel, with another gentle touch upon his arm, as if to recall him out of the thoughtfulness in which he was biting the long ends of his loose neckerchief as he walked along. The touch had its instantaneous effect. He let them fall, turning a smiling face upon her, and said, as he broke into a good-humoured laugh, Hi, Rachel, lass, all is a muddle. That's where I stick. I come to muddle many times and again and never get beyond it. They had walked some distance and were near their own homes. The woman's was the first reached. It was in one of the many small streets for which the favourite undertaker, who turned a handsome sum out of the one poor ghastly pomp of the neighbourhood, kept a black ladder, in order that those who had done their daily groping up and down the narrow stairs might slide out of this working world by the windows. She stopped at the corner, and putting her hand in his, wished him good night. Good night, dear lass. Good night. She went, with her neat figure and her sober womanly step, down the dark street and he stood looking after her until she turned into one of the small houses. There was not a flutter of her coarse shawl, perhaps, but had its interest in this man's eyes. Not a tone of her voice, but had its echo in his innermost heart. When she was lost to his view, he pursued his homeward way, glancing up sometimes at the sky, where the clouds were sailing fast and wildly. But they were broken now, and the rain had ceased, and the moon shone, looking down the high chimneys of Coketown on the deep furnaces below, and casting titanic shadows of the steam engines at rest upon the walls where they were lodged. The man seemed to have brightened with the night as he went on. His home, in such another street as the first, saying that it was narrower, was over a little shop. How it came to pass that any people found it worth their while to sell or buy the wretched little toys, mixed up in his window with cheap newspapers and pork, 
there was a leg to be raffled for tomorrow night, matters not here. He took his end of candle from a shelf, lighted it at another end of candle on the counter, without disturbing the mistress of the shop who was asleep in her little room, and went upstairs into his lodging. It was a room not unacquainted with the black ladder under various tenants, but as neat at present as such a room could be. A few books and writings were on an old bureau in a corner. The furniture was decent and sufficient, and though the atmosphere was tainted, the room was clean. Going to the hearth to set the candle down upon a round three-legged table standing there, he stumbled against something. As he recoiled, looking down at it, it raised itself up into the form of a woman in a sitting attitude. "'Heaven's mercy, woman!' he cried, falling further off from the figure. "'Hast thou come back again?' Such a woman, a disabled, drunken creature, barely able to preserve her sitting posture by steadying herself, with one begrimed hand on the floor, while the other was so purposeless in trying to push away her tangled hair from her face that it only blinded her the more with the dirt upon it. A creature so foul to look at, in her tatters, stains, and splashes, but so much fouler than that in her moral infamy, that it was a shameful thing even to see her. After an impatient oath or two, and some stupid clawing of herself with the hand not necessary to her support, she got her hair away from her eyes sufficiently to obtain a sight of him. Then she sat swaying her body to and fro, and making gestures with her unnerved arm which seemed intended as the accompaniment to a fit of laughter, though her face was stolid and drowsy. "'Ay, lad, what are you there?' Some hoarse sounds meant for this came mockingly out of her at last, and her head dropped forward on her breast. Back again, she screeched, after some minutes, as if he had that moment said it. Yes, I'm back again. Back again, ever and ever so often. Back? Yes, back. Why not? Roused by the unmeaning violence with which she cried it out, she scrambled up and stood supporting herself with her shoulders against the wall, dangling in one hand by the string a dunghill fragment of a bonnet, and trying to look scornfully at him. I'll sell thee off again, and I'll sell thee off again, and I'll sell thee off a score of times, she cried, with something between a furious menace and an effort at a defiant dance. Come away from the bed. He was sitting on the side of it with his face hidden in his hands. Come away from it, tis mine and I've a right to it. As she staggered to it, he avoided her with a shudder, and passed, his face still hidden, to the opposite end of the room. She threw herself upon the bed heavily, and soon was snoring hard. He sunk into a chair, and moved but once all that night. It was to throw a covering over her, as if his hands were not enough to hide her, even in the dark. The fairy palaces burst into illumination before pale morning showed the monstrous serpents of smoke trailing themselves over Coketown. A clattering of clogs upon the pavement, a rapid ringing of bells, and all the melancholy mad elephants, polished and oiled up for the day's monotony, were at their heavy exercise again. Stephen bent over his loom, quiet, watchful, and steady. A special contrast, as every man was in the forest of looms where Stephen worked, to the crashing, smashing, tearing piece of mechanism at which he labored. Never fear, good people of an anxious turn of mind, that art will consign nature to oblivion. Set anywhere, side by side, the work of God and the work of man, and the former, even though it be a troop of hands of very small account, will gain a dignity from the comparison. So many hundred hands in this mill, so many hundred horse steam power, it is known to the force of a single pound weight what the engine will do. 
but not all the calculators of the national debts can tell me the capacity for good or evil, for love or hatred, for patriotism or discontent, for the decomposition of virtue into vice, or the reverse, at any single moment in the soul of one of these its quiet servants, with the composed faces and the regulated actions. There is no mystery in it. There is an unfathomable mystery in the meanest of them forever. Supposing we were to reverse our arithmetic for material objects, and to govern these awful unknown quantities by other means. The day grew strong, and showed itself outside, even against the flaming lights within. The lights were turned out, and the work went on. The rain fell, and the smoke serpents, submissive to the curse of all that tribe, trailed themselves upon the earth. In the waste-yard outside, the steam from the escape pipe, the litter of barrels and old iron, the shining heaps of coals, the ashes everywhere, were shrouded in a veil of mist and rain. The work went on until the noon bell rang, more clattering upon the pavements, the looms and wheels and hands all out of gear for an hour. Stephen came out of the hot mill into the damp wind and cold wet street, haggard and worn. He turned from his own class and his own quarter, taking nothing but a little bread as he walked along towards the hill on which his principal employer lived, in a red house with black outside shutters, green inside blinds, a black street door, up to white steps, Bounderby in letters very like himself, upon a brazen plate, and a round brazen door-handle underneath it, like a brazen full stop. The Bounderby was at his lunch, so Stephen had expected. Would his servant say that one of the hands begged leave to speak to him? Message in return requiring name of such hand, Stephen Blackpool. There was nothing troublesome against Stephen Blackpool? Yes, he might come in. Stephen Blackpool in the parlour, Mr. Bounderby, whom he just knew by sight, at lunch on chop and sherry, Mrs. Sparsett netting at the fireside in a side-saddle attitude, with one foot in a cotton stirrup. It was a part at once of Mrs. Sparsett's dignity and service not to lunch. She supervised the meal officially, but implied that in her own stately person she considered lunch a weakness. "'Now, Stephen,' said Mr. Bounderby, "'what's the matter with you?' Stephen made a bow. Not a servile one. These hands will never do that. Lord bless you, sir, you'll never catch them at that, if they had been with you twenty years. And, as a complimentary toilet for Mrs. Sparsett, tucked his neckerchief ends into his waistcoat. "'Now you know,' said Mr. Bounderby, taking some sherry, "'we have never had any difficulty with you. "'and you've never been one of the unreasonable ones. "'You don't expect to be set up in a coach and six "'and to be fed on turtle soup and venison "'with a gold spoon, as many of them do.' "'Mr. Bounderby always represented this "'to be the sole, immediate, and direct object "'of any hand who was not entirely satisfied. "'And therefore I know already "'that you've not come here to make a complaint. "'Now, you know, I'm certain of that beforehand. "'No, sir.' "'Sure I'll not come for no at kind.' Mr. Bounderby seemed agreeably surprised, notwithstanding his previous strong conviction. "'Very well,' he returned. "'You're a steady hand, and I was not mistaken. Now, let me hear what it's all about. As it's not that, let me hear what it is. What have you got to say?' "'Out we it, lad.' Stephen happened to glance towards Mrs. Sparsett. "'I can go, Mr. Bounderby.' "'If you wish it,' said that self-sacrificing lady, making a feint of taking her foot out of the stirrup. Mr. Bounderby stayed her by holding a mouthful of chop in suspension before swallowing it, and putting out his left hand. Then, withdrawing his hand and swallowing his mouthful of chop, he said to Stephen, "'Now, you know, this good lady is a born lady, a high lady.' You're not to suppose, because she keeps my house for me, that she hasn't been very high up in the tree. Ah, up at the top of the tree. Now, if you've got anything to say that can't be said before a born lady, this lady will leave the room. 
"'If what you've got to say can be said before a born lady, "'this lady will stay where she is.' "'Sir, I hope I never had no say not fitting for a born lady here "'since I were a born Miss N.' "'Was the reply, accompanied with a slight flush. "'Very well,' said Mr. Bounderby, "'pushing away his plates and leaning back. "'Far away. I a come Stephen began, raising his eyes from the floor after a moment's consideration. To ask you your advice, I need to over much. I were married on Easter Monday, nineteen years in, long and dree. She were a young lass, pretty now, with good account of her sen. Well, she went bad soon. Nor along of me, gun knows I were not an unkind husband to her. Now, I've heard all this before, said Mr. Bounderby. She took to drinking, left off working. "'Sold the furniture, pawned the clothes, and played old gooseberry. "'I were patient with you.' "'The more fool you, I think,' said Mr. Bounderby, in confidence to his wine-glass. "'I were very patient with you. I tried weaner from it hour and hour again. "'I tried this, and I tried that, and I tried t'other. "'I'd gone home many time, and found all vanished as I had it whirled. "'And who we has a sense left to bless us and line up burground. I had done not once, not twice, twenty time. Every line in his face deepened as he said it, and put in its affecting evidence of the suffering he had undergone. From bad to worse, from worse to worse, she left me. She disgraced us in every way, as bitter and bad. She come back, she come back, she come back. What could I do to hinder her? I had walked streets nights longer ever I'd go home. I gone to brig, minded to fling me cell over, and I no more on I abode that much that I were owed when I were young. Mrs. Sparsit, easily ambling along with her netting needles, raised the Coriolanian eyebrows and shook her head, as much as to say, The great no trouble as well as the small. Please to turn your humble eye in my direction. I have paid her keep away from me. These five years I paid her. I had gotten decent fouls about me again. I had lived hard and sad, but nor ashamed and fearful a minutes of my life. Last night I went home. There she lay upon the stone. There she is. In the strength of his misfortune and the energy of his distress, he fired for the moment like a proud man. In another moment, he stood as he had stood all the time. His usual stoop upon him his pondering face addressed to Mr. Bounderby with a curious expression on it, half shrewd, half perplexed, as if his mind were set upon unravelling something very difficult, his hat held tight in his left hand, which rested on his hip, his right arm, with a rugged propriety and force of action, very earnestly emphasizing what he said, not least so when it always paused, a little bent, but not withdrawn, as he paused. "'I was acquainted with all this, you know,' said Mr. Bounderby. "'Except the last clause, long ago. It's a bad job, that's what it is. You had better been satisfied as you were, and not have got married. However, it's too late to say that.' "'Was it an unequal marriage, sir, in point of years?' asked Mrs. Sparsett. You hear what this lady asks? Was it an unequal marriage in point of years, this unlucky job of yours? asked Mr. Bounderby. Nor e'en so. I were one and twenty, Miss N, and she were twenty now, but. Indeed, sir, said Mrs. Sparta to her chef with great placidity. I inferred from its being so miserable a marriage that it was probably an unequal one in point of years. Mr. Bounderby looked very hard at the good lady in a sidelong way that had an odd sheepishness about it. He fortified himself with a little more sherry. "'Well, why don't you go on?' he then asked, turning rather irritably on Stephen Blackpool. "'I have come to you, sir. Oh, I am to be rid of this woman.' Stephen infused a yet deeper gravity into the mixed expression of his attentive face, Mrs. Sparsett uttered a gentle ejaculation, as having received a moral shock. "'What do you mean?' said Bounderby, getting up to lean his back against the chimney-piece. "'What are you talking about? You took her for better for worse.' "'I mun be rid of her. I can't burn her more. I have lived under it so long for that. I hadn't had pity and comforting words at best last living a dead. 
Happily, but for her, I should have gone battering mad. He wishes to be free, to marry the female of whom he speaks, I fear, sir, observed Mrs. Sparsit in an undertone, and much dejected by the immorality of the people. I do, lady says what's right, I do. I were coming to it, and I, I read it papers, that great foe, fur for to em, I wish em no hurt, and not bonded together for better for worse, so fast that they can't be set free from the misfortunate marriages, and marry o'er again. When they do not agree for that the tempers is ill-sorted, they has rooms of one kind or another in their houses, above a bit that they can live us unders. We folk I only one room we can't. When that won't do, they are gout and all the cash, and they can say this for you and that for me, and they can go the separate ways. We can't. Spite of all that, they can be set free for smaller wrongs than mine, so I'm unbe rid of this woman, and I want to know how. No, how? returned Mr. Bounderby. If I do any hurt, sir, there's a law to punish me. Of course there is. If I flee from her, there's a law to punish me. Of course there is. If I marry to the dear lass, there's a law to punish me. Of course there is. If I were to live with her and not marry her, saying such things could be, which it never could, a would, a nurse, a god, there's a law to punish me and every innocent child belonging to me. Of course there is. Now a god's name, said Stephen Blackpool, show me the law to help me. <laughs> there's a sanctity in this relation of life, said Mr. Bounderby. And it must be kept up. No, no, don't say that. Don't keep up that way, not that way. Tis kept down that way. I'm a weaver. I were in a factory when I were a child, but I ain't got need to see we, and I ain't to hear we. I read it papers, every sizes, every sessions, and you can read too, I know it, with dismay, out the supposed impossibility again unchained from one another at any price, on any terms, brings blood upon this land, and brings many common married folk to battle, murder, and sudden death. Let us have this right understood. Mine is a grievous case, and I want, if you will be so good, to know the law that helps me. Now, I tell you what said Mr. Bounderby, putting his hands in his pockets. There is such a law. Stephen, subsiding into his quiet manner, and never wandering in his attention, gave a nod. But it's not for you at all. It costs money. It costs a mint of money. How much might that be? Stephen calmly asked. Why, you'd have to go to Doctor's Commons with a suit, and you'd have to go to a court of common law with a suit. And you'd have to go to the House of Lords with your suit, and you'd have to get an Act of Parliament to enable you to marry again, and it would cost you, if it was a case of very plain sailing, I suppose from a thousand to fifteen hundred pound, said Mr. Bounderby. Perhaps twice the money. There's no other law? Certainly not. Why then, sir? said Stephen, turning white and motioning with that right hand of his, as if he gave everything to the four winds. "'Tis a muddle. Tis just a muddle altogether, and the sooner I'm dead the better." Mrs. Sparsett again dejected by the impiety of the people. "'Poor oh, don't you talk nonsense, my good fellow,' said Mr. Bounderby, "'about things you don't understand.' And don't you call the institutions of your country a muddle, or you'll get yourself into a real muddle one of these fine mornings. The institutions of your country are not your piecework, and the only thing you've got to do is to mind your piecework. You didn't take your wife for fast and for loose, but for better for worse. And if she's turned out worse, why, all we've got to say is, she might have turned out better. "'Tis a muddle," said Stephen, shaking his head as he moved to the door. "'Tis a muddle." "'Now I'll tell you what,' Mr. Bounderby resumed, as a valedictory address, "'with what I shall call your unhallowed opinions, you've been quite shocking this lady, who, as I've already told you, is a born lady, and who, as I've not already told you, has had her own marriage misfortunes.' to the tune of tens of thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds. He repeated it with great relish. Now, you've always been a steady hand near two-four, 
"'But my opinion is, and so I tell you plainly, "'that you are turning into the wrong road. "'You've been listening to some mischievous stranger or other. "'They're always about, and the best thing you can do is to come out of that. "'Now, you know, I can see as far into a grindstone as any other man, "'farther than a good many, perhaps, "'cause I had my nose well kept to it when I was young.' I see traces of the turtle soup and venison and gold spoon in this. Yes, I do, cried Mr. Bounderby, shaking his head with obstinate cunning. By the Lord Harry, I do. With a very different shake of the head and deep sigh, Stephen said, Thank you, sir. I wish you good day. So he left Mr. Bounderby swelling at his own portrait on the wall, as if he were going to explode himself into it and Mrs. Sparsit still ambling on with her foot in her stirrup, looking quite cast down by the popular vices. Old Stephen descended the two white steps, shutting the black door with the brazen door-plate by the aid of the brazen full stop, to which he gave a parting polish with the sleeve of his coat, observing that his hot hand clouded it. He crossed the street with his eyes bent upon the ground, and thus was walking sorrowfully away, when he felt a touch upon his arm. It was not the touch he needed most at such a moment, the touch that could calm the wild waters of his soul, as the uplifted hand of the sublimest love and patience could abate the raging of the sea. Yet it was a woman's hand, too. It was an old woman, tall and shapely still, though withered by time, on whom his eyes fell when he stopped and turned. She was very cleanly and plainly dressed, had country mud upon her shoes, and was newly come from a journey. The flutter of her manner in the unwonted noise of the streets, the spare shawl carried unfolded on her arm, the heavy umbrella and little basket, the loose long-fingered gloves to which her hands were unused, all bespoke an old woman from the country in her plain holiday clothes, come into Coketown on an expedition of rare occurrence. Remarking this at a glance, with the quick observation of his class, Stephen Blackpool bent his attentive face, his face, which, like the faces of many of his order, by dint of long working with eyes and hands in the midst of a prodigious noise, had acquired the concentrated look with which we are familiar in the countenances of the deaf, the better to hear what she asked him. "'Pray, sir,' said the old woman, "'didn't I see you come out of that gentleman's house?' pointing back to Mr. Bounderby. "'I believe it was you, unless I've had the bad luck to mistake the person in following.' "'Yes, missus,' returned Stephen. "'It were me.' "'Have you—' "'You'll excuse an old woman's curiosity. "'Have you seen the gentleman?' "'Yes, missus.' "'And how did he look, sir? "'Was he portly, bold, outspoken and arty?' "'As she straightened her own figure "'and held up her hand in adapting her action to her words, "'the idea crossed Stephen that he had seen this old woman before "'and had not quite liked her. "'Oh, yes,' he returned. "'observing her more attentively. "'He were all that.' "'And healthy?' said the old woman. "'As fresh as the wind?' "'Yes,' returned Stephen. "'He were eating and drinking, as large and as loud as Oma be.' "'Thank you,' said the old woman, with infinite content. "'Thank you.' "'He certainly never had seen this old woman before, "'yet there was a vague remembrance in his mind.' as if he had more than once dreamed of some old woman like her. She walked along at his side, and gently accommodating himself to her humour, he said Coketown was a busy place, was it not? To which she answered, Ay, sure, dreadful busy. Then, he said, she came from the country, he saw. To which she answered in the affirmative. By parliamentary this morning. I came forty mile by parliamentary this morning, and I'm going back the same forty mile this afternoon. I walked nine mile to the station this morning, 
and if I find nobody on the road to give me a lift, I shall walk the nine mile back tonight. That's pretty well, sir, at my age, said the chatty old woman, her eye brightening with exultation. Deed it is, don't do it too often, missus. No, no, once a year, she answered, shaking her head. I spend my savings so once every year. I come regular to tramp about the streets and see the gentlemen. Only to see em, returned Stephen. That's enough for me, she replied, with great earnestness and interest of manner. I ask no more. I've been standing about on this side of the way to see that gentleman. Turning her head back towards Mr. Bounderby's again. Come out, but he's late this year, and I have not seen him. You came out instead. Now, if I am obliged to go back without a glimpse of him, I only want a glimpse. Well, I have seen you, and you have seen him, and I must make that do. Saying this, she looked at Stephen as if to fix his features in her mind, and her eye was not so bright as it had been. With a large allowance for difference of tastes, and with all submission to the patricians of Coketown, this seemed so extraordinary a source of interest to take so much trouble about, that it perplexed him. But they were passing the church now, and as his eye caught the clock, he quickened his pace. He was going to work, the old woman said, quickening hers too, quite easily. Yes, time was nearly out. On his telling her where he worked, the old woman became a more singular old woman than before. Ain't you happy? She asked him. Why, there's almost nobody but has the troubles, missus. He answered evasively, because the old woman appeared to take it for granted that he would be very happy indeed, and he had not the heart to disappoint her. He knew that there was trouble enough in the world, and if the old woman had lived so long and could count upon his having so little, why, so much the better for her, and none the worse for him. Ay, ay, you have your troubles at home, you mean, she said. Times just now and then, he answered slightly. But working under such a gentleman, they don't follow you to the factory. No, no, they didn't follow him there, said Stephen. All correct there, everything accordant there. He did not go so far as to say, for her pleasure, that there was a sort of divine right there, but I have heard claims almost as magnificent of late years. They were now in the black by-road near the place, and the hands were crowding in. The bell was ringing, and the serpent was a serpent of many coils, and the elephant was getting ready. The strange old woman was delighted with the very bell. It was the beautifulest bell she had ever heard, she said, and sounded grand. She asked him, when he stopped good-naturedly to shake hands with her before going in, how long he had worked there. A dozen year, he told her. I must kiss the end, said she, that has worked in this fine factory for a dozen year. And she lifted it though he would have prevented her, and put it to her lips. What harmony besides her age and her simplicity surrounded her he did not know, but even in this fantastic action there was a something neither out of time nor place, a something which it seemed as if nobody else could have made as serious, or done with such a natural and touching air. He had been at his loom full half an hour, thinking about this old woman, when, having occasion to move round the loom for its adjustment, he glanced through the window which was in his corner, and saw her, still looking up at the pile of building, lost in admiration. Heedless of the smoke and mud and wet, and of her two long journeys, she was gazing at it, as if the heavy thrum that issued from its many stories were proud music to her. She was gone by and by, and the day went after her, and the lights sprung up again, and the express whirled in full sight of the fairy palace over the arches near, 
little felt amid the jarring of the machinery, and scarcely heard above its crash and rattle. Long before then his thoughts had gone back to the dreary room above the little shop, and to the shameful figure, heavy on the bed, but heavier on his heart. Machinery slackened, throbbing feebly like a fainting pulse, stopped. The bell again. The glare of light and heat dispelled. The factories looming heavy in the black, wet night. Their tall chimney is rising up into the air like competing towers of Babel. He had spoken to Rachel only last night, it was true, and had walked with her a little way. But he had his new misfortune on him in which no one else could give him a moment's relief, and, for the sake of it, and because he knew himself to want that softening of his anger which no voice but hers could affect, he felt he might so far disregard what she had said as to wait for her again. He waited, but she had eluded him. She was gone. On no other night in the year could he so ill have spared her patient face. Oh, better to have no home in which to lay his head than to have a home and dread to go to it through such a cause. He ate and drank, for he was exhausted, but he little knew or cared what, and he wandered about in the chill rain, thinking and thinking, and brooding and brooding. No word of a new marriage had ever passed between them, but Rachel had taken great pity on him years ago, and to her alone he had opened his closed heart all this time on the subject of his miseries, and he knew very well that if he were free to ask her, she would take him. He thought of the home he might at that moment have been seeking with pleasure and pride, of the different man he might have been that night, of the lightness then in his now heavy-laden breast, of the then restored honor, self-respect, and tranquillity, all torn to pieces. He thought of the waste of the best part of his life, of the change it made in his character for the worse every day of the dreadful nature of his existence, bound hand and foot to a dead woman, and tormented by a demon in her shape. He thought of Rachel, how young when they were first brought together in these circumstances, how mature now, how soon to grow old. He thought of the number of girls and women she had seen marry, how many homes with children in them she had seen grow up around her, how she had contentedly pursued her own lone, quiet path for him, and how he had sometimes seen a shade of melancholy on her blessed face that smote him with remorse and despair. He set the picture of her up beside the infamous image of last night, and thought, Could it be that the whole earthly course of one so gentle, good, and self-denying was subjugate to such a wretch as that. Filled with these thoughts, so filled that he had an unwholesome sense of growing larger, of being placed in some new and diseased relation towards the objects among which he passed, of seeing the iris round every misty light turn red, he went home for shelter. A candle faintly burned in the window to which the black ladder had often been raised for the sliding away of all that was most precious in this world to a striving wife and a brood of hungry babies, and Stephen added to his other thoughts the stern reflection that of all the casualties of this existence upon earth not one was dealt out with so unequal a hand as death. The inequality of birth was nothing to it. For say that the child of a king and the child of a weaver were born to-night in the same moment, what was that disparity to the death of any human creature who was serviceable to or beloved by another, while this abandoned woman lived on? 
From the outside of his home he gloomily passed to the inside, with suspended breath and with a slow footstep. He went up to his door, opened it, and so into the room. Quiet and peace were there. Rachel was there, sitting by the bed. She turned her head, and the light of her face shone in upon the midnight of his mind. She sat by the bed, watching and tending his wife. That is to say, he saw that someone lay there, and he knew too well it must be she. But Rachel's hands had put a curtain up, so that she was screened from his eyes. Her disgraceful garments were removed, and some of Rachel's were in the room. Everything was in its place and order as he had always kept it. The little fire was newly trimmed, and the hearth was freshly swept. It appeared to him that he saw all this in Rachel's face, and looked at nothing besides. While looking at it, it was shut out from his view by the softened tears that filled his eyes, but not before he had seen how earnestly she looked at him, and how her own eyes were filled too. She turned again towards the bed, and satisfying herself that all was quiet there, spoke in a low, calm, cheerful voice. I am glad you have come at last, Stephen. You are very late. I have been walking up and down. I thought so. But tis too bad a night for that. The rain falls very heavy, and the wind has risen. The wind? True. It was blowing hard. Hark to the thundering in the chimney and the surging noise. To have been out in such a wind and not to have known it was blowing. I have been here once before today, Stephen. Landlady came round for me at dinner time. There was some one here that needed looking to, she said. Indeed she was right. All wandering and lost, Stephen. Wounded to and bruised. He slowly moved to a chair and sat down, drooping his head before her. I came to do what little I could, Stephen. First, for that she worked with me when we were girls, both. And for that you courted her and married her when I was her friend. He laid his furrowed forehead on his hand with a low groan. And next, for that I know your heart, and am right sure and certain that tis far too merciful to let her die, or even so much as suffer for one to aid. Thou knowest who said, Let him who is without sin amongst you cast the first stone at her. There have been plenty to do that. Thou art not the man to cast the last stone, Stephen, when she is brought so low. Oh, Rachel, Rachel! Thou hast been a cruel sufferer. Heaven reward thee, she said, in compassionate accents. I am thy poor friend with all my heart and mind. The wounds of which she had spoken seemed to be about the neck of the self-made outcast. She dressed them now, still without showing her. She steeped a piece of linen in a basin, into which she poured some liquid from a bottle, and laid it with a gentle hand upon the sore. The three-legged table had been drawn close to the bedside, and on it there were two bottles. This was one. It was not so far off, but that Stephen, following her hands with his eyes, could read what was printed on it in large letters. He turned of a deadly hue, and a sudden horror seemed to fall upon him. "'I will stay here, Stephen,' said Rachel, quietly resuming her seat. "'Till the bells go three. It is to be done again at three, and then she may be left till morning. But thy rest again, to-morrow's work, my dear. I slept sound last night. I can wake many nights when I am put to it. Tis thou who art in need of rest, so white and tired. Try to sleep in the chair there while I watch. Thou hadst no sleep last night, I can well believe. To-morrow's work is far harder for thee than for me. He heard the thundering and surging out of doors and it seemed to him as if his late angry mood were going about trying to get at him. She had cast it out, she would keep it out. He trusted to her to defend him from himself. She don't know me, Stephen. She just drowsily mutters and stares. I have spoken to her times and again, but she don't notice. Tis as well so. When she comes to her right mind once more, I shall have done what I can and she never the wiser. How long, Rachel, this look for, that she'll be so? 
Doctor said she would happily come to her mind tomorrow. His eyes fell again on the bottle, and a tremble passed over him, causing him to shiver in every limb. She thought he was chilled with the wet. No, he said. It were not that he'd had a fright. A fright? Aye, aye, coming in. When I were walking, when I were thinking, when I— It seized him again, and he stood up, holding by the mantel shelf, as he pressed his dank, cold hair down with a hand that shook as if it were palsied. Stephen. She was coming to him, but he stretched out his arm to stop her. No, don't, please, don't. Let me see thee set in my bed. Let me see thee as so good and so forgiving. Let me see thee as I see thee when I coming in. I can never see thee better than so. Never, never, never. He had a violent fit of trembling, and then sunk into his chair. After a time he controlled himself, and resting with an elbow on one knee and his head upon that hand, could look towards Rachel. Seen across the dim candle with his moistened eyes, she looked as if she had a glory shining round her head. He could have believed she had. He did believe it, as the noise without shook the window, rattled at the door below, and went about the house clamoring and lamenting. When she gets better, Stephen, tis to be hoped she'll leave thee to thyself again, and do thee no more hurt. Anyways, we will hope so now, and now I shall keep silence, for I want thee to sleep. He closed his eyes, more to please her than to rest his weary head. But by slow degrees, as he listened to the great noise of the wind, he ceased to hear it, or it changed into the working of his loom, or even into the voices of the day, his own included, saying what had been really said. Even this imperfect consciousness faded away at last, and he dreamed a long, troubled dream. He thought that he and some one on whom his heart had long been set, but she was not Rachel, and that surprised him, even in the midst of his imaginary happiness, stood in the church being married. While the ceremony was performing, and while he recognized among the witnesses some whom he knew to be living, and many whom he knew to be dead, darkness came on, succeeded by the shining of a tremendous light. It broke from one line in the table of commandments at the altar, and illuminated the building with the words. They were sounded through the church, too, as if there were voices in the fiery letters. Upon this the whole appearance before him and around him changed and nothing was left as it had been but himself and the clergyman. They stood in the daylight, before a crowd so vast, that if all the people in the world could have been brought together into one space, they could not have looked, he thought, more numerous, and they all abhorred him, and there was not one pitying or friendly eye among the millions that were fastened on his face. He stood on a raised stage, under his own loom, and looking up at the shape the loom took, and hearing the burial service distinctly read, he knew that he was there to suffer death. In an instant what he stood on fell below him, and he was gone. Out of what mystery he came back to his usual life, and to places that he knew, he was unable to consider. But he was back in those places by some means, and with this condemnation upon him, that he was never, in this world or the next, through all the unimaginable ages of eternity, to look on Rachel's face or hear her voice. Wandering to and fro, unceasingly, without hope, and in search of he knew not what, he only knew that he was doomed to seek it, he was the subject of a nameless, horrible dread, a mortal fear of one particular shape which everything took. Whatsoever he looked at grew into that form sooner or later. The object of his miserable existence was to prevent its recognition by any one among the various people he encountered. Hopeless labor! If he led them out of rooms where it was, 
if he shut up drawers and closets where it stood, if he drew the curious from places where he knew it to be secreted, and got them out into the streets, the very chimneys of the mills assumed that shape, and round them was the printed word. The wind was blowing again, the rain was beating on the housetops, and the larger spaces through which he had strayed contracted to the four walls of his room. Saving that the fire had died out, it was as his eyes had closed upon it. Rachel seemed to have fallen into a doze in the chair by the bed. She sat wrapped in her shawl, perfectly still. The table stood in the same place, close by the bedside, and on it, in its real proportions and appearance, was the shape so often repeated. He thought he saw the curtain move. He looked again, and he was sure it moved. He saw a hand come forth and grope about a little. Then the curtain moved more perceptibly, and the woman in the bed put it back and sat up. With her woeful eyes, so haggard and wild, so heavy and large, she looked all round the room and past the corner where he slept in his chair. Her eyes returned to that corner, and she put her hand over them as a shade while she looked into it. Again they went all round the room, scarcely heeding Rachel, if at all, and returned to that corner. He thought, as she once more shaded them, not so much looking at him as looking for him, with a brutish instinct that he was there, that no single trace was left in those debauched features, or in the mind that went along with them, of the woman he had married eighteen years before. But that he had seen her come to this by inches, he never could have believed her to be the same. All this time, as if a spell were on him, he was motionless and powerless, except to watch her. Stupidly dozing, or communing with her incapable self about nothing, she sat for a little while with her hands at her ears, and her head resting on them. Presently she resumed her staring round the room, and now, for the first time, her eyes stopped at the table with the bottles on it. Straightway she turned her eyes back to his corner, with the defiance of last night and moving very cautiously and softly, stretched out her greedy hand. She drew a mug into the bed, and sat for a while considering which of the two bottles she would choose. Finally she laid her insensate grasp upon the bottle that had swift and certain death in it, and before his eyes pulled out the cork with her teeth. Dream or reality, he had no voice, nor had he power to stir. If this be real, and her allotted time be not yet come, wake, Rachel, wake. She thought of that, too. She looked at Rachel, and very slowly, very cautiously, poured out the contents. The draught was at her lips. A moment, and she would be past all help. Let the whole world wake and come about her with its utmost power. But in that moment Rachel started up with a suppressed cry. The creature struggled, struck her, seized her by the hair, but Rachel had the cup. Stephen broke out of his chair. Rachel, I'm awake in a dream in this dreadful night. Tis all well, Stephen. I have been asleep myself. Tis near three. Hush! I hear the bells. The wind brought the sounds of the church clock to the window. They listened, and it struck three. Stephen looked at her, saw how pale she was, noted the disorder of her hair and the red marks of fingers on her forehead, and felt assured that his senses of sight and hearing had been awake. She held the cup in her hand even now. I thought it must be near three she said, calmly pouring from the cup into the basin, and steeping the linen as before. I am thankful I stayed. Tis done now, when I've put this on. 
There. And now she's quiet again. The few drops in the basin I'll pour away, for tis bad stuff to leave about, though ever so little of it. As she spoke, she drained the basin into the ashes of the fire, broke the bottle on the hearth. She had nothing to do then but to cover herself with her shawl, before going out into the wind and rain. Don't let me walk with thee at this hour, Rachel. No, Stephen, tis but a minute and I'm home. Though I'm not fearful, he said it in a low voice, as they went out at the door. To leave me alone, we are? As she looked at him, saying, Stephen, he went down on his knee before her, on the poor mean stairs, and put an end of her shawl to his lips. Thou art an angel, bless thee, bless thee. I am, as I have told thee, Stephen, thy poor friend. Angels are not like me. Between them and a working woman full of faults, there is a deep gulf set. My little sister is among them, but she is changed. She raised her eyes for a moment as she said the word, and then they fell again, in all their gentleness and mildness, on his face. Thou changest me from bad to good, then makest me humble wish for to be more like thee, and fearful to lose thee when this life is o'er, and aught muddle cleared away. Thou art an angel, it may be thou hast saved my soul alive. She looked at him, on his knee at her feet, with her shawl still in his hand, and the reproof on her lips died away when she saw the working of his face. I come home desperate, I come home without hope, and mad we think it that when I said a word of complaint I was reckoned an unreasonable hand. I told thee I'd had a fright. It was a poison bottle on table. I never hurt a living creature, but happening so sudden upon it, I thought, how can I say what I might have done to me, Sen? Her, her, her both. She put her two hands on his mouth with a face of terror to stop him from saying more. He caught them in his unoccupied hand, and holding them, and still clasping the border of her shawl, said hurriedly, But I see thee, Rachel, setting by the bed. I have seen thee all this night. In me troublous sleep I have known this still be there. Evermore I'll see thee there, and never more will see her or think of her, but thou shalt be beside her. And never more will see her think of anything that angers me, but thou so much better than me shall be by the side on't, and so I'll try to look at time, and so I will try to trust at time, when thou and me at last shall walk together far away, beyond the deep gulfic country, where thy little sister is. He kissed the border of her shawl again, and let her go. She bade him good night in a broken voice, and went out into the street. The wind blew from the quarter where the day would soon appear, and still blew strongly. It had cleared the sky before it, and the rain had spent itself or travelled elsewhere, and the stars were bright. He stood bareheaded in the road watching her quick disappearance. As the shining stars were to the heavy candle in the window, so was Rachel, in the rugged fancy of this man, to the common experiences of his life. Time went on in Coketown like its own machinery, so much material wrought up, so much fuel consumed, so many powers worn out, so much money made. But, less inexorable than iron, steel, and brass, it brought its varying seasons even into that wilderness of smoke and brick, and made the only stand that ever was made in the place against its direful uniformity. Louisa is becoming, said Mr. Gradgrind, almost a young woman. Time, with his innumerable horsepower, worked away not minding what anybody said, and presently turned out young Thomas a foot taller than when his father had last taken particular notice of him. Thomas is becoming, said Mr. Gradgrind, almost a young man. Time passed Thomas on in the mill, while his father was thinking about it, and there he stood in a long tailed coat and a stiff shirt collar. Really, said Mr. Gradgrind, the period has arrived when Thomas ought to go to Bounderby. 
time, sticking to him, passed him on into Bounderby's bank, made him an inmate of Bounderby's house, necessitated the purchase of his first razor, and exercised him diligently in his calculations relative to number one. The same great manufacturer, always with an immense variety of work on hand in every stage of development, passed Sissy onward in his mill, and worked her up into a very pretty article indeed. "'I fear, Jupe,' said Mr. Gradgrind, "'that your continuance at the school any longer would be useless.' "'I am afraid it would, sir,' Sissy answered with a curtsy. "'I cannot disguise from you, Jupe,' said Mr. Gradgrind, knitting his brow, "'that the result of your probation there has disappointed me, has greatly disappointed me. You have not acquired under Mr. and Mrs. M. Chokumchild anything like that amount of exact knowledge which I looked for. You are extremely deficient in your facts. Your acquaintance with figures is very limited. You are altogether backward and below the mark.' "'I am sorry, sir,' she returned. "'But I know it is quite true. Yet I have tried hard, sir.' Yes, said Mr. Gradgrind. Yes, I believe you have tried hard. I have observed you, and I can find no fault in that respect. Thank you, sir. I have thought sometimes, Sissy, very timid here, that perhaps I tried to learn too much, and that if I had asked to be allowed to try a little less, I might have— No, Jupe, no, said Mr. Gradgrind shaking his head in his profoundest and most eminently practical way. No, the course you pursued, you pursued according to the system. The system, and there is no more to be said about it. I can only suppose that the circumstances of your early life were too unfavorable to the development of your reasoning powers, and that we began too late. Yet, as I have said already, I am disappointed. I wish I could have made a better acknowledgment, sir, of your kindness to a poor, forlorn girl who had no claim upon you, and of your protection of her. Don't shed tears, said Mr. Gradgrind. Don't shed tears. I don't complain of you. You are an affectionate, earnest, good young woman, and, and we must make that do. Thank you, sir, very much, said Sissy, with a grateful curtsy. You are very useful to Mrs. Gradgrind, and, in a generally pervading way, you are serviceable in the family also. So I understand from Miss Louisa, and indeed so I have observed myself. I therefore hope, said Mr. Gradgrind, that you can make yourself happy in those relations. I should have nothing to wish, sir, if— I understand you, said Mr. Gradgrind. You still refer to your father— I have heard from Miss Louisa that you still preserve that bottle. Well, if your training in the science of arriving at exact results had been more successful, you would have been wiser on these points. I will say no more. He really liked Sissy too well to have a contempt for her. Otherwise, he held her calculating powers in such very slight estimation that he must have fallen upon that conclusion. Somehow or other, he had become possessed by an idea that there was something in this girl which could hardly be set forth in a tabular form. Her capacity of definition might be easily stated at a very low figure, her mathematical knowledge at nothing, yet he was not sure that if he had been required, for example, to take her off into columns in a parliamentary return, he would have quite known how to divide her. In some stages of his manufacture of the human fabric, the processes of time were very rapid. Young Thomas and Sissy being both at such a stage of their working up, these changes were effected in a year or two, while Mr. Gradgrind himself seemed stationary in his course, and underwent no alteration. Except one, which was apart from his necessary progress through the mill. Time hustled him into a little noisy and rather dirty machinery, in a bycomer, and made him Member of Parliament for Coketown, one of the respected members for ounce weights and measures, one of the representatives of the multiplication table, 
one of the deaf honorable gentlemen, dumb honorable gentlemen, blind honorable gentlemen, lame honorable gentlemen, dead honorable gentlemen, to every other consideration. Else wherefore live we in a Christian land, eighteen hundred and odd years after our master? All this while Louisa had been passing on, so quiet and reserved, and so much given to watching the bright ashes at twilight as they fell into the grate and became extinct, that from the period when her father had said she was almost a young woman, which seemed but yesterday, she had scarcely attracted his notice again when he found her quite a young woman. Quite a young woman, said Mr. Gradgrind, musing. Dear me! Soon after this discovery, he became more thoughtful than usual for several days, and seemed much engrossed by one subject. On a certain night, when he was going out, and Louisa came to bid him good-bye before his departure, as he was not to be home until late, and she would not see him again until the morning, he held her in his arms, looking at her in his kindest manner, and said, My dear Louisa, you are a woman. She answered with the old, quick, searching look of the night when she was found at the circus, then cast down her eyes. Yes, father. My dear, said Mr. Gradgrind, I must speak with you alone and seriously. Come to me in my room after breakfast tomorrow, will you? Yes, father. Your hands are rather cold, Louisa. Are you not well? Quite well, father. And cheerful? She looked at him again and smiled in her peculiar manner. I am as cheerful, father, as I usually am or usually have been. That's well, said Mr. Gridegrind. So he kissed her and went away, and Louisa returned to the serene apartment of the hair-cutting character, and leaning her elbow on her hand, looked again at the short-lived sparks that so soon subsided into ashes. Are you there? Lou, said her brother, looking in at the door. He was quite a young gentleman of pleasure now, and not quite a prepossessing one. Dear Tom, she answered, rising and embracing him. How long it is since you have been to see me? Why, I've been otherwise engaged, Lou, in the evenings. In the daytime old Bounderby has been keeping me at it, rather. But I touch him up with you when he comes at it too strong. And so we preserve an understanding. I say, has father said anything particular to you today or yesterday, Lou? No, Tom, but he told me tonight that he wished to do so in the morning. Ah, uh, that's what I mean, said Tom. Do you know where he is tonight? With a very deep expression. No. Then I'll tell you. He's with old Bounderby. They are having a regular confab together up at the bank. Why at the bank, do you think? Well, I'll tell you again. To keep Mrs. Sparsit's ears as far off as possible, I expect. With her hand upon her brother's shoulder, Louisa still stood looking at the fire. Her brother glanced at her face with a greater interest than usual, and encircling her waist with his arm, drew her coaxingly to him. You are very fond of me, ain't you, Lou? Indeed I am, Tom, though you do let such long intervals go by without coming to see me. Well, sister of mine, when you say that, you are near my thoughts. We might be so much oftener together, mightn't we? Always together, almost, mightn't we? It would do me a great deal of good if you were to make up your mind to I know what, Lou. It would be a splendid thing for me. It would be uncommonly jolly. Her thoughtfulness baffled his cunning scrutiny. He could make nothing of her face. He pressed her in his arm and kissed her cheek. She returned the kiss, but still looked at the fire. I say, Lou, I thought I'd come and just hint to you what was going on, though I suppose you'd most likely guess, even if you didn't know. I can't stay because I'm engaged to some fellows tonight. You won't forget how fond you are of me. No, dear Tom, I won't forget. That's a capital girl, said Tom. Goodbye, Lou. She gave him an affectionate good night and went out with him to the door, 
whence the fires of Coketown could be seen, making the distance lurid. She stood there, looking steadfastly towards them, and listening to his departing steps. They retreated quickly, as glad to get away from Stone Lodge, and she stood there yet, when he was gone and all was quiet. It seemed as if, first in her own fire within the house, and then in the fiery haze without, she tried to discover what kind of woof old time, that greatest and longest established spinner of all, would weave from the threads he had already spun into a woman. But his factory is a secret place, his work is noiseless, and his hands are mutes. Although Mr. Gradgrind did not take after Bluebeard, his room was quite a blue chamber in its abundance of blue books. Whatever they could prove, which is usually anything you like, they proved there, in an army constantly strengthening by the arrival of new recruits. In that charmed apartment the most complicated social questions were cast up, got into exact totals, and finally settled, if those concerned could only have been brought to know it, as if an astronomical observatory should be made without any windows, and the astronomer within should arrange the starry universe solely by pen, ink, and paper, so Mr. Gradgrind, in his observatory, and there are many like it, had no need to cast an eye upon the teeming myriads of human beings around him, but could settle all their destinies on a slate, and wipe out all their tears with one dirty little bit of sponge. To this observatory, then, a stern room with a deadly statistical clock in it, which measured every second with a beat like a rap upon a coffin lid, Louisa repaired on the appointed morning. A window looked towards Coketown, and when she sat down near her father's table, she saw the high chimneys and the long tracts of smoke looming in the heavy distance gloomily. "'My dear Louisa,' said her father, "'I prepared you last night to give me your serious attention in the conversation we are now going to have together. You have been so well trained, and you do, I am happy to say, so much justice to the education you have received, that I have perfect confidence in your good sense. You are not impulsive, you are not romantic, you are accustomed to view everything from the strong, dispassionate ground of reason and calculation. From that ground alone I know you will view and consider what I am going to communicate. He waited, as if he would have been glad that she said something. But she said never a word. Louisa, my dear. You are the subject of a proposal of marriage that has been made to me. Again he waited, and again she answered not one word. This so far surprised him as to induce him gently to repeat, A proposal of marriage, my dear. To which she returned, without any visible emotion whatever, I hear you, father. I am attending, I assure you. Well said Mr. Gradgrind, breaking into a smile, after being for a moment at a loss. You are even more dispassionate than I expected, Louisa. Or perhaps you are not unprepared for the announcement I have it in charge to make. I cannot say that, father, until I hear it. Prepared or unprepared, I wish to hear it all from you. I wish to hear you state it to me, father. Strange to relate, Mr. Gradgrind was not so collected at this moment as his daughter was. He took a paper knife in his hand, turned it over, laid it down, took it up again, and even then had to look along the blade of it, considering how to go on. What you say, my dear Louisa, is perfectly reasonable. I have undertaken then to let you know that, in short, that Mr. Bounderby has informed me that he has long watched your progress with particular interest and pleasure, and has long hoped that the time might ultimately arrive when he should offer you his hand in marriage. That time to which he has so long, and certainly with great constancy, looked forward, is now come. 
Mr. Bounderby has made his proposal of marriage to me, and has entreated me to make it known to you, and to express his hope that you will take it into your favorable consideration. Silence between them. The deadly statistical clock very hollow, the distant smoke very black and heavy. Father, said Louisa, do you think I love Mr. Bounderby? Mr. Gradgrind was extremely discomfited by this unexpected question. Well, my child, I uh, really cannot take upon myself to say. Father, pursued Louisa, in exactly the same voice as before. Do you ask me to love Mr. Bounderby? My dear Louisa, no. No, I ask nothing. Father, she still pursued. Does Mr. Bounderby ask me to love him? Really, my dear, said Mr. Gradgrind, it is difficult to answer your question. Difficult to answer it, yes or no, father? Certainly, my dear, because... Here was something to demonstrate, and it set him up again. Because the reply depends so materially, Louisa, on the sense in which we use the expression... Now, Mr. Bounderby does not do you the injustice, and does not do himself the injustice, of pretending to anything fanciful, fantastic, or, I am using synonymous terms, sentimental. Mr. Bounderby would have seen you grow up under his eyes to very little purpose, if we could go so far to forget what is due to your good sense, not to say to his, as to address you from any such ground. Therefore, perhaps the expression itself, I merely suggest this to you, my dear, may be a little misplaced. What would you advise me to use in its stead, father? My dear Louisa, said Mr. Gradgrind, completely recovered by this time, I would advise you, since you ask me, to consider this question as you have been accustomed to consider every other question, simply as one of tangible fact. The ignorant and giddy may embarrass such subjects with irrelevant fancies and other absurdities that have no existence properly viewed, really no existence, but it is no compliment to you to say that you know better. Now, what are the facts of this case? You are, we will say, in round numbers, twenty years of age. Mr. Bounderby is, we will say, in round numbers, fifty. Now, there is some disparity in your respective years, but in your means and positions there is none. On the contrary, there is a great suitability. Then the question arises. Is this one disparity sufficient to operate as a bar to such a marriage? In considering this question, it is not unimportant to take into account the statistics of marriage so far as they have yet been obtained in England and Wales. I find on reference to the figures that a large proportion of these marriages are contracted between parties of very unequal ages and that the elder of these contracting parties is, in rather more than three-fourths of these instances, the bridegroom. It is remarkable as showing the wide prevalence of this law that among the natives of the British possessions in India, also in a considerable part of China, and among the Kalmucks of Tartary, the best means of computation yet furnished by us travelers yield similar results. The disparity I have mentioned, therefore, almost ceases to be disparity, and virtually all but disappears. What do you recommend, father? Asked Louisa, her reserved composure not in the least affected by these gratifying results. That I should substitute for the term I used just now, for the misplaced expression. Louisa, returned her father, it appears to me that nothing can be plainer. Confining yourself rigidly to fact, the question of fact you state to yourself is, Does Mr. Bounderby ask me to marry him? Yes, he does. The sole remaining question then is, Shall I marry him? I think nothing can be plainer than that. Shall I marry him? Repeated Louisa with great deliberation. Precisely. 
and it is satisfactory to me, as your father, my dear Louisa, to know that you do not come to the consideration of that question with the previous habits of mind and habits of life that belong to many young women. No, father, she returned. I do not. I now leave you to judge for yourself, said Mr. Gradgrind. I have stated the case as such cases are usually stated among practical minds. I have stated it as the case of your mother and myself was stated in its time. The rest, my dear Louisa, is for you to decide. From the beginning she had sat looking at him fixedly. As he now leaned back in his chair and bent his deep-set eyes upon her in his turn, Perhaps he might have seen one wavering moment in her, when she was impelled to throw herself upon his breast and give him the pent-up confidences of her heart. But to see it, he must have overleaped, at a bound, the artificial barriers he had for many years been erecting between himself and all those subtle essences of humanity which will elude the utmost cunning of algebra until the last trumpet ever to be sounded shall blow even algebra to wreck. The barriers were too many and too high for such a leap. With his unbending, utilitarian, matter-of-fact face, he hardened her again, and the moment shot away into the plumless depths of the past to mingle with all the lost opportunities that are drowned there. Removing her eyes from him, she sat so long looking silently towards the town that he said at length, Are you consulting the chimneys of the Coketown works, Louisa? There seems to be nothing there but languid and monotonous smoke. Yet when the night comes, fire bursts out, father. She answered, turning quickly. Of course I know that, Louisa. I do not see the application of the remark. To do him justice, he did not at all. She passed it away with a slight motion of her hand, and concentrating her attention upon him again, said, Father, I have often thought that life is very short. This was so distinctly one of his subjects that he interposed. It is short, no doubt, my dear. Still, the average duration of human life is proved to have increased of late years. The calculations of various life assurance and annuity offices, among the other figures which cannot go wrong, have established the fact. I speak of my own life, father. Oh, indeed. Still, said Mr. Gradgrind, I need not point out to you, Louisa, that it is governed by the laws which govern lives in the aggregate. While it lasts, I would wish to do the little I can and the little I am fit for. What does it matter? Mr. Gradgrind seemed rather at a loss to understand the last four words, replying, How matter? What matter, my dear? Mr. Bounderby, she went on in a steady, straight way, without regarding this, asks me to marry him. The question I have to ask myself is, shall I marry him? That is so, father, is it not? You have told me so, father, have you not? Certainly, my dear. Let it be so. Since Mr. Bounderby likes to take me thus, I am satisfied to accept his proposal. Tell him, father, as soon as you please, that this was my answer. Repeat it, word for word, if you can, because I should wish him to know what I said. It is quite right, my dear, retorted her father approvingly. To be exact. I will observe your very proper request. Have you any wish in reference to the period of your marriage, my child? None, father. What does it matter? Mr. Gradgrind had drawn his chair a little nearer to her and taken her hand. But her repetition of these words seemed to strike with some little discord on his ear. He paused to look at her, and still holding her hand, said, Louisa. I have not considered it essential to ask you one question, because the possibility implied in it appeared to me to be too remote. But perhaps I ought to do so. You have never entertained in secret any other proposal? Father, he returned, almost scornfully, What other proposal can have been made to me? Whom have I seen? Where have I been? What are my heart's experiences? My dear Louisa, 
retired Mr. Gradgrind, reassured and satisfied. You correct me justly. I merely wish to discharge my duty. What do I know, father? said Louisa, in her quiet manner. Of tastes and fancies, of aspirations and affections, of all that part of my nature in which such light things might have been nourished. What escape have I had from problems that could be demonstrated, and realities that could be grasped? As she said it, she unconsciously closed her hand, as if upon a solid object, and slowly opened it, as though she were releasing dust or ash. My dear, assented her eminently practical parent. Quite true, quite true. Why, father, she pursued, what a strange question to ask me. The baby preference that even I have heard of as common among children has never had its innocent resting place in my breast. You have been so careful of me that I never had a child's heart. You have trained me so well that I never dreamed a child's dream. You have dealt so wisely with me, father, from my cradle to this hour, that I never had a child's belief or a child's fear. Mr. Gradgrind was quite moved by his success, and by this testimony to it. My dear Louisa, said he, you abundantly repay my care. Kiss me, my dear girl. So his daughter kissed him. Detaining her in his embrace, he said, I may assure you now, my favorite child, that I am made happy by the sound decision at which you have arrived. Mr. Bounderby is a very remarkable man, and what little disparity can be said to exist between you, if any, is more than counterbalanced by the tone your mind has acquired. It has always been my object so to educate you as that you might, while still in your early youth, be, if I may so express myself, almost any age. Kiss me once more, Louisa. Now let us go find your mother. Accordingly, they went down to the drawing-room, where the esteemed lady, with no nonsense about her, was recumbent as usual, while Sissy worked beside her. She gave some feeble signs of returning animation when they entered, and presently the faint transparency was presented in a sitting attitude. Mrs. Gradgrind, said her husband, who had waited for the achievement of this feat with some impatience, allow me to present to you Mrs. Bounderby. Oh, said Mrs. Gradgrind. So you have settled it. Well, I'm sure I hope your health may be good, Louisa, for if your head begins to split as soon as you are married, which was the case with mine, I cannot consider that you are to be envied, though I have no doubt you think you are, as all girls do. However, I give you joy, my dear, and I hope you may now turn all your illogical studies to a good account. I am sure I do. I must give you a kiss of congratulation, Louisa, but don't touch my right shoulder, for there's something running down it all day long, and now you see— whimpered Mrs. Gradgrind, adjusting her shawls after the affectionate ceremony. I shall be worrying myself morning, noon, and night to know what I am to call him. Mrs. Gradgrind, said her husband solemnly, what do you mean? Whatever am I to call him, Mr. Gradgrind, when he is married to Louisa? I must call him something. It's impossible, said Mrs. Gradgrind, with a mingled sense of politeness and injury. To be constantly addressing him and never giving him a name. I cannot call him Josiah, for the name is insupportable to me. You yourself wouldn't hear of Joe, as you very well know. Am I to call my own son-in-law Mr.? Not, I believe, unless the time has arrived when as an invalid I am to be trampled upon by my relations. Then, what am I to call him? Nobody present having any suggestion to offer in the remarkable emergency, Mrs. Gradgrind departed this life for the time being, after delivering the following codicil to her remarks already executed. As to the wedding, all I ask, Louisa, is, and I ask it with a fluttering in my chest which actually extends to the soles of my feet, that it may take place soon, otherwise I know it is one of those subjects I shall never hear the last of. When Mr. Gradgrind had presented Mrs. Bounderby, Sissy had suddenly turned her head and looked in wonder, in pity, in sorrow, in doubt, in a multitude of emotions, towards Louisa. Louisa had known it, and seen it, without looking at her. 
From that moment she was impassive, proud, and cold, held Sissy at a distance, changed to her altogether. Mr. Bounderby's first disquietude on hearing of his happiness was occasioned by the necessity of imparting it to Mrs. Sparsit. He could not make up his mind how to do it, or what the consequences of the step might be, whether she would instantly depart bag and baggage to Lady Scadger's, or would positively refuse to budge from the premises, whether she would be plaintive or abusive, tearful or tearing, whether she would break her heart or break the looking-glass, Mr. Bounderby could not all foresee. However, as it must be done, he had no choice but to do it. So, after attempting several letters and failing in them all, he resolved to do it by word of mouth. On his way home, on the evening he set aside for this momentous purpose, he took the precaution of stepping into a chemist's shop, and buying a bottle of the very strongest smelling salts. Oh, by George, said Mr. Bounderby, if she takes it in the fainting way, I'll have the skin off her nose at all events. But, in spite of being thus forearmed, he entered his own house with anything but a courageous air and appeared before the object of his misgivings like a dog who was conscious of coming direct from the pantry. "'Good evening, Mr. Bounderby.' "'Good evening, ma'am. Good evening.' He drew up his chair, and Mrs. Sparsett drew back hers, as who should say, "'Your fireside, sir. I freely admit it. It is for you to occupy it all, if you think proper.' "'Don't go to the North Pole, ma'am.' said Mr. Bounderby. "'Thank you, sir,' said Mrs. Sparsett, and returned, though short of her former position. Mr. Bounderby sat looking at her, as, with the points of a stiff, sharp pair of scissors, she picked out holes for some inscrutable ornamental purpose in a piece of cambric, an operation which, taken in connection with the bushy eyebrows and the Roman nose, suggested with some liveliness the idea of a hawk engaged upon the eyes of a tough little bird. She was so steadfastly occupied that many minutes elapsed before she looked up from her work. When she did so, Mr. Bounderby bespoke her attention with a hitch of his head. "'This is Sparsit, ma'am,' said Mr. Bounderby, putting his hands in his pockets and assuring himself with his right hand that the cork of the little bottle was ready for use. "'I have no occasion to say to you that you are not only a lady born and bred, but a devilish sensible woman.' "'Sir,' returned the lady, "'this is indeed not the first time that you have honoured me with similar expressions of your good opinion.' "'Mrs. Sparsit, ma'am,' said Mr. Bounderby, I am going to astonish you. Yes, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsit interrogatively, and in the most tranquil manner possible. She generally wore mittens, and she now laid down her work and smoothed those mittens. Uh, I, I am going, ma'am, said Bounderby, to, to marry Tom Gradgrind's daughter. Yes, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsit. I hope you may be happy, Mr. Bounderby. Oh, indeed, I hope you may be happy, sir. And she said it with such great condescension, as well as with such great compassion for him, that Bounderby, far more disconcerted than if she had thrown her work-box at the mirror or swooned on the hearth-rug, corked up the smelling salts tight in his pocket, and thought— no, oh, not confound a woman. Who could have even guessed she'd take it this way? I wish with all my heart, sir, said Mrs. Sparsit, in a highly superior manner. Somehow she seemed, in a moment, to have established a right to pity him ever afterwards. That you may in all respects be very happy. <laughs> well, ma'am, returned Bounderby, with some resentment in his tone, which was clearly lowered, though in spite of himself. 
I am obliged to you. I hope I shall be. Do you, sir? said Mrs. Sparsit, with great affability. But naturally you do. Of course you do. A very awkward pause on Mr. Bounderby's part succeeded. Mrs. Sparsit sedately resumed her work, and occasionally gave a small cough, which sounded like a cough of conscious strength and forbearance. "'Well, ma'am,' resumed Bounderby, "'under these circumstances I imagine it would not be agreeable to a character like yours to remain here, though you would be very welcome here.' "'Oh, dear, no, sir. I could on no account think of that.' Mrs. Sparsit shook her head, still in her highly superior manner, and a little changed the small cough, coughing now as if the spirit of prophecy rose within her, but had better be coughed down. However, ma'am, said Bounderby, there are apartments at the bank where a born and bred lady, as keeper of the place, would be rather a catch than otherwise, and if the same terms— I beg your pardon, sir. You were so good as to promise that you would always substitute the phrase annual compliment. Uh, well, ma'am, uh, annual compliment. If the same annual compliment would be acceptable there, why, I see nothing to part us unless you do. Sir, returned Mrs. Sparsit, the proposal is like yourself. And if the position I shall assume at the bank is one that I could occupy without descending lower in the social scale— Why, of course it is, said Bounderby. If it was not, ma'am, you don't suppose that I should offer it to a lady who has moved in the society you have moved in? Not that I care for such society, you know, but you do. Mr. Bounderby, you are very considerate. You'll have your own private apartments, and you'll have your coals and your candles and all the rest of it, and you'll have your maid to attend upon you, and you'll have your light porter to protect you, and you'll be what I take the liberty of considering precious comfortable," said Bounderby. Sir, rejoined Mrs. Sparsit, say no more. In yielding up my trust here, I shall not be freed from the necessity of eating the bread of dependence. She might have said the sweet bread, for that delicate article in a savoury brown sauce was her favourite supper. And I would rather receive it from your hand than from any other. Therefore, sir, I accept your offer gratefully, and with many sincere acknowledgments for past favours. And I hope, sir, said Mrs. Sparsit, Concluding in an impressively compassionate manner, I fondly hope that Miss Gradgrind may be all you desire and deserve. Nothing moved Mrs. Sparsit from that position any more. It was in vain for Bounderby to bluster or assert himself in any of his explosive ways. Mrs. Sparsit was resolved to have compassion on him as a victim. She was polite, obliging, cheerful, hopeful. But the more polite, the more obliging, the more cheerful, the more hopeful, the more exemplary altogether she. The forlorner sacrifice and victim, he. She had that tenderness for his melancholy fate that his great bread countenance used to break out into cold perspirations when she looked at him. Meanwhile, the marriage was appointed to be solemnized in eight weeks' time, and Mr. Bounderby went every evening to Stone Lodge as an accepted wooer. Love was made on these occasions in the form of bracelets, and on all occasions during the period of betrothal took a manufacturing aspect. Dresses were made, jewelry was made, cakes and gloves were made, settlements were made, and an extensive assortment of facts did appropriate honour to the contract. The business was all fact, from first to last. The hours did not go through any of those rosy performances which foolish poets have ascribed to them at such times. Neither did the clocks go any faster or any slower than at other seasons. 
a deadly statistical recorder in the Gradgrind Observatory knocked every second on the head as it was born, and buried it with his accustomed regularity. So the day came, as all other days come to people who will only stick to reason, and when it came they were married in the church of the florid wooden legs, that popular order of architecture. Joseph Bounderby Esquire of Coketown, to Louisa, eldest daughter of Thomas Gradgrind Esquire, of Stone Lodge, M.P. for that borough. And when they were united in holy matrimony, they went home to breakfast at Stone Lodge aforesaid. There was an improving party assembled on the auspicious occasion, who knew what everything they had to eat and drink was made of and how it was imported or exported, and in what quantities, and in what bottoms, whether native or foreign, and all about it. The bridesmaids, down to little Jane Gradgrind, were, in an intellectual point of view, fit helpmates for the calculating boy, and there was no nonsense about any of the company. After breakfast, the bridegroom addressed them in the following terms. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Josiah Bounderby of Coketown. Since you have done my wife and myself the honour of drinking and our healths and happiness, I suppose I must acknowledge the same. Though, as you all know me and know what I am and what my extraction was, you won't expect a speech from a man who, when he sees a post, says, That's a post, and when he sees a pump, says, that's a pump, and is not to be got to call a post a pump, or a pump a post, or either of them a toothpick. If you want a speech this morning, my friend and father-in-law, Tom Gagrand, is a member of Parliament, and you know where to get it. I am not your man. However, if I feel a little independent when I look around this table to-day and reflect on how little I thought of marrying Tom Gradgrind's daughter when I was a ragged street boy who never washed his face unless it was at the pump, and that not oftener than once a fortnight, I hope I may be excused. So I hope you like my feeling independent. If you don't, I can't help it. I do feel independent. Now, I have mentioned, and you have mentioned, that I am this day married to Tom Gradgrind's daughter. I am very glad to be so. It has long been my wish to be so. I have watched her bringing up, and I believe she is worthy of me. At the same time, not to deceive you, I believe I am worthy of her. So I thank you on both our parts for the good will you have shown towards us and the best wish I can give the unmarried part of the present company is this. I hope every bachelor may find as good wife as I have found, and I hope every spinster may find as good a husband as my wife has found. Shortly after which oration, as they were going on a nuptial trip to Lyon, in order that Mr. Bounderby might take the opportunity of seeing how the hands got on in those parts, and whether they too require to be fed with gold spoons, the happy pair departed for the railroad. The bride, in passing downstairs, dressed for her journey, found Tom waiting for her, flushed, either with his feelings or the vinous part of the breakfast. What a game girl you are to be such a first-rate sister, Lou, whispered Tom. She clung to him as she should have clung to some far better nature that day, and was a little shaken in her reserved composure for the first time. Old Bounderby's quite ready, said Tom. Time's up. Goodbye. I shall be on the lookout for you when you come back. I say, my dear Lou, ain't it uncommonly jolly now? A sunny midsummer day. There was such a thing sometimes even in Coketown. Seen from a distance in such weather, Coketown lay shrouded in a haze of its own, which appeared impervious to the sun's rays. 
You only knew the town was there, because you knew there could have been no such sulky blotch upon the prospect without a town. A blur of soot and smoke, now confusingly tending this way, now that way, now aspiring to the vault of heaven, now murkily creeping along the earth, as the wind rose and fell or changed its quarter. A dense, formless jumble, with sheets of cross-light in it, that showed nothing but masses of darkness. Coke Town in the distance was suggestive of itself, though not a brick of it could be seen. The wonder was it was there at all. It had been ruined so often that it was amazing how it had borne so many shocks. Surely there never was such a fragile chinaware as that of which the millers of Coketown were made. Handled them never so lightly, and they fell to pieces with such ease that you might suspect them of having been flawed before. They were ruined when they were required to send laboring children to school. They were ruined when inspectors were appointed to look into their works. They were ruined when such inspectors considered it doubtful whether they were quite justified in chopping people up with their machinery. They were utterly undone when it was hinted that perhaps they need not always make quite so much smoke. Besides Mr. Bounderby's gold spoon, which was generally received in Coketown, another prevalent fiction was very popular there. It took the form of a threat. Whenever a Coketowner felt he was ill-used, that is to say, whenever he was not left entirely alone, and it was proposed to hold him accountable for the consequences of any of his acts, he was sure to come out with the awful menace that he would sooner pitch his property into the Atlantic. This had terrified the Home Secretary within an inch of his life on several occasions. However, the Coketowners were so patriotic after all that they never had pitched their property into the Atlantic yet, but, on the contrary, had been kind enough to take mighty good care of it. So there it was, in the haze yonder, and it increased and multiplied. The streets were hot and dusty on the summer day and the sun was so bright that it even shone through the heavy vapor drooping over Coketown, and could not be looked at steadily. Stokers emerged from low underground doorways into factory yards, and set on steps and posts and paling, wiping their swarthy visages and contemplating coals. The whole town seemed to be frying in oil. There was a stifling smell of hot oil everywhere. The steam engines shone with it. The dresses of the hands were soiled with it. The mills throughout their many stories oozed and trickled it. The atmosphere of those fairy palaces was like the breath of the Samoom, and their inhabitants, wasting with heat, toiled languidly in the desert. But no temperature made the melancholy mad elephants more mad or more sane. Their wearisome heads went up and down at the same rate, in hot weather and cold, wet weather and dry, fair weather and foul. The measured motion of their shadows on the walls was the substitute Coketown had to show for the shadows of rustling woods, while for the summer hum of insects, it could offer all year round, from the dawn of Monday to the night of Saturday, the whir of shafts and wheels. Drowsily they whirred all through this sunny day, making the passenger more sleepy and more hot as he passed the humming walls of the mills. Sun-blinds and sprinklings of water a little cooled the main streets and the shops, but the mills and the courts and alleys baked at a fierce heat. Down upon the river that was black and thick with dye, some Coketown boys, who were at large, a rare sight there, rowed a crazy boat, which made a spumous attack upon the water as it jogged along, 
while every dip of an oar stirred up vile smells. But the sun itself, however beneficent, generally was less kind to Coketown than hard frost, and rarely looked intently into any of its closer regions without engendering more death than life. So does the eye of heaven itself become an evil eye, when incapable or sordid hands are interposed between it and the things it looks upon to bless. Mrs. Sparsit sat in her afternoon apartment at the bank, on the shadier side of the frying street. Office hours were over, and at that period of the day, in warm weather, she usually embellished, with her genteel presence, a managerial boardroom over the public office. Her own private sitting-room was a story higher, at the window of which post of observation she was ready every morning to greet Mr. Bounderby, as he came across the road, with the sympathizing recognition appropriate to a victim. He had been married now a year, and Mrs. Sparsit had never released him from her determined pity a moment. The bank offered no violence to the wholesome monotony of the town. It was another red-brick house, with black outside shutters, green inside blinds, a black street door up to white steps, a brazen door-plate, and a brazen door-handle, full stop. It was a size larger than Mr. Bounderby's house, as other houses were from a size to half a dozen sizes smaller. In all other particulars it was strictly according to pattern. Mrs. Sparsett was conscious that by coming in the evening tide among the desks and writing implements she shed a feminine, not to say also aristocratic, grace upon the office. Seated with her needlework or netting apparatus at the window, she had a self-laudatory sense of correcting, by her ladylike deportment, the rude business aspect of the place. With this impression of her interesting character upon her, Mrs. Sparsett considered herself, in some sort, the bank fairy. The townspeople, who in their passing and repassing saw her there, regarded her as the bank dragon, keeping watch over the treasures of the mine. What these treasures were, Mrs. Sparsett knew as little as they did. Gold and silver coin, precious paper, secrets that if divulged would bring vague destruction upon vague persons, generally, however, people whom she disliked, were the chief items in her ideal catalogue thereof. For the rest, she knew that after office hours he reigned supreme over all the office furniture and over a locked-up iron room with three locks, against the door of which strong chamber the light-porter laid his head every night, on a truckle bed that disappeared at cock-crow. Further, she was lady paramount over certain vaults in the basement, sharply spiked off from communication with the predatory world, and over the relics of the current day's work, consisting of blots of ink, worn-out pens, fragments of wafers, and scraps of paper torn so small that nothing interesting could ever be deciphered on them when Mrs. Sparsett tried. Lastly, she was guardian over a little armory of cutlasses and carbines, arrayed in vengeful order above one of the official chimney-pieces, and over that respectable tradition never to be separated from a place of business claiming to be wealthy, a row of fire-buckets vessels calculated to be of no physical utility on any occasion, but observed to exercise a fine moral influence, almost equal to bullion, on most beholders. A deaf serving-woman and the light-porter completed Mrs. Sparsett's empire. The deaf serving-woman was rumored to be wealthy, and a saying had for years gone about among the lower orders of Coketown, that she would be murdered some night when the bank was shut for the sake of her money. It was generally considered, indeed, that she had been due some time, and ought to have fallen long ago, 
but she had kept her life and her situation with an ill-conditioned tenacity that occasioned much offence and disappointment. Mrs. Sparsett's tea was just set for her on a pert little table, with its tripod of legs in an attitude, which she insinuated after office hours, into the company of a stern, leathern-topped long-board table that bestrode the middle of the room. The light porter placed the tea-tray on it, knuckling his forehead as a form of homage. "'Thank you, Bitzer,' said Mrs. Sparsett. "'Thank you, ma'am," returned the light porter. He was a very light porter indeed, as light as in the days when he blinkingly defined a horse for girl number twenty. "'All is shut up, Bitzer,' said Mrs. Sparsett. "'All is shut up, ma'am." "'And what?' said Mrs. Sparsett, pouring out her tea. Is the news of the day? Anything? Well, ma'am, I can't say that I've heard anything particular. Our people are a bad lot, ma'am. But that is no news, unfortunately. What are the restless wretches doing now? Asked Mrs. Sparsett. Merely going on in the old way, ma'am. Uniting and leaguing and engaging to stand by one another. It is much to be regretted said Mrs. Sparsett, making her nose more Roman and her eyebrows more Cariolanian in the strength of her severity, that the United Masters allow of any such class combinations. Yes, ma'am, said Bitter. Being united themselves, they ought one and all to set their faces against employing any man who is united with any other man, said Mrs. Sparsett. They have done that, ma'am, returned Bitter. But it rather fell through, ma'am. I do not pretend to understand these things, said Mrs. Sparsett, with dignity. My lot having been signally cast in a widely different sphere, and Mr. Sparsett, as a powler, being also quite out of the pale of any such dissensions, I only know that these people must be conquered, and that it's high time it was done, once for all. Yes, ma'am returned Bitzer, with a demonstration of great respect for Mrs. Sparsett's oracular authority. You couldn't put it clearer, I am sure, ma'am. As this was his usual hour for having a little confidential chat with Mrs. Sparsett, and as he had already caught her eye and seen that she was going to ask him something, he made a pretense of arranging the rulers, inkstands, and so forth, while that lady went on with her tea glancing through the open window down into the street. "'Has it been a busy day, Bitzer?' asked Mrs. Sparsett. "'Not a very busy day, my lady. About an average day.' He now and then slided into milady instead of ma'am, as an involuntary acknowledgment of Mrs. Sparsett's personal dignity and claims to reverence. "'The clerks?' said Mrs. Sparsett, carefully brushing an imperceptible crumb of bread and butter from her left-hand mitten. "'Are trustworthy, punctual, and industrious, of course?' "'Yes, ma'am, pretty fair, ma'am, with the usual exception.' He held the respectable office of general spy and informer in the establishment, for which volunteer service he received a present at Christmas, over and above his weekly wage. He had grown into an extremely clear-headed, cautious, prudent young man, who was safe to rise in the world. His mind was so exactly regulated that he had no affectations or passions. All his proceedings were the result of the nicest and coldest calculation, and it was not without cause that Mrs. Sparsett habitually observed of him that he was a young man of the steadiest principle she had ever known. Having satisfied himself, on his father's death, that his mother had a right of settlement in Coketown, this excellent young economist had asserted that right for her with such a steadfast adherence to the principle of the case, that she had been shut up in a workhouse ever since. It must be admitted that he allowed her half a pound of tea a year, which was weak in him. First, because all gifts have an inevitable tendency to pauperize the recipient, and secondly, because his only reasonable transaction in that commodity would have been to buy it for as little as he could possibly give, and sell it for as much as he could possibly get. 
it having been clearly ascertained by philosophers that in this is comprised the whole duty of man, not a part of man's duty, but the whole. Pretty fair, ma'am, with the usual exception, ma'am, repeated Bitzer. Ah, said Mrs. Sparsit, shaking her head over her teacup and taking a long gulp. Mr. Thomas, ma'am, I doubt Mr. Thomas very much, ma'am. I don't like his ways at all. Bit, sir, said Mrs. Sparsit, in a very impressive manner. Do you recollect my having said anything to you respecting names? I beg your pardon, ma'am. It's quite true that you did object to names being used, and they're always best avoided. Please to remember that I have a charge here, said Mrs. Sparsit, with her air of state. I hold a trust here, Bitzer. Under Mr. Bounderby, however improbable both Mr. Bounderby and myself might have deemed it years ago that he would ever become my patron, making me an annual compliment, I cannot but regard him in that light. From Mr. Bounderby, I have received every acknowledgment of my social station and every recognition of my family descent that I could possibly expect. More, far more. Therefore, to my patron, I will be scrupulously true, and I do not consider, I will not consider, I cannot consider," said Mrs. Sparsit, with a most extensive stock on hand of honour and morality, "that I should be scrupulously true if I allowed names to be mentioned under this roof, that are unfortunately, most unfortunately, no doubt of that. Connected with his. Bitzer knuckled his forehead again and again begged pardon. No, Bitzer. Continued Mrs. Sparsit. Say an individual, and I will hear you. Say Mr. Thomas, and you must excuse me. With the usual exception, ma'am. Said Bitzer, trying back. Of an individual. Ah. Mrs. Sparsit repeated the ejaculation the shake of the head over her teacup, and the long gulp, as taking up the conversation again at that point where it had been interrupted. "'An individual, ma'am,' said Bitzer, "'has never been what he ought to have been since he first came into the place. He is a dissipated, extravagant idler. He is not worth his salt, ma'am. He wouldn't get it either if he hadn't a friend and relation at court, ma'am.' Ah. <sighs> said Mrs. Sparsit, with another melancholy shake of her head. I only hope, ma'am, pursued Bitzer, that his friend and relation may not supply him with the means of carrying on. Otherwise, ma'am, we know out of whose pocket that money comes. Ah, <sighs> sighed Mrs. Sparsit again, with another melancholy shake of her head. He is to be pitied, ma'am. The last party I have alluded to is to be pitied, ma'am," said Bitzer. "Yes, Bitzer," said Mrs. Sparsit. "I have always pitied the delusion, always." "As to an individual, ma'am," said Bitzer, dropping his voice and drawing nearer, "he is as improvident as any of the people in this town, and you know what their improvidence is, ma'am." No one could wish to know it better than a lady of your eminence does. They would do well," returned Mrs. Sparsit, "to take example by you, Bitzer." Thank you, ma'am. But since you do refer to me, now look at me, ma'am. I have put by a little, ma'am, already. That gratuity which I receive at Christmas, ma'am, I never touch it. I don't even go to the length of my wages, though they're not I, ma'am. Why can't they do as I have done, ma'am? What one person can do, another can do. This again was among the fictions of Coketown. Any capitalist there who made sixty thousand pounds out of sixpence always professed to wonder why the sixty thousand nearest hands didn't each make sixty thousand pounds out of sixpence, and more or less reproached them every one for not accomplishing the little feat. What I did, you can do. Why don't you go and do it? As to their wanting recreations, ma'am," said Bitzer, "it's stuff and nonsense. 
I don't want recreations. I never did, and I never shall. I don't like them. As to their combining together, there are many of them, I have no doubt, that by watching and informing upon one another, could earn a trifle now and then, whether in money or goodwill, and improve their livelihood. Then why don't they improve it, ma'am? It's the first consideration of a rational creature, and it's what they pretend to want. Pretend, indeed, said Mrs. Sparsit. I am sure we are constantly hearing, ma'am, till it becomes quite nauseous concerning their wives and families, said Bitzer. Why, look at me, ma'am. I don't want a wife and family. Why should they? Because they are improvident, said Mrs. Sparsit. Yes, ma'am, returned Bitzer. That's where it is. If they were more provident and less perverse, ma'am, what would they do? They would say, while my hat covers my family, or while my bonnet covers my family, as the case might be, ma'am. I've only one to feed, and that's the person I most like to feed. To be sure, assented Mrs. Sparsit, eating muffin. Thank you, ma'am, said Bitzer, knuckling his forehead again in return for the favor of Mrs. Sparsit's improving conversation. Would you wish a little more hot water, ma'am, or is there anything else that I could fetch you? Nothing just now, Bitzer. Thank you, ma'am. I shouldn't wish to disturb you at your meals, ma'am, particularly tea, knowing your partiality for it," said Bitzer, craning a little to look over into the street from where he stood. But there's been a gentleman been looking up here for a minute or so, ma'am, and he has come across as if he was going to knock. That is his knock, ma'am, no doubt. He stepped to the window, and looking out, and drawing in his head again, confirmed himself with, Yes, ma'am. Would you wish the gentleman to be shown in, ma'am? I don't know who it can be," said Mrs. Sparsit, wiping her mouth and arranging her mitten. A stranger, ma'am, evidently. What can a stranger want at the bank this time of evening, unless he comes upon some business for which he is too late? I don't know," said Mrs. Sparsit. But I hold a charge in this establishment for Mr. Bounderby, and I will never shrink from it. If to see him is any part of the duty I have accepted, I will see him. Use your own discretion, Bitzer. Here, the visitor, all unconscious of Mrs. Sparsit's magnanimous words, repeated his knock so loudly that the light porter hastened down to open the door, while Mrs. Sparsit took the precaution of concealing her little table, with all its appliances upon it, in a cupboard, and then decamped upstairs. That she might appear, if needful, with the greater dignity. If you please, ma'am, the gentleman would wish to see you," said Bitzer, with his light eye at Mrs. Sparsit's keyhole. So Mrs. Sparsit, who had improved the interval by touching up her cap, took her classical features downstairs again, and entered the boardroom in the manner of a Roman matron going outside the city walls to treat with an invading general. The visitor, having strolled to the window, and being then engaged in looking carelessly out, was as unmoved by this impressive entry as man could possibly be. He stood whistling to himself with all imaginable coolness, with his hat still on, and a certain air of exhaustion upon him, in part arising from excessive summer, and in part from excessive gentility. For it was to be seen with half an eye that he was a thorough gentleman, made to the model of the time, weary of everything, and putting no more faith in anything than Lucifer. I believe, sir," quoth Mrs. Sparsit, "you wished to see me." I beg your pardon," he said, turning and removing his hat. "Pray excuse me," <laughs> thought Mrs. Sparsit as she made a stately bend. Five and thirty. Good looking, good figure, good teeth, good voice, good breeding, well dressed, dark hair, bold eyes. All which Mrs. Sparsit observed in her womanly way, like the Sultan who put his head in the pail of water, merely in dipping down and coming up again. Please to be seated, sir," said Mrs. Sparsit. "Thank you. Allow me." He placed a chair for her. But remained himself carelessly lounging against the table. I left my servant at the railway looking after the luggage. 
very heavy train and vast quantity of it in the van, and strolled on looking about me. Exceedingly odd place. Will you allow me to ask if it's always as black as this? In general, much blacker, returned Mrs. Sparsit in her uncompromising way. Is it possible? Excuse me, you are not a native, I think. No, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsit. It was once my good, or ill fortune, as it may be, before I became a widow, to move in a very different sphere. My husband was a Powler. Beg your pardon, really, said the stranger. Was, Mrs. Sparsit repeated, a Powler. Powler family, said the stranger, after reflecting a few moments. Mrs. Sparsit signified assent. The stranger seemed a little more fatigued than before. You must be very much bored here, was the inference he drew from the communication. I am the servant of circumstances, sir, said Mrs. Sparsit, and I have long adapted myself to the governing power of my life. Very philosophical, returned the stranger, and very exemplary and laudable, and— It seemed to be scarcely worth his while to finish the sentence. So he played with his watch-chain wearily. "'May I be permitted to ask, sir,' said Mrs. Sparsit, "'to what I am indebted for the favour of—' "'Assuredly,' said the stranger, "'much obliged to you for reminding me. I am the bearer of a letter of introduction to Mr. Bounderby, the banker. Walking through this extraordinarily black town, while I was getting dinner ready at the hotel, I asked a fellow whom I met— one of the working people who seemed to have been taking a shower-bath of something fluffy, which I assumed to be the raw material. Mrs. Sparsit inclined her head. Raw material, where Mr. Bounderby, the banker, might reside. Upon which, misled, no doubt, by the word banker, he directed me to the bank. Fact being, I presume that Mr. Bounderby, the banker, does not reside in the edifice to which I have the honour of offering his explanation. No, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsit. He does not. Thank you. I had no intention of delivering my letter at the present moment, nor have I, but strolling on to the bank to kill time, and having the good fortune to observe at the window, towards which he languidly waved his hand, then slightly bowed, a lady of a very superior and agreeable appearance, I considered that I could not do better than take the liberty of asking that lady where Mr. Bounderby the banker does live, which I accordingly venture, with all suitable apologies, to do. The inattention and indolence of his manner were sufficiently relieved, to Mrs. Sparsett's thinking, by a certain gallantry at ease, which offered her homage too. Here he was, for instance, at this moment, all but sitting on the table and yet lazily bending over her, as if he acknowledged an attraction in her that made her charming, in her way. "'Banks, I know, are always suspicious, and officially must be,' said the stranger, whose lightness and smoothness of speech were pleasant likewise, suggesting matter far more sensible and humorous than it ever contained, which was perhaps a shrewd device of the founder of his numerous sect whosoever may have been that great man. Therefore, I may observe that my letter, here it is, is from the member for this place, Gradgrind, whom I have had the pleasure of knowing in London. Mrs. Sparsett recognized the hand, intimated that such confirmation was quite unnecessary, and gave Mr. Bounderby's address, with all needful clues and directions in aid. Thousand thanks, said the stranger. Of course, you know the banker well? Yes, sir, rejoined Mrs. Sparsett. In my dependent relation towards him, I have known him ten years. Quite an eternity. I think he married Gregorin's daughter? Yes, said Mrs. Sparsett, suddenly compressing her mouth. He had that honour. The lady is quite a philosopher, I am told. Indeed, sir, said Mrs. Sparsett. Is she? "'Excuse my impertinent curiosity,' pursued the stranger, fluttering over Mrs. Sparsett's eyebrows with a propitiatory air. "'But you know the family, and know the world. I am about to know the family, and may have much to do with them. Is the lady so very alarming? 
Her father gives her such a portentously hard-headed reputation that I have a burning desire to know. Is she absolutely unapproachable, repellently and stunningly clever? I see, by your meaning smile, you think not. You will pour balm into my anxious soul. As to age now, forty, five and thirty? Mrs. Sparsit laughed outright. Ha! A chit! said she. Not twenty when she was married. I give you my honour, Mrs. Powler, returned the stranger, detaching himself from the table, that I never was so astonished in my life. It really did seem to impress him, to the utmost extent of his capacity of being impressed. He looked at his informant for full a quarter of a minute, and appeared to have the surprise in his mind all the time. I assure you, Mrs. Powler, he then said, much exhausted, that the father's manner prepared me for a grim and stony maturity. I am obliged to you, of all things, for correcting so absurd a mistake. Pray excuse my intrusion. Many thanks. Good day. He bowed himself out, and Mrs. Sparsit, hiding in the window curtain, saw him languishing down the street on the shady side of the way, observed of all the town. What do you think of the gentleman bit, sir? She asked the light porter when he came to take away. Spends a deal of money on his dress, ma'am. It must be admitted, said Mrs. Sparsit, that it's very tasteful. Yes, ma'am, returned Bitter, if that's worth the money. Besides which, ma'am, resumed Bitter while he was polishing the table, looks to me as if he gamed. It's immoral to game, said Mrs. Sparsit. It's ridiculous, ma'am, said Bitter because the chances are against the players. Whether it was the heat that prevented Mrs. Sparsit from working, or whether it was that her hand was out, she did no work that night. She sat at the window when the sun began to sink behind the smoke. She sat there when the smoke was burning red, when the color faded from it, when darkness seemed to rise slowly out of the ground and creep upward, upward, up to the housetops, up to the church steeple, up to the summits of the factory chimneys, up to the sky. Without a candle in the room, Mrs. Sparsett sat at the window with her hands before her, not thinking much of the sounds of evening, the whooping of boys, the barking of dogs, the rumbling of wheels, the steps and voices of passengers, the shrill street cries the clogs upon the pavement when it was their hour for going by, the shutting up of shop shutters. Not until the light porter announced that her nocturnal sweetbread was ready did Mrs. Sparsett arouse herself from her reverie, and convey her dense black eyebrows, by that time creased with meditation as if they needed ironing out, upstairs. "'Oh, you fool!' said Mrs. Sparsett, when she was alone at her supper. Whom she meant she did not say, but she could scarcely have meant the sweetbread. The Gradgrind party wanted assistance in cutting the throats of the Graces. They went about recruiting, and where could they enlist recruits more hopefully than among the fine gentlemen who, having found out everything to be worth nothing, were equally ready for anything? Moreover, the healthy spirits who had mounted to this sublime height were attractive to many of the Gradgrind school. They liked fine gentlemen. They pretended that they did not, but they did. They became exhausted in imitation of them, and they yaw-yawed in their speech like them, and they served out, with an enervated air, the little moldy rations of political economy on which they regaled their disciples. There never before was seen on earth such a wonderful hybrid race as was thus produced. Among the fine gentlemen not regularly belonging to the Gradgrind school, there was one of a good family and a better appearance, with a happy turn of humor which had told immensely with the House of Commons on the occasion of his entertaining it with his and the board of directors' view of a railway accident, 
in which the most careful officers ever known, employed by the most liberal managers ever heard of, assisted by the finest mechanical contrivances ever devised, the whole in action on the best line ever constructed, had killed five people and wounded thirty-two, by a casualty without which the excellence of the whole system would have been positively incomplete. Among the slain was a cow, and among the scattered articles unowned, a widow's cap and the honorable member had so tickled the house, which has a delicate sense of humor, by putting the cap on the cow, that it became impatient of any serious reference to the coroner's inquest, and brought the railway off with cheers and laughter. Now this gentleman had a younger brother of still better appearance than himself, who had tried life as a cornet of dragoons, and found it a bore and had afterwards tried it in the train of an English minister abroad, and found it a bore, and had then strolled to Jerusalem, and got bored there, and had then gone yachting about the world, and got bored everywhere. To whom this honorable and jocular member fraternally said one day, Jem, there's a good opening among the hard fact fellows, and they want men. I wonder you don't go in for statistics. Jem, rather taken by the novelty of the idea, and very hard up for a change, was as ready to go in for statistics as for anything else. So he went in. He coached himself up with a blue book or two, and his brother put it about among the hard fact fellows, and said, If you want to bring in, for any place, a handsome dog who can make you a devilish good speech. Look after my brother Jem, for he's your man. After a few dashes in the public meeting way, Mr. Gradgrind and a council of political sages approved of Jem, and it was resolved to send him down to Cogetown to become known there and in the neighborhood. Hence the letter Jem had last night shown to Mrs. Sparsit, which Mr. Bounderby now held in his hand, circumscribed, Josiah Bounderby, Esquire, Banker, Coketown, specially to introduce James Harthouse, Esquire, Thomas Gradgrind. Within an hour of the receipt of this dispatch and Mr. James Harthouse's card, Mr. Bounderby put on his hats and went down to the hotel. There he found Mr. James Harthouse looking out of a window, in a state of mind so disconsolate that he was already half disposed to go in for something else. "'My name, sir,' said his visitor, "'is Josiah Bounderby of Corktown.' Mr. James Harthouse was very happy indeed, though he scarcely looked so, to have a pleasure he had long expected. "'Corktown, sir,' said Bounderby, obstinately taking a chair, is not the kind of place you have been accustomed to. Therefore, if you will allow me, or whether you will or not, for I am a plain man, I'll tell you something about it before we go any further. Mr. Harthouse would be charmed. Don't be too sure of that, said Mr. Bounderby. I don't promise it. First of all, you see our smoke. That's meat and drink to us. It's the healthiest thing in the world in all respects, and particularly for the lungs. If you're one of those who want us to consume it, I differ from you. We're not going to wear the bottoms of our boilers out any faster than we wear them out now, for all unbugging sentiment in Great Britain and Ireland. By way of going in to the fullest extent, Mr. Harthouse rejoined, Mr. Bounderby, I assure you I am entirely and completely of your way of thinking, on conviction. I am glad to hear it, said Bounderby. Now, you have heard a lot of talk about the work in our mills, no doubt. You have? Very good. I'll state the fact of it to you. It's the pleasantest work there is, and it's the lightest work there is, and it's the best paid work there is. More than that, we couldn't improve the mills themselves unless we laid down turkey carpets on the floors, which we're not a-going to do. 
Mr. Bounderby perfectly right. Lastly, said Bounderby, as to our hands, there is not a hand in this town, sir, man, woman, or child, but has one ultimate object in life. That object is to be fed on turtle soup and venison with a gold spoon. Now they're not a-going, none of them, ever to be fed on turtle soup and venison with a gold spoon. Now you know the place. Mr. Harthouse professed himself in the highest degree instructed and refreshed by this condensed epitome of the whole Coketown question. Why, you see, replied Mr. Bounderby, it suits my disposition to have a full understanding with a man, particularly with a public man, when I make his acquaintance. I have only one thing more to say to you, Mr. Harthouse, before assuring you of the pleasure with which I shall respond, to the utmost of my poor ability, to my friend Tom Gradgrind's letter of introduction. You are a man of family. Don't you deceive yourself by supposing for a moment that I am a man of family. I am a bit of dirty riff-raff, and a genuine scrap of rag, tag, and bobtail. If anything could have exalted Jem's interest in Mr. Bounderby, it would have been this very circumstance. Or so he told him. So now, said Bounderby, we may shake hands on equal terms. I say equal terms, because although I know what I am, and the exact depth of the gutter I have lifted myself out of, better than any man does. I am as proud as you are. I am just as proud as you are. Having now asserted my independence in a proper manner, I may come to how do you find yourself, and I hope you're pretty well. The better, Mr. Harthouse gave him to understand, as they shook hands, for the salubrious air of Coketown. Mr. Bounderby received the answer with favour. "'Perhaps you know,' said he. "'Oh, perhaps you don't know. I married Tom Gradgrind's daughter. If you have nothing better to do than to walk up town with me, I shall be glad to introduce you to Tom Gradgrind's daughter.' "'Mr. Bounderby,' said Jem, "'you anticipate my dearest wishes.' They went out without further discourse and Mr. Bounderby piloted the new acquaintance, who so strongly contrasted with him, to the private red-brick dwelling, with the black outside shutters, the green inside blinds, and the black street door up the two white steps. In the drawing-room of which mansion there presently entered to them the most remarkable girl Mr. James Hardhouse had ever seen. She was so constrained, and yet so careless, so reserved, and yet so watchful, so cold and proud, and yet so sensitively ashamed of her husband's braggart humility, from which she shrunk as if every example of it were a cut or a blow, that it was quite a new sensation to observe. In face she was no less remarkable than in manner. Her features were handsome, but their natural play was so locked up that it seemed impossible to guess at their genuine expression. Utterly indifferent, perfectly self-reliant, never at a loss, and yet never at her ease, with her figure in company with them there, and her mind apparently quite alone. It was of no use going in yet a while to comprehend this girl, for she baffled all penetration. From the mistress of the house the visitor glanced to the house itself. There was no mute sign of a woman in the room. No graceful little adornment, no fanciful little device, however trivial, anywhere expressed her influence. Cheerless and comfortless, boastfully and doggedly rich, there the room stared at its present occupants unsoftened and unrelieved by the least trace of any womanly occupation. As Mr. Bounderby stood in the midst of his household goods, so those unrelenting divinities occupied their places around Mr. Bounderby, and they were worthy of one another, and well matched. This, sir, said Bounderby, is my wife, Mrs. Bounderby, Tom Gradgrind's eldest daughter. 
"'Lou, Mr. James Arthouse. "'Mr. Arthouse has joined your father's muster-roll. "'If he is not Tom Gradgrind's colleague before long, "'I believe we shall at least hear of him "'in connection with one of our neighbouring towns. "'You observe, Mr. Arthouse, that my wife is my junior. "'I don't know what she saw in me to marry me, "'but she saw something in me, I suppose, "'or she wouldn't have married me. "'She has lots of expensive knowledge, sir, "'political and otherwise. "'If you want to cram for anything, "'I should be troubled to recommend you "'to a better adviser than Lou Bounderby. "'To a more agreeable adviser, "'or one from whom he would be more likely to learn, "'Mr. Harthouse could never be recommended.' "'Come,' said his host, "'if you're in the complimentary line, "'you'll get on here, "'for you'll meet with no competition.' "'I've never been in the way of learning compliments myself, "'and I don't profess to understand the art of paying them. "'In fact, despise them. "'But your bricking up was different from mine. "'Mine was a real thing, by George. "'You're a gentleman, and I don't pretend to be one. "'I am Josiah Bounderby of Corktown, and that's enough for me. "'However, though I am not influenced by manners and station, "'Lou Bounderby may be. She hadn't my advantages. Disadvantages, you would call them, but I call them advantages. So you'll not waste your power, I dare say. Mr. Bounderby, said Jem, turning with a smile to Louisa, is a noble animal in a comparatively natural state, quite free from the harness in which a conventional hack like myself works. You respect Mr. Bounderby very much, she quietly returned. It is natural that you should. He was disgracefully thrown out for a gentleman who had seen so much of the world, and thought, Now, how am I to take this? You are going to devote yourself, as I gather from what Mr. Bounderby has said, to the service of your country. You have made up your mind, said Louisa, still standing before him where she had first stopped, in all the singular contrariety of her self-possession, and her being obviously very ill at ease. To show the nation the way out of all its difficulties. Mrs. Bounderby, <laughs> he returned, laughing. Upon my honour, no, I will make no such pretence to you. I have seen a little, here and there, up and down. I have found it all to be very worthless, as everybody has, and as some confess they have, and some do not. And I am going in for your respected father's opinions. "'really because I have no choice of opinions, "'and may as well back them as anything else.' "'Have you none of your own?' asked Louisa. "'I have not so much as the slightest predilection left. "'I assure you I attach not the least importance to any opinions. "'The result of the varieties of boredom I have undergone "'is a conviction, unless conviction is too industrious a word "'for the lazy sentiment I entertain on the subject.' that any set of ideas will do just as much good as any other set, and just as much harm as any other set. There's an English family with a charming Italian motto. What will be, will be. It's the only truth going. The vicious assumption of honesty in dishonesty, a vice so dangerous, so deadly, and so common, seemed, he observed, a little to impress her in his favour. He followed up the advantage, by saying in his pleasantest manner, a manner to which she might attach as much or as little meaning as she pleased, The side that can prove anything in the line of units, tens, hundreds, and thousands, Mrs. Bounderby, seems to me to afford the most fun, and to give a man the best chance. I am quite as much attached to it as if I believed it. I am quite as ready to go in for it to the same extent as if I believed it. And what more could I possibly do if I did believe it? "'You are a singular politician,' said Louisa. "'Pardon me, I have not even that merit. "'We are the largest party in the state, I assure you, Mrs. Bounderby. "'If we all fell out of our adopted ranks and were reviewed together.' "'Mr. Bounderby, who had been in danger of bursting in silence, "'interposed here with a project for postponing the family dinner till half-past six, "'and taking Mr. James Harthouse in the meantime, on a round of visits to the voting and interesting notabilities of Coketown and its vicinity. 
the round of visits was made, and Mr. James Harthouse, with a discreet use of his blue coaching, came off triumphantly, though with a considerable accession of boredom. In the evening he found the dinner-table laid for four, but they sat down only three. It was an appropriate occasion for Mr. Bounderby to discuss the flavor of the haperth of stewed eels he had purchased in the streets at eight years old, and also of the inferior water, specially used for laying in the dust, with which he had washed down that repast. He likewise entertained his guest over the soup and fish, with the calculation that he, Bounderby, had eaten in his youth at least three horses under the guise of Polonies and Savaloys. These recitals, Jem, in a languid manner, received with charming every now and then, and they probably would have decided him to go in for Jerusalem again to-morrow morning, had he been less curious respecting Louisa. Is there nothing? he thought, glancing at her as she sat at the head of the table, where her youthful figure, small and slight, but very graceful, looked as pretty as it looked misplaced. Is there nothing that will move that face? Yes, by Jupiter there was something, and here it was, in an unexpected shape. Tom appeared. She changed as the door opened, and broke into a beaming smile. A beautiful smile. Mr. James Harthouse might not have thought so much of it, but that he had wondered so long at her impassive face. She put out her hand, a pretty little soft hand, and her fingers closed upon her brother's as if she would have carried them to her lips. Ay, ay, thought the visitor. This whelp is the only creature she cares for. So, so. The whelp was presented, and took his chair. The appellation was not flattering, but not unmerited. "'When I were your age, young Tom,' said Barnaby, "'I was punctual, or I got no dinner.' "'When you were my age,' resumed Tom, "'you hadn't a wrong balance to get right, and hadn't to dress afterwards.' "'Never mind that now,' said Barnaby. "'Well, then,' grumbled Tom, don't begin with me. Mrs. Bounderby, said Harthouse, perfectly hearing this understrain as it went on, your brother's face is quite familiar to me. Can I have seen him abroad? Or at some public school, perhaps? No, she resumed, quite interested. He has never been abroad yet, and was educated here at home. Tom, love, I am telling Mr. Harthouse that he never saw you abroad. No such luck, sir, said Tom. There was little enough in him to brighten her face, for he was a sullen young fellow, and ungracious in his manner, even to her. So much the greater must have been the solitude of her heart, and her need of some one on whom to bestow it. So much the more is this whelp the only creature she has ever cared for, thought Mr. James Harthouse, turning it over and over. So much the more, so much the more. Both in his sister's presence, and after she had left the room, the whelp took no pains to hide his contempt for Mr. Bounderby, whenever he could indulge it without the observation of that independent man, by making wry faces or shutting one eye. Without responding to these telegraphic communications, Mr. Harthouse encouraged him much in the course of the evening and showed an unusual liking for him. At last, when he rose to return to his hotel, and was a little doubtful whether he knew the way by night, the whelp immediately proffered his services as a guide, and turned out with him to escort him thither. It is very remarkable that a young gentleman who had been brought up under one continuous system of unnatural restraint should be a hypocrite but it was certainly the case with Tom. It was very strange that a young gentleman who had never been left to his own guidance for five consecutive minutes should be incapable at last of governing himself, but so it was with Tom. 
It was altogether unaccountable that a young gentleman whose imagination had been strangled in his cradle should still be inconvenienced by its ghost in the form of groveling sensualities. But such a monster, beyond all doubt, was Tom. "'Do you smoke?' asked Mr. James Harthouse, when they came to the hotel. "'I believe you,' said Tom. He could do no less than ask Tom up, and Tom could do no less than go up. What with a cooling drink adapted to the weather, but not so weak as cool, and what with a rarer tobacco than was to be bought in those parts, Tom was soon in a highly free and easy state at his end of the sofa, and more than ever disposed to admire his new friend at the other end. Tom blew his smoke aside, after he had been smoking a little while, and took an observation of his friend. "'He don't seem to care about his dress,' thought Tom. "'And yet how capitally he does it! What an easy swell he is!' Mr. James Harthouse, happening to catch Tom's eye, remarked that he drank nothing, and filled his glass with his own negligent hand. "'Thank you,' said Tom. "'Thank you. Well, Mr. Harthouse, I hope you have had about a dose of old Bounderby tonight.' Tom said this with one eye shut up again, and looking over his glass knowingly at his entertainer. "'A very good fellow indeed.' returned Mr. James Harthouse. "'You think so, don't you?' said Tom, and shut up his eye again. Mr. James Harthouse smiled, and rising from his end of the sofa, and lounging with his back against the chimney-piece, so that he stood before the empty fire-grate as he smoked, in front of Tom, and looking down at him, observed, "'What a comical brother-in-law you are!' "'What a comical brother-in-law old Bounderby is, I think you mean,' said Tom. "'You are a piece of caustic, Tom,' retorted Mr. James Harthouse. There was something so very agreeable in being so intimate with such a waistcoat, in being called Tom in such an intimate way by such a voice, in being on such off-hand terms so soon with such a pair of whiskers, that Tom was uncommonly pleased with himself. "'Oh, I don't care for old Bounderby,' said he, "'if you mean that. I have always called old Bounderby by the same name when I have talked about him, and I have always thought of him in the same way. I'm not going to begin to be polite now about old Bounderby. We'll be rather late in the day.' "'Don't mind me,' returned James. "'But take care when his wife is by, you know.' "'His wife?' said Tom. "'My sister Lou? Oh, yes!' <laughs> and he laughed, and took a little more of the cooling drink. James Harthouse continued to lounge in the same place and attitude, smoking his cigar in his own easy way, and looking pleasantly at the whelp, as if he knew himself to be a kind of agreeable demon, who had only to hover over him, and he must give up his whole soul if required. It certainly did seem that the wealth yielded to his influence. He looked at his companion sneakingly, he looked at him admiringly, he looked at him boldly, and put up one leg on the sofa. "'My sister Lou,' said Tom, "'she never cared for old Bounderby.' "'That's the past tense, Tom,' returned Mr. James Harthouse, striking the ash from his cigar with his little finger. "'We are in the present tense now.' Verb neuter, not to care. Indicative mood, present tense, first person singular, I do not care. Second person singular, thou dost not care. Third person singular, she does not care. Returned Tom. Very good, very quaint, said his friend. Though you don't mean it. But I do mean it, cried Tom. Upon my honour, why, you won't tell me, Mr. Harthouse, that you really suppose my sister Lou does care for old Bounderby? My dear fellow, returned the other, what am I bound to suppose when I find two married people living in harmony and happiness? Tom had by this time got both his legs on the sofa. If his second leg had not been already there when he was called a dear fellow, he would have put it up at that great stage of the conversation. 
Feeling it necessary to do something then, he stretched himself out at greater length, and, reclining with the back of his head on the end of the sofa, and smoking with an infinite assumption of negligence, turned his common face, and not too sober eyes, towards the face looking down upon him so carelessly yet so potently. "'You know our governor, Mr. Hothouse,' said Tom. "'And therefore you needn't be surprised that Lou married old Bounderby. She never had a lover, and the governor proposed old Bounderby, and she took him. "'Very dutiful in your interesting sister,' said Mr. James Harthouse. "'Yes, but she wouldn't have been as dutiful, and it would not have come off as easily,' returned the whelp. "'If it hadn't been for me.' The tempter merely lifted his eyebrows, but the whelp was obliged to go on. "'I persuaded her,' he said. "'I was stuck into old Bounderby's bank, where I never wanted to be. And I knew I should get into scrapes there if she put old Bounderby's pipe out. So I told her my wishes, and she came into them. She would do anything for me. It was very game of her, wasn't it? It was charming, Tom. Not that it was altogether so important to her as it was to me, continued Tom coolly, because my liberty and comfort, and perhaps my getting on, depended on it. She had no other lover. Staying at home was like staying in jail, especially when I was gone. It wasn't as if she gave up another lover for old Bounderby. But still, it was a good thing in her. Perfectly delightful, and she gets on so placidly. Oh, returned Tom, with contemptuous patronage. She's a regular girl. Girl can get on anywhere. She has settled down to the life. She don't mind. It does just as well as any other. Besides, though Lou is a girl, she's not a common sort of girl. She can shut herself up within herself and think, as I often known her sit and watch the fire for an hour at a stretch. Ay, ay, has resources of her own, said Harthouse, smoking quietly. Not as much of that as you may suppose, returned Tom, for our Governor had a crown with all sort of dry bones and sawdust. It's his system. Formed his daughter on his own model, suggested Harthouse. His daughter and everybody else. Why, he formed me that way, said Tom. Impossible. He did, though, said Tom, shaking his head. I mean to say, Mr. Harthouse, when I first left home and went to old Bounderby's, I was as flat as a warming pan, and you know more about life than any oyster does. Come, Tom, I can hardly believe that. A joke's a joke. Upon my soul, said the whelp. I am serious. I am indeed. He smoked with great gravity and dignity for a little while, and then added, in a highly complacent tone, Oh, I have picked up a little since. I don't deny that. But I have done it myself, you know, thanks to the governor. And your intelligent sister? My intelligent sister is about where she was. She used to complain to me that she had nothing to fall back upon, that girls usually fall back upon, and I don't see how she is to have got over that since. But she don't mind. He sagaciously added, puffing at his cigar again. Girls can always get on, somehow. Calling at the bank yesterday evening for Mr. Bounderby's address, I found an ancient lady there who seemed to entertain great admiration for your sister, observed Mr. James Harthouse, throwing away the last small remnant of the cigar he had now smoked out. Mother Sparset, said Tom. What, you've seen her already, have you? His friend nodded. Tom took his cigar out of his mouth to shut up his eye, which had grown rather unmanageable, with the greater expression, and to tap his nose several times with his finger. Mother Sparsa's feeling for Lou is more than admiration, I should think, said Tom. Say, affection and devotion. Mother Sparsa never said her cap at Bounderby when he was a bachelor. Oh, no. These were the last words spoken by the whelp before a giddy drowsiness came upon him.
followed by complete oblivion. He was roused from the latter state by an uneasy dream of being stirred up with a boot, and also of a voice saying, "'Come, it's late. Be off.' "'Well,' he said, scrambling from the sofa, "'I, I must take my leave of you, though, I say. Yours is a very good tobacco. But it's too mild.' "'Yes, it's too mild,' returned his entertainer. "'It's... It's uh, ridiculously mild," said Tom. Where, where's the door? Good night. He had had another dream of being taken by a waiter through a mist, which, after giving him some trouble and difficulty, resolved itself into the main street, in which he stood alone. He then walked home pretty easily, though not yet free from an impression of the presence and influence of his new friend as if he were lounging somewhere in the air, in the same negligent attitude, regarding him with the same look. The whelp went home and went to bed. If he had had any sense of what he had done that night, and had been less of a whelp and more of a brother, he might have turned short on the road, might have gone down through the ill-smelling river that was dyed black, might have gone to bed in it for good and all and have curtained his head forever with its filthy waters. Oh, my friends, the downtrodden operatives of Coketown! Oh, my friends and fellow countrymen, the slaves of an iron-handed and grinding despotism! Oh, my friends and fellow sufferers, and fellow workmen, and fellow men! I tell you that the hour is come when we must rally round one another as one united power and crumble into dust the oppressors that too long have battened upon the plunder of our families, upon the sweat of our brows, upon the labor of our hands, upon the strength of our sinews, upon the God-created glorious rights of humanity and upon the holy and eternal privileges of brotherhood. Good. Good. Here, here, here. Hurrah. Hurrah. And other cries arose in many voices from various parts of the densely crowded and suffocatingly close hall, in which the orator, perched on a stage, delivered himself of this and what other froth and fume he had in him, he had declaimed himself in a violent heat, and was as hoarse as he was hot. By dint of roaring at the top of his voice under a flaring gaslight, clenching his fists, knitting his brows, setting his teeth, and pounding with his arms, he had taken so much out of himself by this time that he was brought to a stop and called for a glass of water. As he stood there, trying to quench his fiery face with his drink of water, the comparison between the orator and the crowd of attentive faces turned towards him was extremely to his disadvantage. Judging him by nature's evidence, he was above the mass in very little but the stage on which he stood. In many great respects he was essentially below them. He was not so honest, he was not so manly, he was not so good-humoured. He substituted cunning for their simplicity, and passion for their safe, solid sense. An ill-made, high-shouldered man, with lowering brows, and his features crushed into an habitually sour expression, he contrasted most unfavourably, even in his mongrel dress, with the great body of his hearers in their plain working clothes. Strange as it always is to consider any assembly in the act of submissively resigning itself to the dreariness of some complacent person, lord or commoner, whom three-fourths of it could, by no human means, raise out of the slough of inanity to their own intellectual level, it was particularly strange, and it was even particularly affecting, to see this crowd of earnest faces, whose honesty in the main no competent observer free from bias could doubt, 
so agitated by such a leader. Good! Hear, hear! Hurrah! The eagerness both of attention and intention, exhibited in all the countenances, made them a most impressive sight. There was no carelessness, no languor, no idle curiosity, none of the many shades of indifference to be seen in all other assemblies visible for one moment there. That every man felt his condition to be, somehow or other, worse than it might be, that every man considered it incumbent on him to join the rest towards the making of it better, that every man felt his only hope to be in his allying himself to the comrades by whom he was surrounded, and that in this belief, right or wrong, unhappily wrong then, the whole of that crowd were gravely, deeply, faithfully in earnest, must have been as plain to any one who chose to see what was there as the bare beams of the roof and the whitened brick walls nor could any such spectator fail to know in his breast that these men, through their very delusions, showed great qualities, susceptible of being turned into the happiest and best account, and that to pretend, on the strength of sweeping axioms, howsoever cut and dried, that they went astray wholly without cause, and of their own irrational wills, was to pretend that there could be smoke without fire, death without birth, harvest without seed, anything or everything produced from nothing. The orator, having refreshed himself, wiped his corrugated forehead from left to right several times with his handkerchief folded into a pad, and concentrated all his revived forces in a sneer of great disdain and bitterness. But, O oh, my friends and brothers, O oh, men and Englishmen, the downtrodden operatives of Coketown, what shall we say of that man, that working man, that I should find it necessary so to libel the glorious name, who, being practically and well acquainted with the grievances and wrongs of you, the injured pith and marrow of this land, and having heard you, with a noble and majestic unanimity that will make tyrants tremble, resolve for to subscribe to the funds of the United Aggregate Tribunal, and to abide by the injunctions issued by that body for your benefit, whatever they may be. What, I ask you, will you say of that working man, since such I must acknowledge him to be? who at such a time deserts his post and sells his flag, who at such a time turns a traitor and a craven and a recreant, who at such a time is not ashamed to make to you the dastardly and humiliating avowal that he will hold himself aloof and will not be one of those associated in the gallant stand for freedom and for right. The assembly was divided at this point. There were some groans and hisses, but the general sense of honor was much too strong for the condemnation of a man unheard. Be sure you're right, Slackbridge. Put him up. Let's hear him. Such things were said on many sides. Finally, one strong voice called out, Is the man here? If the man's here, Slackbridge, let's hear the man himself instead of you which was received with a round of applause. Slackbridge, the orator, looked about him with a withering smile, and holding out his right hand at arm's length, as the manner of all Slackbridges is, to still the thundering sea, waited until there was a profound silence. Oh, my friends and fellow men, said Slackbridge then, shaking his head with violent scorn, I do not wonder that you, the prostrate sons of labor, are incredulous of the existence of such a man. But he who sold his birthright for a mess of pottage existed, and Judas Iscariot existed, and Castlereagh existed, and this man exists. Here a brief press and confusion near the stage ended in the man himself standing at the orator's side before the concourse. 
He was pale and a little moved in the face. His lips especially showed it. But he stood quiet, with his left hand at his chin, waiting to be heard. There was a chairman to regulate the proceedings, and this functionary now took the case into his own hands. "'My friends,' said he, "'by virtue of my office as your president, I ask of our friend Slackbridge, who may be a little over in this business, to take his seat. Was this man, Stephen Blackpool, is here? You all know this man, Stephen Blackpool. You know him along his misfortunes and his good name. With that, the chairman shook him frankly by the hand and sat down again. Slackbridge likewise sat down, wiping his hot forehead, always from left to right, and never the reverse way. My friends, Stephen began, in the midst of a dead calm. I heard what's been spoken to me, and tis likely I shan't mend it. For Rayford had heard the truth concerning myself, from my lips, than from any other mons. Though I never could speak afore some money without being moidered and muddled. Slackbridge shook his head as if he would shake it off in his bitterness. I'm one single hand in Bounderby's mill, o'er the men there, as don't come in with proposed regulations. I canna come in with em, my friends. I doubt they're doing you any good. Likely they'll do yet. Slackbridge laughed, folded his arms, and frowned sarcastically. But it ain't so much for that as I stand out. If that were all, I'd come in with rest. But I have reasons, mine, you see, for being hindered. Not only now, but allers, allers, lifelong. Slackbridge jumped up and stood beside him, gnashing and tearing. Oh, my friends, what but this did I tell you? Oh, my fellow countrymen, what warning but this did I give you? And how shows this recreant conduct in a man on whom unequal laws are known to have fallen heavy? Oh, you Englishmen, I ask you, how does this subination show in one of yourselves? who is thus consenting to his own undoing and to yours, and to your children's and your children's children's. There was some applause and some crying of shame upon the man, but the greater part of the audience were quiet. They looked at Stephen's worn face, rendered more pathetic by the homely emotions it evinced, and in the kindness of their nature they were more sorry than indignant. "'Tis the delegate's trade for speak,' said Stephen. "'And he's paid for it, and he knows his work. Let him keep to it. Let him give no heed to our eye up at Burr. That's not for him. That's not for nobody but me.' There was a propriety, not to say a dignity, in these words, that made the hearers yet more quiet and attentive. The strong voice called out, "'Slackbridge, let the man be here, and hold thee tongue.' Then. The place was wonderfully still. My brothers, said Stephen, whose low voice was distinctly heard, and my fellow workmen, for that you are to me, though nor as I knows unto this delegate here, I have but a word to say, and I could send no more if I were to speak till strike a day. I know weel or what's afore me. I know weel that you are resolved to no more ado wi a man who is nout wi you in this matter. I know weel that I was lying perished it road, you'd feel it right to pass me by, as a foreigner and stranger. What I a I mun make best on. Stephen Blackpool, said the chairman, rising. Think on it again. Think on it once again, lad, afore thou art shunned by our old friends. There was an universal murmur to the same effect, though no man articulated a word. Every eye was fixed on Stephen's face. To repent of his determination would be to take a load from all their minds. He looked around him and knew that it was so. Not a grain of anger with them was in his heart. He knew them, far below their surface weaknesses and misconceptions, as no one but their fellow laborer could. I have thought on it above a bit, sir. I simply cannot come in. 
I mun go ways lazy for me. I mun take me leave o' all here. He made a sort of reverence to them by holding up his arms, and stood for the moment in that attitude, not speaking until they slowly dropped at his sides. Mon is the pleasant word as some here have spoken with me. Mon is the face I see here, as I first seen when I was young and lighter-hearted than now. I never had no frats before, so never I were born, with any of me like. Gone all's I have none now that's making you call me a traitor in that. You I mean to say. Addressing Slackbridge. What's easier to call the mech out, so let be. He had moved away a pace or two to come down from the platform, when he remembered something he had not said, and returned again. Applet, he said, turning his furrowed face slowly about, that he might as it were individually address the whole audience, those both near and distant. Aptly, when this question has been taken up and discussed, there'll be a threat to turn out if I'm let to work among you. I hope I shall de ere ever such a time comes, and I shall work solitary among you unless it comes. Truly I'm undo it, my friends, not to brave you, but to live. I am no but work to live by, and wherever can I go? I who has work sinner when no height at all in Coke Town here. I make no complaints of being turned to away or being outcasting and overlooking from this time forward, for hope I shall be let to work. If there's any right for me at all, my friends, I think tis that. Not a word was spoken. Not a sound was audible in the building but the slight rustle of men moving a little apart, all along the centre of the room, to open a means of passing out to the man with whom they had all bound themselves to renounce companionship. Looking at no one, and going his way with a lowly steadiness upon him that asserted nothing and sought nothing, old Stephen, with all his troubles on his head, left the scene. Then Slackbridge, who had kept his oratorical arm extended during the going out, as if he were repressing with infinite solicitude, and by a wonderful moral power, the vehement passions of the multitude, applied himself to raising their spirits. Had not the Roman Brutus, O oh my British countrymen, condemned his son to death, and had not the Spartan mothers, O oh my soon-to-be victorious friends, driven their flying children on the points of their enemies' swords. Then was it not the sacred duty of the men of Coketown, with forefathers before them, an admiring world in company with them, and a posterity to come after them, to hurl out traitors from the tents they had pitched in a sacred and a godlike cause? The winds of heaven answered yes, and bore yes, east, west, north and south, and consequently three cheers for the United Aggregate Tribunal. Slackbridge acted as a fugleman, and gave the time. The multitude of doubtful faces, a little conscience-stricken, brightened at the sound and took it up. Private feeling must yield to the common cause. Hurrah! The roof yet vibrated with the cheering when the assembly dispersed. Thus easily did Stephen Blackpool fall into the loneliest of lives, the life of solitude among a familiar crowd, the stranger in the land who looks into ten thousand faces for some answering look and never finds it, is in cheering society as compared with him who passes ten averted faces daily that were once the countenances of friends. Such experience was to be Stephen's now, in every waking moment of his life, at his work, on his way to it and from it, at his door, at his window, everywhere. By general consent they even avoided that side of the street on which he habitually walked, and left it, of all the working men, to him only. He had been for many years a quiet, silent man, associating but little with other men, and used to companionship with his own thoughts. 
He had never known before the strength of the want in his heart for the frequent recognition of a nod, a look, a word, or the immense amount of relief that had been poured into it by drops through such small means. It was even harder than he could have believed possible to separate in his own conscience his abandonment by all his fellows from a baseless sense of shame and disgrace. The first four days of his endurance were days so long and heavy that he began to be appalled by the prospect before him. Not only did he see no Rachel all the time, but he avoided every chance of seeing her, for although he knew that the prohibition did not yet formally extend to the women working in the factories, he found that some of them with whom he was acquainted were changed to him, and he feared to try others and dreaded that Rachel might even be singled out from the rest if she were seen in his company. So he had been quite alone during the four days, and had spoken to no one, when, as he was leaving his work at night, a young man of a very light complexion accosted him in the street. "'Your name's Blackpool, and it?' said the young man. Stephen colored to find himself with his hat in his hand in his gratitude for being spoken to, or in the suddenness of it, or both. He made a feint of adjusting the lining, and said, Yes. You are their hand they have sent to Coventry, I mean, said Bitzer, the very light young man in question. Stephen answered, Yes. Again. I supposed so, from their all appearing to keep away from you. Mr. Bounderby wants to speak to you. You know his house, don't you? Stephen said, Yes. Again. Then go straight up there, will you? Said Bitzer. You're expected and have only to tell the servant it's you. I belong to the bank, so if you go straight up without me, I, I was sent to fetch you. Then you'll save me a walk. Stephen, whose way had been in the contrary direction, turned about and betook himself, as in duty bound, to the red brick castle of the giant Bounderby. "'Well, Stephen,' said Bounderby, in his windy manner, "'what's this I hear? What have these pests of the earth been doing to you? Come in and speak up.' It was into the drawing-room that he was thus bidden. A tea-table was set out, and Mr. Bounderby's young wife, and her brother, and a great gentleman from London were present to whom Stephen made his obeisance, closing the door and standing near it, with his hat in his hand. "'This is the man I was telling you about, Harthouse,' said Mr. Bounderby. The gentleman he addressed, who was talking to Mrs. Bounderby on the sofa, got up, saying in an indolent way, "'Oh, really?' and dawdled to the hearth-rug where Mr. Bounderby stood. "'Now,' said Bounderby, "'speak up. After the four days he had passed, this address fell rudely and discordantly on Stephen's ear. Besides being a rough handling of his wounded mind, it seemed to assume that he really was the self-interested deserter he had been called. "'What were it, sir?' said Stephen. "'As you were pleased to want with me.' "'Why, I've told you,' returned Bounderby. "'Speak up like a man, since you are a man, and tell us about yourself and this combination.' "'With your pardon, sir,' said Stephen Blackpool, "'I am not to send about it.' Mr. Bounderby, who was always more or less like a wind, finding something in his way here, began to blow at it directly. "'Now look here, Harthouse,' said he, "'here's a specimen of them. When this man was here once before, I warned this man against the mischievous strangers who are always about, and who ought to be hanged wherever they are found, and I told this man that he was going in the wrong direction. Now would you believe it that although they've put this mark upon him, he's such a slave to them still, that he's afraid to open his lips about them? I said they had no to send about it, sir, nor as I were fearful of opening my lips. You said— I know what you said. More than that, I know what you mean, you see. Not always the same thing, by the Lord Harry. Quite different things. You had better tell us at once that that fellow Slackbridge is not in the town stirring up the people to mutiny, 
and that he is not a regular qualified leader of the people, that is a most confounded scoundrel. You'd better tell us so at once. You can't deceive me. You want to tell us so. Why don't you? I'm as sorry as you are, sir, when people's leader is bad, said Stephen, shaking his head. They take such as offers. Happily, tis the smallest of their misfortunes when they can get no better. The wind began to get boisterous. Now you'll think this pretty well, Harthouse, said Mr. Bounderby. You'll think this is tolerably strong. You'll say, upon my soul, that this is a tidy specimen of what my friends have to deal with. But this is nothing, sir. You shall hear me ask this man a question. Pray, Mr. Blackpool, may I take the liberty of asking you how it happens that you refuse to be in this combination? How it happens? Ah, said Mr. Bounderby, with his thumbs in the arms of his coat, and jerking his head and shutting his eyes in confidence with the opposite wall. How it happens? A life for not come to it, sir. But sin as you ask question, and I'll not want it be ill-mannered, I'll answer. I have passed a promise. Not to me, you know, said Bounderby. Gusty weather with deceitful calms, one now prevailing. Oh, no, sir, not to you. As for me, any consideration for me has had just nothing at all to do with it, said Bounderby, still in confidence with the wall. If only Josiah Bounderby of Corktown had been in question, you would have joined and made no bones about it. Why, yes, sir, it is true. Though he knows, said Mr. Bounderby, now blowing a gale, that there are a set of rascals and rebels whom transportation is too good for. Now, Mr. Arthouse, you've been knocking about the world some time. Did you ever meet with anything like that man out of this blessed country? Nay, nee, ma'am, said Stephen Blackpool, staunchly protesting against the words that had been used, and instinctively addressing himself to Louisa, after glancing at her face. Not rebels, nor yet rascals. No tick kind, ma'am, no tick kind. They've not done me a kindness, ma'am, as I know and feel. But there's not a dozen men amongst them, ma'am, a dozen, not six, but what believes he has done his duty by rest and by his cell. God forbid as I as has known, as had the experience of these men all my life, I as has eaten and drunken with em, and seaten with em when I'm toiling with em, and loving em, should fail for to stand by em with truth, let em who has done to me what they may. He spoke with the rugged earnestness of his place and character, deepened perhaps by a proud consciousness that he was faithful to his class under all their mistrust. But he fully remembered where he was, and did not even raise his voice. No, ma'am, no. They're true to one another, faithful to one another, affectionate to one another, into death. Be poor amongst them, sick amongst them, grieve amongst them, only the money causes that carries grief to the poor man's door, and they'll be tender with you, gentle with you, comfortable with you, christened with you. Be sure of that, ma'am. They'll be riven to bits ere ever they be different. In short, said Mr. Bounderby, it's because they're so full of virtues that they've turned you adrift. Go through with it while you're about it. Out with it. Oh, it is, ma'am resumed Stephen, appearing still to find his natural refuge in Louisa's face. That what is best in us folk seems to turn us most to trouble and misfortune and mistake, I don't know, but tis so. I know it is, as an oath heavens above me ain't smoke. We're patient too, and want in general to do right, and I kind of think the fault is all we us. Now, my friend, said Mr. Bounderby, whom he could not have exasperated more, quite unconscious of it though he was, than by seeming to appeal to any one else. If you will favour me with your attention for half a minute, I should like to have a word or two with you. You said just now that you had nothing to tell us about this business. You're quite sure of that before we go any further? Sir, I'm sure on it. Here's a gentleman from London present. Mr. Bounderby made a back-handed point at Mr. James Harthouse with his thumb. 
a parliament gentleman. I should like him to hear a short bit of dialogue between you and me, instead of taking the substance of it, for I know precious well before and what it will be. Nobody knows better than I do. Take notice. Instead of receiving it on trust from my mouth. Stephen bent his head to the gentleman from London, and showed a rather more troubled mind than usual. He turned his eyes involuntarily to his former refuge, but had a look from that quarter, expressive though instantaneous, he settled them on Mr. Bounderby's face. "'Now, what you complain of?' asked Mr. Bounderby. "'I am not come here, sir,' Stephen reminded him. "'To complain. I come for what I was sent for.' "'What?' repeated Mr. Bounderby, folding his arms. "'Do you people, in a general way, complain of?' Stephen looked at him with some little irresolution for a moment, and then seemed to make up his mind. "'Sir, I were never good at showing out, though I have me sure of feeling it. Dee, we're in a muddle, sir. Look round town, so rich as tis, and see number of people has been brought into here for weave and for card, and for peace out of living, all the same way somehow's, twixt the candles and the graves. Look how we live and where we live, and in what numbers, and by what chances, and with what sameness, and look how mills is all as a-going, and how they never works us no near to any decent object, set no as death. Look how you consider us, and writes of us, and talks of us, and goes up with your deputations to secretaries of state about us, and how you always right, and how we're always wrong, and never had no reason in us since we were born. Look how this has growing and growing, sir, bigger and bigger, broader and broader, harder and harder, for a year to year, for a generation unto generation. Who can look on it, sir, and fairly tell a man tis nor a muddle? Of course said Mr. Bounderby. Now, perhaps you'll let the gentleman know how you would set this muddle, as you're so fond of calling it, to rights. I don't know, sir. I cannot be expected to. Tis not me as should be looking for that, sir. Tis them as is poor o'er me, and o'er aught rest of us. What do they take upon themselves, sir, if not for do it? I'll tell you something towards it at any rate, returned Bounderby. We will make an example of half a dozen slack bridges. We'll indict the blackguards for felony, and get them shift off to penal settlements. Stephen gravely shook his head. Don't tell me we won't, man, said Bounderby, by this time blowing a hurricane. Because we will, I tell you. Sir, returned Stephen, with the quiet confidence of absolute certainty. If you were to take a hundred slack bridges, all as there is, and all the number ten times to us, and was to sew em up in separate sacks, and sink em in deepest ocean as were made ere ever dry land come to be, you'll leave the muddle just where it is, mischievous strangers," said Stephen, with an anxious smile. When I were norrin, I'm sure si never we were called to mind at mischievous strangers. "'Tis not by them the troubles may, sir. "'Tis not with them it commences. "'I owe no favour for them. "'I owe no reason to favour them. "'But tis hopeless and useless to dream of taking them from the trade, "'said of taking the trade for them. "'All oh, that know about me in this room were here afore I come, "'and will be here when I am gone. "'Put that clock aboard a ship and pack it off to Norfolk Island, "'and the time will go on just the same.' So tis with Slackridge every bit. Reverting for a moment to his former refuge, he observed a cautionary movement of her eyes towards the door. Stepping back, he put his hand upon the lock. But he had not spoken out of his own will and desire, and he felt it in his heart a noble return for his late injurious treatment to be faithful to the last to those who had repudiated him. He stayed to finish what was in his mind. Sir, I can with my little learning and my common way tell the gentleman what will better all this. Though some working men of this town could above my powers, but I can tell him what will never do. The strong hand will never do it. Victory and triumph will never do it. 
agreeing for to make one side unnaturally always and forever right, and t'other side unnaturally always and forever wrong will never, never do it. Nor yet Lerin alone will never do it. Let thousands upon thousands alone, all leading the light lives and all falling into light muddle, as they will be as one, and you will be as another. We are black, unpassable world betwixt you, just as long as short a time as such like misery can last. Not drawing nigh to folk with kindness and patience and cheery ways that so draws nigh to one another in their money troubles and so cherishes one another in their distresses who what they need themselves. Like I humbly believe, as no people the gentleman has seen in noise travels can beat, will never do till sun turns to ice. Most of all, rating him as so much power and regulating him as if they were figures in a sum of machines, without love and likens, without memories and inclinations, without souls to weary and souls to hope. When all goes quiet, dragging on with him as if they'd nout at kind, and when all goes on quiet, reproaching him for the want of such humany feelings in the dealings with you, This'll never do, sir, till God's work is unmade. Stephen stood with the open door in his hand, waiting to know if anything more were expected of him. Just stop a moment, said Mr. Bounderby, excessively red in the face. I told you, the last time you were here with a grievance, that you had better turn about and come out of that. And I also told you, if you remember, that I was up to the gold spoon lookout. I were not up to it, Miss Censor, I do assure you. Now, it's clear to me, said Mr. Bounderby, that you are one of those chaps who have always got a grievance, and you go about sowing it and raising crops. That's the business of your life, my friend. Stephen shook his head, mutely protesting that, indeed, he had other business to do for his life. You're such a waspish, raspish, ill-conditioned chap, you see said Mr. Bounderby, that even your own union, the men who know you best, will have nothing to do with you. I never thought those fellows could be right in anything, but I tell you what, I so far go along with em for a novelty that I'll have nothing to do with you either. Stephen raised his eyes quickly to his face. You can finish off what you're at, said Mr. Bounderby, with a meaning nod, and then go elsewhere. "'Sir, you know, Wheel,' said Stephen, expressively, "'that if I cannot get work with you, I cannot get it elsewhere.' The reply was, "'What I know, I know, and what you know, you know. I have no more to say about it.' Stephen glanced at Louisa again, but her eyes were raised to his no more. Therefore, with a sigh, and saying barely above his breath, Heaven help us all in this world. He departed. It was falling dark when Stephen came out of Mr. Bounderby's house. The shadows of night had gathered so fast that he did not look about him when he closed the door, but plodded straight along the street. Nothing was further from his thoughts than the curious old woman he had encountered on his previous visit to the same house when he heard a step behind him that he knew, and turning, saw her in Rachel's company. He saw Rachel first, as he had heard her only. Ah, Rachel, my dear, Mrs. Thowier. Well, and now you are surprised to be sure, and with reason, I must say. The old woman returned. Here I am again, you see. Bro, we Rachel, said Stephen, falling into their step, walking between them and looking from one to the other. Why, I come to be with this good lass pretty much as I came to be with you, said the old woman, cheerfully taking the reply upon herself. My visiting time is later this year than usual, for I have been rather troubled with shortness of breath, and so put it off till the weather was fine and warm. For the same reason I don't make all my journey in one day, but divide it into two days, and get a bed tonight at the Traveller's Coffee House, down by the railroad, a nice clean house. 
and go back parliamentary at six in the morning. Well, but what has this to do with this good lass, says you? I'm going to tell you. I've heard of Mr. Bounderby being married. I read it in the paper, where it looked grand. Oh, it looked fine. And I want to see his wife. I have never seen her yet. Now, if you'll believe me, she hasn't come out of that house since noon today. So, not to give her up too easily, I was waiting about a little last bit more. When I passed close to this good lass two or three times, and her face being so friendly, I spoke to her, and she spoke to me. There, said the old woman to Stephen. You can make all the rest out for yourself now, a deal shorter than I can, I dare say. Once again, Stephen had to conquer an instinctive propensity to dislike this old woman though her manner was as honest and simple as a manner possibly could be. With a gentleness that was as natural to him as he knew it to be to Rachel, he pursued the subject that interested her in her old age. "'Well, missus,' said he, "'I have seen the lady, and she were young and handsome, with fine dark thinking eyes and a still way. Rachel, as I had ne'er seen the like on.' "'Young and handsome, yes!' cried the old woman, quite delighted. As bonny as a rose, and what a happy wife. Ah, missus, I suppose she be, said Stephen, with a doubtful glance at Rachel. Suppose she be? She must be. She's your master's wife, returned the old woman. Stephen nodded assent. The was to master, said he, glancing again at Rachel. Not master any more. That all ended twixt him and me. Have you left his work, Stephen? Asked Rachel, anxiously and quickly. Why, Rachel? He replied. Whether I have left his work, or whether his work hath left me, comes to the same. His work and me are parted. Tis as we'll so better, I was thinking, when you comes up with me. It would have brought trouble upon trouble if I'd stayed there. Haply tis a kindness to many that I go. Happily tis a kind of to me sen. Anyways, it mun be done. I mun turn me face for court time for time and seek a fortune, dear, by beginning fresh. Where will you go, Stephen? I don't know to eat, said he, lifting his hat and smoothing his thin hair with the flat of his hand. But I'm not going to eat, Rachel, nor yet tomorrow. Tant easy over much to know where to turn, but a good heart will come to me. Herein, too, the sense of even thinking unselfishly aided him. Before he had so much as closed Mr. Bounderby's door, he had reflected that at least his being obliged to go away was good for her, as it would save her from the chance of being brought into question for not withdrawing from him. Though it would cost him a hard pang to leave her, and though he could think of no similar place in which his condemnation would not pursue him, perhaps it was almost a relief to be forced away from the endurance of the last four days, even to unknown difficulties and distresses. So he said, with truth, I'm more late some Rachel under it than I could have believed. It was not her part to make his burden heavier. She answered with her comforting smile, and the three walked on together. Age, especially when it strives to be self-reliant and cheerful, finds much consideration among the poor. The old woman was so decent and contented, and made so light of her infirmities, though they had increased upon her since her former interview with Stephen, that they both took an interest in her. She was too sprightly to allow of their walking at a slow pace on her account, but she was very grateful to be talked to, and very willing to talk in any extent. So, when they came to their part of the town, she was more brisk and vivacious than ever. "'Come to my poor place, missus,' said Stephen, "'and take a cup of tea. Rachel will come then, and afterwards I'll see thee safe to the traveller's lodging. Tis maybe long, Rachel.' Ere ever I a chance of thy company again. They complied, 
and the three went on to the house where he lodged. When they turned into a narrow street, Stephen glanced at his window with a dread that always haunted his desolate home. But it was open, as he had left it, and no one was there. The evil spirit of his life had flitted away again, months ago, and he had heard no more of her since. The only evidence of her last return now were the scantier movables in his room and the grayer hair upon his head. He lighted a candle, set out his little tea-board, got hot water from below, and brought in small portions of tea and sugar, a loaf, and some butter from the nearest shop. The bread was new and crusty, the butter fresh, and the sugar lump, of course, in fulfillment of the standard testimony of the Coketown magnates, that these people lived like princes, sir. Rachel made the tea, so large a party necessitated the borrowing of a cup and the visitor enjoyed it mightily. It was the first glimpse of sociality the host had had for many days. He, too, with the world a wide heath before him, enjoyed the meal, again in corroboration of the magnates, as exemplifying the utter want of calculation on the part of these people, sir. I never thought yet, missus, said Stephen, or asking thy name. The old lady announced herself as Mrs. Pegler. A widow, I think, said Stephen. Oh, many long years. Mrs. Pegler's husband, one of the best on record, was already dead, by Mrs. Pegler's calculation, when Stephen was born. Twere a bad job, too, to lose so good a one, said Stephen. On his children. Mrs. Pegler's cup, rattling against her saucer as she held it, denoted some nervousness on her part. No, she said. Not now, not now. Dead, Stephen, Rachel softly hinted. I'm sorry I've spoken on it, said Stephen. I ought to add it in my mind as I might touch a sore place. I, I blame me sen. While he excused himself, the old lady's cub rattled more and more. I had a son, she said, curiously distressed, and not by any of the usual appearances of sorrow. And he did well, wonderfully well. But he is not to be spoken of, if you please. He, he is, uh... Putting down her cup, she moved her hands as if she would have added, by her action, Dead. Then she said aloud, I have lost him. Stephen had not yet got the better of his having given the old lady pain, when his landlady came stumbling up the narrow stairs, and calling him to the door, whispered in his ear. Mrs. Pegler was by no means deaf, for she caught a word as it was uttered. Bounderby! she cried, in a suppressed voice, starting up from the table. Oh, hide me! Don't let me be seen for the world! Don't let him come up till I've got away! Pray! Pray! She trembled and was excessively agitated, getting behind Rachel when Rachel tried to reassure her, and not seeming to know what she was about. Brarkin, Mrs. Arkin, said Stephen, astonished. "'Tisn't Mr. Bounderby, tis his wife. You're not fain of her. You're as a go mad about to burn our sin. But are you sure it's the lady and not the gentleman? she asked, still trembling. Certain sure. Well, then, Pray don't speak to me, nor yet take any notice of me, said the old woman. Let me be quite to myself in this corner. Stephen nodded, looking to Rachel for an explanation, which she was quite unable to give him, took the candle, went downstairs, and in a few moments returned, lighting Louisa into the room. She was followed by the whelp. Rachel had risen and stood apart with her shawl and bonnet in her hand, when Stephen, himself profoundly astonished by this visit, put the candle on the table. Then he too stood, with his doubled hand upon the table near it, waiting to be addressed. For the first time in her life Louisa had come into one of the dwellings of the Coketown hands. 
For the first time in her life she was face to face with anything like individuality in connection with them. She knew of their existence by hundreds and by thousands. She knew what results in work a given number of them would produce in a given space of time. She knew them in crowds passing to and from their nests like ants or beetles. But she knew from her reading infinitely more of the ways of toiling insects than of these toiling men and women. Something to be worked so much and paid so much, and there ended. Something to be infallibly settled by laws of supply and demand. Something that blundered against these laws and floundered into difficulty. Something that was a little pinched when wheat was dear, and over ate itself when wheat was cheap. Something that increased at such a rate of percentage, and yielded such another percentage of crime, and such another percentage of pauperism. Something wholesale, of which vast fortunes were made. Something that occasionally rose like a sea, and did some harm and waste, chiefly to itself, and fell again. This she knew the Coketown hands to be. But she had scarcely thought more of separating them into units than of separating the sea itself into its component drops. She stood for some moments looking round the room. From the few chairs, the few books, the common prints, and the bed, she glanced to the two women and to Stephen. I have come to speak to you, in consequence of what passed just now. I should like to be serviceable to you if you will let me. Is this your wife? Rachel raised her eyes, and they sufficiently answered no, and dropped again. I remember, said Louisa, reddening at her mistake. I recollect now to have heard your domestic misfortunes spoken of, though I was not attending to the particulars at the time. It was not my meaning to ask a question that would give pain to anyone here. If I should ask any other question that may happen to have that result, give me credit, if you please, for being in ignorance how to speak to you as I ought. As Stephen had but a little while ago instinctively addressed himself to her, so she now instinctively addressed herself to Rachel. Her manner was short and abrupt, yet faltering and timid. He has told you what has passed between himself and my husband. You would be his first resource, I think. I have heard the end of it, young lady, said Rachel. Did I understand that, being rejected by one employer, he would probably be rejected by all? I thought he said as much. The chances are very small, young lady, next to nothing, for a man who gets a bad name among them. What shall I understand that you mean by a bad name? The name of being troublesome. Then by the prejudices of his own class, and by the prejudices of the other, he is sacrificed alike? Are the two so deeply separated in this town that there is no place whatever for an honest workman between them? Rachel shook her head in silence. He fell into suspicion, said Louisa, with his fellow weavers because he had made a promise not to be one of them. I think it must have been to you that he made that promise. Might I ask you why he made it? Rachel burst into tears. I didn't seek it of him, poor lad. I prayed him to avoid trouble for his own good, little thinking he'd come to it through me. But I know he'd die a hundred deaths, ere ever he'd break his word. I know that of him well. Stephen had remained quietly attentive, in his usual thoughtful attitude, with his hand at his chin. He now spoke, in a voice rather less steady than usual. No one excepting Miss Anne can ever know what honour, and what love, and what respect I bear to Rachel— or with what cause? When I passed that promise, I towed her true. She were the angel of my life. T'were a solemn promise. Tis gone from me for ever. Louisa turned her head to him, and bent it with a deference that was new to her. She looked from him to Rachel, and her features softened. What will you do? She asked him, and her voice had softened, too. Well, ma'am, said Stephen, making the best of it with a smile. When I finish off, I won't quit this part and try another. Fortnight to Miss Fortnight, a man can but try. There's nought to be done without trying. Set laying down and dying. 
How will you travel? A foot, me kind lady. A foot. Louisa colored, and a purse appeared in her hand. The rustling of a banknote was audible as she unfolded one and laid it on the table. Rachel, will you tell him, for you know how, without offence, that this is freely his to help him on his way? Will you entreat him to take it? I cannot do that, young lady. She answered, turning her head aside. Bless you for thinking of the poor lad with such tenderness, but tis for him to know his heart and what is right according to it. Louisa looked in part incredulous, in part frightened, in part overcome with quick sympathy, when this man of so much self-command, who had been so plain and steady through the late interview, lost his composure in a moment, and now stood with his hand before his face. She stretched out hers as if she would have touched him, then checked herself and remained still. Not even Rachel, said Stephen, when he stood again with his face uncovered, could make such a kind offering with any words kinder. To show that I'm not a man without reason and gratitude, I'll take two pounds. I'll borrow for pay back. Twill be sweetest work as ever I had done. That puts it in my power to acknowledge once more my lasting thankfulness for this present action. She was fain to take up the note again, and to substitute the much smaller sum he had named. He was neither courtly nor handsome nor picturesque in any respect, and yet his manner of accepting it, and of expressing his thanks without more words, had a grace in it that Lord Chesterfield could not have taught his son in a century. Tom had sat upon the bed, swinging one leg and sucking his walking-stick with sufficient unconcern until the visit had attained this stage. Seeing his sister ready to depart, he got up, rather hurriedly, and put in a word. Just wait a moment, Lou. Before we go, I should like to speak to him a moment. Something comes into my head. If you'll step out on the stairs, Blackpool, I'll mention it. And never mind the light, man. Tom was remarkably impatient of his moving towards the cupboard to get one. It don't want a light. Stephen followed him out, and Tom closed the room door and held the lock in his hand. I say, he whispered, I think I can do a good turn. Don't ask me what it is, because it may not come to anything. There's no harm in my trying. His breath fell like a flame of fire on Stephen's ear. It was so hot. And that was our light porter at the bank, said Tom, who brought you the message tonight. I call him our light porter because I belong to the bank too. Stephen thought, What a hurry he is in. He spoke so confusedly. Well, said Tom, Now look here. When are you off? Today is Monday, replied Stephen, considering. Why, sir, Friday or Saturday night about. Friday or Saturday, said Tom. Now look here. I'm not sure that I can do you the good turn I want to do you. That's my sister, you know, in your room. But if I may be able to, and if I should not be able to, there's no harm done. So I tell you what, you know our light porter again? Yes, sir, said Stephen. Very well, returned Tom. When you leave work of a night, between this and your going away, just hang about the bank an hour or so, will you? Don't take on as if you meant anything, if he should see you hanging about there, because I shan't put him up to speak to you, unless I find I can do you the service I want to do you. In that case, he'll have a note or a message for you, but not else. Now, look here. You are sure you understand? He had wormed a finger in the darkness through a buttonhole of Stephen's coat, and was screwing that corner of the garment tied up round and round in an extraordinary manner. I understand, sir, said Stephen. Now, look here, repeated Tom. Be sure you don't make any mistake then, and don't forget. I shall tell my sister as we go home what I have in view, and she'll approve, I know. Now, look here. You're all right, are you? You understand all about it? Very well, then. Come along, Lou. He pushed the door open as he called to her but did not return into the room, or wait to be lighted down the narrow stairs. 
He was at the bottom when she began to descend, and was in the street before she could take his arm. Mrs. Pegler remained in her corner until the brother and sister were gone, and until Stephen came back with the candle in his hand. She was in a state of inexpressible admiration of Mrs. Bounderby, and, like an unaccountable old woman, wept, "'Because she was such a pretty dear.' Yet Mrs. Pegler was so flurried, lest the object of her admiration should return by chance, or anybody else should come, that her cheerfulness was ended for that night. It was late, too, to people who rose early and worked hard. Therefore the party broke up, and Stephen and Rachel escorted their mysterious acquaintance to the door of the traveller's coffee-house, where they parted from her. They walked back together to the corner of the street where Rachel lived, and as they drew nearer and nearer to it, silence crept upon them. When they came back to the dark corner where their unfrequent meetings always ended, they stopped, still silent, as if both were afraid to speak. I shall strive to see thee again, Rachel, afore I go, but if not— Thou wilt not, Stephen, I know. Tis better that we make up our minds to be open with one another. That's always right, tis bolder and better. I have been thinking then, Rachel, there is tis but a day or two that remains, to better for thee, my dear, not to be seen with me. Might bring thee into trouble for no good. Tis not for that, Stephen, that I mind. But thou know'st our old agreement, tis for that. Well, well, said he, tis better anyways. Thou'lt write to me and tell me all that happens, Stephen. Yes, what can I say now but heaven be with thee? Heaven bless thee, heaven thank thee and reward thee. May it bless thee, Stephen, too, in all thy wanderings, and send thee peace and rest at last. I told thee, my dear, said Stephen Blackpool, that night that I would never see or think of anything that angered me, but thou so much better than me should be beside it. Thou art beside it now, thou makes me see it with a better eye. Bless thee. Good night. Goodbye. It was but a hurried parting in a common street, yet it was a sacred remembrance to these two common people. Utilitarian economists, skeletons of schoolmasters, commissioners of fact, genteel and used-up infidels, gabblers of many little dogs-eared creeds, the poor you will have always with you. Cultivate in them, while there is yet time, the utmost graces of the fancies and affections, to adorn their lives so much in need of ornament. Or in the day of your triumph, when romance is utterly driven out of their souls, and they and a bare existence stand face to face, reality will take a wolfish turn and make an end of you. Stephen worked the next day, and the next, uncheered by a word from any one, and shunned in all his comings and goings as before. At the end of the second day he saw land. At the end of the third his loom stood empty. He had overstayed his hour in the street outside the bank on each of the two first evenings, and nothing had happened there, good or bad. That he might not be remiss in his part of the engagement, he resolved to wait full two hours on this third and last night. There was the lady who had once kept Mr. Bounderby's house, sitting at the first-floor window as he had seen her before, and there was the light porter, sometimes talking with her there, and sometimes looking over the blind below which had bank upon it, and sometimes coming to the door and standing on the steps for a breath of air. When he first came out, Stephen thought he might be looking for him and pass near. But the light porter only cast his winking eyes upon him slightly and said nothing. Two hours were a long stretch of lounging about after a long day's labor. Stephen sat upon the step of a door, leaned against a wall under an archway, strolled up and down, listened for the church clock, stopped and watched children playing in the street. Some purpose or other is so natural to everyone, 
that a mere loiterer always looks and feels remarkable. When the first hour was out, Stephen even began to have an uncomfortable sensation upon him of being for the time a disreputable character. Then came the lamplighter, and two lengthening lines of light all down the long perspective of the street, until they were blended and lost in the distance. Mrs. Sparsit closed the first-floor window, drew down the blind, and went upstairs. Presently a light went upstairs after her, passing first the fanlight of the door, and afterwards the two staircase windows on its way up. By and by one corner of the second-floor blind was disturbed, as if Mrs. Sparsit's eye were there. Also the other corner, as if the light-porter's eye were on that side. Still no communication was made to Stephen. Much relieved when the two hours were at last accomplished, he went away at a quick pace, as a recompense for so much loitering. He had only to take leave of his landlady and lie down on his temporary bed upon the floor, for his bundle was made up for to-morrow, and all was arranged for his departure. He meant to be clear of the town very early, before the hands were in the street. It was barely daybreak when, with a parting look round his room, mournfully wondering whether he should ever see it again, he went out. The town was as entirely deserted as if the inhabitants had abandoned it, rather than hold communication with him. Everything looked wan at that hour. Even the coming sun made but a pale waste in the sky, like a sad sea. By the place where Rachel lived, though it was not in his way, by the red brick streets, by the great silent factories, not trembling yet, by the railway, where the danger lights were waning in the strengthening day, by the railway's crazy neighborhood, half pulled down and half built up, by scattered red brick villas, where the besmoked evergreens were sprinkled with a dirty powder, like untidy snuff-takers, by cold dust paths and many varieties of ugliness, Stephen got to the top of the hill and looked back. Day was shining radiantly upon the town then, and the bells were going for the morning work. Domestic fires were not yet lighted, and the high chimneys had the sky to themselves. Puffing out their poisonous volumes, they would not be long in hiding it. But for half an hour some of the many windows were golden, which showed the Coketown people a sun eternally in eclipse through a medium of smoked glass. So strange to turn from the chimneys to the burns, so strange to have the road dust on his feet instead of the coal grit, so strange to have lived to his time of life and yet to be beginning like a boy this summer morning. With these musings in his mind, and his bundle under his arm, Stephen took his attentive face along the high road, and the trees arched over him, whispering that he left a true and loving heart behind. Mr. James Harthouse, going in for his adopted party, soon began to score. With the aid of a little more coaching for the political sages, a little more genteel listlessness for the general society, and a tolerable management of the assumed honesty in dishonesty, most effective and most patronized by the polite deadly sins, he speedily came to be considered of much promise. The not being troubled with earnestness was a grand point in his favor, enabling him to take to the hard fact fellows with as good a grace as if he had been born one of the tribe, and to throw all other tribes overboard as conscious hypocrites. Whom none of us believe, my dear Mrs. Bounderby, and who do not believe themselves. The only difference between us and the professors of virtue or benevolence or philanthropy, never mind the name, is that we know it is all meaningless and say so, while they know it equally and will never say so. Why should she be shocked or warned by this reiteration? 
It was not so unlike her father's principles and her early training that it need startle her. Where was the great difference between the two schools, when each chained her down to material realities and inspired her with no faith in anything else? What was there in her soul for James Harthouse to destroy, which Thomas Gradgrind had nurtured there in its state of innocence? It was even the worse for her at this pass that in her mind, implanted there before her eminently practical father began to form it, a struggling disposition to believe in a wider and nobler humanity than she had ever heard of, constantly strove with doubts and resentments. With doubts, because the aspiration had been so laid waste in her youth, with resentments because of the wrong that had been done her, if it were indeed a whisper of the truth. Upon a nature long accustomed to self-suppression, thus torn and divided, the Harthouse philosophy came as a relief and justification. Everything being hollow and worthless, she had missed nothing and sacrificed nothing. What did it matter, she had said to her father when he proposed her husband, what did it matter, she said still. With a scornful self-reliance, she asked herself, what did anything matter, and went on. Towards what? Step by step, onward and downward, towards some end, yet so gradually, that she believed herself to remain motionless. As to Mr. Harthouse, whither he tended, he neither considered nor cared. He had no particular design or plan before him. No energetic wickedness ruffled his lassitude. He was as much amused and interested at present as it became so fine a gentleman to be, perhaps even more than it would have been consistent with his reputation to confess. Soon after his arrival, he languidly wrote to his brother, the honorable and jocular member, that the Bounderbys were great fun, and further, that the female Bounderby, instead of being the Gorgon he had expected, was young, and remarkably pretty. After that, he wrote no more about them, and devoted his leisure chiefly to their house. He was very often in their house, in his flittings and visitings about the Coketown district, and was much encouraged by Mr. Bounderby. It was quite in Mr. Bounderby's gusty way to boast to all his world that he didn't care about your highly connected people, but that if his wife, Tom Gradgrind's daughter, did, she was welcome to their company. Mr. James Harthouse began to think that it would be a new sensation if the face which changed so beautifully for the whelp would change for him. He was quick enough to observe, he had a good memory, and did not forget a word of the brother's revelations. He interwove them with everything he saw of the sister, and he began to understand her. To be sure, the better and profounder part of her character was not within his scope of perception, for in natures, as in seas, depth answers unto depth but he soon began to read the rest with a student's eye. Mr. Bounderby had taken possession of a house and grounds about fifteen miles from the town, and accessible, within a mile or two, by a railway striding on many arches over a wild country, undermined by deserted coal-shafts, and spotted at night by fires and black shapes of stationary engines at pits, mouths. This country, gradually softening towards the neighborhood of Mr. Bounderby's retreat, there mellowed into a rustic landscape, golden with heath, and snowy with hawthorn in the spring of the year, and tremulous with leaves and their shadows all the summer time. The bank had foreclosed a mortgage effected on the property, thus pleasantly situated, by one of the Coketown magnates who, in his determination to make a shorter cut than usual to an enormous fortune, over-speculated himself by about two hundred thousand pounds. These accidents did sometimes happen in the best-regulated families of Coketown. 
but the bankrupts had no connection whatever with the improvident classes. It afforded Mr. Bounderby supreme satisfaction to install himself in this snug little estate, and with demonstrative humility to grow cabbages in the flower-garden. He delighted to live, barrack fashion among the elegant furniture, and he bullied the very pictures with his origin. "'Fly, sir,' he would say to a visitor, "'and told the nickets,' the late owner, "'gave seven hundred pound for that sea beach. Now, to be plain with you, if I ever, in the whole course of my life, take seven looks at it, at a hundred pound a look, it'll be as much as I shall do.' No, by George, I don't forget that I'm Joe Sire bound to be of Corktown. For years upon years, the only pictures in my possession, all that I could have got into my possession by any means, unless I stole them, were the engravings of a man shaving himself in a boot on the blacking bottles that I was overjoyed to use in cleaning boots with, and that I sold when they were empty for a farthing apiece. I'm glad to get it. Then he would address Mr. Harthouse in the same style. Harthouse, you have a couple of horses down here. Bring half a dozen more, if you like, and we'll find room for them. There's stabling in this place for a dozen horses, and unless Nicketts is belied, he kept the full number. A round dozen of them, sir. When that man was a boy, he went to Westminster School. Went to Westminster School as a king's scholar when I— was principally living on garbage and sleeping in market baskets. Why, if I wanted to keep a dozen horses, which I don't, for one's good enough for me, I couldn't bear to see em in their stalls here, and think what my own lodging used to be. I couldn't look at em, sir, and not order em out. Yet so things come round. You see this place? You know what sort of place it is? You're aware that there's not a completer place of its size in this kingdom or elsewhere, I don't care where, and here, got into the middle of it, like a maggot in a nut, is Josiah Bounderby, while Nicketts, as a man came into my office and told me yesterday, Nicketts, who used to act in Latin in the Westminster School plays with the chief justices and nobility of this country applauding him till they were black in the face is drivelling at this minute, drivelling, sir, in a fifth floor up a narrow, dark back street in Antwerp. It was among the leafy shadows of this retirement, in the long, sultry summer days, that Mr. Harthouse began to prove the face which had set him wondering when he first saw it, and to try if it would change for him. Mrs. Bounderby, I deem it a most fortunate accident that I find you alone here. I have for some time had a particular wish to speak to you. It was not by any wonderful accident that he found her, the time of day being that at which she was always alone, and the place being her favorite resort. It was an opening in a dark wood, where some felled trees lay, and where she would sit watching the fallen leaves of last year, as she had watched the falling ashes at home. He sat down beside her with a glance at her face. "'Your brother, my young friend Tom.' Her colour brightened, and she turned to him with a look of interest. "'I never in my life,' he thought, "'saw anything so remarkable and so captivating as the lighting of those features.' His face betrayed his thoughts, perhaps without betraying him, for it might have been according to its instructions so to do. "'Pardon me, the expression of your sisterly interest is so beautiful. Tom should be so proud of it. I know this is inexcusable, but I am so compelled to admire. Being so impulsive, she said composedly. Mrs. Bounderby, no. You know I make no pretense with you. You know I am a sordid piece of human nature, ready to sell myself at any time, for any reasonable sum, and altogether incapable of any Arcadian proceeding whatever. I am waiting, she returned, for your further reference to my brother. You are rigid with me, and I deserve it. I am as worthless a dog as you will find, except that I am not false, not false. But you surprised and started me from my subject, which was your brother. I have an interest in him. 
Have you an interest in anything, Mr. Harthouse? She asked, half incredulously and half gratefully. If you had asked me when I first came here, I should have said no. I must say now, even at the hazard of appearing to make pretense and of justly awakening your incredulity, yes. She made a slight movement, as if she were trying to speak, but could not find voice. At length she said, Mr. Harthouse, I give you credit for being interested in my brother. Thank you. I claim to deserve it. You know how little I do claim, but I will go that length. You have done so much for him, you are so fond of him, your whole life, Mrs. Bounderby, expresses such charming self-forgetfulness on his account. Pardon me again, I am running wide of the subject. I am interested in him for his own sake. She made the slightest action possible, as if she would have risen in a hurry and gone away. He had turned the course of what he said at that instant, and she remained. Mrs. Bounderby, he resumed, in a lighter manner, and yet with a show of effort in assuming it, which was even more expressive than the manner he dismissed. It is no irrevocable offence in a young fellow of your brother's years, if he is heedless, inconsiderate, and expensive. A little dissipated in the common phrase. Is he? Yes. Allow me to be frank. Do you think he games at all? I think he makes bets. Mr. Harthouse waiting, as if that were not her whole answer, she added, I know he does. Of course, he loses? Yes. Everybody does lose who bets. May I hint at the probability of your sometimes supplying him with money for these purposes? She sat, looking down, but at this question raised her eyes searchingly and a little resentfully. Acquit me of impertinent curiosity, my dear Mrs. Bounderby. I think Tom may be gradually falling into trouble, and I wish to stretch out a helping hand to him from the depths of my wicked experience. Shall I say again, for his sake? Is that necessary? She seemed to try to answer, but nothing came of it. Candidly, to confess everything that has occurred to me, said James Harthouse, again gliding with the same appearance of effort into his more airy manner, I will confide to you my doubt whether he has had many advantages whether, forgive my plainness, whether any great amount of confidence is likely to have been established between himself and his most worthy father. I do not, said Louisa, flushing with her own great remembrance in that wise, think it likely, or between himself and, I may trust to your perfect understanding of my meaning, I am sure, and his highly esteemed brother-in-law. She flushed deeper and deeper and was burning red when she replied in a fainter voice, I do not think that likely either. Mrs. Bounderby, said Harthouse, after a short silence, may there be a better confidence between yourself and me? Tom has borrowed a considerable sum of you. You will understand, Mr. Harthouse, she returned after some indecision. She had been more or less uncertain and troubled throughout the conversation and yet had in the main preserved her self-contained manner. You will understand that if I tell you what you press to know, it is not by way of complaint or regret. I would never complain of anything, and what I have done I do not in the least regret. So spirited, too, thought James Harthouse. When I married, I found that my brother was even at that time heavily in debt. Heavily for him, I mean heavily enough to oblige me to sell some trinkets. They were no sacrifice. I sold them very willingly. I attached no value to them. They were quite worthless to me. Either she saw in his face that he knew, or she only feared in her conscience that he knew that she spoke of some of her husband's gifts. She stopped and reddened again. If he had not known it before, he would have known it then though he had been a much duller man than he was. Since then I have given my brother, at various times, what money I could spare, in short, what money I have had. Confiding in you at all, on the faith of the interest you profess for him, I will not do so by halves. Since you have been in the habit of visiting here, he has wanted in one sum as much as a hundred pounds. I have not been able to give it to him. I have felt uneasy for the consequences of his being so involved, 
but I have kept these secrets until now, when I trust them to your honour. I have held no confidence with any one, because you anticipated my reason just now. She abruptly broke off. He was a ready man, and he saw and seized an opportunity here of presenting her own image to her, slightly disguised as her brother. Mrs. Bounderby, though a graceless person, of the world worldly, I feel the utmost interest, I assure you, in what you tell me. I cannot possibly be hard upon your brother. I understand and share the wise consideration with which you regard his errors. With all possible respect both for Mr. Gradgrind and for Mr. Bounderby, I think I perceive that he has not been fortunate in his training. Bred at a disadvantage towards the society in which he has his part to play, he rushes into these extremes for himself, from opposite extremes that have long been forced, with the very best intentions, we have no doubt, upon him. Mr. Bounderby's fine bluff English independence, though a most charming characteristic, does not, as we have agreed, invite confidence. If I might venture to remark that it is the least in the world deficient in that delicacy to which a youth mistaken, a character misconceived, and abilities misdirected, would turn to relief and guidance, I should express what it presents to my own view. As she sat looking straight before her, across the changing lights, upon the grass, into the darkness of the wood beyond, he saw in her face her application of his very distinctly uttered words. All allowance, he continued, must be made. I have one great fault to find with Tom, however, which I cannot forgive, of which I take him heavily to account. Louisa turned her eyes to his face, and asked him what fault was that. Perhaps, he returned, I have said enough. Perhaps it would have been better, on the whole, if no allusion to it had escaped me. You alarm me, Mr. Harthouse. Pray let me know it. To relieve you from needless apprehension, and as this confidence regarding your brother, which I prize, I am sure, above all possible things, has been established between us, I obey. I cannot forgive him for not being more sensible in every word, look, and act of his life, of the affection of his best friend, of the devotion of his best friend, of her unselfishness, of her sacrifice. The return he makes her, within my observation, is a very poor one. What she has done for him demands his constant love and gratitude, not his ill-humour and caprice. Careless fellow as I am, I am not so indifferent, Mrs. Bounderby, as to be regardless of this vice in your brother, or inclined to consider it a venial offence. The wood floated before her, for her eyes were suffused with tears. They rose from a deep well, long concealed, and her heart was filled with acute pain that found no relief in them. In a word, it is to correct your brother in this, Mrs. Bounderby, that I must aspire. My better knowledge of his circumstances, and my direction and advice in extricating them, rather valuable, I hope, as coming from a scapegrace on a much larger scale, will give me some influence over him, and all I gain I shall certainly use towards this end. I have said enough, and more than enough, I seem to be protesting that I am a sort of good fellow, when, upon my honour, I have not the least intention to make any protestation to that effect, and openly announce that I am nothing of the sort. Yonder, among the trees, he added, having lifted up his eyes and looked about, for he had watched her closely until now, is your brother himself, no doubt just come down. As he seems to be loitering in this direction, it may be as well, perhaps, to walk towards him, and throw ourselves in his way. He has been very silent and doleful of late. Perhaps his brotherly conscience is touched, if there are such things as consciences, though upon my honour I hear of them much too often to believe in them. He assisted her to rise, and she took his arm, and they advanced to meet the whelp. He was idly beating the branches as he lounged along, or he stooped viciously to rip the moss from the trees with his stick. He was startled when they came upon him while he was engaged in this latter pastime, and his color changed. Hello, he stammered. I didn't know you were here. Whose name, Tom? 
said Mr. Harthouse, putting his hand upon his shoulder and turning him, so that they all three walked towards the house together. Have you been carving on the trees? Whose name? returned Tom. Oh, you mean what girl's name? You have a suspicious appearance of inscribing some fair creatures on the bark, Tom. Not much of that, Mr. Harthouse. Unless some fair creature with a slashing fortune at her own disposal would take a fancy to me. Or she might be as ugly as she was rich, without any fear of losing me. I'd car her name as often as she liked. I'm afraid you're a mercenary, Tom. <laughs> mercenary, repeated Tom. Who is not mercenary? Ask my sister. Have you so proved it to be a failing of mine, Tom? said Louisa, showing no other sense of his discontent and ill nature. You know whether the cap fits you, Lou? returned her brother sulkily. If it does, you can wear it. Tom is misanthropical today, as all bored people are now and then, said Mr. Harthouse. Don't believe him, Mrs. Bounderby. He knows much better. I shall disclose some of his opinions of you, privately expressed to me, unless he relents a little. At all events, Mr. Harthouse, said Tom, softening in his admiration of his patron, but shaking his head solidly, too. You can't tell her that I ever praised her for being mercenary. I may have praised her for being the contrary, and I should do it again, if I had as good reason. However, never mind this now. It's not very interesting to you, and I am sick of the subject. They walked on to the house, where Louisa quitted her visitor's arm and went in. He stood looking after her as she ascended the steps and passed into the shadow of the door, then put his hand upon her brother's shoulder again, and invited him with a confidential nod to a walk in the garden. Tom, my fine fellow, I want to have a word with you. They had stopped among a disorder of roses. It was part of Mr. Bounderby's humility to keep Nickets's roses on a reduced scale, and Tom sat down on a terrace parapet, plucking buds and picking them to pieces, while his powerful familiar stood over him, with a foot upon the parapet, and his figure easily resting on the arm supported by that knee. They were just visible from her window. Perhaps she saw them. Tom! What's the matter? Oh, Mr. Hardhouse, said Tom with a groan. I am hard up and bothered out of my life. My good fellow, so am I. You, returned Tom, you are the picture of independence, Mr. Hardhouse. I am in a horrible mess. You have no idea what a state I've got myself into. What a state my sister might have got me out of if she would only have done it. He took to biting the rosebuds now, and tearing them away from his teeth with a hand that trembled like an infirm old man's. And after one exceedingly observant look at him, his companion relapsed into his lightest air. Tom, you are inconsiderate. You expect too much of your sister. You have had money of her, you dog. You know you have. Well, Mr. Hardhouse, I know I have. How else was I to get it? Here's old Bounderby, always boasting that at my age he lived upon two pence a month or something that sort. Here's my father drawing what he calls a line and tying me down to it from a baby, neck and heels. Here's my mother who never has anything of her own except her complaints. What is a fellow to do for money, and where am I to look for it, if not to my sister? He was almost crying, and scattered the buds about by dozens. Mr. Harthouse took him persuasively by the coat. But, my dear Tom, if your sister has not got it— Not got it, Mr. Harthouse? I don't say she has got it. I may have wanted more than she was likely to have got, but then she ought to get it. She could get it. It's of no use pretending to make a secret of matters now, after what I've told you already. You know she didn't marry old Boundby for her own sake, or for his sake, but for my sake. Then why doesn't she get what I want out of him for my sake? She's not obliged to say what she's going to do with it. She's sharp enough. She could manage to coax it out of him if she chose. Then why doesn't she choose when I tell her of what consequence it is? But no, there she sits in his company like a stone, instead of making herself agreeable and getting it easily. 
I don't know what you may call this, but I call it unnatural conduct. There was a piece of ornamental water immediately below the parapet on the other side, into which Mr. James Harthouse had a very strong inclination to pitch Mr. Thomas Gradgrind, Jr., as the injured men of Coketown threatened to pitch their property into the Atlantic. But he preserved his easy attitude, and nothing more solid went over the stone balustrades than the accumulated rosebuds now floating about. A little surface island. My dear Tom, said Harthouse, let me try to be your banker. For God's sake, replied Tom suddenly. Don't talk about bankers. And very white he looked, in contrast with the roses, very white. Mr. Harthouse, as a thoroughly well-bred man, accustomed to the best society, was not to be surprised. He could as soon have been affected, but he raised his eyelids a little more, as if they were lifted by a feeble touch of wonder. Albeit it was as much against the precepts of his school to wonder as it was against the doctrines of the Gradgrind College. What is the present need, Tom? Three figures? Out with them, say what they are. <laughs> Mr. Hardhouse, returned Tom, now actually crying and his tears were better than his injuries, however pitiful a figure he made. It's too late. The money is of no use to me at present. I should have had it before to be of use to me. But I am very much obliged to you. You are a true friend. A true friend. Wilp, Wilp, thought Mr. Harthouse lazily. What an ass you are. And I take your offer as a great kindness, said Tom, grasping his hand. That's a great kindness, Mr. Harthouse. Well, returned the other, it may be of more use by and by, and, my good fellow, if you will open your bedevilments to me, when they come thick upon you, I can show you better ways out of them than you can find for yourself. Thank you, said Tom, shaking his head dismally and chewing rosebuds. I wish I had known you sooner, Mr. Harthouse. Now you see, Tom, said Mr. Harthouse, in conclusion, himself tossing over a rose or two as a contribution to the island which was always drifting to the wall, as if it wanted to become a part of the mainland. Every man is selfish in everything he does, and I am exactly like the rest of my fellow creatures. I am desperately intent, the languor of his desperation becoming quite tropical, on your softening towards your sister, which you ought to do, and on your being a more loving and agreeable sort of brother which you ought to be. I will be, Mr. Hardhouse. No time like the present, Tom. Begin at once. Certainly I will, and my sister Lou shall say so. Having made which bargain, Tom? said Hardhouse, clapping him on the shoulder again, with an air which left him at liberty to infer, as he did, poor fool, that this condition was imposed upon him in merely careless good nature to lessen his sense of obligation. We will tear ourselves asunder until dinner time. When Tom appeared before dinner, though his mind seemed heavy enough, his body was on the alert, and he appeared before Mr. Bounderby came in. I didn't mean to be cross, Lou, he said, giving her his hand and kissing her. I know you are fond of me and you know I am fond of you. After this there was a smile upon Louisa's face that day, for someone else. At last, for someone else. So much the less is the whelp the only creature she cares for, thought James Harthouse, reversing the reflection of his first day's knowledge of her pretty face. So much the less, so much the less. The next morning was too bright a morning for sleep and James Harthouse rose early and sat in the pleasant bay window of his dressing-room, smoking the rare tobacco that had had so wholesome an influence on his young friend. Reposing in the sunlight, with the fragrance of his eastern pipe about him, and the dreamy smoke vanishing into the air, so rich and soft with summer odors, he reckoned up his advantages as an idle winner might count his gains. He was not at all bored for the time, and could give his mind to it. 
he had established a confidence with her, from which her husband was excluded. He had established a confidence with her that absolutely turned upon her indifference towards her husband, and the absence, now and at all times, of any congeniality between them. He had artfully, but plainly, assured her that he knew her heart in its last most delicate recesses. He had come so near to her through its tenderest sentiment. He had associated himself with that feeling, and the barrier behind which she lived had melted away. All very odd, and very satisfactory. And yet he had not, even now, any earnest wickedness of purpose in him. Publicly and privately it were much better for the age in which he lived that he and the legion of whom he was one were designedly bad than indifferent and purposeless. It is the drifting icebergs setting with any current anywhere that wreck the ships. When the devil goeth about like a roaring lion, he goeth about in a shape by which few but savages and hunters are attracted. But when he is trimmed, smooth, and varnished, according to the mode, when he is a-weary of vice and a-weary of virtue, used up as to brimstone and used up as to bliss, then, whether he take to the serving out of red tape or to the kindling of red fire, he is the very devil. So James Harthouse reclined in the window, indolently smoking, and reckoning up the steps he had taken on the road by which he happened to be travelling. The end to which it led was before him, pretty plainly. But he troubled himself with no calculations about it. What will be, will be. As he had rather a long ride to take that day, for there was a public occasion to do at some distance, which afforded a tolerable opportunity of going in for the grad-grind men, he dressed early and went down to breakfast. He was anxious to see if she had relapsed since the previous evening. No, it resumed where he had left off. There was a look of interest for him again. He got through the day as much or as little to his own satisfaction, as was to be expected under the fatiguing circumstances, and came riding back at six o'clock. There was a sweep of some half-mile between the lodge and the house, and he was riding along at a foot-pace over the smooth gravel, once Nickets's, when Mr. Bounderby burst out of the shrubbery with such violence as to make his horse shy across the road. "'Art house!' cried Mr. Bounderby. "'Have you heard?' "'Heard what?' said Harthouse, soothing his horse and inwardly favouring Mr. Bounderby with no good wishes. "'Then you haven't heard.' "'I've heard you, and so has this brute. I've heard nothing else.' Mr. Bounderby, red and hot, planted himself in the centre of the path before the horse's head, to explode his bombshell with more effect. "'The bank's robbed.' "'You don't mean it.' "'Robbed last night, sir.' "'Robbed in an extraordinary manner. Robbed with a false key.' "'Of much?' Mr. Bounderby, in his desire to make the most of it, really seemed mortified by being obliged to reply. "'Why, no, not of very much, but it might have been.' "'Of how much?' "'Oh, a uh, sum, if you stick to a sum, uh, not more than hundred and fifty pound,' said Mr. Bounderby, with impatience. But it's not the sum, it's the fact. It's the fact of the bank being robbed. That's the important circumstance. I'm surprised you don't see it. My dear Bounderby, said James, dismounting and giving his bridle to his servant, I do see it, and as I'm overcome as you can possibly desire me to be by the spectacle afforded to my mental view. Nevertheless, I may be allowed, I hope, to congratulate you which I do with all my soul, I assure you, on your not having sustained a greater loss. Uh, thank ye, replied Bounderby, in a short, ungracious manner. But I tell you what, it might have been twenty thousand pound. I suppose it might. Suppose it might, by the Lord, you may suppose so. By George! 
said Mr. Bounderby, with sundry menacing nods and shakes of his head. It might have been twice twenty. There's no knowing what it would have been, or it wouldn't have been, as it was, but for the fellows being disturbed. Louisa had come up now, and Mrs. Sparsett, and Bitzer. Uh, here's Tom Gradgrind's daughter, knows pretty well what it might have been if you don't, blustered Bounderby. Dropped, sir, as if she were shot when I told her. Never knew her to do such a thing before. Does her credit under the circumstances, in my opinion? She still looked faint and pale. James Hardhouse begged her to take his arm, and as they moved on very slowly, asked her how the robbery had been committed. "'But I'm going to tell you,' said Bounderby, irritably giving his arm to Mrs. Sparsett. "'If you hadn't been so mighty particular about the sum, I should have begun to tell you before. You know this lady, for she is a lady, Mrs. Sparsett?' "'I have already had the honour. "'Very well. And this young man bits her. You saw him, too, on the same occasion.' Mr. Harthouse inclined his head in assent and Bitzer knuckled his forehead. Very well. They live at the bank. You know they live at the bank, perhaps? Very well. Yesterday afternoon, at the close of business hours, everything was put away as usual. In the iron room that this young fellow sleeps outside of, there was never mind how much. In the little safe in young Tom's closet, the safe used for petty purposes, there was a hundred and fifty-odd pound. Hundred and fifty-four seven one, said Bitzer. Come, retorted Bounderby, stopping to wheel round upon him. Let's have none of your interruptions. It's bad enough to be robbed while you're snoring because you're too comfortable, without being put right with your poor seven ones. I didn't snore myself when I was at your age, let me tell you. I hadn't victuals enough to snore, and I didn't four seven one. Not if I knew it. Bitzer knuckled his forehead again, in a sneaking manner, and seemed at once particularly impressed and depressed by the instance last given of Mr. Bounderby's moral abstinence. A hundred and fifty-odd pound, resumed Mr. Bounderby. That sum of money young Tom locked in his safe. Not a very strong safe, but that's no matter now. Everything was left all right. Sometime in the night— while this young fellow snored. This is Sparsett, ma'am. You say you have heard him snore? Sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett, I cannot say that I have heard him precisely snore, and therefore must not make that statement. But on winter evenings, when he has fallen asleep at his table, I have heard him, what I should prefer to describe as partially choke. I have heard him on such occasions produce sounds of a nature similar to what may be sometimes heard in Dutch clocks. Not, said Mrs. Sparsett, with a lofty sense of giving strict evidence, that I would convey any imputation on his moral character. Far from it. I have always considered Bitzer a young man of the most upright principle, and to that I beg to bear my testimony. Well— said the exasperated Bounderby. While he was snoring, or choking, or Dutch clocking, or something or other, being asleep, some fellows somehow, whether previously concealed in the house or not, remains to be seen, got to young Tom safe, forced it, and abstracted the contents. Being then disturbed, they made off, letting themselves out at the main door, and double-locking it again. Was double-locked, and the key under Mrs. Sparsett's pillow. We a false key, which were picked up in the street near the bank, about twelve o'clock to-day. No alarm takes place till this chap Bitzer turns out this morning, and begins to open and prepare the offices for business. Then, looking at Tom's safe, he sees the door ajar, and finds the lock forced, and the money gone. Where is Tom, by the by? asked Harthouse, glancing round. "'He's been helping the police,' said Bounderby. "'And stays behind at the bank. I wish these fellows had tried to rob me when I was at his time of life. They'd have been out of pocket if they'd invested eighteen pence in the job, I can tell them that.' "'Is anybody suspected?' 
Suspected? I should think there was somebody suspected. Hey, God, said Bounderby, relinquishing Mrs. Sparsett's arm to wipe his heated head. Josiah Bounderby of Corktown is not to be plundered and nobody suspected. No, thank you. Might Mr. Harthouse inquire who was suspected? I'll tell you, said Bounderby, stopping and facing about to confront them all. It's not to be mentioned everywhere. It's not to be mentioned anywhere in order that the scoundrels concerned, there's a gang of them, may be thrown off their guard. So take this in confidence. Now, wait a bit. Mr. Bounderby wiped his head again. What should you say to— Here he violently exploded. To a hand being in it. I hope, said Harthouse lazily, not our friend Blackpot— Say pool instead of pot, sir, returned Bounderby. And that's the man. Louisa faintly uttered some word of incredulity and surprise. Oh, yes, I know, said Bounderby, immediately catching at the sound. I know, I'm used to that. I know all about it. They're the finest people in the world, these fellows are. They've got the gift of the gab they have. They only want to have their rights explained to them, they do. But I tell you what, show me a dissatisfied hand, and I'll show you the man that's fit for anything bad. I don't care what it is. Another of the popular fictions of Coketown, which some pains have been taken to disseminate, and which some people really believed. But I am acquainted with these chaps, said Bounderby. I can read them off, like books. Mrs. Sparsett, ma'am, I appeal to you. What warning did I give that fellow the first time he set foot in the house, when the express object of his visit was to know how he could knock religion over and floor the established church? Mrs. Sparsett, in point of high connections you are on a level with the aristocracy. Did I say, or did I not say to that fellow, You can't hide the truth from me. You're not the kind of fellow I like. You'll come to no good. Assuredly, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett. You did, in a highly impressive manner, give him such an admonition. When he shocked you, ma'am, said Bounderby. When he shocked your feelings. Yes, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett, with a meek shake of her head. He certainly did so. Though I do not mean to say but that my feelings may be weaker on such points, more foolish, if the term is preferred, than they might have been, if I had always occupied my present position. Mr. Bounderby stared with a bursting pride at Mr. Harthouse, as much as to say, I am the proprietor of this female, and she is worthy of your attention, I think. Then resumed his discourse. You can recall for yourself, Harthouse, what I said to him when you saw him. I didn't mince the matter with him. I am never mealing with them. I know em. Very well, sir. Three days after that he bolted. Went off nobody knows where, as my mother did in my infancy. Only with this difference, that he's a worse subject than my mother, if possible. What did he do before he went? What do you say? Mr. Bounderby, with his hat in his hand, gave a beat upon the crown at every little division of his sentences, as if it were a tambourine. To his being seen, night after night, watching the bank, to his lurking about there after dark, to its striking Mrs. Sparsit that he could be lurking for no good, to her calling Bitzer's attention to him, and they're both taking notice of him, and to its appearing on inquiry to-day, that he was also noticed by the neighbours. Having come to the climax, Mr. Bounderby, like an oriental dancer, put his tambourine on his head. Suspicious, said James Harthouse. Certainly. I think so, sir, said Bounderby, with a defiant nod. I think so. But there are more of them in it. There's an old woman. One never hears of these things till the mischief's done. All sorts of defects are found out on the stable door after the horse is stolen. There's an old woman turns up now, 
an old woman who seems to have been flying into town on a broomstick every now and then. She watches the place a whole day before this fellow begins. And on the night when you saw him, she steals away with him and holds a council with him. I suppose to make her report on going off duty and be damned to her. There was such a person in the room that night, and she shrunk from observation, thought Louisa. That is not all of them, even as we already know them, said Bounderby, with many nods of hidden meaning. But I've said enough for the present. You'll have the goodness to keep it quiet and mention it to no one. It may take time, but we shall have them. It's policy to give them line enough, and there's no objection to that. Of course, they will be punished with the utmost rigour of the law, as notice boards observe, replied James Harthouse. And serve them right. Fellows who go in for banks must take the consequences. If there were no consequences, we should all go in for banks. He had gently taken Louisa's parasol from her hand, and had put it up for her, and she walked under its shade though the sun did not shine there. "'For the present, Lou Bounderby,' said her husband, "'here's Mrs. Sparsit to look after. Mrs. Sparsit's nerves have been acted upon by this business, and she'll stay here a day or two, so make her comfortable.' "'Thank you very much, sir,' that discreet lady observed. "'But pray do not let my comfort be a consideration. Anything will do for me.' It soon appeared that if Mrs. Sparsit had a failing in her association with that domestic establishment, it was that she was so excessively regardless of herself and regardful of others as to be a nuisance. On being shown her chamber, she was so dreadfully sensible of its comforts as to suggest the inference that she would have preferred to pass the night on the mangle in the laundry. True, the Powlers and the Skadgerses were accustomed to splendour. But it is my duty to remember. Mrs. Sparsit was fond of observing with a lofty grace, particularly when any of the domestics were present, that what I was I am no longer. Indeed, said she, if I could altogether cancel the remembrance that Mr. Sparsit was a Powler, or that I myself am related to the Skadgers family, or if I could even revoke the fact and make myself a person of common descent and ordinary connections, I would gladly do so. I should think it, under existing circumstances, right to do so. The same hermetical state of mind led to her renunciation of made dishes and wines at dinner, until fairly commanded by Mr. Bounderby to take them, when she said, Indeed, you are very good, sir and departed from a resolution of which she had made rather formal and public announcement, to wait for the simple mutton. She was likewise deeply apologetic for wanting the salt, and feeling amiably bound to bear out Mr. Bounderby to the fullest extent in the testimony he had borne to her nerves, occasionally sat back in her chair and silently wept, at which periods a tear of large dimensions like a crystal earring, might be observed, or rather must be, for it insisted on public notice, sliding down her Roman nose. But Mrs. Sparsett's greatest point, first and last, was her determination to pity Mr. Bounderby. There were occasions when, in looking at him, she was involuntarily moved to shake her head, as who would say, Alas! Poor Yorick! After allowing herself to be betrayed into these evidences of emotion, she would force a lambent brightness, and would be fitfully cheerful, and would say, You have still good spirits, sir, I am thankful to find, and would appear to hail it as a blessed dispensation that Mr. Bounderby bore up as he did. One idiosyncrasy for which she often apologized she found it excessively difficult to conquer. She had a curious propensity to call Mrs. Bounderby Miss Gradgrind, and yielded to it some three or four score times in the course of the evening. Her repetition of this mistake covered Mrs. Sparsit with modest confusion, 
but indeed, she said, it seemed so natural to say Miss Gradgrind, whereas, to persuade herself that the young lady whom she had had the happiness of knowing from a child could be really and truly Mrs. Bounderby, she found almost impossible. It was a further singularity of this remarkable case, that the more she thought about it, the more impossible it appeared. The difference is, she observed, being such, in the drawing-room after dinner, Mr. Bounderby tried the case of the robbery, examined the witnesses, made notes of the evidence, found the suspected persons guilty, and sentenced them to the extreme punishment of the law. That done, Bitzer was dismissed to town with instructions to recommend Tom to come home by the mail train. When candles were brought, Mrs. Sparsett murmured, Don't be low, sir. Pray let me see you cheerful, sir, as I used to do. Mr. Bounderby, upon whom these consolations had begun to produce the effect of making him, in a bull-headed blundering way, sentimental, sighed like some large sea-animal. "'I cannot bear to see you so, sir,' said Mrs. Sparsett. "'Try a hand at backgammon, sir, as you used to do when I had the honour of living under your roof.' "'I haven't played backgammon, ma'am,' said Mr. Bounderby, "'since that time.' "'No, sir,' said Mrs. Sparsett, soothingly. "'I am aware that you have not. I remember that Miss Gradgrind takes no interest in the game. But I shall be happy, sir, if you will condescend." They played near a window opening on the garden. It was a fine night, not moonlight, but sultry and fragrant. Louisa and Mr. Harthouse strolled out into the garden, where their voices could be heard in the stillness, though not what they said. Mrs. Sparsett, from her place at the backgammon board, was constantly straining her eyes to pierce the shadows without. "'What's the matter, ma'am?' said Mr. Bounderby. "'You don't see a fire, do you?' "'Oh, dear, no, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsett. "'I was thinking of the dew.' "'What have you got to do with the dew, ma'am?' said Mr. Bounderby. "'It's not myself, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsett. I am fearful of Miss Gradgrind's taking cold. She never takes cold, said Mr. Bounderby. Really, sir? <coughs> said Mrs. Sparsett, and was affected with a cough in her throat. When the time drew near for retiring, Mr. Bounderby took a glass of water. Oh, sir, said Mrs. Sparsett. Not your sherry warm with lemon peel and nutmeg? Why, I've got out of the habit of taking it now, ma'am, said Mr. Bounderby. Oh, the more's the pity, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett. You are losing all your good old habits. Cheer up, sir. If Miss Gradgrind will permit me, I will offer to make it for you, as I have often done. Miss Gradgrind, readily permitting Mrs. Sparsett to do anything she pleased, that considerate lady made the beverage and handed it to Mr. Bounderby. It will do you good, sir. It will warm your heart. It is the sort of thing you want, and ought to take, sir. And when Mr. Bounderby said, Your health, ma'am, she answered with great feeling, Thank you, sir. The same to you, and happiness also. Finally, she wished him good night with great pathos, and Mr. Bounderby went to bed with a maudlin persuasion that he had been crossed in something tender, though he could not, for his life, have mentioned what it was. Long after Louisa had undressed and lain down, she watched and waited for her brother's coming home. That could hardly be, she knew, until an hour past midnight. But in the country silence, which did anything but calm the trouble of her thoughts, time lagged wearily. At last, when the darkness and stillness had seemed for hours to thicken one another, she heard the bell at the gate. She felt as though she would have been glad that it had rang on until daylight, but it ceased, 
and the circles of its last sound spread out fainter and wider in the air, and all was dead again. She waited yet another quarter of an hour, as she judged. Then she arose, put on a loose robe, and went out of her room in the dark and up the staircase to her brother's room. His door being shut, she softly opened it and spoke to him, approaching his bed with a noiseless step. She kneeled down beside it, passed her arm over his neck, and drew his face to hers. She knew that he only feigned to be asleep, but she said nothing to him. He started by and by as if he were just then awakened, and asked who that was and what was the matter. Tom, have you anything to tell me? If ever you loved me in your life and have anything concealed from everyone besides, tell it to me. I, I don't know what you mean, Lou. You have been dreaming. My dear brother. She laid her head down on his pillow, and her hair flowed over him as if she would hide him from everyone but herself. Is there nothing that you have to tell me? Is there nothing you can tell me if you will? You can tell me nothing that will change me. Oh, Tom, tell me the truth. I don't know what you mean, Lou. As you lie here alone, my dear, in the melancholy night, so you must lie somewhere one night when even I, if I am living then, shall have left you. As I am here beside you, barefoot, unclothed, undistinguishable in darkness, so must I lie through all the night of my decay until I am dust. In the name of that time, Tom, tell me the truth now. What is it you want to know? You may be certain. In the energy of her love, she took him to her bosom as if he were a child. That I will not reproach you. You may be certain that I will be compassionate and true to you. You may be certain that I will save you at whatever cost. Oh, Tom, have you nothing to tell me? Whisper very softly. Say only yes, and I shall understand you. She turned her ear to his lips, but he remained doggedly silent. Not a word, Tom. How can I say yes, or how can I say no, when I don't know what you mean? Lou, you are a brave, kind girl. Worthy I begin to think of a better brother than I am. But I have nothing more to say. Go to bed. Go to bed. You are tired. She whispered presently, more in her usual way. Yes, I am quite tired out. You have been so hurried and disturbed today. Have any fresh discoveries been made? Only those you have heard of from him. Tom, have you said to anyone that we made a visit to those people and that we saw those three together? No. Didn't you yourself particularly ask me to keep it quiet when you asked me to go there with you? Yes, but I did not know then what was going to happen. Nor I neither. How could I? He was very quick upon her with this retort. Ought I to say, after what has happened? said his sister, standing by the bed. She had gradually withdrawn herself and risen. That I made that visit. Should I say so? Must I say so? Good heavens, Lou, returned her brother. You are not in the habit of asking my advice. Say what you like. If you keep it to yourself, I shall keep it to myself. If you disclose it, there's an end of it. It was too dark for either to see the other's face, but each seemed very attentive and to consider before speaking. Tom, do you believe the man I gave the money to is really implicated in this crime? I don't know. I don't see why he shouldn't be. He seemed to me an honest man. Another person may seem to you dishonest and yet not be so. There was a pause, for he had hesitated and stopped. In short, resumed Tom, as if he had made up his mind, if you come to that, perhaps I was so far from being altogether in his favor that I took him outside the door to tell him quietly that I thought he might consider himself very well off to get such a windfall as he had got from my sister, and that I hoped he would make good use of it. You remember whether I took him out or not. I say nothing against a man. He may be a very good fellow, for anything I know. I hope he is. Was he offended by what you said? No, he took it pretty well. He was civil enough. Where are you, Lou? He sat up in bed and kissed her. Good night, my dear. Good night. You have nothing more to tell me? No. What should I have? He wouldn't have me tell you a lie. 
I wouldn't have you do that tonight, Tom, of all the nights in your life, many and much happier as I hope they will be. Thank you, my dear Lou. I'm so tired that I'm sure I wonder I don't say anything to get to sleep. Go, go to bed, go to bed. Kissing her again, he turned round, drew the coverlet over his head, and lay as still as if that time had come by which she had adjured him. She stood for some time at the bedside before she slowly moved away. She stopped at the door, looked back when she had opened it, and asked him if he had called her. But he lay still, and she softly closed the door and returned to her room. Then the wretched boy looked cautiously up and found her gone, crept out of bed, fastened his door, and threw himself upon his pillow again tearing his hair, morosely crying, grudgingly loving her, hatefully but impenitently spurning himself, and no less hatefully and unprofitably spurning all the good in the world. Mrs. Sparsett, lying by to recover the tone of her nerves in Mr. Bounderby's retreat, kept such a sharp lookout night and day under her Carolanian eyebrows that her eyes, like a couple of lighthouses on an iron-bound coast, might have warned all prudent mariners from that bold rock her Roman nose, and the dark and craggy region in its neighborhood, but for the placidity of her manner. Although it was hard to believe that her retiring for the night could be anything but a form, so severely wide awake were those classical eyes of hers, and so impossible did it seem that her rigid nose could yield to any relaxing influence, yet her manner of sitting, smoothing her uncomfortable, not to say gritty, mittens, they were constructed of a cool fabric like a meat-safe, or of ambling to unknown places of destination with her foot in her cotton stirrup, was so perfectly serene that most observers would have been constrained to suppose her a dove, embodied by some freak of nature in the earthly tabernacle of a bird of the hook-beaked order. She was a most wonderful woman for prowling about the house. How she got from story to story was a mystery beyond solution. A lady so decorous in herself, and so highly connected, was not to be suspected of dropping over the banisters or sliding down them. Yet her extraordinary facility of locomotion suggested the wild idea. Another noticeable circumstance in Mrs. Sparsett was that she was never hurried. She would shoot with consummate velocity from the roof to the hall, yet would be in full possession of her breath and dignity on the moment of her arrival there. Neither was she ever seen by human vision to go at a great pace. She took very kindly to Mr. Harthouse, and had some pleasant conversation with him soon after her arrival. She made him her stately curtsy in the garden, one morning before breakfast. "'It appears but yesterday, sir,' said Mrs. Barset, "'that I had the honour of receiving you at the bank, when you were so good as to wish to be made acquainted with Mr. Bounderby's address.' "'An occasion, I am sure, not to be forgotten by myself in the course of ages,' said Mr. Harthouse, inclining his head to Mrs. Sparsett with the most indolent of all possible airs. "'We live in a singular world, sir,' said Mrs. Sparsett. "'I have had the honour, by a coincidence of which I am proud, to have made a remark, similar in effect, though not so epigrammatically expressed.' "'A singular world, I would say, sir,' pursued Mrs. Sparsett, after acknowledging the compliment with a drooping of her dark eyebrows, not altogether so mild in its expression as her voice was in its dulcet tones. As regards the intimacies we form at one time, with individuals we were quite ignorant of, at another. I recall, sir, that on that occasion you went so far as to say you were actually apprehensive of Miss Gradgrind. Your memory does me more honour than my insignificance deserves. I availed myself of your obliging hints to correct my timidity, and it is unnecessary to add that they were perfectly accurate. Mrs. Sparsett's talent for 
in fact, for anything requiring accuracy with a combination of strength of mind and family, is too habitually developed to admit of any question. He was almost falling asleep over this compliment. It took him so long to get through, and his mind wandered so much in the course of its execution. You found Miss Gradgrind— I really cannot call her Mrs. Bounderby. It's very absurd of me. As youthful as I described her? You drew her portrait perfectly, said Mr. Harthouse. Presented her dead image. Very engaging, sir, said Mrs. Sparsit, causing her mittens slowly to revolve over one another. Highly so. It used to be considered, said Mrs. Sparsit, that Miss Gradgrind was wanting in animation, but I confess she appears to me considerably and strikingly improved in that respect. Aye, and indeed here is Mr. Bounderby, cried Mrs. Sparsit, nodding her head a great many times, as if she had been talking and thinking of no one else. How do you find yourself this morning, sir? Pray, let us see you cheerful, sir. Now, these persistent assuagements of his misery and lightnings of his load had by this time begun to have the effect of making Mr. Bounderby softer than usual toward Mrs. Sparsit, and harder than usual to most other people from his wife downward. So, when Mrs. Sparsit said, with forced lightness of heart, You want your breakfast, sir, but I dare say Miss Gradgrind will soon be here to preside at the table. Mr. Bounderby replied, If I waited to be taken care of by my wife, ma'am, I believe you know pretty well I should wait till doomsday. So I'll trouble you to take charge of the teapot. Mrs. Sparsett complied and assumed her old position at table. This again made the excellent woman vastly sentimental. She was so humble withal that when Louisa appeared she rose, protesting she never could think of sitting in that place under existing circumstances, often as she had had the honour of making Mr. Bounderby's breakfast, before Mrs. Gradgrind, she begged pardon, she meant to say Miss Bounderby, she hoped to be excused, but she really could not get it right yet, though she trusted to become familiar with it by and by, had assumed her present position. It was only, she observed, because Miss Gradgrind happened to be a little late, and Mr. Bounderby's time was so very precious, and she knew it of old to be so essential that he should have breakfast to the moment, that she had taken the liberty of complying with his request, long as his will had been a law to her. "'There, stop where you are, ma'am,' said Bounderby. "'Stop where you are. Mrs. Bounderby will be very glad to be relieved of the trouble, I believe.' "'Don't say that, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsett, almost with severity. "'Because that is very unkind to Mrs. Bounderby. And to be unkind is not to be you, sir.' "'You may set your mind at rest, ma'am. You can take it very quietly, can't you, Lou?' said Mr. Bounderby, in a blustering way, to his wife. "'Of course. It is of no moment. Why should it be of any importance to me?' "'Why should it be of any importance to any one, Mrs. Sparsit, ma'am?' said Mr. Bounderby, swelling with a sense of slight. "'You attach too much importance to these things, ma'am. By George, you'll be corrupted in some of your notions here.' You are old-fashioned, ma'am. You are behind Tom Gradrine's children's time. What is the matter with you? asked Louisa, coldly surprised. What has given you offence? Offence? repeated Bounderby. Do you suppose if there was any offence given me, I shouldn't name it and request to have it corrected? I'm a straightforward man, I believe. I don't go beating about for side winds. I suppose no one ever had occasion to think you too diffident or too delicate. Louisa answered him composedly. I have never made that objection to you, either as a child or as a woman. I don't understand what you would have. Have? returned Mr. Bounderby. Nothing. Otherwise, don't you, Lou Bounderby, know thoroughly well 
that I, Josiah Bounderby of Coketown, would have it. She looked at him, as he struck the table and made the teacups ring, with a proud color in her face that was a new change, Mr. Harthouse thought. You are incomprehensible this morning, said Louisa. Pray take no further trouble to explain yourself. I am not curious to know your meaning. What does it matter? Nothing more was said on this theme, and Mr. Harthouse was soon idly gay on indifferent subjects. But from this day the sparset action upon Mr. Bounderby threw Louisa and James Harthouse more together, and strengthened the dangerous alienation from her husband and confidence against him with another, into which she had fallen by degrees so fine that she could not retrace them if she tried. But whether she ever tried or no, lay hidden in her own closed heart. Mrs. Sparsett was so much affected on this particular occasion, that, assisting Mr. Bounderby to his hat after breakfast, and being then alone with him in the hall, she imprinted a chaste kiss upon his hand, murmured, My benefactor, and retired, overwhelmed with grief. Yet it is an indubitable fact, within the cognizance of this history, that five minutes after he had left the house in the self-same hat, the same descendant of the Scadgerses and connection by matrimony of the Powlers shook her right-hand mitten at his portrait, made a contemptuous grimace at that work of art, and said, Serve you right, you noodle, and I am glad of it. Mr. Bounderby had not been long gone when Bitzer appeared. Bitzer had come down by train, shrieking and rattling over the long line of arches that bestrode the wild country of past and present coal pits, with an express from Stone Lodge. It was a hasty note to inform Louisa that Mrs. Gradgrind lay very ill. She had never been well within her daughter's knowledge, but she had declined within the last few days had continued sinking all through the night, and was now as nearly dead as her limited capacity of being in any state that implied the ghost of an intention to get out of it allowed. Accompanied by the lightest of porters, fit colorless servants her at death's door when Mrs. Gradgrind knocked, Louisa rumbled to Coketown, over the coal pits, past and present, and was whirled into its smoky jaws. She dismissed the messenger to his own devices, and rode away to her old home. She had seldom been there since her marriage. Her father was usually sifting and sifting at his parliamentary cinder-heap in London, without being observed to turn up many precious articles among the rubbish, and was still hard at it in the national dust-yard. Her mother had taken it rather as a disturbance than otherwise to be visited, as she reclined upon her sofa. Young people, Louisa felt herself all unfit for. Sissy, she had never softened to again since the night when the stroller's child had raised her eyes to look at Mr. Bounderby's intended wife. She had no inducements to go back, and had rarely gone. Neither, as she approached her old home now, did any of the best influences of old home descend upon her. The dreams of childhood, its airy fables, its graceful, beautiful, humane, impossible adornments of the world beyond, so good to be believed in once, so good to be remembered when outgrown, for then the least among them rises to the stature of a great charity in the heart, suffering little children to come into the midst of it, and to keep with their pure hands a garden in the stony ways of this world, wherein it were better for all the children of Adam that they should oftener sun themselves, simple and trustful and not worldly wise, what had she to do with these? Remembrances of how she had journeyed to the little that she knew, by the enchanted roads of what she and millions of innocent creatures had hoped and imagined, of how, first coming upon reason through the tender light of fancy, 
she had seen it a beneficent god, deferring to gods as great as herself. Not a grim idol, cruel and cold, with its victims bound hand to foot, and its big dumb shape set up with a sightly stare, never to be moved by anything but so many calculated tons of leverage, what had she to do with these? Her remembrances of home and childhood were remembrances of the drying up of every spring and fountain in her young heart as it gushed out. The golden waters were not there. They were flowing for the fertilization of the land where grapes are gathered from thorns and figs from thistles. She went, with a heavy, hardened kind of sorrow upon her, into the house and into her mother's room. Since the time of her leaving home, Sissy had lived with the rest of the family on equal terms. Sissy was at her mother's side, and Jane, her sister, now ten or twelve years old, was in the room. There was great trouble before it could be made known to Mrs. Gradgrind that her eldest child was there. She reclined, propped up, from mere habit, on a couch, as nearly in her old usual attitude as anything so helpless could be kept in. She had positively refused to take to her bed, on the ground that if she did, she would never hear the last of it. Her feeble voice sounded so far away in her bundle of shawls, and the sound of another voice addressing her seemed to take such a long time in getting down to her ears, that she might have been lying at the bottom of a well. The poor lady was nearer truth than she ever had been, which had much to do with it. On being told that Mrs. Bounderby was there, she replied, at cross-purposes, that she had never called him by that name since he married Louisa, that, pending her choice of an objectionable name, she had called him J, and that she could not at present depart from that regulation, not being yet provided with a permanent substitute. Louisa had sat by her for some minutes, and had spoken to her often, before she arrived at a clear understanding who it was. She then seemed to come to it all at once. "'Well, my dear,' said Mrs. Gradgrind, "'and I hope you are going on satisfactorily to yourself. It was all your father's doing. He set his heart upon it, and he ought to know.' "'I want to hear of you, mother, not of myself.' "'You want to hear of me, my dear? That's something new, I am sure, when anybody wants to hear of me. Not at all well, Louisa, very faint and giddy.' "'Are you in pain, dear mother?' I think there's a pain somewhere in the room, said Mrs. Gradgrind. But I couldn't positively say that I have got it. After this strange speech, she lay silent for some time. Louisa, holding her hand, could feel no pulse, but kissing it could see a slight thin thread of life in fluttering motion. You very seldom see your sister, said Mrs. Gradgrind. She grows like you. I wish you would look at her. Sissy, bring her here. She was brought, and stood with her hand in her sister's. Louisa had observed her with her arm round Sissy's neck, and she felt the difference of this approach. Do you see the likeness, Louisa? Yes, mother, I should think her like me, but— Ah, oh, yes, I always say so. Mrs. Gradgrind cried with unexpected quickness. And that reminds me, I— I want to speak to you, my dear. Sissy, my good girl, leave us alone for a minute. Louisa had relinquished the hand, had thought that her sister's was a better and brighter face than hers had ever been, had seen in it, not without a rising feeling of resentment, even in that place and at that time, something of the gentleness of the other face in the room, the sweet face with the trusting eyes, made paler than watching and sympathy made it by the rich dark hair. Left alone with her mother, Louisa saw her lying with an awful lull upon her face, like one who was floating away under some great water, all resistance over, content to be carried down the stream. She put the shadow of a hand to her lips again, and recalled her. You were going to speak to me, mother. Eh? 
Yes, to be sure, my dear. You know your father is almost always away now, and therefore I must write to him about it. About what, mother? Don't be troubled. About what? You must remember, my dear, that whenever I have said anything on any subject, I have never heard the last of it, and consequently that I have long left off saying anything. I can hear you, mother. But it was only by dint of bending down to her ear, and at the same time attentively watching the lips as they moved, that she could link such faint and broken sounds into any chain of connection. You learnt a great deal, Louisa, and so did your brother, ologies of all kinds from morning to night. If there is any ology left of any description that has not been worn to rags in this house, all I can say is, I hope I shall never hear its name. I can hear you, mother, when you have strength to go on. This to keep her from floating away. But there is something, not an ology at all, that your father has missed or forgotten, Louisa. I don't know what it is. I have often sat with Sissy near me and thought about it. I shall never get its name now, but your father may. It makes me restless. I want to write to him to find out for God's sake what it is. Give me a pen, give me a pen. Even the power of restlessness was gone, except from the poor head which could just turn from side to side. She fancied, however, that her request had been complied with and that the pen she could not have held was in her hand. It matters little what figures of wonderful no meaning she began to trace upon her wrappers. The hand soon stopped in the midst of them. The light that had always been feeble and dim behind the weak transparency went out, and even Mrs. Gradgrind emerged from the shadow in which man walketh and disquieteth himself in vain, took upon her the dread solemnity of the sages and patriarchs. Mrs. Sparsett's nerves began slow to recover their tone. The worthy woman made a stay of some weeks in duration at Mr. Bounderby's retreat, where, notwithstanding her anchorite turn of mind, based upon her becoming consciousness of her altered state, she resigned herself, with noble fortitude, to lodging, as one may say, in clover, and feeding on the fat of the land. During the whole term of this recess from the guardianship of the bank, Mrs. Sparsett was a pattern of consistency, continuing to take such pity on Mr. Bounderby to his face, as is rarely taken on man, and to call his portrait a noodle to its face, with the greatest acrimony and contempt. Mr. Bounderby, having got it into his explosive composition that Mrs. Sparsett was a highly superior woman to perceive that he had that general cross upon him in his deserts, for he had not yet settled what it was, and further that Louisa would have objected to her as a frequent visitor, if it had comported with his greatness that she should object to anything he chose to do, resolved not to lose sight of Mrs. Sparsett easily. So when her nerves were strung up to the pitch of again consuming sweetbreads in solitude, he said to her at the dinner-table, on the day before her departure, "'I tell you what, ma'am, you shall come down here of a Saturday, while the fine weather lasts, and stay till Monday.' To which Mrs. Sparsett returned, in effect, though not of the Mohammedan persuasion, to hear is to obey. Now, Mrs. Sparsett was not a poetical woman, but she took an idea in the nature of an allegorical fancy into her head. Much watching of Louisa, and much consequent observation of her impenetrable demeanour, which keenly whetted and sharpened Mrs. Sparsett's edge, must have given her, as it were, a lift in the way of inspiration. She erected in her mind a mighty staircase, with a dark pit of shame and ruin at the bottom, and down those stairs, from day to day and hour to hour, she saw Louisa coming. It became the business of Mrs. Sparsett's life to look up at her staircase, and to watch Louisa coming down, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, sometimes several steps at one bout sometimes stopping, never turning back. 
If she had once turned back, it might have been the death of Mrs. Sparsit in spleen and grief. She had been descending steadily to the day and on the day when Mr. Bounderby issued the weekly invitation recorded above. Mrs. Sparsit was in good spirits, and inclined to be conversational. "'And pray, sir,' said she, "'if I may venture to ask a question appertaining to any subject on which you show reserve, which is indeed hardly in me, for I well know you have a reason for everything you do, have you received intelligence respecting the robbery? Why, um, no, not, not yet. Under the circumstances, I didn't expect it yet. Rome wasn't built in a day, ma'am. Very true, sir, said Mrs. Sparsett, shaking her head. No, yet in a week, ma'am. No, indeed, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett, with a gentle melancholy upon her. In a similar manner, ma'am, said Bounderby. I can wait, you know. If Romulus and Remus could wait, Josiah Bounderby can wait. They were better off in their youth than I was, however. They had a she-wolf for a nurse. I had only a she-wolf for a grandmother. She didn't give any milk, ma'am. She gave bruises. <laughs> she was a regular old and at that. Ah! Mrs. Sparsett sighed and shuddered. No, ma'am. "'continued Bounderby. "'I have not heard anything more about it. "'It's in hand, though, and young Tom, "'who rather sticks to business at present, "'something new for him, he hadn't the school in I had, "'is helping. "'My injunction is, keep it quiet, "'and let it seem to blow over. "'Do what you like under the rose, "'but don't give a sign of what you're about, "'though half a hundred of them will combine together and get this fellow, who was bolted, out of reach for good. Keep it quiet, and the thieves will grow in confidence by little and little, and we shall have them. Very sagacious, sir, said Mrs. Sparsett. Very interesting. The old woman you mentioned, sir. The old woman I mentioned, ma'am, said Bounderby, cutting the matter short, as it was nothing to boast about is not laid hold of. But she may take her oath she will be, if that's any satisfaction to a villainous old mind. In the meantime, ma'am, I am of the opinion, if you ask me my opinion, that the less she's talked about, the better. The same evening, Mrs. Sparsett, in her chamber window, resting from her packing operations, looked towards her great staircase and saw Louisa still descending. She sat by Mr. Harthouse in an alcove in the garden, talking very low. He stood leaning over her, as they whispered together, and his face almost touched her hair. "'If not quite,' said Mrs. Sparsett, straining her hawk's eyes to the utmost. Mrs. Sparsett was too distant to hear a word of their discourse, or even to know that they were speaking softly, otherwise than from the expression of their figures. But what they said was this. You recollect the man, Mr. Harthouse? Uh, perfectly. His face, and his manner, and what he said? Perfectly. And an infinitely dreary person he appeared to me to be, lengthy and prosy in the extreme. It was knowing to hold forth in the humble virtue school of eloquence. But I assure you I thought at the time, my good fellow, you were overdoing this. It has been very difficult to me to think ill of that man. My dear Louisa, as Tom says, which he never did say, you know no good of the fellow? No, certainly. Nor of any other such person? How can I? She returned with more of her first manner on her than he had lately seen. When I know nothing of them, men or women. My dear Louisa, then consent to receive the submissive representation of your devoted friend, who knows something of the several varieties of his excellent fellow-creatures, for excellent they are. I am quite ready to believe, in spite of such little foibles, are as always helping themselves to what they can get hold of. This fellow talks. Well, every fellow talks. 
He professes morality. Well, all sorts of humbugs profess morality. From the House of Commons to the House of Correction, there is a general profession of morality, except among our people. It really is that exception which makes our people quite reviving. You saw and heard the case? He was one of the fluffy classes pulled up extremely short by my esteemed friend Mr. Bounderby, who, as we know, is not possessed of that delicacy which would soften so tight a hand. The member of the fluffy classes was injured, exasperated, left the house grumbling, met somebody who proposed to him to go in for some share of this bank business, went in, put something in his pocket which had nothing in it before, and relieved his mind extremely. Really, he would have been an uncommon, instead of a common fellow, if he had not availed himself of such an opportunity. Or he may have originated altogether, if he had the cleverness. I almost feel as though it must be bad in me, returned Louisa, after sitting thoughtful a while, to be so ready to agree with you, and to be so lightened in my heart by what you say. I only say what is reasonable, nothing worse. I have talked it over with my friend Tom more than once. Of course, I remain on terms of perfect confidence with Tom, and he is quite of my opinion, and I am quite of his. Will you walk? They strolled away, among the lanes beginning to be indistinct in the twilight, she leaning on his arm, and she little thought how she was going down, down, down Mrs. Sparsett's staircase. Night and day Mrs. Sparsett kept it standing, when Louisa had arrived at the bottom and disappeared in the gulf, it might fall in upon her, if it would. But until then, there it was to be, a building before Mrs. Sparsett's eyes, and there Louisa always was upon it, and always gliding down, down, down. Mrs. Sparsett saw James Harthouse come and go. She heard of him here and there, she saw the changes of the face he had studied. She, too, remarked to a nicety how and when it clouded, how and when it cleared. She kept her black eyes wide open, with no touch of pity, with no touch of compunction, all absorbed in interest. In the interest of seeing her, ever drawing, with no hand to stay her, nearer and nearer to the bottom of this new giant's staircase. With all her deference for Mr. Bounderby as contradistinguished from his portrait, Mrs. Sparsett had not the smallest intention of interrupting the descent. Eager to see it accomplished, and yet patient, she waited for the last fall as for the ripeness and fullness of the harvest of her hopes. Hushed in expectancy, she kept her wary gaze upon the stairs, and seldom so much as darkly shook her right mitten, with her fist in it, at the figure coming down. The figure descended the great stairs steadily, steadily, always verging, like a weight in deep water, to the black gulf at the bottom. Mr. Gradgrind, apprised of his wife's decease, made an expedition from London, and buried her in a business-like manner. He then returned with promptitude to the national cinder-heap, and resumed his sifting for the odds and ends he wanted, and his throwing of the dust about into the eyes of other people who wanted other odds and ends, in fact resumed his parliamentary duty. In the meantime, Mrs. Sparsett kept unwinking watch and ward, separated from her staircase all the week by the length of iron road dividing Coketown from the country house, she yet maintained her cat-like observation of Louisa through her husband, through her brother, through James Harthouse, through the outsides of letters and packets, through everything animate and inanimate that at any time went near the stairs. "'Your foot on the last step, my lady,' said Mrs. Sparsett, apostrophizing the descending figure with the aid of her threatening mitten. "'And all your art shall never blind me.' "'Art or nature, though, the original stock of Louise's character, or the graft of circumstances upon it, 
her curious reserve did baffle, while it stimulated, one as sagacious as Mrs. Sparsit. There were times when Mr. James Harthouse was not sure of her. There were times when he could not read the face he had studied so long, and when this lonely girl was a greater mystery to him than any woman of the world with a ring of satellites to help her. So time went on, until it happened that Mr. Bounderby was called away from home by business which required his presence elsewhere for three or four days. It was on a Friday that he intimated this to Mrs. Sparsit at the bank, adding, "'But you'll go down to-morrow, ma'am, all the same. You'll go down just as if I was there. It will make no difference to you.' "'Pray, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsit, reproachfully, "'let me beg you not to say that. Your absence will make a vast difference to me, sir, as I think you very well know.' "'Well, ma'am, then uh, you must get on in my absence as, uh, as well as you can,' said Mr. Bounderby, not displeased. "'Mr. Bounderby,' retorted Mrs. Sparsit, "'your will is to me a law, sir. Otherwise it might be my inclination to dispute your kind commands, not feeling sure that it will be quite so agreeable to Miss Gradgrind to receive me, as it ever is to your own munificent hospitality.' But you shall say no more, sir. I will go upon your invitation. Why, when I invite you to my house, ma'am, said Bounderby, opening his eyes, I should hope you'd want no other invitation. No, indeed, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsit. I should hope not. Say no more, sir. I would, sir, I could see you gay again. What do you mean, ma'am? blustered Bounderby. Sir, rejoined Mrs. Sparsit. There was wont to be an elasticity in you which I sadly miss. Be buoyant, sir. Mr. Bounderby, under the influence of this difficult adjuration, backed up by her compassionate eye, could only scratch his head in a feeble and ridiculous manner, and afterwards assert himself at a distance by being heard to bully the small fry of business all the morning. Bit, sir said Mrs. Sparsit that afternoon, when her patron was gone on his journey, and the bank was closing. "'Present my compliments to young Mr. Thomas, and ask him if he would step up and partake of a lamb-chop and walnut ketchup, with a glass of India ale.' Young Mr. Thomas, being usually ready for anything in that way, returned a gracious answer, and followed on its heels. "'Mr. Thomas,' said Mrs. Sparsit, these plain viands being on table, I thought you might be tempted. Thank you, Mrs. Sparsit, said the whelp, and gloomily fell to. How is Mr. Harthouse, Mr. Tom? asked Mrs. Sparsit. Oh, he's all right, said Tom. Where may he be at present? Mrs. Sparsit asked, in a light conversational manner, after mentally devoting the whelp to the furies for being so uncommunicative. He's shooting at Yorkshire, said Tom. Sent Lou a basket half as big as a church yesterday. The kind of gentleman now, said Mrs. Sparsit, sweetly, whom one might wager to be a good shot. Crack, said Tom. He had long been a down-looking young fellow, but this characteristic had so increased of late that he never raised his eyes to any face for three seconds together. Mrs. Sparsit, consequently, had ample means of watching his looks, if she were so inclined. "'Mr. Harthouse is a great favourite of mine,' said Mrs. Sparsit. "'As indeed he is of most people. May we expect to see him again shortly, Mr. Tom?' "'Why, I expect to see him to-morrow,' returned the whelp. "'Good news!' cried Mrs. Sparsit, blandly. "'I've got an appointment with him, to meet him in the evening at the station here.' said Tom. And I'm going to dine with him afterwards, I believe. He's not coming down to the country house for a week or so, being due somewhere else. At least, he says so. But I shouldn't wonder if he was to stop here over Sunday and stray that way. Which reminds me, said Mrs. Sparsit. Would you remember a message to your sister, Mr. Tom, if I was to charge you with one? Well, I'll try, returned the reluctant whelp. If it isn't a long one. 
It is merely my respectful compliments, said Mrs. Parsett. And I fear I may not trouble her with my society this week, being still a little nervous, and better perhaps by my poor self. Oh, if that's all, observed Tom. It wouldn't much matter, even if I also forget it, for Lou is not likely to think of you unless she sees you. Having paid for his entertainment with this agreeable compliment, he relapsed into a hangdog silence until there was no more India ale left. When he said, "Well, Mrs. Parsett, I must be off," and went off. Next day, Saturday, Mrs. Parsett sat at her window all day long, looking at the customers going in and out, watching the postman, keeping an eye on the general traffic of the street, revolving many things in her mind, but above all, keeping her attention on her staircase. The evening come. She put on her bonnet and shawl and went quietly out, having her reasons for hovering in a furtive way about the station by which a passenger would arrive from Yorkshire, and for preferring to peep into it round pillars and corners and out of ladies' waiting room windows to approach its precincts openly. Tom was in attendance and loitered about until the expected train came in. It brought no Mister Hardhouse. Tom waited until the crowd had dispersed and the bustle was over, and then referred to a posted list of trains and took counsel with porters. That done, he strolled away idly, stopping in the streets and looking up it and down it, and lifting his hat off and putting it on again, and yawning and stretching himself. And exhibiting all the symptoms of mortal weariness to be expected in one who had still to wait until the next train should come in, an hour and forty minutes hence. This is a device to keep him out of the way," said Mrs. Sparsit, starting from the dull office window whence she had watched him last. Harthouse is with his sister now. It was the conception of an inspired moment. And she shot off with her utmost swiftness to work it out. The station for the country house was at the opposite end of the town. The time was short, the road not easy, but she was so quick in pouncing on a disengaged coach, so quick in darting out of it, producing her money, seizing her ticket, and diving into the train, that she was borne along the arches spanning the land of coal pits, past and present. As if she had been caught up in a cloud and whirled away. All the journey, immovable in the air, though never left behind, plain to the dark eyes of her mind as the electric wires which ruled a colossal strip of music paper out of the evening sky were plain to the dark eyes of her body. Mrs. Sparsit saw her staircase with the figure coming down, very near the bottom now. Upon the brink of the abyss, an overcast September evening, just at nightfall, saw beneath its drooping eyelids Mrs. Sparsit glide out of her carriage, pass down the wooden steps of the little station into a stony road, cross it into a green lane, and become hidden in a summer growth of leaves and branches. One or two late birds sleepily chirping in their nests. And a bat heavily crossing and recrossing her, and the reek of her own tread in the thick dust that felt like velvet, were all Mrs. Sparsit heard or saw until she very softly closed a gate. She went up to the house, keeping within the shrubbery, and went round it, peeping between the leaves at the lower windows. Most of them were open, as they usually were in such warm weather. But there were no lights yet, and all was silent. She tried the garden with no better effect. She thought of the wood and stole towards it, heedless of long grass and briars, of worms, snails, and slugs, and all the creeping things that be. With her dark eyes and her hook nose warily in advance of her, Mrs. Sparsit softly crushed her way through the thick undergrowth. So intent upon her object that she probably would have done no less if the wood had been a wood of adders. Hark! 
the smaller birds might have tumbled out of their nests, fascinated by the glittering of Mrs. Sparsett's eyes in the gloom as she stopped and listened. Lower voices, close at hand. His voice and hers. The appointment was a device to keep the brother away. There they were, yonder, by the felled tree. Bending low among the dewy grass, Mrs. Sparsett advanced closer to them. She drew herself up, and stood behind a tree, like Robinson Crusoe in his ambuscade against the savages. So near to them that at a spring, and that no great one, she could have touched them both. He was there secretly, and had not shown himself at the house. He had come on horseback, and must have passed through the neighboring fields, for his horse was tied to the meadow side of the fence, within a few paces. "'My dearest love,' said he, "'what could I do? Knowing you were alone, was it possible I could stay away?' "'You may hang your head to make yourself the more attractive. I don't know what they see in you when you hold it up,' thought Mrs. Sparsett. "'But you little think.' my dearest love, whose eyes are on you. That she hung her head was certain. She urged him to go away, she commanded him to go away, but she neither turned her face to him nor raised it. Yet it was remarkable that she sat as still as ever the amiable woman in ambuscade had seen her sit, at any period in her life, her hands rested in one another like the hands of a statue, and even her manner of speaking was not hurried. "'My dear child,' said Harthouse, Mrs. Sparsett saw with delight that his arm embraced her, "'will you not bear with my society for a little while?' "'Not here.' "'Where, Louisa?' "'Not here.' "'But we have so little time to make so much of, and I have come so far and am altogether so devoted and distracted. There never was a slave at once so devoted and ill-used by his mistress. To look for your sunny welcome that has warmed me into life, and to be received in your frozen manner, is heart-rending. Am I to say again that I must be left to myself here? But we must meet, my dear Louisa. Where shall we meet? They both started. The listener started guiltily, too, for she thought there was another listener among the trees. It was only rain, beginning to fall fast in heavy drops. Shall I ride up to the house a few minutes hence, innocently supposing that its master is at home and will be charmed to receive me? No. Your cruel commands are implicitly to be obeyed. Though I am the most unfortunate fellow in the world, I believe to have been insensible to all other women, and to have fallen prostrate at last under the foot of the most beautiful, and the most engaging, and the most imperious. My dearest Louisa, I cannot go myself, or let you go, in this hard abuse of your power. Mrs. Sparsett saw him detain her with his encircling arm, and heard him then and there, within her, Mrs. Sparsett's greedy hearing, tell her how he loved her and how she was the stake for which he ardently desired to play away all that he had in life. The objects he had lately pursued turned worthless beside her. Such success as was almost in his grasp he flung away from him like the dirt it was compared with her. Its pursuits, nevertheless, if it kept him near her, or its renunciation if it took him from her, or flight if she shared it, or secrecy if she commanded it, or any fate, or every fate, was all alike to him, so that she was true to him. The man who had seen how cast away she was, whom she had inspired at their first meeting with an admiration, an interest of which he had thought himself incapable, whom she had received into her confidence, who was devoted to her and adored her. All this and more in his hurry, and in hers, in the whirl of her own gratified malice, in the dread of being discovered, in the rapidly increasing noise of heavy rain among the leaves, and a thunderstorm rolling up, Mrs. Sparsett received into her mind, set off with such an unavoidable halo of confusion and indistinctness, 
that when at length he climbed the fence and led his horse away, she was not sure where they were to meet, or when, except that they had said it was to be that night. But one of them yet remained in the darkness before her, and while she tracked that one, she must be right. Oh, my dearest love, thought Mrs. Sparsit, you little think how well attended you are. Mrs. Sparsit saw her out of the wood, and saw her enter the house. What to do next? It rained now in a sheet of water. Mrs. Sparsit's white stockings were of many colors, green predominating. Prickly things were in her shoes. Caterpillars slung themselves, in hammocks of their own making, from various parts of her dress. Rills ran from her bonnet and her Roman nose. In such condition, Mrs. Sparsit stood hidden in the density of the shrubbery, considering what next. Lo! Louisa coming out of the house, hastily cloaked and muffled and stealing away. She elopes. She falls from the lowermost stair and is swallowed up in the gulf. Indifferent to the rain and moving with a quick determined step, she struck into a side path parallel with the ride. Mrs. Sparsett followed in the shadow of the trees at but a short distance for it was not easy to keep a figure in view going quickly through the umbrageous darkness. When she stopped to close the side-gate without noise, Mrs. Sparsett stopped. When she went on, Mrs. Sparsett went on. She went by the way Mrs. Sparsett had come, emerged from the green lane, crossed the stony road, and ascended the wooden steps to the railroad. A train for Coketown would come through presently, Mrs. Sparsett knew, so she understood Coketown to be her first place of destination. In Mrs. Sparsett's limp and streaming state, no extensive precautions were necessary to change her usual appearance, but she stopped under the lee of the station wall, tumbled her shawl into a new shape, and put it on over her bonnet. So disguised, she had no fear of being recognized when she followed up the railroad steps, and paid her money in the small office. Louisa sat waiting in a corner. Mrs. Sparsett sat waiting in another corner. Both listened to the thunder which was loud, and to the rain as it washed off the roof and pattered on the parapets of the arches. Two or three lamps were rained out and blown out. So both saw the lighting to advantage as it quivered and zigzagged on the iron tracks. The seizure of the station with a fit of trembling, gradually deepening to a complaint of the heart, announced the train. Fire and steam and smoke and red light, a hiss, a crash, a bell, and a shriek. Louisa put into one carriage, Mrs. Sparsett into another. The little station a desert speck in the thunderstorm. Though her teeth chattered in her head from wet and cold, Mrs. Sparsett exulted hugely. The figure had plunged down the precipice, and she felt herself, as it were, attending on the body. Could she, who had been so active in the getting up of the funeral triumph, do less than exult? She will be at Coketown long before him, thought Mrs. Sparsett, though his horse is never so good. Where will she wait for him? And where will they go together? Patience, we shall see. The tremendous rain occasioned infinite confusion when the train stopped at its destination. Gutters and pipes had burst, drains had overflowed, and streets were under water. In the first instant of alighting, Mrs. Sparsett turned her distracted eyes towards the waiting coaches, which were in great request. She will get into one she considered, and will be away before I can follow in another. At all risks of being run over, I must see the number and hear the order given to the coachman. But Mrs. Sparsett was wrong in her calculation. Louisa got into no coach, and was already gone. The black eyes kept under the railroad carriage in which she had travelled 
settled upon it a moment too late. The door not being opened after several minutes, Mrs. Sparsett passed it and repassed it, saw nothing, looked in, and found it empty. Wet through and through, with her feet squelching and squashing in her shoes whenever she moved, with a rash of rain upon her classical visage, with a bonnet like an overripe fig, with all her clothes spoiled, with damp impressions of every button, string, and hook and eye she wore printed off upon her highly connected back, with a stagnant verdure on her general exterior, such as accumulates on an old park vents in a moldy lane, Mrs. Sparsett had no resource but to burst into tears of bitterness, and say, I have lost her. The National Dustmen, after entertaining one another with a great many noisy little fights among themselves, had dispersed for the present, and Mr. Gradgrind was at home for the vacation. He sat riding in the room with the deadly statistical clock, proving something, no doubt, probably in the main, that the good Samaritan was a bad economist. The noise of the rain did not disturb him much, but it attracted his attention sufficiently to make him raise his head sometimes, as if he were rather remonstrating with the elements. When it thundered very loudly, he glanced towards Coketown, having it in his mind that some of the tall chimneys might be struck by lightning. The thunder was rolling into distance, and the rain was pouring down like a deluge, when the door of his room opened. He looked round the lamp upon his table, and saw, with amazement, his eldest daughter. Louisa! Father, I want to speak to you. What is the matter? How strange you look, and good heaven! said Mr. Gradgrind, wondering more and more. Have you come here exposed to this storm? She put her hands to her dress, as if she hardly knew. Yes. Then she uncovered her head, and letting her cloak and hood fall where they might, stood looking at him. So colorless, so disheveled, so defiant and despairing, that he was afraid of her. What is it? I conjure you, Louisa, tell me what is the matter. She dropped into a chair before him, and put her cold hand on his arm. Father, you have trained me from my cradle. Yes, Louisa. I curse the hour in which I was born to such a destiny. He looked at her in doubt and dread, vacantly repeating, Curse the hour? Curse the hour? How could you give me life, and take from me all the inappreciable things that raise it from the state of conscious death? Where are the graces of my soul? Where are the sentiments of my heart? What have you done, O oh father, what have you done, with the garden that should have bloomed once, in this great wilderness here? She struck herself with both her hands upon her bosom. If it had ever been here, its ashes alone would save me from the void in which my whole life sinks. I did not mean to say this, but, father, you remember the last time we conversed in this room? He had been so wholly unprepared for what he heard now that it was with difficulty he answered. Yes, Louisa. What has risen to my lips now would have risen to my lips then if you had given me a moment's help. I don't reproach you, father. What you have never nurtured in me you have never nurtured in yourself. But, oh, if you had only done so long ago, or if you had only neglected me, what a much better and much happier creature I should have been this day. On hearing this, after all his care, he bowed his head upon his hand and groaned aloud. Father, if you had known, when we were last together here, what even I feared while I strove against it, as it has been my task from infancy to strive against every natural prompting that has arisen in my heart, if you had known that there lingered in my breast sensibilities, affections, weaknesses capable of being cherished into strength, defying all the calculations ever made by man, and no more known to his arithmetic than his creator is, would you have given me to the husband who I am now sure that I hate? He said, No, no, my poor child. 
would you have doomed me at any time to the frost and blight that have hardened and spoiled me? Would you have robbed me for no one's enrichment, only for the greater desolation of this world, of the immaterial part of my life, the spring and summer of my belief, my refuge from what is sordid and bad in the real things around me, my school in which I should have learned to be more humble and more trusting with them, and to hope in my little sphere to make them better? Oh, no, 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 Louisa! Yet, father, if I had been stone blind, if I had groped my way by my sense of touch and had been free, while I knew the shapes and surfaces of things, to exercise my fancy somewhat in regard to them, I should have been a million times wiser, happier, more loving, more contented, more innocent and human in all good respects than I am with the eyes I have. Now hear what I have come to say. He moved to support her with his arm. She, rising as he did so, they stood close together, she with a hand upon his shoulder, looking fixedly in his face. With a hunger and thirst upon me, father, which have never been for a moment appeased, with an ardent impulse towards some region where rules and figures and definitions were not quite absolute, I have grown up, battling every inch of the way. I never knew you were unhappy, my child. Father, I always knew it. In this strife I have almost repulsed and crushed my better angel into a demon. What I have learned has left me doubting, misbelieving, despising, regretting what I have not learned, and my dismal resource has been to think that life would soon go by, and that nothing in it could be worth the pain and trouble of a contest. And you so young, Louisa, he said with pity. And I so young. In this condition, father, for I show you now without fear or favour the ordinary deadened state of my mind as I know it, you proposed my husband to me. I took him. I never made a pretense to him or you that I loved him. I knew, and father you knew, and he knew that I never did. I was not wholly indifferent, for I had a hope of being pleasant and useful to Tom. I made that wild escape into something visionary, and have slowly found out how wild it was. But Tom had been the subject of all the little tenderness of my life. Perhaps he became so because I knew so well how to pity him. It matters little now, except as it may dispose you to think more leniently of his errors. As her father held her in his arms, she put her other hand upon his other shoulder, and still looking fixedly in his face, went on. When I was irrevocably married, there rose up into rebellion against the tie, the old strife, made fiercer by all those causes of disparity which arise out of our two individual natures, and which no general law shall ever rule or state for me, father, until they shall be able to direct the anatomist where to strike his knife into the secrets of my soul. Louisa, he said, and said imploringly, for he well remembered what had passed between them in their former interview. I do not reproach you, father. I make no complaint. I am here with another object. What can I do, child? Ask me what you will. I am coming to it. Father, chance then threw into my way a new acquaintance, a man such as I had had no experience of, used to the world, light, polished, easy, making no pretenses, avowing the low estimate of everything that I was half afraid to form in secret, conveying to me almost immediately, though I don't know how or by what degrees, that he understood me and read my thoughts. I could not find that he was worse than I. There seemed to be a near affinity between us. I only wondered it should be worth his while, who cared for nothing else, to care so much for me. For you, Louisa. Her father might instinctively have loosened his hold, but that he felt her strength departing from her, and saw a wild, dilating fire in the eyes steadfastly regarding him. I say nothing of his plea for claiming my confidence. It matters very little how he gained it. Father, he did gain it. What you know of the story of my marriage, he soon knew, just as well. Her father's face was ashy white, and he held her in both his arms. I have done no worse. I have not disgraced you. But if you ask me whether I have loved him, or do love him, I tell you plainly, father, that it may be so. I don't know. 
She took her hands suddenly from his shoulders, and pressed them both upon her side, while in her face, not like itself, and in her figure drawn up, resolute to finish by a last effort what she had to say, the feelings long suppressed broke loose. This night, my husband being away, he has been with me, declaring himself my lover. This minute he expects me, for I could release myself of his presence by no other means. I do not know that I am sorry. I do not know that I am ashamed. I do not know that I am degraded in my own esteem. All that I know is your philosophy and your teaching will not save me. Now, father, you have brought me to this. Save me by some other means. He tightened his hold in time to prevent her sinking on the floor, but she cried out in a terrible voice, I shall die if you hold me. Let me fall upon the ground. And he laid her down there, and he saw the pride of his heart and the triumph of his system lying an insensible heap at his feet. Louisa awoke from a torpor, and her eyes languidly opened on her old bed at home and her old room. It seemed at first as if all that had happened since the days when these objects were familiar to her were the shadows of a dream, but gradually, as the objects became more real to her sight, the events became more real to her mind. She could scarcely move her head for pain and heaviness, her eyes were strained and sore, and she was very weak. A curious, passive inattention had such possession of her that presence of her little sister in the room did not attract her notice for some time. Even when their eyes had met and her sister had approached the bed, Louisa lay for minutes looking at her in silence and suffering her timidly to hold her passive hand before she asked, When was I brought to this room? Last night, Louisa. Who brought me here? Sissy, I believe. Why do you believe so? Because I found her here this morning. She didn't come to my bedside to wake me, as she always does, and I went to look for her. She was not in her own room either, and I went looking for her all over the house, until I found her here taking care of you and cooling your head. Will you see father? Sissy said I was to tell him when you woke. What a beaming face you have, Jane said Louisa, as her young sister, timidly still, bent down to kiss her. Have I? I'm very glad you think so. I am sure it must be Sissy's doing. The arm Louisa had begun to twine around her neck unbent itself. You can tell father if you will. Then, staying her for a moment, she said, It was you who made my room so cheerful and gave it this look of welcome. Oh, no, Louisa. It was done before I came. It was— Louisa turned upon her pillow and heard no more. When her sister had withdrawn, she turned her head back again and lay with her face towards the door until it opened and her father entered. He had a jaded, anxious look upon him, and his hand, usually steady, trembled in hers. He sat down at the side of the bed tenderly asking how she was, and dwelling on the necessity of her keeping very quiet after her agitation and exposure to the weather last night. He spoke in a subdued and troubled voice, very different from his usual dictatorial manner, and was often at a loss for words. My dear Louisa, my poor daughter. He was so much at a loss at that place that he stopped altogether. He tried again. My unfortunate child. The place was so difficult to get over that he tried again. It would be hopeless for me, Louisa, to endeavor to tell you how overwhelmed I have been, and still am, by what broke upon me last night. The ground on which I stand has ceased to be solid under my feet. The only support on which I leaned, and the strength of which it seemed, and still does seem, impossible to question, has given way in an instant. I am stunned by these discoveries. I have no selfish meaning in what I say, but I find the shock of what broke upon me last night to be very heavy indeed. She could give him no comfort herein. 
she had suffered the wreck of her whole life upon the rock. I will not say, Louisa, that if you had by any happy chance undeceived me some time ago, it would have been better for us both, better for your peace and better for mine, for I am sensible that it may not have been a part of my system to invite any confidence of that kind. I had proved my my system to myself, and I have rigidly administered it, and I must bear the responsibility of its failures. I only entreat you to believe, my favorite child, that I have meant to do right. He said it earnestly, and to do him justice he had. Engaging fathomless deeps with his little mean excise rod, and in staggering over the universe with his rusty stiff-legged compasses, he had meant to do great things. Within the limits of his short tether he had tumbled about, annihilating the flowers of existence with greater singleness of purpose than many of the blatant personages whose company he kept. I am well assured of what you say, father. I know I have been your favorite child. I know you have intended to make me happy. I have never blamed you, and I never shall. He took her outstretched hand and retained it in his. My dear, I have remained all night at my table, pondering again and again on what has so painfully passed between us. When I consider your character, when I consider that what has been known to me for hours has been concealed by you for years, when I consider under what immediate pressure it has been forced from you at last, I come to the conclusion that I cannot but mistrust myself. He might have added more than all when he saw the face now looking at him. He did add it in effect, perhaps, as he softly moved her scattered hair from her forehead with his hand. Such little actions, slight in another man, were very noticeable in him, and his daughter received them as if they had been words of contrition. But said Mr. Gradgrind, slowly, and with hesitation, as well as with a wretched sense of happiness. If I see reason to mistrust myself for the past, Louisa, I should also mistrust myself for the present and the future. To speak unreservedly to you, I do. I am far from feeling convinced now, however differently I might have felt only this time yesterday, that I am fit for the trust you repose in me, that I know how to respond to the appeal you have come home to make to me, that I have the right instinct, supposing it for the moment to be some quality of that nature, how to help you and to set you right, my child. She had turned upon her pillow and lay her face upon her arm so that he could not see it. All her wildness and passion had subsided, but, though softened, she was not in tears. Her father was changed in nothing so much as in the respect that he would have been glad to see in her tears. Some persons hold, he pursued, still hesitating, that there is a wisdom of the head, and that there is a wisdom of the heart. I have not supposed so, but, as I have said, I mistrust myself now. I have supposed the head to be all-sufficient. It may not be all-sufficient. How can I venture this morning to say that it is? If that other kind of wisdom should be what I have neglected, and should be the instinct that is wanted, Louisa? He suggested it very doubtfully as if he were half unwilling to admit it even now. She made him no answer, lying before him on her bed, still half-dressed, much as he had seen her lying on the floor of his room last night. Louisa. And his hand rested on her hair again. I have been absent from here, my dear, a good deal of late, and though your sister's training has been pursued according to the system— he appeared to come to that word with great reluctance always. It has necessarily been modified by daily associations begun, in her case, at an early age. 
I ask you, ignorantly and humbly, my daughter, for the better, do you think? Father, she replied, without stirring, if any harmony has been awakened in her young breast that was mute in mine until it turned to discord, let her thank heaven for it, and go upon her happier way, taking it as her greatest blessing that she has avoided my way. Oh, my child, my child, he said in a forlorn manner, I am an unhappy man to see you thus. What avails it to me that you do not reproach me, if I so bitterly reproach myself? He bent his head and spoke low to her. Louisa, I have a misgiving that some change may have been slowly working out about me in this house, by mere love and gratitude, that what the head had left undone and could not do, the heart may have been doing silently. Can it be so? She made him no reply. I am not too proud to believe it, Louisa. How could I be arrogant and you before me? Can it be so? Is it so, my dear? He looked upon her once more, lying cast away there, and without another word went out of the room. He had not been long gone when she heard a light tread near the door and knew that some one stood beside her. She did not raise her head. A dull anger that she should be seen in her distress, and that the involuntary look she had so resented should come to this fulfillment, smoldered within her like an unwholesome fire. All closely imprisoned forces brand and destroy. The air that would be healthful to the earth, the water that would enrich it, the heat that would ripen it, tear it when caged up. So in her bosom even now, the strongest qualities she possessed, long turned upon themselves, became a heap of obduracy that rose against a friend. It was well that soft touch came upon her neck, and that she understood herself to be supposed to have fallen asleep. The sympathetic hand did not claim her resentment. Let it lie there. Let it lie. It lay there, warming into life a crowd of gentler thoughts, and she rested. As she softened with the quiet, and the consciousness of being so watched, some tears made their way into her eyes. The face touched hers and she knew that there were tears upon it, too, and she the cause of them. As Louisa feigned to rouse herself and sat up, Sissy retired, so that she stood placidly near the bedside. I hope I have not disturbed you. I have come to ask if you would let me stay with you. Why should you stay with me? My sister will miss you. You are everything to her. Am I? returned Sissy, shaking her head. I would be something to you, if I might. What? said Louisa, almost sternly. Whatever you want most, if I could be that, I would like to try to be as near it as I can, and however far off that may be, I will never tire of trying. Will you let me? My father sent you to ask me. No, indeed, replied Sissy. He told me that I might come in now, but he sent me away from the room this morning, or at least— She hesitated and stopped. At least what? said Louisa, with her searching eyes upon her. I thought it best myself that I should be sent away, for I felt very uncertain whether you would like to find me here. Have I always hated you so much? I hope not, for I have always loved you, and I have always wished that you should know it. But you changed to me a little shortly before you left home. Not that I wondered at it. You knew so much, and I knew so little, and it was so natural in many ways, going as you were among other friends, that I had nothing to complain of, and was not at all hurt. Her color rose as she said it modestly and hurriedly. Louisa understood the loving pretense, and her heart smote her. May I try? said Sissy, emboldened to raise her hand to the neck that was insensibly drooping towards her. Louisa, taking down the hand that would have embraced her in another moment, held it in one of hers, and answered, First, Sissy, do you know what I am? 
I am so proud and so hardened, so confused and troubled, so resentful and unjust to everyone and to myself, that everything is stormy, dark, and wicked to me. Does not that repel you? No. I am so unhappy, and all that should have made me otherwise is so laid waste, that if I had been bereft of sense to this hour, and instead of being as learned as you think me, had to begin to acquire the simplest truths, I could not want a guide to peace, contentment, honour, all the good of which I am quite devoid, more abjectly than I do. Does not that repel you? No. In the innocence of her brave affection, and the brimming up of her old devoted spirit, the once deserted girl shone like a beautiful light upon the darkness of the other. Louisa raised the hand that it might clasp her neck and join its fellow there. She fell upon her knees, and clinging to this stroller's child, looked up at her almost with veneration. Forgive me, pity me, help me, have compassion on my great need, and let me lay this head of mine upon a loving heart. Oh, lay it here, cried Sissy. Lay it here, my dear. Mr. James Harthouse passed a whole night and a day in a state of so much hurry that the world, with its best glass in his eye, would scarcely have recognized him during that insane interval as the brother gem of the honorable and jocular member. He was positively agitated. He several times spoke with an emphasis similar to the vulgar manner. He went in and went out in an unaccountable way like a man without an object. He rode like a highwayman. In a word, he was so horribly bored by existing circumstances that he forgot to go in for boredom in the manner prescribed by the authorities. After putting his horse at Coketown through the storm as if it were a leap, he waited up all night, from time to time ringing his bell with the greatest fury, charging the porter who kept watch with delinquency in withholding letters or messages that could not fail to have been entrusted to him, and demanding restitution on the spot. The dawn coming, the morning coming, and the day coming, and neither message nor letter coming with either, he went down to the country house. There the report was, Mr. Bounderby away, and Mrs. Bounderby in town, left for town suddenly last evening, not even known to be gone until receipt of message, importing that her return was not to be expected for the present. In these circumstances he had nothing for it but to follow her to town. He went to the house in town. Mrs. Bounderby not there. He looked in at the bank. Mr. Bounderby away, and Mrs. Sparsett away. Mrs. Sparsett away? Who could have been reduced to sudden extremity for the company of that griffin? Well, I don't know, said Tom, who had his own reasons for being uneasy about it. She was off somewhere at daybreak this morning. She was full of mystery. I hate her. So I did that white chap. He's always got his blinking eyes upon a fellow. Where were you last night, Tom? Where was I last night? said Tom. Come, I like that. I was waiting for you, Mr. Hardhouse, till it came down as I never saw it come down before. Where was I, too? Where were you, you mean? I was prevented from coming. Detained. Detained? murmured Tom. Two of us were detained. I was detained looking for you till I lost every train but the mail. Would have been a pleasant job to go down by that on such a night. I had to walk home through a pond. I was obliged to sleep in town after all. Where? Where? Why, in my own bed at Bounderby's. Did you see your sister? How the deuce? Returned Tom, staring. Could I see my sister when she was fifteen miles off? Cursing these quick retorts of the young gentleman to whom he was so true a friend, Mr. Harthouse disembarrassed himself of that interview with the smallest conceivable amount of ceremony, and debated for the hundredth time what all this could mean. He made only one thing clear. It was 
that whether she was in town or out of town, whether he had been premature with her who was so hard to comprehend, or she had lost courage, or they were discovered, or some mischance or mistake at present incomprehensible had occurred, he must remain to confront his fortune, whatever it was. The hotel where he was known to live when condemned to that region of blackness was the stake to which he was tied. As to all the rest, what will be will be. So, whether I am waiting for a hostile message, or an assignation, or a penitent remonstrance, or impromptu wrestle with my friend Bounderby in the Lancashire manner, which would seem as likely as anything else in the present state of affairs, I'll dine, said Mr. James Harthouse. Bounderby has the advantage in point of weight, and if anything of a British nature is to come off between us, it may be as well to be in training. Therefore he rang the bell, and tossing himself negligently on a sofa, ordered, some dinner at six, with a beefsteak in it, and got through the intervening time as well as he could. That was not particularly well, for he remained in the greatest perplexity, and as the hours went on, and no kind of explanation offered itself, his perplexity augmented at compound interest. However, he took affairs as coolly as it was in human nature to do, and entertained himself with the facetious idea of the training more than once. It wouldn't be bad. Oh, he yawned at one time. To give the waiter five shillings and throw him. At another time it occurred to him. Or a fellow of thirteen or fourteen stone might be hired by the hour. But these jests did not tell materially on the afternoon, or his suspense, and sooth to say, they both lagged fearfully. It was impossible, even before dinner, to avoid often walking about in the pattern of the carpet, looking out of the window, listening at the door for footsteps, and occasionally becoming rather hot when any steps approached that room. But after dinner, when the day turned to twilight, and the twilight turned to night, and still no communication was made to him, it began to be, as he expressed it, like the holy office and slow torture. However, still true to his conviction that indifference was the genuine high-breeding, the only conviction he had, he seized this crisis as the opportunity for ordering candles and a newspaper. He had been trying in vain, for half an hour, to read this newspaper, when the waiter appeared and said, at once mysteriously and apologetically, "'Beg your pardon, sir. Your want is, sir, if you please.' A general recollection that this was the kind of thing the police said to the swell mob caused Mr. Harthouse to ask the waiter in return, with bristling indignation, what the devil he meant by wanted. "'Beg your pardon, sir. Young lady outside, sir, wishes to see you.' "'Outside?' Where? Outside this door, sir. Giving the waiter to the personage before mentioned, as a blockhead duly qualified for that consignment, Mr. Harthouse hurried into the gallery. A young woman, whom he had never seen, stood there, plainly dressed, very quiet, very pretty. As he conducted her into the room and placed a chair for her, he observed, by the light of the candles, that she was even prettier than he had at first believed. Her face was innocent and youthful, and its expression remarkably pleasant. She was not afraid of him, or in any way disconcerted. She seemed to have her mind entirely preoccupied with the occasion of her visit, and to have substituted that consideration for herself. "'I speak to Mr. Harthouse?' she said when they were alone. To Mr. Harthouse, he added in his mind, and you speak to him with the most confiding eyes I ever saw, and the most earnest voice, though so quiet, I ever heard. If I do not understand, and I do not, sir, said Sissy, what your honour as a gentleman binds you to in other matters. The blood really rose in his face as she began in these words. I am sure I may rely upon it to keep my visit secret, 
and to keep secret what I'm going to say. I will rely upon it, if you tell me I may so far trust. You may, I assure you. I am young, as you see. I am alone, as you see. In coming to you, sir, I have no advice or encouragement beyond my own hope. He thought. But that is very strong. As he followed the momentary upward glance of her eyes, he thought, besides, This is a very odd beginning. I don't see where we are going. I think, said Sissy, you have already guessed whom I left just now. I have been in the greatest concern and uneasiness during the past four and twenty hours, which have appeared as many years, he returned, on a lady's account. The hopes I have been encouraged to form that you come from that lady do not deceive me, I trust. I left her within an hour. At? At her father's. Mr. Harthouse's face lengthened in spite of his coolness, and his perplexity increased. Then I certainly, he thought, do not see where we are going. She hurried there last night. She arrived there in great agitation, and was insensible all through the night. I live at her father's, and was with her. You may be sure, sir, you will never see her again as long as you live. Mr. Harthouse drew a long breath, and if ever man found himself in the position of not knowing what to say, made the discovery beyond all question that he was so circumstanced. The childlike ingenuousness with which his visitor spoke, her modest fearlessness, her truthfulness which put all artifice aside, her entire forgetfulness of herself in her earnest, quiet holding to the object with which she had come, all this, together with her reliance on his easily given promise, which in itself shamed him, presented something in which he was so inexperienced, and against which he knew any of his usual weapons would fall so powerless, that not a word could he rally to his relief. At last he said, So startling an announcement, so confidently made, and by such lips, is really disconcerting in the last degree. May I be permitted to inquire, if you are charged to convey that information to me in those hopeless words, by the lady of whom we speak? I have no charge from her. The drowning man catches at the straw. With no disrespect for your judgment, and no doubt of your sincerity, Excuse my saying that I cling to the belief that there is yet hope that I am not condemned to perpetual exile from that lady's presence. There is not the least hope. The first object of my coming here, sir, is to assure you that you must believe that there is no more hope of your ever speaking with her again than there would be if she had died when she came home last night. Must believe? But if I can't, or if I should, by infirmity of nature, be obstinate and won't— It is still true. There is no hope. James Harthouse looked at her with an incredulous smile upon his lips, but her mind looked over and beyond him, and the smile was quite thrown away. He bit his lip, and took a little time for consideration. Well, if it should unhappily appear, he said, after due pains and duty on my part, that I am brought to a position so desolate as this banishment, I shall not become the lady's persecutor. For you said you had no commission from her? I have only the commission of my love for her, and her love for me. I have no other trust, than that I have been with her since she came home, and that she has given me her confidence. I have no further trust, than that I know something of her character and her marriage. Oh, Mr. Harthouse, I think you had that trust, too. He was touched, in the cavity where his heart should have been, in that nest of addled eggs where the birds of heaven would have lived if they had not been whistled away, by the fervor of this reproach. I am not a moral sort of fellow, he said, and I never make any pretensions to the character of a moral sort of fellow. I am as immoral as need be. At the same time, in bringing any distress upon the lady who is the subject of the present conversation, or in unfortunately compromising her in any way, or in committing myself by any expression of sentiments towards her, not perfectly reconcilable with, in fact, with the domestic hearth, or in taking any advantage of her father's being a machine, or of her brother's being a whelp, or of her husband's being a bear, I beg to be allowed to assure you that I have had no particularly evil intentions, but have glided on from one step to another with a smoothness so perfectly diabolical, 
that I had not the slightest idea the catalogue was half so long until I began to turn it over. Whereas I find, said Mr. James Harthouse, in conclusion, that it is really in several volumes. Though he said all this in his frivolous way, the way seemed, for that once, a conscious polishing of but an ugly surface. He was silent for a moment, and then proceeded with a more self-possessed air, though with traces of vexation and disappointment that would not be polished out. After what has just now been represented to me, in a manner I find it impossible to doubt. I know of hardly any other source from which I could have accepted it so readily. I feel bound to say to you, in whom the confidence you have mentioned has been reposed, that I cannot refuse to contemplate the possibility, however unexpected, of my seeing the lady no more. I am sorely to blame for the thing having come to this, and, and, I cannot say, he added, rather hard up for a general peroration, that I have any sanguine expectation of ever becoming a moral sort of fellow, or that I have any belief in any moral sort of fellow whatever. Sissy's face sufficiently showed that her appeal to him was not finished. You spoke, he resumed, as she raised her eyes to him again, of your first object. I may assume that there is a second to be mentioned? Yes. Will you oblige me by confiding it? Mr. Harthouse, returned Sissy, with a blending of gentleness and steadiness that quite defeated him and with a simple confidence in his being bound to do what she required that held him at a singular disadvantage. The only reparation that remains with you is to leave here immediately and finally. I am quite sure that you can mitigate in no other way the wrong and harm you have done. I am quite sure that it is the only compensation you have left it in your power to make. I do not say that it is much or that it is enough, but it is something and it is necessary. Therefore, though without any other authority than I have given you, and even without the knowledge of any other person than yourself and myself, I ask you to depart from this place to-night, under an obligation never to return to it. If she had asserted any influence over him beyond her plain faith in the truth and right of what she said, if she had concealed the least doubt or irresolution, or had harbored, for the best purpose, any reserve or pretense, if she had shown or felt the lightest trace of any sensitiveness to his ridicule or his astonishment, or any remonstrance he might offer, he would have carried it against her at this point. But he could as easily have changed a clear sky by looking at it in surprise as affect her. But do you know, he asked, quite at a loss, the extent of what you ask? You probably are not aware that I am here on a public kind of business, preposterous enough in itself, but which I have gone in for, and sworn by, and am supposed to be devoted to in quite a desperate manner? You probably are not aware of that, but I assure you it's the fact. It had no effect on Sissy, fact or no fact. Besides which, said Mr. Harthouse, taking a turn or two across the room, dubiously, it's so alarmingly absurd. It would make a man so ridiculous, after going in for these fellows, to back out in such an incomprehensible way. I am quite sure, repeated Sissy, that it is the only reparation in your power, sir. I am quite sure, or I would not have come here. He glanced at her face and walked about again. Upon my soul, I don't know what to say. So immensely absurd. It fell to his lot now to stipulate for secrecy. If I were to do such a very ridiculous thing, he said, stopping again presently and leaning against the chimney-piece, it could only be in the most inviolable confidence. I will trust to you, sir, returned Sissy. And you will trust to me. His leaning against the chimney-piece reminded him of the night with the whelp. It was the self-same chimney-piece. And somehow, he felt as if he were the whelp to-night. He could make no way at all. I suppose a man never was placed in a more ridiculous position, he said, after looking down, and looking up, and laughing, and frowning, and walking off, and walking back again. 
But I see no way out of it. What will be, will be. This will be, I suppose. I must take off myself, I imagine. In short, I engage to do it. Cissy rose. She was not surprised by the result, but she was happy in it, and her face beamed brightly. You will permit me to say, continued Mr. James Harthouse, that I doubt if any other ambassador or ambassadress could have addressed me with the same success. I must not only regard myself as being in a very ridiculous position, but as being vanquished at all points. Will you allow me the privilege of remembering my enemy's name? My name? said the ambassadress. The only name I could possibly care to know tonight. Sissy Jupe. Pardon my curiosity at parting. Related to the family? I am only a poor girl, returned Sissy. I was separated from my father. He was only a stroller and taken pity on by Mr. Gradgrind. I have lived in the house ever since. She was gone. It wanted this to complete the defeat, said Mr. James Harthouse, sinking with a resigned air on the sofa, after standing transfixed a little while. The defeat may now be considered perfectly accomplished. Only a poor girl, only a stroller, only James Harthouse made nothing of, only James Harthouse a great pyramid of failure. The great pyramid put it into his head to go up the Nile. He took a pen upon the instant, and wrote the following note, in appropriate hieroglyphics, to his brother. Dear Jack, all up at Coketown, bored out of the place, and going in for camels. Affectionately, Jem. He rang the bell. Send my fellow here. Gone to bed, sir. Tell him to get up and pack up. He wrote two more notes, one to Mr. Bounderby, announcing his retirement from that part of the country, and showing where he would be found for the next fortnight, the other, similar in effect, to Mr. Gradgrind. Almost as soon as the ink was dry upon their superscriptions, he had left the tall chimneys of Coketown behind, and was in a railway carriage, tearing and glaring over the dark landscape. The moral sort of fellows might suppose that Mr. James Harthouse derived some comfortable reflections afterwards from this prompt retreat, as one of his few actions that made any amends for anything, and as a token to himself that he had escaped the climax of a very bad business. But it was not so at all. A secret sense of having failed and been ridiculous a dread of what other fellows who went in for similar sorts of things would say at his expense if they knew it, so oppressed him that what was about the very best passage in his life was the one of all others he would not have owned to on any account, and the only one that made him ashamed of himself. The indefatigable Mrs. Sparsett, with a violent cold upon her, her voice reduced to a whisper, and her stately frame so racked by continual sneezes that it seemed in danger of dismemberment, gave chase to her patron until she found him in the metropolis, and there, majestically sweeping in upon him at his hotel in St. James Street, exploded the combustibles with which she was charged, and blew up. Having executed her mission with infinite relish, this high-minded woman then fainted away on Mr. Bounderby's coat-collar. Mr. Bounderby's first procedure was to shake Mrs. Sparsett off, and leave her to progress as she might through various stages of suffering on the floor. He next had recourse to the administration of potent restoratives, such as screwing the patient's thumbs, smiting her hands, abundantly watering her face, and inserting salt in her mouth. When these attentions had recovered her, which they speedily did, he hustled her into a fast train without offering any other refreshment, and carried her back to Coketown more dead than alive. Regarded as a classical ruin, Mrs. Sparsett was an interesting spectacle on her arrival at her journey's end, but considered in any other light 
the amount of damage she had by that time sustained was excessive, and impaired her claims to admiration. Utterly heedless of the wear and tear of her clothes and constitution, and adamant to her pathetic sneezes, Mr. Bounderby immediately crammed her into a coach, and bore her off to Stone Lodge. "'Now, Tom Gradgrind,' said Bounderby, bursting into his father-in-law's room late at night, "'here's a lady here, Mrs. Sparsit. You know Mrs. Sparsit, who has something to say to you that will strike you dumb.' "'You have missed my letter,' exclaimed Mr. Gradgrind, surprised by the apparition. "'Missed your letter, sir?' bawled Bounderby. "'The present time is no time for letters. No man shall talk to Josiah Bounderby of Corktown about letters, with his mind in the state it's in now.' "'Bounderby,' said Mr. Gradgrind, in a tone of temperate remonstrance, "'I speak of a very special letter I have written to you in reference to Louisa.' "'Tom Gradgrind,' replied Bounderby, knocking the flat of his hand several times with great vehemence on the table. I speak of a very special messenger that has come to me in reference to Louisa. Mrs. Sparsid, ma'am, stand forward. That unfortunate lady, hereupon essaying to offer testimony, without any voice, and with painful gestures expressive of an inflamed throat, became so aggravating and underwent so many facial contortions, that Mr. Bounderby, unable to bear it, seized her by the arm and shook her. "'If you can't get it out, ma'am,' said Bounderby, "'leave me to get it out. This is not a time for a lady, however highly connected, to be totally inaudible and seemingly swallowing marbles. Tom Gradgrind, Mrs. Sparsit, lately found herself, by accident, in a situation to overhear a conversation out of doors between your daughter and your precious gentleman friend, Mr. James Harthouse. Indeed, said Mr. Gradgrind. Ah, indeed, cried Bounderby. And in that conversation— It is not necessary to repeat its tenor, Bounderby. I know what passed. You do? Perhaps, said Bounderby, staring with all his might at his so quiet and assuasive father-in-law. You know where your daughter is at the present time. Undoubtedly. She is here. There? My dear Bounderby, let me beg you to restrain these loud outbreaks on all accounts. Louisa is here. The moment she could detach herself from that interview with the person of whom you speak, and whom I deeply regret to have been the means of introducing to you, Louisa hurried here for protection. I myself had not been at home many hours when I received her here in this room. She hurried by the train to town. She ran from town to this house, through a raging storm, and presented herself before me in a state of distraction. Of course, she has remained here ever since. Let me entreat you, for your own sake and for hers, to be more quiet. Mr. Bounderby silently gazed about him for some moments in every direction except Mrs. Sparsit's direction and then, abruptly turning upon the niece of Lady Scadgers, said to that wretched woman, "'Now, ma'am, we shall be happy to hear any little apology you may think proper to offer for going about the country at express pace with no other luggage than a cock and bull, ma'am.' "'Sir,' whispered Mrs. Sparsit, "'my nerves are at present too much shaken, and my health is at present too much impaired in your service.' to admit of my doing more than taking refuge in tears. Which she did. Well, ma'am, said Bounderby, without making any observation to you that may not be made with propriety to a woman of good family, what I have got to add to that is that there is something else in which it appears to me you may take refuge, namely a coach. And the coach in which we came here being at the door, you'll allow me to hand you down to it and pack you on to the bank, where the best course for you to pursue will be to put your feet into the hottest water you can bear and take a glass of scalding rum and butter after you get into bed. 
With these words Mr. Bounderby extended his right hand to the weeping lady, and escorted her to the conveyance in question, shedding many plaintive sneezes by the way. He soon returned alone. Now, as you showed me in your face, Tom Gradgrind, that you wanted to speak to me, he resumed, here I am, but I am not in a very agreeable state, I tell you plainly, not relishing this business even as it is, and not considering that I am at any time as dutifully and submissively treated by your daughter, as Josiah Bounderby of Corktown ought to be treated by his wife. You have your opinion, I dare say, and I have mine. I know, if you mean to say anything to me to-night that goes against this candid remark, you had better let it alone. Mr. Gradgrind, it will be observed, being much softened, Mr. Bounderby took particular pains to harden himself at all points. It was his amiable nature. My dear Bounderby, Mr. Gradgrind began in reply, Now you'll excuse me, but I don't want to be too dear, that is to start with. When I begin to be dear to a man, I generally find that his intention is to come over me. I am not speaking to you politely, but as you are aware, I am not polite. If you like politeness, you know where to get it. You have your gentlemen friends, you know, and they'll serve you with as much of the article as you want. I don't keep it myself. Bounderby, urged Mr. Gradgrind, we are all liable for mistakes. I thought you couldn't make them, interrupted Bounderby. Perhaps I thought so, but I say we are all liable to mistakes, and I should feel sensible of your delicacy, and grateful for it, if you would spare me these references to Harthouse. I shall not associate him in our conversation with your intimacy and encouragement. Pray do not persist in connecting him with mine. I never mentioned his name, said Bounderby. Well, well returned Mr. Gradgrind with a patient, even a submissive, air, and he sat for a little while pondering. Bounderby, I see reason to doubt whether we have ever quite understood Louisa. Who oh, do you mean by we? Let me say I, then, he returned, in answer to the coarsely blurted question. I doubt whether I have understood Louisa. I doubt whether I have been quite right in the manner of her education. There you hit it, returned Bounderby. There I agree with you. You've found it out at last, have you? Education? I'll tell you what education is. To be tumbled out of doors, neck and crop, and put on the shortest allowance of everything except blows. That's what I call education. I think your good sense will perceive. Mr. Gradgrind remonstrated in all humility that whatever the merits of such a system may be, it would be difficult of general application to girls. I don't see it at all, sir, returned the obstinate Bounderby. Well, sighed Mr. Gradgrind, we will not enter into the question. I assure you I have no desire to be controversial. I seek to repair what is amiss, if I possibly can, and I hope you will assist me in a good spirit, Bounderby, for I have been very much distressed. I don't understand you yet, said Bounderby, with determined obstinacy, and therefore I won't make any promises. In the course of a few hours, my dear Bounderby, Mr. Gradgrind proceeded, in the same depressed and propitiatory manner. I appear to myself to have become better informed as to Louisa's character than in previous years. The enlightenment has been painfully forced upon me, and the discovery is not mine. I think there are, Bounderby, you will be surprised to hear me say this, I think there are qualities in Louisa which, which have been harshly neglected and, and a little perverted, and and I would suggest to you that, that if you would kindly meet me in a timely endeavor to leave her to her better nature for a while, and to encourage it to develop itself by tenderness and consideration, it, 
it would be the better for the happiness of all of us. Louisa, said Mr. Gradgrind, shading his face with his hand, has always been my favorite child. The blusterous Bounderby crimsoned and swelled to such an extent on hearing these words that he seemed to be, and probably was, on the brink of a fit. With his very ears a bright purple shot with crimson, he pent up his indignation, however, and said, You'd like to keep her here for a time? I... I had intended to recommend, my dear Bounderby, that you should allow Louisa to remain here on a visit, and be attended by Sissy, I mean, of course, Cecilia Jupe, who understands her and in whom she trusts. I gather from all this, Tom Gradgrind, said Bounderby, standing up with his hands in his pockets, that you are of the opinion that there's what people call some incompatibility between Lou Bounderby and myself. I fear there is at present a general incompatibility between Louisa and, and, and almost all the relations in which I have placed her, was her father's sorrowful reply. Now look you here, Tom Gradgrind, said Bounderby the flushed, confronting him with his legs wide apart, his hands deeper in his pockets, and his hair like a hayfield wherein his windy anger was boisterous. You've said your say, I'm going to say mine. I am a Corktown man. I am Josiah Bounderby of Corktown. I know the bricks of this town, and I know the works of this town, and I know the chimneys of this town, and I know the smoke of this town, and I know the hands of this town. I know them all pretty well. They're real. When a man tells me anything about imaginative qualities, I always tell that man, whoever he is, that I know what he means. He means turtle soup and venison with a gold spoon, and as he wants to be set up with a coach and six. That's what your daughter wants. Since you are of opinion that she ought to have what she wants, I recommend you to provide it for her, because, Tom Gradgrind, she will never have it from me. Bounderby, said Mr. Gradgrind, I hoped, after my entreaty, you would have taken a different tone. Just wait a bit retorted Bounderby. You had your say, I believe. I heard you out. Hear me out, if you please. Don't make a spectacle of unfairness as well as inconsistency, because although I am sorry to see Tom Gradrine reduced to his present position, I should be doubly sorry to see him brought so low as that. Now, there's an incompatibility of some sort or another, I am given to understand by you, between your daughter and me. I'll give you to understand in reply to that, that there unquestionably is an incompatibility of the first magnitude, to be summed up in this, that your daughter don't properly know her husband's merits, and is not impressed with such a sense as would become her by George, of the honour of his alliance. That's plain speaking, I hope. Bounderby, urged Mr. Gradgrind, this is unreasonable. Is it? said Bounderby. Well, I'm glad to hear you say so, because when Tom Gradgrind, with his new lights, tells me that what I say is unreasonable, I am convinced at once it must be devilish sensible. With your permission, I'm going on. You know my origin, and you know that for a good many years of my life I didn't want a shoeing horn, in consequence of not having a shoe. Yet you may believe it or not, as you think proper, that there are ladies, born ladies, belonging to families, families, who next to worship the ground I walk on. He discharged this like a rocket at his father-in-law's head. Whereas your daughter, proceeded Bounderby, is far from being a born lady, that you know yourself. Not that I care a pinch of candle snuff about such things, for you are very well aware I don't. But that such is the fact, and you, Tom Gradgrind, can't change it. Why do I say this? Not, I fear, observed Mr. Gradgrind in a low voice, to spare me. Hear me out, said Bounderby, and refrain from cutting in till your turn comes round. 
I say this because highly connected females have been astonished to see the way in which your daughter has conducted herself and to witness her insensibility. They've wondered how I have suffered it, and I wonder myself now, and I won't suffer it. Bounderby, returned Mr. Gradgrind, rising, the less we say to-night, the better, I think. On the contrary, Tom Gradgrind, the more we say to-night, the better, I think. That is— The consideration checked him. Till I have said all I mean to say, and then I don't care how soon we stop. I come to a question that may shorten the business. What do you mean by the proposal you made just now? What do I mean, Bounderby? By your visiting proposition, said Bounderby, with an inflexible jerk of the hayfield. I mean that I hope you may be induced to arrange in a friendly manner for allowing Louisa a period of repose and reflection here, which may tend to a gradual alteration for the better, in many respects. To a softening down of your ideas of the incompatibility, said Bounderby. If you put it in those terms. What made you think of this? I have already said I fear Louisa has not been understood. Is it asking too much, Bounderby, that you, so far her elder, should aid in trying to set her right? You have accepted a great charge of her, for better, for worse, for— Mr. Bounderby may have been annoyed by the repetition of his own words to Stephen Blackpool, but he cut the quotation short with an angry start. Come, said he. I don't want to be told about that. I know what I took her for as well as you do. Never you mind what I took her for, that's my lookout. I was merely going on to remark, Bounderby, that we may all be more or less in the wrong, not even excepting you, and that some yielding on your part, remembering the trust you have accepted, may not only be an act of true kindness, but perhaps a debt incurred towards Louisa. I think differently, blustered Bounderby. I'm going to finish this business according to my own opinions. Now I don't want to make a quarrel of it with you, Tom Gradgrind. To tell the truth, I don't think it would be worthy of my reputation to quarrel on such a subject. As to your gentleman friend, he may take himself off wherever he likes best. If he falls in my way, I shall tell him my mind. If he don't fall in my way, I shan't, for it won't be worth my while to do it. As to your daughter, who I made Lou Bounderby, and might have done better by leaving Lou Gradgrind, if she don't come home to-morrow by twelve o'clock at noon, I shall understand that she prefers to stay away, and I shall send her word in apparel and so forth over here, and you'll take charge of her for the future. What I shall say to people in general of the incompatibility that led to my soul laying down the law will be this. I am Josiah Bounderby, and I had my bringing up. She's the daughter of Tom Gradgrind, and she had her bringing up. And the two horses wouldn't pull together. I'm pretty well known to be rather an uncommon man, I believe. And most people will understand fast enough that it must be a woman— rather out of the common, also, who in the long run would come up to my mark. Let me seriously entreat you to reconsider this, Bounderby, urged Mr. Gradgrind, before you commit yourself to such a decision. I always come to a decision, said Bounderby, tossing his hat on, and whatever I do, I do at once. I should be surprised at Tom Gradgrind addressing such a remark to Josiah Bounderby of Cork Town, knowing what he knows of him. If I could be surprised by anything Tom Gradgrind did, after his making himself a party to sentimental humbug, I have given you my decision, and I have got no more to say. Good night. So Mr. Bounderby went home to his townhouse to bed. At five minutes past twelve o'clock next day, he directed Mrs. Bounderby's property to be carefully packed up and sent to Tom Gradgrind's, advertised his country retreat for sale by private contract, and resumed a bachelor life. The robbery at the bank had not languished before, 
and did not cease to occupy a front place in the attention of the principal of that establishment now. In boastful proof of his promptitude and activity, as a remarkable man and a self-made man, and a commercial wonder more admirable than Venus, who had risen out of the mud instead of the sea, he liked to show how little his domestic affairs abated his business ardor. Consequently, in the first few weeks of his resumed bachelorhood, he even advanced upon his usual display of bustle, and every day made such a rout in renewing his investigations into the robbery, that the officers who had it in hand almost wished it had never been committed. They were at fault, too, and off the scent. Although they had been so quiet since the first outbreak of the matter, that most people really did suppose it to have been abandoned as hopeless, nothing new occurred. No man or woman took untimely courage or made a self-betraying step. More remarkable yet, Stephen Blackpool could not be heard of, and the mysterious old woman remained a mystery. Things having come to this pass, and showing no latent signs of stirring beyond it, the upshot of Mr. Bounderby's investigations was that he resolved to hazard a bold burst. He drew up a placard, offering twenty pounds reward for the apprehension of Stephen Blackpool, suspected of complicity in the robbery of Coketown Bank on such a night. He described the said Stephen Blackpool by dress, complexion, estimated height, and manner as minutely as he could. He recited how he had left the town, and in what direction he had been last seen going. He had the whole printed in great black letters on a staring broadsheet, and he caused the walls to be posted with it in the dead of night, so that it should strike upon the sight of the whole population at one blow. The factory bells had need to ring their loudest that morning to disperse the groups of workers who stood in the tardy daybreak, collected round the placards, devouring them with eager eyes. Not the least eager of the eyes assembled were the eyes of those who could not read. These people, as they listened to the friendly voice that read aloud, there was always some such ready to help them, stared at the characters which meant so much with a vague awe and respect that would have been half ludicrous if any aspect of public ignorance could ever be otherwise than threatening and full of evil. Many ears and eyes were busy with a vision of the matter of these placards, among turning spindles, rattling looms, and whirling wheels, for hours afterwards. And when the hands cleared out again into the streets, there were still as many readers as before. Slackbridge, the delicate, had to address his audience too that night, and Slackbridge had obtained a clean bill from the printer and brought it in his pocket. Oh, my friends and fellow countrymen, the downtrodden operatives of Coketown! Oh, my fellow brothers and fellow workmen and fellow citizens and fellow men! What a to-do was there when Slackbridge unfolded what he called the damning document, and held it up to the gaze and for the execration of the working man community. Oh, my fellow men! Behold of what a traitor in the camp of those great spirits who are enrolled upon the holy scroll of justice and of union is appropriately capable. O oh, my prostrate friends, with the galling yoke of tyrants on your necks and the iron foot of despotism treading down your fallen forms into the dust of the earth, upon which right glad would your oppressors be to see you creeping on your bellies all the days of your lives, like the serpent in the garden. O oh, my brothers, and shall I as a man not add my sisters to? What do you say now of Stephen Blackpool, with a slight stoop in his shoulders and about five foot seven in height, as set forth in this degrading and disgusting document, this blighting bill, this pernicious placard, 
this abominable advertisement, and with what majesty of denouncement will you crush the viper? Who would bring this stain and shame upon the godlike race that happily has cast him out forever? Yes, my compatriot, happily cast him out and sent him forth. For you remember how he stood here before you on this platform. You remember how face to face and foot to foot I pursued him through all his intricate windings. You remember how he sneaked and slunk and sidled and splitted of straws until with not an inch of ground to which to cling I hurled him out from amongst us an object for the undying finger of scorn to point at, and for the avenging fire of every free and thinking mind to scorch and scar. And now, my friends, my laboring friends, for I rejoice and triumph in that stigma, my friends whose hard but honest beds are made in toil, and whose scanty but independent pots are boiled in hardship. And now I say, my friends, what appellation has that dastard craven taken to himself? When, with the mask torn from his features, he stands before us in all his native deformity, a what? A thief, a plunderer, a proscribed fugitive, with a price upon his head, a fester and a wound upon the noble character of the Coketown operative. Therefore, my band of brothers in a sacred bond, to which your children and your children's children yet unborn have set their infant hands and seals, I propose to you on the part of the United Aggregate Tribunal, ever watchful for your welfare, ever zealous for your benefit, that this meeting does resolve that Stephen Blackpool, Weaver, referred to in this placard, having been already solemnly disowned by the community of Coketown Hands, the same are free from the shame of his misdeeds, and cannot as a class be reproached with his dishonest actions. Thus Slackbridge, gnashing and perspiring after a prodigious sort. A few stern voices called out, No! No! And a score or two hailed with assenting cries of, Here, here! The caution from one man, Slackbridge, you're over hettering. You're going too fast. But these were pygmies against an army. The general assemblage subscribed to the gospel according to Slackbridge, and gave three cheers for him as he sat demonstratively panting at them. These men and women were yet in the streets, passing quietly to their homes, when Sissy, who had been called away from Louisa some minutes before, returned. "'Who is it?' asked Louisa. "'It is Mr. Bounderby,' said Sissy, timid of the name. "'And your brother, Mr. Tom, and the young woman who says her name is Rachel, and that you know her.' "'What do they want, Sissy, dear?' "'They want to see you. Rachel has been crying, and seems angry.' "'Father!' said Louisa, for he was present. I cannot refuse to see them, for a reason that will explain itself. Shall they come in here? As he answered in the affirmative, Sissy went away to bring them. She reappeared with them directly. Tom was last, and remained standing in the obscurest part of the room, near the door. Mrs. Bounderby, said her husband, entering with a cool nod, I don't disturb you, I hope. This is an unseasonable hour. But here is a young woman who has been making statements which render my visit necessary. Tom Gradgrind, as your son, young Tom, refuses for some obstinate reason or other to say anything at all about those statements, good or bad, I am obliged to confront her with your daughter. You have seen me once before, young lady said Rachel, standing in front of Louisa. Tom coughed. You have seen me, young lady, repeated Rachel, as she did not answer. Once before. Tom coughed again. I have. Rachel cast her eyes proudly towards Mr. Bounderby, and said, 
Will you make it known, young lady, where and who was there? I went to the house where Stephen Blackpool lodged, on the night of his discharge from his work, and I saw you there. He was there, too. And an old woman who did not speak, and whom I could scarcely see, stood in a dark corner. My brother was with me. Why couldn't you say so, young Tom? demanded Bounderby. I promised my sister I wouldn't. Which Louisa hastily confirmed. And besides, said the whelp bitterly, she tells her own story so precious well and so full that what business had I to take it out of her mouth? Say, young lady, if you please, pursued Rachel, why in an evil hour you ever came to Stephen's that night? I felt compassion for him, said Louisa, her color deepening, and I wished to know what he was going to do and wished to offer him assistance. Thank you, ma'am," said Bounderby. "Much flattered and obliged." "Did you offer him?" asked Rachel. "A banknote." "Yes, but he refused it and would take only two pounds in gold." Rachel cast her eyes towards Mr. Bounderby again. "Oh, certainly," said Bounderby. "If you put the question whether your ridiculous and improbable account was true or not." I'm bound to say it's confirmed, young lady," said Rachel. "Stephen Blackpool is now named as a thief in public print all over this town, and where else? There have been a meeting tonight where he have been spoken of in the same shameful way. Stephen, the honestest lad, the truest lad, the best." Her indignation failed her, and she broke off sobbing. "I am very, very sorry." Said Louisa. "Oh, young lady, young lady," returned Rachel. "I hope you may be, but I don't know. I can't say what you may have done. The like of you don't know us, don't care for us, don't belong to us. I am not sure why you may have come that night. I can't tell but what you may have come with some aim of your own, not minding to what trouble you brought such as the poor lad. I said then, bless you for coming, and I said it of my heart." You seem to take so pitifully to him, but I don't know now. I don't know. Louisa could not reproach her for her unjust suspicions. She was so faithful to her idea of the man, and so afflicted. And when I think," said Rachel through her sobs, "that the poor lad was so grateful, thinking you so good to him, when I mind that he put his hand over his hard work and face to hide the tears that you brought up there." Oh, I hope you may be sorry, and have no bad cause to be it, but I don't know, I don't know. You're a pretty article," growled the whelp, moving uneasily in his dark corner. To come here with these precious imputations, you ought to be bundled out for not knowing how to behave yourself, and you would be by rights. She said nothing in reply, and her low weeping was the only sound that was heard. Until Mister Bounderby spoke, come," said he. "You know what you're engaged to do. You'd better give your mind to that, not this." "Deed, I am loath that any here should see me like this," returned Rachel, drying her eyes. "But I won't be seen so again, young lady. When I had read what's put in print to Stephen, and what has just as much truth in it as if it had been put in print to you, I went straight to the bank." To say I knew where Stephen was, and to give a sure and certain promise that he should be here in two days, I couldn't meet with Mister Bounderby then, and your brother sent me away, and I tried to find you, but you was not to be found, and I went back to work. Soon as I come out of the mill to night, I hastened to hear what was said of Stephen, for I know with pride he will come back to shame it, and then I went again to seek Mister Bounderby, and I found him, and I told him every word I knew. And he believed no word I said, and brought me here. So far, that's true enough," assented Mister Bounderby, with his hands in his pockets and his hat on. But I have known you people before today, you'll observe, and I know you'll never die for want of talking. Now I'll recommend you not so much to mind talking just now as doing. You've undertaken to do something. All I remark upon that at present is, do it. I have written to Stephen by the post that went out this afternoon, 
as I have written to him once before since he went away, said Rachel, and he will be here at furthest in two days. Then I'll tell you something. You are not aware, perhaps, retorted Mr. Bounderby, that you yourself have been looked after now and then, not being considered quite free from suspicion in this business on account of most people being judged according to the company they keep. The post office hasn't been forgotten either. What I'll tell you is that no letter to Stephen Blackpool has ever got into it. Therefore, what has become of yours? I leave you to guess. Perhaps you're mistaken and never wrote any. He hadn't been gone from here, young lady, as much as a week, said Rachel, turning appealingly to Louisa, when he sent me the only letter I have had from him, saying that he was forced to seek work in another name. No, oh, bad George, cried Bounderby, shaking his head with a whistle. He changes his name, does he? That's rather unlucky, too, for such an immaculate chap. It's considered a little suspicious in courts of justice, I believe, when an innocent happens to have many names. What? said Rachel, with the tears in her eyes again. What young lady in the name of mercy was left the poor lad to do? The masters against him on one hand, the men against him on the other. He only wanting to work hard in peace and do what he felt right. Can a man have no soul of his own, no mind of his own? Must he go wrong all through with this side, or must he go wrong all through with that, or else be hunted like a hare? Indeed, indeed, I pity him from my heart, returned Louisa. And I hope that he will clear himself. You need have no fear of that young lady, he is sure. All the surer, I suppose. Said Mr. Bounderby, for your refusing to tell where he is, eh? He shall not, through any act of mine, come back with the unmerited reproach of being brought back. He shall come back of his own accord to clear himself and to put all those that have injured his good character and he not here for its defence to shame. I have told him what has been done against him," said Rachel, throwing off all distrust as a rock throws off the sea. And he will be here at furthest in two days. Notwithstanding which, added Mr. Bounderby, if he can be laid hold of any sooner, he shall have an earlier opportunity of clearing himself. As to you, I have nothing against you. What you came and told me turns out to be true, and I've given you the means of proving it to be true, and there's an end of it. I wish you good night, all. I must be off to look a little further into this. Tom came out of his corner when Mr. Bounderby moved, moved with him, kept close to him, and went away with him. The only parting salutation of which he delivered himself was a sulky, Good night, father. With a brief speech and a scowl at his sister, he left the house. Since his sheet anchor had come home, Mr. Gradgrind had been sparing of speech. He still sat silent when Louisa mildly said, "Rachel, you will not distrust me one day when you know me better." It goes against me," Rachel answered in a gentler manner, "to mistrust any one. But when I am so mistrusted, when we all are, I cannot keep such things quite out of my mind. I ask your pardon for having done you an injury. I don't think what I said now." Yet I might come to think it again with the poor lad so wronged. Did you tell him in your letter? Inquired Sissy. That suspicion seemed to have fallen upon him because he had been seen about the bank at night. He would then know what he would have to explain on coming back, and would be ready. Yes, dear. She returned. But I can't guess what can ever have taken him there. He never used to go there. It was never in his way. His way was the same as mine, and not near it. Sissy had already been at her side, asking her where she lived and whether she might come tomorrow night to inquire if there were news of him. I doubt," said Rachel, "if he can be here till next day. Then I will come next night too," said Sissy. When Rachel, assenting to this, was gone, Mister Gradgrind lifted up his head and said to his daughter, "Louisa, my dear." I have never, that I know of, 
seen this man. Do you believe him to be implicated? I think I have believed it, Father, though with great difficulty. I do not believe it now. That is to say, you once persuaded yourself to believe it from knowing him to be suspected. His appearance and manner, are they so honest? Very honest. And her confidence not to be shaken, I ask myself, said Mr. Gradgrind, musing. Does the real culprit know of these accusations? Where is he? Who is he? His hair had latterly begun to change its color. As he leaned upon his hand again, looking gray and old, Louisa, with a face of fear and pity, hurriedly went over to him and sat close at his side. Her eyes by accident met Sissy's at the moment. Sissy flushed and started, and Louisa put her finger on her lip. Next night, when Sissy returned home and told Louisa that Stephen was not come, she told it in a whisper. Next night again, when she came home with the same account, and added that he had not been heard of, she spoke in the same low, frightened tone. From the moment of that interchange of looks, they never uttered his name or any reference to him aloud, nor ever pursued the subject of the robbery when Mr. Gradgrind spoke of it. The two appointed days ran out, three days and nights ran out, and Stephen Blackpool was not come, and remained unheard of. On the fourth day, Rachel, with unabated confidence, but considering her dispatch to have miscarried, went up to the bank, and showed her letter from him with his address at a working colony, one of many not upon the main road, sixty miles away. Messengers were sent to that place, and the whole town looked for Stephen to be brought in next day. During this whole time the whelp moved about with Mr. Bounderby like his shadow, assisting in all the proceedings. He was greatly excited, horribly fevered, bit his nails down to the quick, spoke in a hard, rattling voice, and with lips that were black and burnt up. At the hour when the suspected man was looked for, the whelp was at the station offering to wager that he had made off before the arrival of those who were sent in quest of him, and that he would not appear. The whelp was right. The messengers returned alone. Rachel's letter had gone. Rachel's letter had been delivered. Stephen Blackpool had decamped in that same hour, and no soul knew more of him. The only doubt in Coketown was whether Rachel had written in good faith, believing that he really would come back, or warning him to fly. On this point, opinion was divided. Six days, seven days, far on into another week, the wretched whelp plucked up a ghastly courage and began to grow defiant. Was the suspected fellow the thief? Pretty question. If not, where was the man, and why did he not come back? Where was the man, and why did he not come back? In the dead of night, the echoes of his own words, which had rolled heaven knows how far away in the daytime, came back instead, and abided by him until morning. Day and night again, day and night again, no Stephen Blackpool. Where was the man, and why did he not come back? Every night Sissy went to Rachel's lodging, and sat with her in her small, neat room. All day Rachel toiled as such people must toil, whatever their anxieties. The smoke-serpents were indifferent who was lost or found, who turned out bad or good. The melancholy, mad elephants, like the hard-fact men, abated nothing of their set routine, whatever happened. Day and night again, day and night again, the monotony was unbroken. Even Stephen Blackpool's disappearance was falling into the general way, and becoming as monotonous a wonder as any piece of machinery in Coketown. 
I misdoubt, said Rachel, if there is as many as twenty left in all this place who have any trust in the poor dear lad now. She said it to Sissy as they sat in her lodging, lighted only by the lamp at the street corner. Sissy had come there when it was already dark to await her return from work, and they had since sat at the window where Rachel had found her, wanting no brighter light to shine on their sorrowful talk. If it hadn't been mercifully brought about that I was to have to speak to you, pursued Rachel, times are when I think my mind would not have kept right. But I get hope and strength through you, and you believe that though appearances may rise against him, he will be proved clear. I do believe so, returned Sissy. With my whole heart, I feel so certain, Rachel, that the confidence you hold in yours against all discouragement is not like to be wrong. That I have no more doubt of him than if I had known him through as many years of trial as you have. And I, my dear, said Rachel with a tremble in her voice, have known him through them all to be, according to his quiet ways, so faithful to everything honest and good, that if he was never to be heard of more, and I was to live to be a hundred years old, I could say with my last breath, God knows my heart, I have never once left trust in Stephen Blackpool. We all believe, up at the lodge, Rachel, that he will be freed from suspicion sooner or later. The better I know it to be so believed there, my dear, said Rachel, and the kinder I feel it that you come away from there purposely to comfort me and to keep me company and be seen with me when I am not yet free from all suspicion myself. The more grieved I am that I should ever have spoken those mistrusting words to the young lady, and yet I. You don't mistrust her now, Rachel. Now that you have brought us more together, no, but I can't at all times keep out of my mind. Her voice so sunk into a low and slow communing with herself that Sissy, sitting by her side, was obliged to listen with attention. I can't at all times keep out of my mind mistrustings of someone. I can't think who 'tis. I can't think how or why it may be done, but I mistrust that someone has put Stephen out of the way. I mistrust that by his coming back of his own accord and showing himself innocent before them all, some one would be confounded who, to prevent that, has stopped him and put him out of the way. That is a dreadful thought," said Sissy, turning pale. "It is a dreadful thought to think he may be murdered." Sissy shuddered and turned paler yet. "When it makes its way into my mind, dear," said Rachel, "and it will come sometimes, though I do all I can to keep it out." We're counting on to high numbers as I work, and saying over and over again pieces that I knew when I were a child. I fall into such a wild, hot hurry that, however tired I am, I want to walk fast, miles and miles. I must get the better of this before bedtime. I'll walk home with you. He might fall ill upon the journey back," said Sissy, faintly offering a worn-out scrap of hope. And in such a case, there are many places on the road where he might stop. But he is in none of them. He has been sought for in all, and he is not there. True. Was Sissy's reluctant admission. He'd walk the journey in two days. If he was footsore and couldn't walk, I sent him in the letter he got the money to ride, lest he should have none of his own to spare. Let us hope that tomorrow will bring something better, Rachel. Come into the air. Her gentle hand adjusted Rachel's shawl upon her shining black hair in the usual manner of her wearing it, and they went out. The night being fine, little knots of hands were here and there lingering at street corners, but it was supper time with the greater part of them, and there were but few people in the street. You're not so hurried now, Rachel, and your hand is cooler. I get better, dear. If I can only walk and breathe a little fresh, times when I can't, I turn weak and confused. But you must not begin to fail, Rachel, for you may be wanted at any time to stand by Stephen. Tomorrow is Saturday. If no news comes tomorrow, let us walk in the country on Sunday morning and strengthen you for another week. Will you go? Yes, dear. They were by this time in the street where Mister Bounderby's house stood. The way to Sissy's destination led them past the door. And they were going straight towards it. Some train had newly arrived in Coketown, which had put a number of vehicles in motion and scattered a considerable bustle about the town. 
Several coaches were rattling before them and behind them as they approached Mr. Bounderby's, and one of the latter drew up with such briskness as they were in the act of passing the house that they looked round involuntarily. The bright gaslight over Mr. Bounderby's steps showed them Mrs. Sparsett in the coach, in an ecstasy of excitement struggling to open the door. Mrs. Sparsett, seeing them at the same moment, called them to stop. "'It's a coincidence!' exclaimed Mrs. Sparsett, as she was released by the coachman. "'It's a providence! Come out, ma'am!' Then said Mrs. Sparsett to someone inside, "'Come out, or we'll have you dragged out.' Hereupon no other than the mysterious old woman descended, whom Mrs. Sparsett incontinently collared. "'Leave her alone, everybody!' cried Mrs. Sparsett, with great energy. "'Let nobody touch her. She belongs to me. Come in, ma'am.' Then said Mrs. Sparsett, reversing her former word of command, "'Come in, ma'am, or we'll have you dragged in.' The spectacle of a matron of classical deportment seizing an ancient woman by the throat and hauling her into a dwelling-house would have been under any circumstances sufficient temptation to all true English stragglers so blessed as to witness it to force a way into that dwelling-house and see the matter out. But when the phenomenon was enhanced by the notoriety and mystery by this time associated all over the town with the bank robbery, it would have lured the stragglers in with an irresistible attraction, though the roof had been expected to fall upon their heads. Accordingly, the chance witnesses on the ground, consisting of the busiest of the neighbors to the number of some five and twenty, closed in after Sissy and Rachel, as they closed in after Mrs. Sparsett and her prize, and the whole body made a disorderly eruption into Mr. Bounderby's dining-room, where the people behind lost not a moment's time in mounting on the chairs to get the better of the people in front. "'Fetch Mr. Bounderby down,' cried Mrs. Sparsett. "'Rachel, young woman, you know who this is.' "'It's Mrs. Pegler,' said Rachel. "'I should think it is,' cried Mrs. Sparsett, exulting. "'Fetch Mr. Bounderby. Stand away, everybody.' Here old Mrs. Pegler, muffling herself up and shrinking from observation, whispered a word of entreaty. "'Don't tell me,' said Mrs. Sparsett aloud. "'I have told you twenty times coming along that I will not leave you till I have handed you over to him myself. Mr. Bounderby now appeared, accompanied by Mr. Grandgrind and the whelp, with whom he had been holding conference upstairs. Mr. Bounderby looked more astonished than hospitable at sight of this uninvited party in his dining-room. "'Why, what's the matter now?' said he. "'Mrs. Sparsett, ma'am?' "'Sir,' explained that worthy woman. I trust it is my good fortune to produce a person you have much desired to find. Stimulated by my wish to relieve your mind, sir, and connecting together such imperfect clues to the part of the country in which that person might be supposed to reside, as have been afforded by the young woman, Rachel, fortunately now present to identify, I have had the happiness to succeed, and to bring that person with me. I need not say most unwillingly on her part. It has not been, sir, without some trouble that I have effected this. But trouble in your service is to me a pleasure, and hunger, thirst, and cold a real gratification. Here Mrs. Sparsett ceased, for Mr. Bounderby's visage exhibited an extraordinary combination of all possible colours and expressions of discomfiture, as old Mrs. Pegler was disclosed to his view. "'By what do you mean by this?' was his highly unexpected demand, in great warmth. "'I ask you, what do you mean by this, Mrs. Sparsett, ma'am?' "'Sir?' exclaimed Mrs. Sparsett, faintly. "'Why don't you mind your own business, ma'am?' roared Bounderby. 
Ah, oh, there you go, and poke your officious nose into my family affairs. This allusion to her favorite feature overpowered Mrs. Sparsit. She sat down stiffly in a chair, as if she were frozen, and with a fixed stare at Mr. Bounderby, slowly grated her mittens against one another, as if they were frozen too. "'My dear Josiah!' cried Mrs. Pegler, trembling. "'My darling boy, I am not to blame. It's not my fault, Josiah. I told this lady over and over again that I knew she was doing what would not be agreeable to you, but she would do it. What did you let her bring you for? Couldn't you knock her cap off, or a tooth out, or scratch her, or do something or other to her? asked Bounderby. My own boy! She threatened me that if I resisted her, I should be brought by constables, and it was better to come quietly than make that stir in such a— Mrs. Pegler glanced timidly but proudly round the walls. Such a fine ass as this, indeed. Indeed it is not my fault, my dear, noble, stately boy. I have always lived quiet and secret, Josiah, my dear. I have never broken the condition once. I have never said I was your mother. I have admired you at a distance, and if I have come to town sometimes, with long times between, to take a proud peep at you, I have done it unbeknown, my love, and gone away again. Mr. Barnaby, with his hands in his pockets, walked in impatient mortification up and down at the side of the long dining-table, while the spectators greedily took in every syllable of Mrs. Pegler's appeal, and at each succeeding syllable became more and more round-eyed. Mr. Bounderby, still walking up and down when Mrs. Pegler had done, Mr. Gradgrind addressed that maligned old lady. "'I am surprised, madam,' he observed with severity, "'that in your old age you have the face to claim Mr. Bounderby for your son, after your unnatural and inhuman treatment of him?' "'Me unnatural?' cried poor old Mrs. Pegler. "'Me inhuman to my dear boy?' "'Dear!' repeated Gradgrind. "'Yes. Dear in his self-made prosperity, madam, I dare say. Not very dear, however, when you deserted him in his infancy and left him to the brutality of a drunken grandmother.' "'I deserted my Josiah?' cried Mrs. Pegler, clasping her hands. "'Now, Lord, forgive you, sir, for your wicked imaginations, and for your scandal against the memory of my poor mother, who died in my arms before Josiah was born. May you repent of it, sir, and live to no bear.' She was so very earnest and injured that Mr. Gradgrind, shocked by the possibility which dawned upon him, said in a gentler tone, "'Do you deny, then, madam, that you left your son to—to to be brought up in the gutter?' "'Josiah in the gutter?' exclaimed Mrs. Pegler. "'No such thing, sir. Never. For shame on you. My dear boy knows, and will give you to know, that though he come of humble parents, he come of parents that loved him as dear as the best could, and never thought it hardship on themselves to pinch a bit that he might write and cipher beautiful, and of his books at home to show it. I have I, said Mrs. Pegler, with indignant pride. And my dear boy knows, and will give you to know, sir, that after his beloved father died, when he was eight years old, his mother, too, could pinch a bit, as it was her duty and her pleasure and her pride to do it, to help him out in life and put him prentice. 
and a steady lad he was, and a kind master he had to lend him a hand, and well he worked his own way forward to be rich and thriving. And I'll give you to know, sir, for this my dear boy won't, that though his mother kept but a little village shop, he never forgot her, but pensioned me on thirty pound a year, more than I want, for I put by out of it, only making the condition that I was to keep down in my own part, and make no boasts about him, and not trouble him. And I never have, except with looking at him once a year, when he has never knowed it, and it's right, said poor old Mrs. Pegler, in affectionate championship. That I should keep down in me own part, and I have no doubts that if I was here I should do a many befitting things, and I am well contented, and I can keep my pride and my desire to myself, and I can love for love's own sake, and I am ashamed of you, sir, said Mrs. Pegler, lastly, for your slanders and suspicions. And I never stood here before, nor never wanted to stand here when my dear son said no, and I shouldn't be here now if it hadn't been for being brought here, and for shame upon you, oh, for shame, to accuse me of being a bad mother to my son, with my son standing here to tell you so different. The bystanders, on and off the dining-room chairs, raised a murmur of sympathy with Mrs. Pegler, and Mr. Gradgrind felt himself innocently placed in a very distressing predicament, when Mr. Bounderby, who had never ceased walking up and down, and had every moment swelled larger and larger, and grown redder and redder, stopped short. "'I don't exactly know.' said Mr. Bounderby, how I came to be favoured with the attendance of the present company, uh, but I don't inquire. When they're quite satisfied, perhaps they'll be so good as to disperse. Whether they're satisfied or not, perhaps they'll be so good as to disperse. Now, I'm not bound to deliver a lecture on my family affairs. I have not undertaken to do it, and I'm not going to do it. Therefore, those who expect any explanation whatever upon that brunt of the subject will be disappointed, particularly Tom Gradgrind, and he can't know it too soon. In reference to the bank robbery, there has been a mistake made concerning my mother. If there hadn't been over-officiousness, it wouldn't have been made, and I hate over-officiousness at all times, whether or no. Good evening. Although Mr. Bounderby carried it off in these terms, holding the door open for the company to depart, there was a blustering sheepishness upon him, at once extremely crestfallen and superlatively absurd. Detected as the bully of humility, who had built his windy reputation upon lies, and in his boastfulness had put the honest truth as far away from him as he had advanced a mean claim, there is no meaner, to tack himself on to a pedigree, he cut a most ridiculous figure. With the people filing off at the door he held, who he knew would carry what had passed to the whole town, to be given to the four winds, he could not have looked a bully more shorn and forlorn if he had had his ears cropped. Even that unlucky female, Mrs. Sparsett, fallen from her pinnacle of exultation into the slough of despond, was not in so bad a plight as that remarkable man and self-made humbug, Josiah Bounderby of Coketown. Rachel and Sissy leaving Mrs. Pegler to occupy a bed at her son's for that night, walked together to the gate of Stone Lodge, and there parted. Mr. Gradgrind joined them before they had gone very far, and spoke with much interest of Stephen Blackpool, for whom he thought this signal failure of the suspicions against Mrs. Pegler was likely to work well. As to the whelp, 
Throughout this scene, as on all other late occasions, he had stuck close to Bounderby. He seemed to feel that as long as Bounderby could make no discovery without his knowledge, he was so far safe. He never visited his sister, and had only seen her once since she went home, that is to say, on the night when he still stuck close to Bounderby, as already related. There was one dim, unformed fear lingering about his sister's mind, to which she never gave utterance, which surrounded the graceless and ungrateful boy with a dreadful mystery. The same dark possibility had presented itself in the same shapeless guise this very day to Sissy, when Rachel spoke of some one who would be confounded by Stephen's return, having put him out of the way. Louisa had never spoken of harboring any suspicion of her brother in connection with the robbery. She and Sissy had held no confidence on the subject, save in that one interchange of looks when the unconscious father rested his grey head on his hand. But it was understood between them, and they both knew it. This other fear was so awful that it hovered about each of them like a ghostly shadow neither daring to think of its being near herself, far less of its being near the other. And still the forced spirit which the whelp had plucked up throve with him. If Stephen Blackpool was not the thief, let him show himself. Why didn't he? Another night, another day and night. No Stephen Blackpool. Where was the man? and why did he not come back? The Sunday was a bright Sunday in autumn, clear and cool, when early in the morning Sissy and Rachel met to walk in the country. As Coketown cast ashes not only on its own head, but on the neighborhoods too, after the manner of those pious persons who do penance for their own sins by putting other people into sackcloth, it was customary for those who now and then thirsted for a draught of pure air, which is not absolutely the most wicked among the vanities of life, to get a few miles away by the railroad, and then begin their walk or their lounge in the fields. Sissy and Rachel helped themselves out of the smoke by the usual means, and were put down at a station about midway between the town and Mr. Bounderby's retreat. Though the green landscape was blotted here and there with heaps of coal, it was green elsewhere, and there were trees to see, and there were larks singing, though it was Sunday, and there were pleasant scents in the air, and all was overarched by a bright blue sky. In the distance one way, Coketown showed as a black mist. In another distance, hills began to rise. In the third, there was a faint change in the light of the horizon when it shone upon the far-off sea. Under their feet the grass was fresh. Beautiful shadows of branches flickered upon it and speckled it. Hedgerows were luxuriant. Everything was at peace. Engines at pit's mouths and lean old horses that had won the circle of their daily labor into the ground were alike quiet. Wheels had ceased for a short space to turn, and the great wheel of earth seemed to revolve without the shocks and noises of another time. They walked on across the fields and down the shady lanes, sometimes getting over a fragment of fence so rotten that it dropped at the touch of the foot, sometimes passing near a wreck of bricks and beams overgrown with grass, marking the site of deserted works. They followed paths and tracks, however slight. Mounds where grass was rank and high, and where brambles, duckweed, and such-like vegetation were confusedly heaped together, they always avoided, for dismal stories were told in that country of the old pits hidden beneath such indications. The sun was high when they sat down to rest. They had seen no one near or distant for a long time and the solitude remained unbroken. It is so still here, Rachel, and the way is so untrodden that I think we must be the first to have been here all the summer, 
As Sissy said it, her eyes were attracted by another of those rotten fragments of fence upon the ground. She got up to look at it. And yet, I don't know. This has not been broken very long. The wood is quite fresh where it gave way. Here are footsteps, too. Oh, Rachel! She ran back and caught her round the neck. Rachel had already started up. What is the matter? I don't know. There is a hat lying in the grass. They went forward together. Rachel took it up, shaking from head to foot. She broke into a passion of tears and lamentations. Stephen Blackpool was written in his own hand on the inside. Oh, the poor lad, the poor lad. He has been made away with. He is lying murdered here. Is there, has the hat any blood upon it? Sissy faltered. They were afraid to look, but they did examine it, and found no mark of violence, inside or out. It had been lying there for some days, for rain and dew had stained it, and the mark of its shape was on the grass where it had fallen. They looked fearfully about them, without moving, but could see nothing more. Rachel? I will go on a little by myself. She had unclasped her hand and was in the act of stepping forward, when Rachel caught her in both arms with a scream that resounded over the wide landscape. Before them, at their very feet, was the brink of a black ragged chasm hidden by the thick grass. They sprang back and fell upon their knees each hiding her face upon the other's neck. Oh, my good Lord, he's down there, down there. At first this, and her terrific screams, were all that could be got from Rachel by any tears, by any prayers, by any representations, by any means. It was impossible to hush her. And it was deadly necessary to hold her, or she would have flung herself down the shaft. Rachel, dear Rachel, good Rachel, for the love of heaven, not these dreadful cries. Think of Stephen, think of Stephen, think of Stephen. By an earnest repetition of this entreaty, poured out in all the agony of such a moment, Sissy at last brought her to be silent, and to look at her with a tearless face of stone. Rachel, Stephen may be living. You wouldn't leave him lying maimed at the bottom of this dreadful place a moment, if you could bring help to him. No, 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 no. Don't stir from here, for his sake. Let me go and listen. She shuddered to approach the pit, but she crept towards it on her hands and knees, and called to him as loud as she could call. She listened, but no sound replied. She called again and listened, still no answering sound. She did this twenty, thirty times. She took a little clod of earth from the broken ground where he had stumbled and threw it in. She could not hear it fall. The wide prospect, so beautiful in its stillness but a few minutes ago, almost carried despair to her brave heart as she rose and looked all round her, seeing no help. Rachel, we must lose not a moment. We must go in different directions seeking aid. You shall go by the way we have come, and I will go forward by the path. Tell anyone you see, and everyone, what has happened. Think of Stephen, think of Stephen. She knew by Rachel's face that she might trust her now. And after standing for a moment to see her running, wringing her hands as she ran, she turned and went upon her own search. She stopped at the hedge to tie her shawl there as a guide to the place, then threw her bonnet aside and ran as she had never run before. Run, Sissy, run, in heaven's name. Don't stop for breath. Run, run. Quickening herself by carrying such entreaties in her thoughts, she ran from field to field, and lane to lane, and place to place, as she had never run before, until she came to a shed by an engine house, where two men lay in the shade, asleep on straw, first to wake them and next to tell them, all so wild and breathless as she was, what had brought her there were difficulties. But they no sooner understood her than their spirits were on fire like hers. One of the men was in a drunken slumber, 
but on his comrades shouting to him that a man had fallen down the old hell shaft, he started out to a pool of dirty water, put his head in it, and came back sober. With these two men she ran to another half a mile farther, and with that one to another, while they ran elsewhere. Then a horse was found, and she got another man to ride for life or death to the railroad, and send a message to Louisa, which she wrote and gave him. By this time a whole village was up, and windlasses, ropes, poles, candles, lanterns, all things necessary, were fast collecting and being brought into one place, to be carried to the old hell shaft. It seemed now hours and hours since she had left the lost man lying in the grave where he had been buried alive. She could not bear to remain away from it any longer. It was like deserting him, and she hurried swiftly back, accompanied by a half-dozen laborers, including the drunken man whom the news had sobered, and who was the best man of all. When they came to the old hell shaft, they found it as lonely as she had left it. The men called and listened as she had done, and examined the edge of the chasm, and settled how it had happened and then sat down to wait until the implements they wanted should come up. Every sound of insects in the air, every stirring of the leaves, every whisper among these men made Sissy tremble, for she thought it was a cry at the bottom of the pit. But the wind blew idly over it, and no sound arose to the surface, and they sat upon the grass, waiting and waiting. After they had waited some time, straggling people who had heard of the accident began to come up. Then the real help of implements began to arrive. In the midst of this Rachel returned, and with her party there was a surgeon, who brought some wine and medicines. But the expectation among the people that the man would be found alive was very slight indeed. There being now people enough present to impede the work, the sobered man put himself at the head of the rest, or was put there by the general consent, and made a large ring round the old hell shaft, and appointed men to keep it. Besides such volunteers as were accepted to work, only Sissy and Rachel were at first permitted within this ring. But later in the day, when the message brought an express from Coketown, Mr. Gradgrind and Louisa and Mr. Bounderby, and the whelp were also there. The sun was four hours lower than when Sissy and Rachel had first sat down upon the grass, before a means of enabling two men to descend securely was rigged with poles and ropes. Difficulties had arisen in the construction of this machine, simple as it was. Requisites had been found wanting, and messages had had to go and return. It was five o'clock in the afternoon of the bright autumnal Sunday before a candle was set down to try the air, while three or four rough faces stood crowded close together, attentively watching it, the man at the windlass lowering as they were told. The candle was brought up again, feebly burning, and then some water was cast in. Then the bucket was hooked on, and the sobered man and another got in with lights, giving the word, Lure away. As the rope went out, tight and strained, and the windlass creaked, there was not a breath among the one or two hundred men and women looking on that came as it was wont to come. The signal was given, and the windlass stopped, with abundant rope to spare. Apparently so long an interval ensued with the man at the windlass standing idle that some women shrieked that another accident had happened. But the surgeon, who held the watch, declared five minutes not to have elapsed yet, and sternly admonished them to keep silence. He had not well done speaking when the windlass was reversed and worked again. Practiced eyes knew that it did not go as heavily as it would if both workmen had been coming up, and that only one was returning. 
The rope came in tight and strained, and ring after ring was coiled upon the barrel of the windlass, and all eyes were fastened on the pit. The sobered man was brought up and leaped out briskly on the grass. There was an universal cry of, Alive or dead? And then a deep, profound hush. When he said, Alive, a great shout arose, and many eyes had tears in them. But he's hurt very bad, he added, as soon as he could make himself heard again. Where's doctor? He's hurt so very bad, sir, that we do know how to get him up. They all consulted together, and looked anxiously at the surgeon, as he asked some questions and shook his head on receiving the replies. The sun was setting now, and the red light in the evening sky touched every face there, and caused it to be distinctly seen in all its rapt suspense. The consultation ended in the men returning to the windlass, and the pit been going down again, carrying the wine and some other small matters with him. Then the other man came up. In the meantime, under the surgeon's directions, some men brought a hurdle, on which others made a thick bed of spare clothes covered with loose straw, while he himself contrived some bandages and slings from shawls and handkerchiefs. As these were made, they were hung upon an arm of the pitman who had last come up, with instructions how to use them. And as he stood, shone by the light he carried, leaning his powerful loose hand upon one of the poles, and sometimes glancing down the pit, and sometimes glancing round upon the people, he was not the least conspicuous figure in the scene. It was dark now, and torches were kindled. It appeared from the little this man said to those about him, which was quickly repeated all over the circle, that the lost man had fallen upon a mass of crumbled rubbish with which the pit was half choked up, and that his fall had been further broken by some jagged earth at the side. He lay upon his back with one arm doubled under him, and according to his own belief had hardly stirred since he fell except that he had moved his free hand to a side pocket, in which he remembered to have some bread and meat, of which he had swallowed crumbs, and had likewise scooped up a little water in it now and then. He had come straight away from his work, on being written to, and had walked the whole journey, and was on his way to Mr. Bounderby's country house after dark when he fell. He was crossing that dangerous country at such a dangerous time, because he was innocent of what was laid to his charge, and couldn't rest from coming the nearest way to deliver himself up. The old hell shaft, the pitman said, with a curse upon it, was worthy of its bad name to the last, for though Stephen could speak now, he believed it would soon be found to have mangled the life out of him. When all was ready, this man, still taking his last hurried charges from his comrades and the surgeon after the windlass had begun to lower him, disappeared into the pit. The rope went out as before, the signal was made as before, and the windlass stopped. No man removed his hand from it now. Everyone waited with his grasp set, and his body bent down to the work ready to reverse and wind in. At length the signal was given, and all the ring leaned forward. For now the rope came in, tightened and strained to its utmost as it appeared, and the men turned heavily, and the windlass complained. It was scarcely endurable to look at the rope and think of its giving way. But ring after ring was coiled upon the barrel of the windlass safely, and the connecting chains appeared, and finally the bucket with the two men holding on at the sides, a sight to make the head swim and oppress the heart, and tenderly supporting between them, slung and tied within, the figure of a poor, crushed human creature.
A low murmur of pity went round the throng, and the women wept aloud, as this form, almost without form, was moved very slowly from its iron deliverance, and laid upon the bed of straw. At first none but the surgeon went close to it. He did what he could in its adjustment on the couch, but the best that he could do was to cover it. That gently done, he called to him Rachel and Sissy, and at that time the pale, worn, patient face was seen looking up at the sky, with the broken right hand lying barely on the outside of the covering garments, as if waiting to be taken by another hand. They gave him drink, moistened his face with water, and administered some drops of cordial and wine. Though he lay quite motionless looking up at the sky, he smiled and said, Rachel. She stooped down on the grass at his side, and bent over him until her eyes were between his and the sky, for he could not so much as turn them to look at her. Rachel, my dear. She took his hand. He smiled again and said, Don't let go. That in great pain, my own dear Stephen. I have been. But not now. I have been dreadful and dree and long, my dear. But tis o'er now. Ah, Rachel, oh, a muddle. From first to last, a muddle. The spectre of his old look seemed to pass as he said the word. I have fell into a pit, my dear, as a cost we ain't knowledge of folk now living, hundreds and hundreds of men's lives, fathers, sons, brothers, dear to thousands and thousands, and keeping her from want and hunger. I have fell into a pit that I've been whipped fire damp, crueler than battle. I have read on it in public petition, as on him on may read, from men that work in pits, in which they are praying and praying to lawmakers, for Christ's sake not to let the work be murder to them, but to spur em for the wives and children that they loves, as well as gentle folk loves theirs. When it were in work it killed without need, when tis let alone it kills without need. See how we die and no need, one way and another, in a muddle, every day. He faintly said it, without any anger against any one, merely as the truth. Thy little sister, Rachel, Thou hast not forgot her, thou art not like to forget her, and me so nigh her. Thou snowest poor, patient, suffering dear, how thou didst work for her, sitting all day long in a little chair at thy window, and how she died, young and misshapen, all along a sickly her as had no need to be, and all along a work in people's miserable homes, a muddle, oh, a muddle. Louisa approached him, but he could not see her, lying with his face turned up to the night sky. If all things that touches us, my dear, was not so muddled, I shouldn't have had to need to come here. If we was not in a muddle amongst ourselves, I shouldn't have been by my own weavers and working brothers so mistook. If Mr. Bounderby had ever knowed me right, if he'd ever knowed me at all, he wouldn't a took an offence with me. He wouldn't a suspect him me. But look up yonder, Rachel, look above. Following his eyes, she saw that he was gazing at a star. It has shined upon me, he said reverently. In my pain and trouble down below, it has shined into my mind. I have looked at it and thought of thee, Rachel, till the muddle in my mind have cleared away. Above a bit, I hope. If some have been wanting in understanding me better, I too have been wanting in understanding them better. When I got thy letter, I easily believe in that what the young lady said and done to me, and what her brother said and done to me, was one, and that there were a wicked plot betwixt em. When I fell, I were in anger with her, and hurrying on to be as unjust to her as others was to me. But in our judgment, like as in our doings, 
we mun bear and forbear. In my pain and trouble, looking up yonder, we it shining on me, I have seen more clear, and I made it my dying prayer, that all the world may only come together more, and get a better understanding of one another, than when I were in it my own weak cell. Louisa, hearing what he said, bent over him on the opposite side to Rachel, so that he could see her. You heard, he said, after a few moments' silence. I not forgot you, lady. Yes, Stephen, I have heard you, and your prayer is mine. You are your father. Will you take a message to him? He is here, said Louisa, with dread. Shall I bring him to you? If you please. Louisa returned with her father. Standing hand in hand, they both looked down upon the solemn countenance. Sir, you will clear me and make my name good with all men. This I leave to you. Mr. Gradgrind was troubled, and asked how. Sir, was the reply. Your son will tell you how. Ask him. I make no charges. I leave none of him me. Not a single word. I have seen and spoken with your son one night. I ask no more of you than you clear me. And I trust to you to do it. The bearers being now ready to carry him away, and the surgeon being anxious for his removal, those who had torches or lanterns prepared to go in front of the litter. Before it was raised, and while they were arranging how to go, he said to Rachel, looking upward at the star, Often as I come to me, Sen, and found it shining on me down there in me trouble, I thought it were the star as guided to our Saviour's home. I almost think it be the very star. They lifted him up, and he was overjoyed to find that they were about to take him in the direction whither the star seemed to him to lead. Rachel, beloved lass, don't let go of my hand. We may walk together tonight, my dear. I will hold thy hand and keep beside thee, Stephen, all the way. Bless thee. Will somebody be pleased to cover me face? They carried him very gently along the fields, and down the lanes, and over the wide landscape, Rachel always holding the hand in hers. Very few whispers broke the mournful silence. It was soon a funeral procession. The star had shown him where to find the God of the poor, and through humility and sorrow and forgiveness he had gone to his Redeemer's rest. Before the ring formed round the old hell shaft was broken, one figure had disappeared from within it. Mr. Bounderby and his shadow had not stood near Louisa, who held her father's arm, but in a retired place by themselves. When Mr. Gradgrind was summoned to the couch, Sissy, attentive to all that happened, slipped behind that wicked shadow, a sight in the horror of his face, if there had been eyes there but for any sight but one, and whispered in his ear. Without turning his head, he conferred with her for a few moments, and vanished. Thus the whelp had gone out of the circle before the people moved. When the father reached home, he sent a message to Mr. Bounderby's, desiring his son to come to him directly. The reply was that Mr. Bounderby, having missed him in the crowd and seen nothing of him since, had supposed him to be at Stone Lodge. I believe, father, said Louisa, he will not come back to town to-night. Mr. Gradgrind turned away and said no more. In the morning he went down to the bank himself as soon as it was opened, and seeing his son's place empty, he had not the courage to look in first, went back along the street to meet Mr. Bounderby on his way there, to whom he said that, for reasons he would soon explain, but entreated not then to be asked for, he had found it necessary to employ his son at a distance for a little while. Also that he was charged with the duty of vindicating Stephen Blackpool's memory, and declaring the thief. 
Mr. Bounderby, quite confounded, stood stock still in the street after his father-in-law had left him, swelling like an immense soap-bubble without its beauty. Mr. Gridgrind went home, locking himself in his room, and kept it all that day. When Sissy and Louisa tapped at his door, he said, without opening it, Not now, my dears. In the evening. On their return in the evening, he said, I am not able yet. Tomorrow. He ate nothing all day, and had no candle after dark and they heard him walking to and fro late at night. But in the morning he appeared at breakfast at the usual hour, and took his usual place at the table. Aged and bent he looked, and quite bowed down, yet he looked a wiser man, and a better man, than in the days when in this life he wanted nothing but facts. Before he left the room he appointed a time for them to come to him, and so, with his grey head drooping, went away. "'Dear father,' said Louisa, when they kept their appointment, "'you have three young children left. They will be different. I will be different yet, with heaven's help.' She gave her hand to Sissy, as if she meant with her help too. "'Your wretched brother,' said Mr. Gradgrind. Do you think he had planned this robbery when he went with you to the lodging? I fear so, father. I know he had wanted money very much and had spent a great deal. The poor man being about to leave the town, it came into his evil brain to cast suspicion on him? I think it must have flashed upon him while he sat there, father, for I asked him to go there with me. The visit did not originate with him. He had some conversation with the poor man. Did he take him aside? He took him out of the room. I asked him afterwards why he had done so, and he made a plausible excuse. But since last night, father, and when I remember the circumstances by its light, I am afraid I can imagine too truly what passed between them. Let me know, said her father, if your thoughts present your guilty brother in the same dark view as mine. I fear, father, hesitated Louisa, that he must have made some representation to Stephen Blackpool, perhaps in my name, perhaps in his own, which induced him to do in good faith and honesty what he had never done before, and to wait about the bank those two or three nights before he left the town. Too plain, returned the father. Too plain. He shaded his face and remained silent for some moments. Recovering himself, he said, And now... How is he to be found? How is he to be saved from justice in the few hours that I can possibly allow to elapse before I publish the truth? How is he to be found by us, and only by us? Ten thousand pounds could not affect it. Sissy has affected it, father. He raised his eyes to where she stood, like a good fairy in his house and said in a tone of softened gratitude and grateful kindness, It is always you, my child. We had our fears, Sissy explained, glancing at Louisa, before yesterday, and when I saw you brought to the side of the litter last night, and heard what passed, being close to Rachel all the time, I went to him when no one saw, and said to him, Don't look at me. See where your father is. Escape at once, for his sake and your own. He was in a tremble before I whispered to him, and he started and trembled more then, and said, Where can I go? I have very little money, and I don't know who will hide me. I thought of father's old circus. I have not forgotten where Mr. Sleary goes at this time of year, and I read of him in a paper only the other day. I told him to hurry there, and tell his name, and ask Mr. Sleary to hide him till I came. I'll get to him before the morning, he said, and I saw him shrink away among the people. Thank heaven, exclaimed his father. He may be got abroad yet. It was more hopeful, as the town to which Sissy had directed him was within three hours' journey of Liverpool, whence he could be swiftly dispatched to any part of the world. But caution being necessary in communicating with him, for there was a greater danger every moment of his being suspected now, and nobody could be sure at heart but that Mr. Bounderby himself in a bullying vein of public zeal, might play a Roman part, 
it was consented that Sissy and Louisa should repair to a place in question by a circuitous course alone, and that the unhappy father, setting forth in an opposite direction, should get round to the same bourne by another and wider route. It was further agreed that he should not present himself to Mr. Sleary, lest his intention should be mistrusted, or the intelligence of his arrival should cause his son to take flight anew but that the communication should be left to Sissy and Louisa to open, and that they should inform the cause of so much misery and disgrace of his father's being at hand, and of the purpose for which they had come. When these arrangements had been well considered, and were fully understood by all three, it was time to begin to carry them into execution. Early in the afternoon, Mr. Gradgrind walked directly from his own house into the country, to be taken up on the line by which he was to travel, and at night the remaining two set forth upon their different course, encouraged by not seeing any face they knew. The two travelled all night, except when they were left off, for odd numbers of minutes, at branch places, up illimitable flights of steps, or down wells, which was the only variety of those branches, and early in the morning were turned out on a swamp a mile or two from the town they sought. From this dismal spot they were rescued by a savage old postilion, who happened to be up early, kicking a horse in a fly, and so were smuggled into the town by all the back lanes where the pigs lived, which, although not a magnificent or even savory approach, was, as is usual in such cases, the legitimate highway. The first thing they saw on entering the town was the skeleton of Sleary's Circus. The company had departed for another town more than twenty miles off, and had opened there last night. The connection between the two places was by a hilly turnpike road, and the travelling on that road was very slow. Though they took but a hasty breakfast, and no rest, which it would have been in vain to seek under such anxious circumstances, it was noon before they began to find the bills of Sleary's horse-riding on barns and walls, and one o'clock when they stopped in the market-place. A grand morning performance by the riders, commencing at that very hour, was in course of announcement by the bellmen as they set their feet upon the stones of the street. Sissy recommended that, to avoid making inquiries and attracting attention in the town, they should present themselves to pay at the door. If Mr. Sleary were taking the money, he would be sure to know her, and would proceed with discretion. If he were not, he would be sure to see them inside, and knowing what he had done with the fugitive, would proceed with discretion still. Therefore they repaired, with fluttering hearts, to the well-remembered booth. The flag, with the inscription, Series Horse Riding, was there, and the Gothic niche was there, but Mr. Sleary was not. Master Kidderminster, grown too maturely turfy to be received by the wildest credulity as Cupid any more, had yielded to the invincible force of circumstances, and his beard, and in the capacity of a man who made himself generally useful, presided on this occasion over the exchequer, having also a drum in reserve on which to expend his leisure moments and superfluous forces. In the extreme sharpness of his lookout for base coin, Mr. Kidderminster, as at present situated, never saw anything but money. So Sissy passed him unrecognized, and they went in. The Emperor of Japan, on a steady old horse stenciled with black spots, was twirling five wash-hand basins at once, as it is the favorite recreation of that monarch to do. Sissy, though well acquainted with his royal line, had no personal knowledge of the present Emperor, and his reign was peaceful. Miss Josephine Sleary, in her celebrated, graceful, equestrian Tyrolean flower act, 
was then announced by a new clown, who humorously said cauliflower act, and Mr. Sleary appeared, leading her in. Mr. Sleary had only made one cut at the clown with his long whiplash, and the clown had only said, If she do so again, I'll throw the horse at you, when Sissy was recognized both by father and daughter. But they got through the act with great self-possession, and Mr. Sleary, saving for the first instant, conveyed no more expression into his locomotive eye than into his fixed one. The performance seemed a little long to Sissy and Louisa, particularly when it stopped to afford the clown an opportunity of telling Mr. Sleary, who said, Indeed, sir, to all his observations in the calmest way, and with his eye on the house, about two legs sitting on three legs, looking at one leg, when in came four legs, and laid hold of one leg, and got up two legs, caught hold of three legs, and threw em at four legs, who ran away with one leg. For, although an ingenious allegory related to a butcher, a three-legged stool, a dog, and a leg of mutton, this narrative consumed time, and they were in great suspense. At last, however, little fair-haired Josephine made her curtsy amid great applause, and the clown, left alone in the ring, had just warmed himself, and said, Now all ever turn, when Sissy was touched on the shoulder and beckoned out. She took Louisa with her, and they were received by Mr. Sleary in a very little private apartment with canvas sides, a grass floor, and a wooden ceiling, all a slant, on which the box company stamped their approbation, as if they were coming through. Cecilia, said Mr. Sleary, who had brandy and water at hand, it does me good to see you. You was always a favorite with us, and you've done us credit since the old times, I'm sure. You must see our people, my dear, afore we speak of business, or they'll break their hearts, especially the women. Here's Josephine has been and got married to E. W. B. Childers, and she hath got a boy, and though he's only three years old, he sticks it on to any pony you can bring against him. He's named the Little Wonder of Scholastic Equitation, and if you don't hear of that boy Athlis, You'll hear of him at Paris. And you recollect Kidder Mister that was thought to be rather sweet upon yourself? Well, he's married too. Married a widder, old enough to be his mother. She was tightrope, she was, and now she's nothing on account of fat. They've got two children, though we're strong in the fairy business and the nursery dodge. If you was to see our children in the wood, with their father and mother both a-dying on a horse, their uncle a-receiving of them, and as with warts upon a horse, themselves both a-going a black burying on a horse, and the robins a-coming in to cover em with leaves upon a horse, you say it was the completest thing as ever you set your eyes upon. And you remember Emma Gordon, my dear, as was almost the mother to you? Of course you do, I needn't ask. Well, Emma, she's lost her husband. He was throwed a heavy backfall off an elephant in a sort of a pagoda thing, as the Sultan of the Indias, and he never got the better of it. And she married a second time. Married a cheesemonger as fell in love with her from the front, and he's the overseer and making a fortune. These various changes, Mr. Sleary, very short of breath now, related with great heartiness and with a wonderful kind of innocence, considering what a bleary and brandy and watery old veteran he was. Afterwards he brought in Josephine, an E. W. B. Childers, rather deeply lined in the jaws by daylight, and the little wonder of scholastic equitation, and, in a word, all the company. Amazing creatures they were in Louise's eyes, so white and pink of complexion, so scant of dress, 
and so demonstrative of leg, but it was very agreeable to see them crowding about Sissy, and very natural in Sissy to be unable to refrain from tears. There, now Cecilia hath kissed all the children, and hugged all the women, and shaken hands all round with all the men, clear every one of you, and ring in the band for the second part. As soon as they were gone, he continued in a low tone. Now, Cecilia, I don't ask to know any secrets, but I suppose I may consider this to be Miss Squire. This is his sister, yes. And t'other one's daughter? That's what I mean. Hope I see you well, miss, and I hope the squire is well. My father will be here soon, said Louisa, anxious to bring him to the point. Is my brother safe? Safe and sound, he replied. I want you just to take a peep at the ring, miss, through here. Cecilia, you know the dodge. Find the spy hole for yourself. They each looked through a chink in the board. That Jack the Giant Killer, piece of comic infant business, said Sleary. There's a property house, you see, for Jack to hide in. There's my clown with a saucepan lid and a spit for Jack's servant. There's little Jack himself in a splendid suit of armor. There's two comic black servants, twice as big as the house, to stand by it and to bring it in and clear it. And the giant, a very expensive basket one. He ain't on yet. Now, do you see them all? Yes, yes, they both said. Look at them again said Sleary. Look at em well. You see em all? Very good. Now, miss. He put a form for them to sit on. I have my opinions, and the squire your father hath his. I don't want to know what your brother's been up to. It's better for me not to know. All I say is, the squire has stood by Cecilia, and I'll stand by the squire. Your brother is one of them black servants. Louisa uttered an exclamation, partly of distress, partly of satisfaction. It's a fact, said Sleary. And even knowing it, you couldn't put your finger on him. Let the squire come. I shall keep your brother here after the performance. I shan't undress him, nor yet wash his paint off. Let the squire come here after the performance, or come here yourself after the performance, and you shall find your brother and have the whole place to talk to him in. Never mind the looks of him, as long as he's well hid. Louisa, with many thanks and with a lightened load, detained Mr. Sleary no longer then. She left her love for her brother, with her eyes full of tears, and she and Sissy went away until later in the afternoon. Mr. Gradgrind arrived within an hour afterwards. He too had encountered no one whom he knew, and was now sanguine, with Leary's assistance, of getting his disgraced son to Liverpool in the night. As neither of them could be his companion, without almost identifying him under any disguise, he prepared a letter to a correspondent whom he could trust, beseeching him to ship the bearer off to any coast, to North or South America, or any distant part of the world to which he could be the most speedily and privately dispatched. This done, they walked about, waiting for the service to be quite vacated, not only by the audience, but by the company and by the horses. After watching it a long time, they saw Mr. Sleary bring out a chair and sit down by the side door, smoking as if that were his signal that they might approach. Your servant, squire, was his cautious salutation as they passed in. If you want me, you'll find me here. You mustn't mind your son having a comic livery on. They all three went in. Mr. Gradgrind sat down forlorn on the clown's performing chair in the middle of the ring. On one of the back benches, Remote in the subdued light and the strangeness of the place, sat the villainous whelp, sulky to the last, whom he had the misery to call his son. In a preposterous coat like a beetle's, with cuffs and flaps exaggerated to an unspeakable extent, 
in an immense waistcoat, knee-breeches, buckled shoes, and a mad cocked hat, with nothing fitting him, and everything of coarse material, moth-eaten and full of holes, with seams in his black face, where fear and heat had started through the greasy composition daubed all over it, anything so grimly, detestably, ridiculously shameful as the whelp in his comic livery, Mr. Gradgrind never could by any other means have believed in, weighable and measurable fact though it was. And one of his model children had come to this. At first the whelp would not draw any nearer, but persisted in remaining up there by himself, yielding at length, if any concession so suddenly made can be called yielding, to the entreaties of Sissy, for Louisa he disowned altogether, he came down bench by bench until he stood in the sawdust on the verge of the circle as far as possible within its limits from where his father sat. How was this done? asked the father. How was what done? This robbery, said the father, raising his voice upon the word. I forced to save myself overnight and shut it up ajar before I went away. I had had the key that was found made long before. I dropped it that morning that it might be supposed to have been used. I didn't take the money all at once. I pretended to put my balance away every night, but I didn't. Now you know all about it. If a thunderbolt had fallen on me, said the father, it would have shocked me less than this. I don't see why, grumbled the son. So many people are employed in situations of trust. So many people out of so many will be dishonest. I've heard you talk a hundred times of its being a law. How can I help laws? You have comforted others with such things, father. Comfort yourself. The father buried his face in his hands, and the son stood in his disgraceful grotesqueness biting straw. His hands, with the black partly worn away inside, looking like the hands of a monkey. The evening was fast closing in, and from time to time he turned the whites of his eyes restlessly and impatiently towards his father. There were the only parts of his face that showed any life or expression. The pigment upon it was so thick. You must be got to Liverpool and sent abroad. I suppose I must. I can't be more miserable anywhere, whimpered the whelp, than I've been here ever since I can remember. That's one thing. Mr. Gradgrind went to the door and returned with Sleary, to whom he submitted the question, how to get this deplorable object away. Why, I've been thinking of it, Squire. There's not much time to lose, though you must say yes or no, it's over twenty miles to the rail. There's a coach in half an hour that goes to the rail, purpose to cast the mail train. That train will take him right to Liverpool. But look at him. Will any coach— I don't mean that he shall go in the comic livery, said Sleary. Say the word, and I'll make a jaskin of him out of the wardrobe in five minutes. I don't understand, said Mr. Gradgrind. A jaskin, a carter. Make up your mind quick, squire. There'll be beer to fetch. I've never met with nothing but beer as I'll ever clean a comic blackamoor. Mr. Gradgrind rapidly assented. Mr. Sleary rapidly turned out from a box, a smock frock, a felt hat, and other essentials. The whelp rapidly changed clothes behind a screen of bays. Mr. Sleary rapidly brought beer and washed him white again. Now, said Sleary, come along to the coach and jump up behind and I'll go with you there and they'll suppose you one of my people. Say farewell to your family. And tharps the word. Here is your letter, said Mr. Gradgrind. All necessary means will be provided for you. Atone by repentance and better conduct for the shocking action you have committed and the dreadful consequences to which it has led. Give me your hand, my poor boy, and may God forgive you as I do. 
The culprit was moved to a few abject tears by these words and their pathetic tone. But when Louisa opened her arms, he repulsed her afresh. Not you. I don't want to have anything to say to you. Oh, Tom, Tom, do we end so after all my love? After all your love? He returned obdurately. Pretty love. Leaving old Bounderby to himself, and packing my best friend Mr. Hardhouse off, and going home just when I was in the greatest danger. Pretty love that. Coming out with every word about our having gone to that place, when you saw the net was gathering round me. Pretty love that. You're regularly giving me up. You never cared for me. Darn the word, said Sleary at the door. They all confusedly went out. Louisa crying to him that she forgave him and loved him still, and that he would one day be sorry to have left her so, and glad to think of these her last words far away, when some one ran against them. Mr. Gradgrind and Sissy, who were both before him while his sister yet clung to his shoulder, stopped and recoiled. For there was Bitzer, out of breath. His thin lips parted, his thin nostrils distended, his white eyelashes quivering, his colorless face more colorless than ever, as if he ran himself into a white heat when other people ran themselves into a glow. There he stood, panting and heaving, as if he had never stopped since the night long ago when he had run them down before. I'm sorry to interfere with your plans said Bitzer, shaking his head. But I can't allow myself to be done by Ostradus. I must have young Mr. Tom. He mustn't be got away by Ostradus. Here he is in a smock frock, and I must have him. By the collar, too, it seemed, for so he took possession of him. They went back into the booth, Sleary shutting the door to keep intruders out. Bitzer, still holding the paralyzed culprit by the collar, stood in the ring, blinking at his old patron through the darkness of the twilight. Bitzer, said Mr. Gradgrind, broken down and miserably submissive to him. Have you a heart? The circulation, sir, returned Bitzer, smiling at the oddity of the question. Couldn't be carried on without one. No man so acquainted with the facts established by Harvey relating to the circulation of the blood can doubt that I have a heart. Is it accessible, cried Mr. Gradgrind, to any compassionate influence? It is accessible to reason, sir, returned the excellent young man, and to nothing else. They stood looking at each other, Mr. Gradgrind's face as white as the pursuer's. What motive, even what motive in reason, can you have for preventing the escape of this wretched youth? said Mr. Gradgrind and crushing his miserable father. See his sister here. Pity us. Sir, returned Bitzer in a very businesslike and logical manner. Since you ask me what motive I have in reason for taking young Mr. Tom back to Corktown, it is only reasonable to let you know. I have suspected young Mr. Tom of this bank robbery from the first. I had my eye upon him before that time, for I knew his ways. I have kept my observations to myself, but I have made them, and I have got ample proofs against him now, besides his running away, and besides his own confession, which I was just in time to overhear. I had the pleasure of watching your house yesterday morning, and following you here. I am going to take young Mr. Tom back to Coketown, in order to deliver him over to Mr. Bounderby. Sir, I have no doubt whatever that Mr. Bounderby will then promote me to young Mr. Tom's situation, and I wish to have his situation, sir, for it will be a rise to me and will do me good. If this is solely a question of self-interest with you, Mr. Gradgride began, I beg your pardon for interrupting you, sir, returned Bitzer, but I am sure you know that the whole social system is a question of self-interest. What you must always appeal to is a person's self-interest. It's your only hold. We are so constituted. I was brought up in that catechism when I was very young, sir, as you are aware. 
"'What sum of money,' said Mr. Gradgrind, "'will you set against your expected promotion?' "'Thank you, sir,' returned Bitzer, "'for hinting at the proposal, but I will not set any sum against it. Knowing that your clear head would propose that alternative, I have gone over the calculations in my mind, and I find that to compound a felony, even on very high terms indeed, would not be as safe and good for me as my improved prospects in the bank. Bitzer, said Mr. Gradgrind, stretching out his hands as though he would have said, See how miserable I am? Bitzer, I have but one chance left to soften you. You were many years at my school. If, in remembrance of the pains bestowed upon you there, you can persuade yourself in any degree to disregard your present interest and release my son, I entreat and pray you to give him the benefit of that remembrance. I really wonder, sir, rejoined the old pupil in an argumentative manner, to find you taking a position so untenable. My schooling was paid for. It was a bargain, and when I came away, the bargain ended. It was a fundamental principle of the Gradgrind philosophy that everything was to be paid for. Nobody was ever on any account to give anybody anything, or render anybody help without purchase. Gratitude was to be abolished, and the virtues springing from it were not to be. Every inch of the existence of mankind, from birth to death, was to be a bargain across a counter, and if we didn't get to heaven that way, it was not a politico-economical place, and we had no business there. I don't deny, added Bitzer, that my schooling was cheap, but that comes right, sir. I was made in the cheapest market, and have to dispose of myself in the dearest. He was a little troubled here, by Louisa and Sissy crying. Pray don't do that, said he. It's no use doing that. It only worries. You seem to think that I have some animosity against young Mr. Tom, whereas I have none at all. I am only going on the reasonable grounds I have mentioned to take him back to Coketown. If he was to resist, I should set up the cry of, Stop, thief! But he won't resist. You may depend upon it. Mr. Sleary, who, with his mouth open and his rolling eye as immovably jammed in his head as his fixed one, had listened to these doctrines with profound attention, here stepped forward. Squire, you know perfectly well, and your daughter knoweth perfectly well, better than you, because I said it to her, that I didn't know what your son had done, and that I didn't want to know. I said it was better not though I only thought then it was some skylarking. However, this young man having made it known to be a robbery of a bank, why, that's a serious thing. Much too serious a thing for me to compound, as this young man has very properly called it. Consequently, squire, you mustn't quarrel with me if I take this young man's side and say he's right and there's no help for it. But I tell you what I'll do, squire. I'll drive your son and this young man over to the rail and prevent exposure here. I can't consent to do more, but I'll do that. Fresh lamentations from Louisa and deeper affliction on Mr. Gradgrind's part followed this desertion of them by their last friend. But Sissy glanced at him with great attention, nor did she in her breast misunderstand him. As they were all going out again, he favored her with one slight roll of his movable eye, desiring her to linger behind. As he locked the door, he said excitedly, The squire stood by you, Cecilia, and I'll stand by the squire. More than that, this is a precious rascal, and belongs to that bluttering cove that my people nearly pitched out o' winder. It'll be a dark night. I've got a horse that'll do anything but speak. I've got a pony that'll go fifteen mile an hour with childreth driving of him. I've got a dog that'll keep a man to one place twenty and four hours. Get a word with the young squire. Tell him when he sees our horse begin to dance, not to be afraid of being spilt, 
but to look out for a pony gig coming up. Tell him when he sees that gig close by to jump down and it'll take him off at a rattling pace. If my dog lets this young man stir a peg on foot, I give him leave to go. And if my horse ever stirs from the spot where he begins a dancing till the morning, I don't know him. Sharp's the word. The word was so sharp that in ten minutes Mr. Childers, sauntering about the marketplace in a pair of slippers, had his cue, and Mr. Sleary's equipage was ready. It was a fine sight to behold the learned dog barking round it, and Mr. Sleary instructing him, with his one practicable eye, that Bitzer was the object of his particular attentions. Soon after dark they all three got in and started, the learned dog, a formidable creature, already pinning Bitzer with his eye, and sticking close to the wheel on his side, that he might be ready for him in the event of his showing the slightest disposition to alight. The other three sat up at the inn all night in great suspense. At eight o'clock in the morning Mr. Sleary and the dog reappeared, both in high spirits. All right, squire, said Mr. Sleary. Your son may be aboard a ship by this time. Childers took him off an hour and a half after we left there last night. The horse danced the polka till he was deadbeat. He would have waltzed if he hadn't been in harness. And then I gave him the word, and he went to sleep comfortable. When that precious young rascal said he'd go forward afoot, the dog hung on to his neck handkerchief with all four legs in the air and pulled him down and rolled him over. Though he come back into the drag, and there he sat till he turned the horse's head at half past six this morning. Mr. Gradgrind overwhelmed him with thanks, of course, and hinted as delicately as he could at a handsome remuneration in money. I don't want money myself, squire, but Childers is a family man, and if you was to, like, offer him a five-pound note, it mightn't be unacceptable. Likewise, if you was to stand a collar for the dog, or a set of bells for the horse, I should be very glad to take em. Brandy and water I always take. If you wouldn't think it going too far, squire, to make a little spread for the company at about three and thick the head, not reckoning loose, it would make em happy. All these little tokens of his gratitude Mr. Gradgrind very willingly undertook to render, though he thought them far too slight, he said, for such a service. Very well, squire. Then if you'll only give a horse-riding, a bespeak, whenever you can, you'll more than balance the account. Now, squire, if your daughter will excuse me, I should like one parting word with you. Louisa and Sissy withdrew to an adjoining room. Mr. Sleary, stirring and drinking his brandy and water as he stood, went on. Squire, you don't need to be told that dogs is wonderful animals. Their instinct said Mr. Gradgrind, is surprising. Whatever you call it, and I'm blessed if I know what to call it, said Sleary. It is astonishing, the way in which a dog'll find you, the distance he'll come. His scent, said Mr. Gradgrind, being so fine. I'm blessed if I know what to call it, repeated Sleary, shaking his head. But I have had dogs find me, squire, in a way that made me think whether that dog hadn't gone to another dog and said, You don't happen to know a person of the name of Sleary, do you? Person of the name of Sleary in the horse-riding way? Stout man, game eye? And whether that dog mightn't have said, Well, I can't say I know him myself, but I know a dog that I think would be likely to be acquainted with him. And whether that dog mightn't have thought it over and said, Sleary, Sleary, oh, yes, to be sure. A friend of mine mentioned him to me at one time. I can get you his address directly. In consequence of my being afore the public, and going about so much, you see, 
There must be a number of dogs acquainted with me, Squire, that I don't know. Mr. Gradgrind seemed to be quite confounded by this speculation. Anyway, said Sleary, after putting his lips to his brandy and water, it's fourteen months ago, Squire, since we was at Chester. We was getting up our children in the wood one morning, when there comes into our ring by the stage door a dog. He had traveled a long way. He was in a very bad condition. He was lame and pretty well blind. He went round to our children one after another, as if he was a seeking for a child he knowed. And then he come to me, and throwed himself up behind, and stood on his two forelegs, weak as he was, and then he wagged his tail and died. Squire, that dog was Merry Legs. Sissy's father's dog? Cecilia's father's old dog. Now, Squire, I can take my oath from my knowledge of that dog that that man was dead and buried afore that dog come back to me. Josephine and Childers and me talked it over a long time, whether I should write or not, but we agreed, no, there's nothing comfortable to tell, why unsettle her mind and make her unhappy. Though whether her father basely deserted her, or whether he broke his own heart alone rather than pull her down along with him, never will be known now, squire, till, no, not till we know how the dogs findeth us out. She keeps the bottle that he sent her for to this hour, and she will believe in his affection to the last moment of her life, said Mr. Gradgrind. It seems to present two things to a person, don't it, squire? said Mr. Sleary musing as he looked down into the depths of his brandy and water. One, that there is a love in the world, not all self-interest after all, but something very different to other that it bath a way of its own of calculating or not calculating, which somehow or another is at least as hard to give a name to as the ways of the dogs is. Mr. Gradgrind looked out of window and made no reply. Mr. Sleary emptied his glass and recalled the ladies. Cecilia, my dear, kiss me and good-bye. Miss Squire, to see you treating of her like a sister, and a sister that you trust and honor with all your heart and more, is a very pretty sight to me. I hope your brother may live to be better deserving of you, and a better comfort to you. Squire, shake hands, first and last. Don't be cross with us, poor vagabonds. People must be amused. They can't be always a-learning, nor yet they can't be always a-working, and ain't made for it. You must have us, Squire. Do the wise thing, and the kind thing, too, and make the best of us, not the worst. And I never thought before said Mr. Sleary, putting his head in at the door again to say it, that I was too much of a cackler. It is a dangerous thing to see anything in the sphere of a vain blusterer before the vain blusterer sees it himself. Mr. Bounderby felt that Mrs. Sparsit had audaciously anticipated him, and presumed to be wiser than he. He turned this presumption, on the part of a woman in her dependent position, over and over in his mind, until it accumulated with turning like a great snowball. At last he made the discovery that to discharge this highly connected female, to have it in his power to say, She was a woman of family, and wanted to stick to me, but I wouldn't have it, and I got rid of her would be to get the utmost possible amount of crowning glory out of the connection, and at the same time to punish Mrs. Sparsit according to her deserts. Filled fuller than ever with this great idea, Mr. Bounderby came in to lunch, and sat himself down in the dining-room of former days, where his portrait was. Mrs. Sparsit sat by the fire, with her foot in her cotton stirrup, 
little thinking whither she was posting. Since the Pegler affair, this gentlewoman had covered her pity for Mr. Bounderby with a veil of quiet melancholy and contrition. In virtue thereof, it had become her habit to assume a woeful look, which woeful look she now bestowed upon her patron. "'What's the matter now, ma'am?' said Mr. Bounderby, in a very short, rough way. "'Pray, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsett, "'do not bite my nose off.' "'Bite your nose off, ma'am?' repeated Mr. Bounderby. "'Your nose?' meaning, as Mrs. Sparsett conceived, that it was too developed a nose for the purpose, after which offensive implication he cut himself a crust of bread and threw the knife down with a noise. Mrs. Sparsett took her foot out of her stirrup and said, "'Mr. Bounderby, sir?' "'Well, ma'am,' retorted Mr. Bounderby, "'what is there in that?' "'May I ask, sir?' said Mrs. Sparsett, have you been ruffled this morning? Yes, ma'am. May I inquire, sir? pursued the injured woman, whether I am the unfortunate cause of your having lost your temper? Now, I'll tell you what, ma'am, said Bounderby. I am not come here to be bullied. A female may be highly connected, but she can't be permitted to bother and badger a man in my position, and I am not going to put up with it. Mr. Bounderby felt it necessary to get on, foreseeing that if he allowed of details, he would be beaten. Mrs. Sparsett first elevated, then knitted her Coriolanian eyebrows, gathered up her work into its proper basket, and rose. Sir, said she majestically, it is apparent to me that I am in your way at present. I will retire to my own apartment. "'Allow me to open the door, ma'am.' "'Thank you, sir. I can do it for myself.' "'You had better allow me, ma'am,' said Bounderby, passing her and getting his hand upon the lock. "'Because I can take the opportunity of saying a word to you before you go, Mrs. Sparsit, ma'am. I rather think you are cramped here, do you know. It appears to me that— under my humble roof there's hardly opening enough for a lady of your genius in other people's affairs. Mrs. Sparsett gave him a look of the darkest scorn, and said, with great politeness, Really, sir? I have been thinking it over, you see, since the late affairs have happened, ma'am, said Bounderby, and it appears to my poor judgment. Oh, pray, sir! Mrs. Sparsett interposed with sprightly cheerfulness. "'Don't disparage your judgment. Everybody knows how unerring Mr. Bounderby's judgment is. Everybody has had proofs of it. It must be the theme of general conversation. Disparage anything in yourself but your judgment, sir,' said Mrs. Sparsett, laughing. Mr. Bounderby, very red and uncomfortable, resumed. It appears to me, ma'am, I say, that a different sort of establishment altogether would bring out a lady of your powers, such as an establishment as your relations, Lady Scadgers, now. Don't you think you might find some affairs there, ma'am, to interfere with? It never occurred to me before, sir, returned Mrs. Sparsett. But now you mention it, should think it highly probable. "'Then supposing you try, ma'am,' said Bounderby, laying an envelope with a cheque in it in her little basket. "'You can take your own time for going, ma'am, but perhaps in the meanwhile it will be more agreeable to a lady of your powers of mind to eat her meals by herself and not to be intruded upon. I really ought to apologise to you, being only Josiah Bounderby of Corktown, for having stood in your light so long. "'Pray don't name it, sir,' returned Mrs. Sparsett. "'If that portrait could speak, sir. But it has the advantage over the original of not possessing the power of committing itself and disgusting others. It would testify that a long period has elapsed since I first habitually addressed it as the picture of a noodle. Nothing that a noodle does can awaken surprise or indignation. The proceedings of a noodle can only inspire—' contempt. 
Thus saying, Mrs. Sparsit, with her Roman features like a medal, struck to commemorate her scorn of Mr. Bounderby, surveyed him fixedly from head to foot, swept disdainfully past him, and ascended the staircase. Mr. Bounderby closed the door and stood before the fire, projecting himself, after his old explosive manner, into his portrait, and into futurity. Into how much of futurity? He saw Mrs. Sparsit fighting out a daily fight at the points of all the weapons in the female armory, with the grudging, smarting, peevish, tormenting Lady Scadgers, still laid up in bed with her mysterious leg, and gobbling her insufficient income down by about the middle of every quarter, and a mean little airless lodging, a mere closet for one, a mere crib for two. But did he see more? Did he catch any glimpse of himself making a show of bitzer to strangers, as the rising young man, so devoted to his master's great merit, who had won young Tom's place, and had almost captured young Tom himself, in the times when by various rascals he was spirited away? Did he see any faint reflection of his own image making a vain glorious will, whereby five-and-twenty humbugs, past five-and-fifty years of age, each taking upon himself the name Josiah Bounderby of Coketown, should forever dine in Bounderby Hall, forever lodge in Bounderby Buildings, forever attend a Bounderby Chapel, forever go to sleep under a Bounderby Chaplain, forever be supported out of a Bounderby estate, and forever nauseate all healthy stomachs with a vast amount of Bounderby balderdash and bluster. Had he any prescience of the day, five years to come, when Josiah Bounderby of Coketown was to die of a fit in the Coketown street, and this same precious will was to begin its long career of quibble, plunder, false pretenses, vile example, little service, and much law? Probably not. Yet the portrait was to see it all out. Here was Mr. Gradgrind, on the same day and in the same hour, sitting thoughtful in his own room. How much of futurity did he see? Did he see himself a white-haired, decrepit man, bending his hitherto inflexible theories to appointed circumstances, making his facts and figures subservient to faith, hope, and charity, and no longer trying to grind that heavenly trio in his dusty little mills? Did he catch sight of himself, therefore, much despised by his late political associates? Did he see them, in the era of its being quite settled that the national dustmen have only to do with one another, and owe no duty to an abstraction called a people, taunting the honourable gentleman with this and with that and with what not, five nights a week, until the small hours of the morning? Probably he had that much foreknowledge, knowing his men. Here was Louisa, on the night of the same day, watching the fire as in days of yore, though with a gentler and a humbler face. How much of the future might arise before her vision! Broadsides in the streets, signed with her father's name, exonerating the late Stephen Blackpool, Weaver, from misplaced suspicion, and publishing the guilt of his own son, with such extenuation as his years and temptation, he could not bring himself to add his education, might beseech, were of the present. So Stephen Blackpool's tombstone, with her father's record of his death, was almost of the present, for she knew it was to be. These things she could plainly see. But how much of the future? A working woman christened Rachel, after a long illness, once again appearing at the ringing of the factory bell, 
and passing to and fro at the set hours among the coquetan hands. A woman of pensive beauty, always dressed in black, but sweet-tempered and serene, and even cheerful, who, of all the people in the place, alone appeared to have compassion on a degraded drunken wretch of her own sex, who was sometimes seen in the town secretly begging of her, and crying to her. A woman working, ever working, but content to do it, and preferring to do it as her natural lot, until she should be too old to labor any more. Did Louisa see this? Such a thing was to be. A lonely brother, many thousands of miles away, writing, on paper blotted with tears, that her words had too soon come true, and that all the treasures in the world would be cheaply bartered for a sight of her dear face. At length, this brother coming nearer home, with hope of seeing her, and being delayed by illness. And then a letter, in a strange hand, saying, He died in hospital of fever such a day, and died in penitence and love of you, his last word being your name. Did Louisa see these things? Such things were to be. End of Hard Times by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.